It's time now for John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Chet Graham, Johnny. Who? Wake up, boy. Chet Graham claims New York Mutual. Oh, hi, Chet. How are things? Bad. Johnny, I have to make a little trip out to the coast on a phony claim. I'll be gone about four days, but I need someone to hold down my office while I'm away. Can you do it? Oh, that's not my line, Chet. You know that. Well, make it your line, Johnny. Somebody has to be here. Look, you can live in my apartment. You can use my tickets to wish you were here. You can even take my girl if you want. New York's swell this time of year. Can't you get anybody there? Oh, everybody's got the flu or busy or something. When do you want to leave for the coast? I'd like to get out on the noon plane today. Well, I can be down there by 11. Good. We'll probably miss each other, but just walk right in the office and make yourself at home. I'll call you from L.A. Have a good trip. Uh, by the way, what does your girl look like? Even your best dream was never that good. Just leave her phone number on your desk. John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to New York Mutual Underwriters Limited, Rockefeller Center, New York City. Attention, Mr. Chester Graham, claims and adjustments. Dear Chet, you probably read some of this in the Los Angeles papers, but they don't have the whole story. Maybe they'll never get it all. I hope not. I found out part of it, stumbled into the rest of it, and I'm trying to forget all of it. The following is an accounting of expenditures during your four-day absence and my investigation of the James Clayton matter. Expense account item one, $14.35 transportation Hartford to New York, where, as per your advice, I walked in your office, sat down, and made myself at home. And where, 15 minutes later, I had a caller. Mr. Dollar, is it? That's right. The girl at the reception desk said Mr. Graham was out of town and that you were taking his place. Yes. Please sit down. Well, thank you, but I don't have time. I'm Miss Stebbins, Dr. James Clayton's nurse. He asked me to see you. I see. He gave me these policy numbers. He said that your company wrote these policies and that he'd like to talk to one of you. Well, certainly, Miss Stebbins. He can come by any time. No, you don't understand. Dr. Clayton can't get away from the office. We're terribly rushed, and I really should be getting back myself. He's there all alone. Well, do you know what it's about, Miss Stebbins? I... No. The doctor's been acting strangely all day. He had me cancel all of his outside calls, and then he sent me here. He said to explain that it was very urgent. I'm... I'm very concerned for him. The tall, pale brunette girl in the crisply starched uniform and cape was certainly concerned about something. She bit her lip, forced out a wan, unprofessional smile, and started to cry. I pretended not to notice all this as we got on the elevator and went down into the street. However, ten minutes later, when we arrived at a suite of offices in the Pelroy building, I had to notice Dr. James Clayton. He met us at the door. Most of his costume was medically correct, white coat and carrying a stethoscope in one hand. But in the other, he brandished a thirty-two Ivor Johnson. The safety was off. Oh, oh, it's you. Yes, doctor. This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance office. Claims investigation? Yeah. Oh, fine. Uh, Jane, this would be a good time for you to get some lunch, don't you think? Well, Doctor, I have all of those lab reports to No, go ahead, Jane. Like a good girl, I want to speak with Mr. Dollar alone. Of course, Doctor, if you say so. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Sit down. Very fine girl, Jane. She's worked for me a long time. Very fine. Do you always meet her at the door with firearms, Doctor? Oh, oh, this. Well, all I can say is this is a ridiculous mess. My life's been threatened by a man who has definite homicidal tendencies. This, I, I, I don't even know how to load it. <laughs> I look foolish, I suppose. A threat on your life, Doctor, comes under the heading of police business. I know that very well. And I would go directly to the police, only... Well, it is a delicate matter. You seem dubious already. No, just curious. Go on, please. <clears throat> well, several months ago, I attended a patient named Florence Harmon... A thorough examination disclosed that her poor physical condition wasn't based on any organic disorder, but rather upon an emotional instability. Now, this, I finally discovered, was brought about by her marriage to an erratic, ruthless, ill-tempered man, Benjamin Harmon. I could only advise that she divorce him immediately. Well, that's somewhat extreme, Doctor. 
Are you always certain of advice like that? Well, in this case, there's no other answer. I approached Mr. Harmon on the subject last night at his home. I explained that Mrs. Harmon's health, her very life is in jeopardy. And more is involved here than keeping intact a union which has nothing but legality as a binding force. I see. But uh, Mr. Harmon doesn't care for semantics, huh? Uh, he attacked me. And if it hadn't been for the assistance of Mrs. Harmon and a servant, he might have choked me to death. When I left, he threatened me. Then you should have called the police. Yes, yes, I thought of that. But look, if, if you approached Harmon in the right manner, Dollar, he might discard his ideas of violence. Well, you're the expert on homicidal tendencies, but the best thing I can see for you is to prefer assault charges and have them locked up. I know all that, but it's for Mrs. Harmon's sake. Please understand, she's been through a shattering ordeal. Look, Mr. Dollar, would you, would you go see him and talk to him? If you think he means it, really then I'll call the police and prefer charges against him. The Harmon residence was in Westchester, a story and a half colonial with all the trimmings. There was a 51 Cadillac in the open garage and a 52 Ford station wagon in front of the house. Yes? This one didn't have a white coat or stethoscope, but he had a gun. What is it? Mr. Harmon? I'm Harmon. What do you want? Mr. Harmon, my name is Dollar. And Dollar, I'm like... huh? Get out of my way! Oh! Here, Mr. Dollar. Drink this. Easy now. Oh. Take it, please. Oh, you had quite a blow. Try a little more. It should make you feel better. What was... Who... Oh, you... You can bring suit against him, against us. You can do anything you want to, Mr. Dollar. He's just ungovernable. He could easily have killed you. You, uh, Mrs. Harmon? Yes. Your husband think I was the ice man? Oh, I don't know what he thought. I, I just heard him yell at you, and when I came to the door, you were lying there, and he'd taken the station wagon and left. Why, last night, he even attacked my personal physician and threatened to kill him. I don't know what's gotten into him. You'd better sit down. Oh, that's getting better. Where'd he go? Heaven only knows. Mad. That's what he is, Mr. Dollar. Mad. He's liable to do anything. I'm... I'm scared. I'm scared stiff. I called Dr. Clayton, who promised to notify the police. It was about a quarter to six when I got back to his office. A broad-shouldered man in a tweed suit was in the reception room. Hi. You Dr. Clayton? No. Hey, uh, don't I know you? I was thinking the same about you. Uh, wait, Dollar? Yeah. Tom Bassman, Central Division. Oh, sure. How are you, Tom? Fine. Hey, you must be the one. What? This Dr. Clayton called downtown about a threat, said his insurance company had advised him to report it. That's right. Well, where is he? Well, he should be here, Tom. What's his nurse say? I rang the buzzer. No one around at all. What's this all about? A man named Benjamin Harmon's threatened the doctor's life. I met him myself. He's carrying a gun and he looked dangerous to me. I just came from his house. He's still there? No. I better phone in and get a pickup out on him. When the doctor shows up, I'll get a complaint. And... Oh, hello. Hello. Why, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Miss Stevens. Is Dr. Clayton here? This is Sergeant Bassman. We want to see him ourselves. You're a police officer? That's right, miss. I heard him talking to you on the phone. Is anything the matter? Just want to see him. Well, goodness, he sent me out to pick up these things. He was here when I left. Oh. What? Perhaps he had an emergency. Well, is there any way we can find out? Well, if he had one, it would be right here on the pad, because I always have to know... Oh. That's funny. What? He's on an emergency call, 1213 Alessandro Street. Can I see that, please? Uh-huh. There's no name on this, Miss Stebbins. Do you recognize the address at all? No, I don't. The doctor just wouldn't take a random emergency call unless it were very unusual. This might be unusual. Dollar, how bad off did you think Harmon was? Mad. Had a gun. Cracked me. Plenty rough. Well, this is in the warehouse district. Think we better go down there? I think so. Wait. What? 1213. 
Well, it'd have to be that vacant lot over there. This one's 1240, and the rest belong to that warehouse. Yeah. Tom. Hmm? That car. M.D. on the license plate? Yeah. It might be Clayton's. Yeah. Uh, it's Clayton's car, all right. He must be around here somewhere looking for 1213. Yeah. Well, let's have a peek. Tom. I see. Uh, he's had it. Is it Clayton? Yeah, that's him. Some emergency this was. Yeah. We'll return to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. On weekends, it seems everybody takes his car out on the highways. Some drivers are less experienced than others. They either speed or poke along with a whole stream of cars behind them. Both types are a menace to safety. Whatever you do, be moderate, be obedient to all traffic laws. Be careful, use your head, and don't take chances. Now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. An hour of questioning in the neighborhood turned up two people who recalled hearing the shots. And one man remembered seeing a man who answered Benjamin Harmon's description loitering in the vicinity of a nearby bar earlier in the evening. Obviously, Dr. Clayton had been lured to his death by the murderer who had telephoned him, pretended to need a physician, waited till the victim appeared, and then shot him down. Expense account item three, $11.65. A good dinner, three martinis, tip, and thinking at Toot Shores. After which, I strolled over to the Pelroy building. Expense account item four, five dollars even. Bribe watchman. Uh, I shouldn't be doing this, you know. Might lose my job over it. I appreciate it. But since you're from the insurance company, I guess you're all right. Just looking around is all. Too bad about the doctor. Nice fellow. Very. What do you think you'll find? A policeman been ahead almost an hour ago, poking around. You know if they found anything? Sure. Well, what? Doctor's emergency kit. Heard him say he didn't take it uh, with him when he went out on that emergency. Yeah, don't be too long. The business about the emergency kit started me thinking. I opened Clayton's file drawer and skimmed through every patient's name from Abbott to Zabrowski. He'd been a thorough man, and from all evidences, operated an efficient medical office. However, he had no medical history in his files on Florence Harmon. There was nothing to indicate that she had ever been a patient of his. On the other hand, there was an entry a year before which showed that he had examined, treated, and discharged Benjamin Harmon as a patient. I think these two developments supplied me with all of the curiosity I needed for a while. Nurse Jane Stebbins' home address was duly noted on Dr. Clayton's phone book. Oakdale House. Surprisingly enough, on Oak Street. Special rates for nurses. Room 210. Oh, Mr. Dollar. How do you feel? Not too good, Mr. Dollar. I just got home a little while ago. They kept me down there pretty long. Do you want to come in? Thanks. I don't want to keep you up. It isn't much of a place, is it? I mean, I haven't straightened it up for days, it seems. I'm sorry. Things like this aren't easy. I know. Don't apologize to me. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Have they caught Mr. Harmon yet? No, not yet. Uh, Miss Stebbins, you worked for Dr. Clayton a long while, didn't you? Five years. 
Then you should be able to tell me who he was going to marry. Marry? Well, I didn't know. I have no idea. He'd already made arrangements for a honeymoon. Honeymoon? Look. Reservations on the Ile de France for next April. I found them in his desk drawer. Confirmed to Dr. and Mrs. James Clayton. Well? What difference does it make? I don't know. Seems strange that you've been with him for such a long time and didn't know about this. I... Or did you? All right. What about Mrs. Harmon? Well... Look, Miss Stebbins. Things are wrong all the way down the line about your doctor's death. About what happened before it. It'll come out sooner or later. I suppose it will. It's awful to say this, Mr. Darling. But Mrs. Harmon was the only one Dr. Clayton saw socially. And she, of course, is married. Of course. And the good doctor advised her to get a divorce. He meet her when Mr. Harmon was a patient of his? Yes, that's right. They became friendly. But Mrs. Harmon was never a patient. No, never. Just her husband. What can you tell me about Mr. Harmon? Well, really, all I know is he came in to see Dr. Clayton a few times. Over a year ago, I guess. Then after... After he saw what was happening between Mrs. Harmon and Dr. Clayton, he stopped coming in. I sent a copy of his medical history to another doctor. But Dr. Clayton had been seeing Mrs. Harmon all this time. It's awful to say this now, Mr. Dollar. Doctor's dead. I'm no moralist. We're all human. It's happened before. Married people have been attracted by others. I'm tired, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Do you have any idea why I was called in today? At first, I didn't. I... Well, of course, it happened. The police told me about Mr. Harmon's threats. But I don't understand what you're trying to do. The police want Mr. Harmon, and what does it all mean? It means the wrong man was killed. Please, Mr. Dollar. I should have tumbled to it right away, but your husband fit the part too well. Now, look here. I've been through quite enough today with the police looking for Ben. I don't have... You and Clayton. I was going to be the star witness when the state tried him for shooting your husband. Whatever I said as a material witness would back up his self-defense plea and get him off on a justifiable homicide. Isn't that it? I tell you, I won't listen And you and the doctor would sail to France and live happily ever after. What's the matter? Wouldn't your husband give you a divorce? You won't listen. Go ahead. If you say it's that way, Mr. Dollar, and you know everything, I know you know everything, then it must be that way. Yeah, only it got fouled up. Your husband did shoot your doctor boyfriend after all. Get out of here. Get out of my house. You can't prove anything. You're right, Mrs. Harmon. I can't prove anything. Not a thing. They catch your husband and they'll put him away for it. But you have something to live with for the rest of your life. Or maybe you didn't really love your doctor after all. Get out! Get out! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! What? Well, that's it, Sergeant. I want to know if people can really get by with this kind of thing in our courts of law. If and when you pick up Benjamin Harmon, will he have any kind of defense? Oh, we'll get him, Dollar. The others, I can't answer. What you just told me is really a thing. I don't see how any lawyer can do much for a guy who threatens another man's life and finally guns him down, do you? Supposing I could prove that Harmon was being set up as a patsy, that the doctor was really supposed to gun him down and plead self-defense. Up to the judge and the jury. When we get Harmon, he'll be arraigned and indicted on first-degree murder charges. Don't worry about that. And if it goes that far, it generally means he'll get the works. After all, we're pretty sure he shot and killed the doctor. Hang up, Dollar. Huh? You still there, Dollar? Hang up or I'll blow your head off. Benjamin Harmon wasn't kidding. He was blazing mad, he had a gun, and I knew he wasn't afraid to use it. I was across the street when you left my place a little while ago. Fixing up another deal, were you? I don't know what you're talking about, Harmon. I followed you here so we could have this talk. And we're going to have it, you and I. You ought to put that gun away and let them take you. They'll shoot you down if they see Nobody's you. Nobody's going to shoot me down, not yet. Now, where's your office? Hartford, Connecticut. I mean here. Where do you practice here? Come on. I don't practice anything here. My office is in Hartford. This apartment belongs to a friend of mine. 
I'm standing in for him here while he's out of town. Where's his office? New York Mutual Liability. I mean his law office. I want to get down there and see how much... Hold on now. I'm not a lawyer. My friend's not a lawyer. We're insurance investigators. Where's the office? I tell you, we... Listen! Clayton called me this morning and said a lawyer named Dollar was on his way over to talk to me about divorcing Florence. If you hadn't started swinging that gun butt around, I'd have told you why I was there. I think I know why Clayton called you and told you that, but I don't... You and he were trying to pull something to take my wife away from me. I know that much. You're wrong, Harmon. I didn't know anything about that. Nobody takes my wife away from me. Now, that's the kind of temper that got you in all the trouble you're in. Look, you can shoot me here and I'll be number two. But they'll get you real easy here. You know I didn't kill Clayton? How do I know you didn't kill him? You threatened him. Half a dozen people heard you threaten him. I have an idea why you did it, and you might have been right, but murder for any reason... Shut up! You're in on it somewhere. You know who did kill him, and you're going to clear me or I'll rip it out of you, Dollar. Or rip it out of you! Why, you crazy... You... All right. Here. Try this. Go on. I'm tired of fooling with you. Now, get on your feet. Well, you got one point in your favor. This gun hasn't been fired. Do you have another one? No. No. Here, take another drink. Now, you have a chance to talk to me right now. I don't think the police will be interested in much you have to say. I wanted to kill Clayton, but I didn't. I didn't. Nobody will believe that. I know I've got a temper and I've tried to control it, but I didn't kill him. I'm not impressed with that. I want facts. Where were you when Clayton was shot? How do I know? I didn't know what time he was shot. Say between five and six today. I was out getting mad. Fried. Where? Who saw you? No. After after we met, I was so sore. I jumped in the car and went out and bought myself a jug. I know it sounds crazy, but I spent most of the time just sitting in the car down to the docks, just drinking and thinking and getting mad. I don't know what it was. I don't know when I walked over to the saloon. Phone Clayton. I told him I was on Alessandro Street and to come on down. I wanted to have a showdown. You mean you wanted him to come down so you could kill him? Maybe I did have that on my mind. I don't know. I waited an hour or so, but he never showed up. When I called back at his office, nobody answered. So I climbed back in my car, and that's where I heard about my being wanted for killing him. It was on the newscast. I didn't do it, Dollar. I swear I didn't. The others I knew about, and I didn't kill them. What others? Florence always had other friends. I guess I don't love her anymore, but I don't know. Maybe I hate her for all of it. When a man doesn't let part of his life walk away from him, I wouldn't give her a divorce. If I had let her get away with it, it would have been too much for me to hold. Even though... Because... Even though you didn't love her and you knew she didn't love you? Yeah. That sounds stupid. Maybe. I loved her once. She loved me the way two people only love at certain times. Hell, no sense yet. I'm not well, Dollar. Clayton gave me a year. Another doctor, 18 months. Finished anemia. The two of them could have waited at least till I was dead, couldn't they? Couldn't they? I found some sleeping pills in your medicine cabinet and I fed him a couple with some hot cocoa. He dropped off to sleep in your bed while I made some phone calls confirming what he just told me. Expense account item five, taxi fare. Four dollars and five cents back to Oak Street, to Oakdale House. Special rates for nurses. I thought you'd be back. I'm glad it's you. I think somehow you're the kind of man who understands things. I'll be a good listener. Go ahead. When I first started as his nurse, I fell in love with him. 
I guess it's an old story. Terribly old and corny. But then he met her. I heard him tell you all those lies today about treating Mrs. Harmon. I was out in the hall. Didn't have any idea exactly what he intended to do until I heard him call Mr. Harmon. Right after you left. He told him you were a lawyer. He knew Harmon was upset enough to attack me. Doctor was very good about knowing what people would do. I was here when Mr. Harmon called him tonight. Doctor took the call and wrote it down on the pad. I saw him put the gun inside his coat, and I knew he was going down there to shoot Mr. Harmon. So I followed him. He was walking around the dark looking for Mr. Harmon with a gun in his hand. I ran up to him and pleaded with him not to be crazy that she wasn't worth it. Then he said he was going to kill me, too. He struggled, and the gun went off. I don't know how many times. Then I came back here and pretended I'd been down at the drugstore. I see. What's your first name? Jane. Jane, Dr. Clayton made all sorts of elaborate plans so he'd have a self-defense plea. But you don't have to go to all that trouble. You can prove self-defense. He had the gun. He was going to use it on you. I beg your pardon? I can help you, Jane. It would go second degree or manslaughter, suspended. You didn't mean to shoot him, but he meant to shoot you. No. You're nice. But I can't get off. What? I guess they haven't found her yet. I killed Mrs. Harmon an hour ago. Expense account item six, same as one, transportation back to Hartford. I didn't spend any other money, Chet. I didn't meet your girl, and I didn't see the musical. I didn't go any place. I just sat in your office and looked at the walls for the next three days. I'm leaving this where you'll see it when you come in tomorrow morning. Settle up and don't call me for a long time. A long, long time, if you call at all. Expense account total, $56.35. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and is written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. John Lund can currently be seen in the Universal International picture just across the street. Featured in tonight's cast were Victor Perrin, Virginia Gregg, Joseph Kearns, John McIntyre, and Jeanette Nolan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Every Sunday, CBS Radio's Bob Trout brings you a timely weekend roundup of world news. As a special eyewitness feature, an overseas CBS Radio News correspondent flies in to give you an up-to-the-minute account of developments on his beat. Don't miss Bob Trout's World News Roundup Sundays on the CBS Radio Network. your listening enjoyment, John Lund as Johnny Dollar. Ned Talbot, Johnny. What are you working on? Why, nothing at the moment. I was thinking of going to New York for a couple of days. Why? Well, I have one here on my desk you might be able to do something with while you're there. Well, tell me about it. Corinthian covers a textile outfit in New York, Wallace Cottons and Company. This week their auditors found a shortage in the books. 
How much of a shortage? Well, it's nearly 5,000. Uh, wait, I got it right here. Uh, $4,185. And I'm supposed to find out who took it? Oh, no, we already know who did that. One of the bookkeepers in their office, uh, Lester James. He's been arrested and admitted everything. I thought maybe you could find out what he did with all that money. Well, I'm going to New York anyway. I'll see what I can do. Expense accounts submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lester James matter. Expense account item one, $32.56. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. After receiving from Ned Talbot the necessary information concerning the indemnity claim of Wallace Cottons and Company Incorporated. I arrived in New York at 1.30 in the afternoon and checked in at the new Weston. Central Division told me that Lester James was being held in the 17th Precinct Jail. I went right over. Well, here you are, darling. Now what? Take it easy, James. This is Johnny Dollar. He wants to talk to you. Hello, James. Hi. Uh, I'll see you later, Dollar, huh? Yeah, thanks, Sergeant. You'll give me a yell when you finish, huh? Right. Well, what are you? Lawyer or something? Nope. I don't want a lawyer. Said somebody be around to talk to me again, but I don't want to see anybody. Why not? I just don't want to see anybody, that's all. Well, you'll have to be represented by counsel when you go into court. All right, let somebody represent me. Just a technicality, anyhow. I know what'll happen in court. I've got my confession. Who are you, anyway? I'm an insurance investigator. Well, what are you doing here? It's a swell day outside. I'm trying to find out what you did with that 4185 bucks that you took from Wallace Cottons. Oh, that? Yeah, that. How about it, James? Isn't it enough that I'm in jail? It's enough for the police, but not for my insurance company. I don't have anything to say to you. Now, look, don't be foolish. A whole or a partial recovery will have a lot to do with what happens to you in court. I don't want to be foolish. It's just that I spent it all, every dime of it. No way to pay it back. Spend it on what? Doesn't make any difference. Might make a lot of difference. I don't have anything to tell you. You've never been in trouble before, have you? No, no. They think of things like that when a man comes up for sentencing. Now, this is your first offense. I know, I know. You trying to shield somebody, James? Why don't you go away? You've been trying the market? Did you gamble with it? No, no, just leave me alone. I won't tell you anything, Mr. Dollar. If you bought something with it or... Gave it to somebody. If it can be recovered in some No, part. no, I tell you. Go away, leave me alone. I'd like to, but you're a thief, James. And you're going to get what's coming to you. I can't leave you alone. Listen. Now, you listen to me. If I don't get the information I want from you, I'll get it elsewhere. I'm going to be real honest with you. Corinthian Liability wrote a blanket policy on Walls, Cottons, and Company promising to pay them in full for every loss caused by fire or theft on their premises. Now, no insurance company takes the word of some guy sitting in a jail cell where there's cash to be recovered. It's the same as stolen property. If you gave it to someone or spent it when it wasn't yours, it's still redeemable. Now, what do you have to say? Look, Mr. Dollar, this won't do you any good. I'm no low forehead job who got caught crawling in a drugstore window. I'm a college graduate. I've been in the business world for ten years or better. I know what I want to tell you and what I want to keep to myself. And I don't want to talk about this, do you understand? And there's no way or no person who can make me talk about it. I took the money, I admitted that. I did a bad job of it, I was caught, I've confessed, and you've got me. And that's the whole story. Okay. Have it your way, Lester. Go away. Just go away, please. Mr. James was a tall, dark-complexioned man in his early 30s. His hair was black, straight, and closely cropped. His features regular. Not good, not bad. The kind of man you see every day on the street. Somehow, the kind of man I hadn't expected to meet. 
Expense account item two, dollar thirty-five, cab fare. I went over to the apartment on 59th Street where Lester James had lived. According to the penciled note above the first door to the right of the entrance, Mrs. Anastasia Denovich was the manager. Yes, what is, please? Uh, you're uh, Mrs. Denovich? Yes, what do you want, mister? I understand that uh, Mr. Lester James lived here. Is that right? Oh, yes. Bad. Bad. I hear he sells money, and that's bad. Yeah. Uh, I'm from the insurance company, Mrs. Denovich. We're trying to recover some of that money if we can. Wonder if you could help me. I fixed dinner now for my son. He's come home from work. what I do? Well, I want to know about Lester James. What is? The works, Mrs. Denovich. Did he drink? Gamble? Did he stay in nights or go out? Did he pay his rent? You're a policeman? Insurance investigator. Oh, please. Sometime else. Look, it's important now. I talked to Lester on phone. He said I don't have to answer any question. Well, you don't have to, but I'd appreciate it if you would. My son home soon. Uh, oh. All right, mister. I know these things. You ask about men who live here. Well, look, how about his friends? Who visited them? I no. I cannot say no visitor. Oh, is he a good tenant? No trouble, like Mr. O'Sullivan on third floor, always drunk. Fine. Did you ever meet his girl? Girl? Well, sure, his girl. He oh. has a girlfriend. No, I, I never see girlfriend. Uh, how long have you known him? Five, six years, maybe, ever since he moved in here, this place. Do you know how he spent his time? Work. He wore a cart. No, I mean besides working at the textile company. How else? I, no. He poor fella, that one. How's that? He still money through, but he poor fella, just same. For him, I feel. Yeah. Lester, he quiet and he think. I know he live up in that little room quiet. Think he does all the time, he think. Oh, my son's dinner. Please, you go now. Just a minute. I'd like to see his apartment if I can. Mm. No matter. You bring key back, please. Mm. Thank you, Mrs. Denovich. The apartment Lester James had lived in was as dismal as the neighborhood. A tiny closet kitchen, a bed that came out of the wall, and a pair of grimy windows that looked across the court into another pair of equally grimy windows. The furniture was early 30s and threadbare. Among his personal effects, I found nothing of value. The apartment yielded no more information than James had. Expense account item three, $1.95, dinner. I had it in a neighborhood restaurant called the 59er, a place where, I learned, Lester James had frequently eaten. The restaurant manager remembered him and liked him. A woman who ran a bakery shop across the street told me how he'd come back from the war in 1946 and had worn his uniform for a month until he got a job and could buy some civilian clothes. All in all, I was getting a composite picture of Lester James that... Didn't look quite right. Whatever he was to the people who knew him casually, he wasn't a man who ever had any money to spend. Well, hiya. Hi. No good, huh? Uh-uh. Well, that's where it goes. We had some action here today, no? Oh? Sit down. <laughs> James' preliminary hearing was this afternoon. A man from the district attorney's office took about 15 minutes to lay out the evidence against James. Uh-huh. And the public defender took about three minutes trying to get James to answer one question. What did he do with the money? Did I miss anything? No, yeah, not a thing. Wouldn't open up at all. Just said that he'd spent it. Well, public defender about threw up his hands. I'm about ready to throw up mine. When is the trial set for? Uh, sometime next week. I'd like to talk to him again. He been moved yet? Didn't go to the sheriff's office. Somebody bail him? He bailed himself. Two hundred dollars he had in war bonds. Has he left yet? No. Go get out till about six. That's when the ship changes. Are you still want to see him? Yeah, I'll wait. An hour later, when Lester James emerged from the doorway and turned right, I followed him about a half a block behind. When he caught a cab and headed uptown, I caught one. Stayed right with him. When he got out at the Empress Theater and walked around to the stage door, I was standing at the alley entrance. Ten minutes later, he came out and hailed a cab. Once more, I followed. 
This time he went back to his apartment on 59th Street. I waited 15 minutes before I went in. James? James? James, it's me. Johnny Dollar. I got a couple of whiffs of it standing there in front of the door. (coughs) The room was acrid, stinging with gas fumes. And Lester James was stretched out on the floor of his six-foot kitchen. (coughs) When I picked him up and carried him out, I didn't know whether he was alive or dead. John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Thirty seconds after I found Lester James, I'd called a police ambulance. In a matter of minutes, an intern was working over him with a pull motor. There was no telling how much gas he breathed in or for how long a time the jet had been open. Hand me that. Thanks. Swab. Okay. You alive? Maybe. Hard to say on these. That shot should cause some reaction. Oh? This your place? No, it's his. You know him? His name is Lester James. I met him earlier today. Can you give me that? Uh, We might be getting something here. About this thing? Yeah. He'll be sick if... Oh. What? He's catching on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's have a little more. Getting some pulse. Respiration, too. What are you making? It depends. If he had a heart condition, it'll be tough. Nothing more we can do here. Let's move him. Now, where will he be? 48th Street Emergency. Why? Well, I'd like to talk to him when he comes around. Better phone in first. Oh, sure. Ah, that's the third one tonight. What is it, the weather? Not for him. You know why? He's out on bail. Goes to trial on an embezzling charge pretty soon. Oh. Well, I'll be sure and call in. Yeah, right. Investigating officers questioned me regarding the circumstances of Lester James' attempted suicide. I told them what had happened and gave them my business address for reference. After that, I went back to my hotel and had dinner. Then I went over to the Empress Theater. A musical show was playing there. And it had just finished. I didn't quite get that, mister. A dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar, what can I do for you, sir? Between 6.30 and 7 o'clock tonight... Man came here to the stage entrance and talked to you. A lot of people talk to me here. What man? His name was Lester James. Uh, no, I don't remember no Lester James. Maybe he didn't give you his name. Uh, you come here to see somebody? Is that, that it? He might have. I don't know. He's about 5'11". Weighs 175 or 80. Didn't have any hat on. Raincoat. Dark man. You remember him? Oh, oh, yes, of course. Him, yes. You remember him? Oh, sure, yeah. He's been around a lot of times, Lester (laughs) Joe. I didn't even recognize that name first. Would you mind telling me what he was doing here? Well, he comes here to see Margie Cook. That his girlfriend? Oh, no, I don't think so. She never sees him when he asks. Who's Margie Cook? Uh, She sings here. You ever seen them together? Well, I don't know. I've never seen them together. Is she still here? Yeah, what's that? I'd like to talk to her. Is she still here? Oh, no, no, Margie left. She finishes in the second act. Could you tell me where she lives? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I can't tell you that. Well, where can I phone her? Well, I just can't tell you that either. Look, would you do me a favor? Well, if I can, what is it? Would you telephone her and tell her my business and ask her if she'd see me? Oh, I suppose I can do that all right, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Take a chair right there. I'll just see what I can do for you. Expense account item four, two dollars and sixty-five cents. More cab fare. This time to the apartment of Margie Cook, singer. She met me at the door with cold cream on her face, wrapped in a chenille dressing gown. Uh, Miss Cook? You must be Mr. Dollar. Come in, please. Thank you. 
I didn't quite understand Frank on the telephone. Frank? Oh, the, the doorman at the theater. Yeah. Yes. I didn't quite know what to make of it. Goodness, are you really an insurance detective? Yeah, investigator. Can I fix you a drink? No, no, thanks. You mentioned something about a man named Lester James, Mr. Dollar? Yes. You know him? Well, n- no, I don't. There's a sort of a reservation in the way you say that, Miss Cook. You know his name? Yes, I know the name. What's this all about? Oh, just a routine investigation. Are you sure? Oh, yes. I'm curious. How did you get my name? How am I connected with Lester James? Well, that's what I want you to tell me. Oh, first, about my name. Well, James was at the theater tonight asking for you. I found that out from the doorman. And then I asked to speak to you. Oh, I understand James has been around there quite a bit. I... I really don't know how to tell you this. I've only seen the man once in my life. Is that so? Honestly. He's... Well, he's really quite impossible. I... Oh, dear. This is very embarrassing to be asked about a thing like this by a complete stranger. Well, maybe I can save you that embarrassment if you'll answer one question. All right. He ever give you any presents? Yes. What? Well, that cigarette case there. This one? Mm-hmm. And the lighter to go with it. Uh-huh. Tiffany's. Pretty, aren't they? And expensive. What else? Well, let me think. Oh, that wasn't from him. Oh, that was. What? The lamp over there. Uh-huh. And a fur piece. Uh, could I see that? I'm afraid I gave it away. Oh, I see. I gave it to my kid's sister who was visiting me a couple of months ago. What kind of fur piece was it? Ermine. Ermine. I think that's about it. Except for orchids that used to come every night. A dozen orchids every night. He sent them to you? Mm-hmm. For about three months. You only saw him once and he gave you all these gifts. Oh, dear. I, I know how that must sound. Look... It started about six months ago, I guess. I got a card in my dressing room one night asking me to dinner. It was signed Lester James. Well, I'd never heard of anyone named Lester James, and I tore it up. But every night after that, I kept getting the card, and pretty soon flowers, and then the lighter and the cigarette case came. That's when I saw him. I didn't even dine with him, Mr. Dollar. We had one drink, and I told him I had a headache. I see. Gifts still kept coming, flowers, invitations, and I ignored them. I tried to send the things back, but I didn't know where to send them, so I gave away some, and... Some I've kept, and that's it. Why didn't you see him after that one night? Oh, he was... He was so different than what I'd imagined. I mean, I've had my share of stage door Johnnies, but this man was... Well, he couldn't say a word without stumbling. He had no poise, no sophistication, nothing. All he had was money. I see. Well, he didn't have money either, Miss Cook. What? He worked for $72 a week as a bookkeeper. But all the gifts, the things he gave me, sent me, he had to have money. He's been stealing it to buy those things for you. For heaven's sake. Why, for heaven's sake. And that's why you're here. No wonder. He tried to commit suicide a couple of hours ago. Suicide? No. Oh, no. I'm sorry I had to come to you to get this information. He wouldn't tell anybody what he'd done with the money. Will he go to prison? I'm afraid so. Oh, but we had nothing. He was just a name to me. Well, apparently, you were something more to him. I spent the next two days tracking down the places from which the gifts had been purchased and ascertaining their retail values. Total... $2,780. $2,780. I also learned from Margie Cook that Lester James had made appointments to meet her at various times at different expensive restaurants around town. She had never once kept any of these appointments. A check with the Waldorf, 21, the Stork, and several other places revealed that James had always made elaborate arrangements to entertain her. His restaurant bills, which were paid, came to $835. The florist bill... $680. Total, $4,295. Hello? Hi. Remember me? Sure. Insurance man. What now? 
How do you feel? Okay. You saved me, didn't you? I suppose so. Why? Well, for the same reason you'd save a man who was dying, James. <laughs> you know what I've been doing? What? Answering the questions that you wouldn't answer. I met Margie Cook. What? My job. I had to. Listen, you had no right to go to her. You had no right. Look, it's the company's money you were spending on her. I had every right. Unpleasant as it may be. And she... She knows all about me? Yep. We took back all the things you gave her. You, you dirty scum. Look, look. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at yourself. I didn't steal the money. You did. Why didn't you leave it alone? What difference does the money make to you? Nothing to me. What do you want now? Well, I didn't get all of it traced down. There's still $410 I'm worried about. I, uh... Yeah. Here. I've got this much. Yeah. Can you remember what you did with the rest of it? Pretty thorough, aren't you? I try to be. Well? Oh, come on, Lester. We've got most of it. What difference does it make now? You and your money... That's all it is to you. Dollars and cents. Dollars and cents that were stolen. Remember that. What did you do? See her on the stage one night? No. She was in the office. Office? Your office? Yes. Some fashion convention about six months ago. She was modeling some of our fabrics for them. The publicity people brought her over. I never saw anyone like that before. You figured a little money would attract her to you, huh? I heard that's the best way to do it. Well, it's one way, but it's not the best way, Lester. Right. I pictured myself knocking on her door one night and saying, I'm a bookkeeper and I live on 59th Street. Why don't you come over and have a bottle of beer with me? You know, she might have come. What makes you think so? I met her. Up until the time I talked with Lester James in the emergency hospital, I had my doubts about love at first sight. But after I talked to him, I was convinced that it could and did happen to him. I was sorry that he didn't know quite how to handle it. I was also wondering if I'd been in his shoes, would I have done the same thing? Johnny Dollar. Oh, I was afraid you might have left town. Well, I'm just packing up. Who's this? Margie Cook. Remember me? Oh, yeah, Sure been able to sleep thinking about, well, thinking about that man. Pastor James? Yes. What'll happen to him? He'll go to prison. Even with all the money returned? Only half of that stuff's redeemable. Take at least, oh, 2,500 more. And then what? Well, then it would be up to the court. I want to pay it. What? I want to make it up, the whole thing. Look, Miss Cook, uh, I know your motives are the best, but, uh, you're not responsible in any way for this man's actions. He just Mr. went... Mr. Dollar, he's the first man I've ever known who actually went out on a limb for the girl he loves. I'm the girl and he's the man. Are you serious? Poor Dumbbell. He doesn't belong in any prison. He ought to get married to some nice girl. I want to help him. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah. What's the matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. Expense account item five, twenty-eight dollars, hotel. Item six, thirty-seven dollars, meals. Item seven, fifteen dollars, fifteen cents, miscellaneous. Item eight, same as one, transportation back home. Total, one hundred and fifty-one dollars and twenty-two cents. Remarks, James comes to trial next week in view of Margie Cook's paying back the money he stole. James just might get a suspended sentence, but... As always, that's up to the court. Here's truly Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Henry Grant, Johnny. You read your morning paper yet? I'm on page four in my second donut. Well, turn back to page one. There's a picture there of Mrs. Frank Loring. Oh, I read it. Enoch Arden divorce decree. 
Husband missing seven years, New York court declared him legally dead. So? So we had him insured for a quarter of a million. And this court decision means you'll have to pay off? Within ten days. Something make you think Loring isn't as dead as he ought to be? It's a possibility. I had a phone call a little while ago from a woman up in Boston. She saw the item, too. Well, what's her connection? She's a nurse. Ten years ago, when we issued the Loring policy, she was working for the physician who examined him. Now, her story may not mean anything, but... Well, I asked her to take the first plane she could get and come in for a talk. She uh, should be here by uh, 11 o'clock. I'll grab a cab and come right over. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment... Plus refreshment. Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Hemispheric Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Enoch Arden matter. Expense account item one, 50 cents, cab fare to your home office, where Henry Grant provided me with a complete file of previous investigations and police reports covering the disappearance of Frank Loring. I was about halfway through them when Grant came in with an attractive woman in her early 30s. Johnny, this is Miss Ruth Boulogne, the young lady I told you about. How you do? Miss Boulogne, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar's an investigator, Miss Boyne. Uh, I want you to tell him exactly what you told me on the phone this morning and, well, anything else you may have thought of on the way down here. Well, I don't really know whether I have anything to tell. You worked for the doctor who examined Loring when his policy was issued? Yes, Dr. Felton. That was in New York. I'd just gotten out of training. It was my first job. I was only there three months, then I went into the Army during the war. Mm-hmm. And since the war, I've worked in Boston, the Haywood Clinic. I... Uh, well, I, I feel sort of foolish telling you all this. I'm probably wrong. But she thinks she saw Loring in Boston, Johnny. When? Well, about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago yesterday. Where? At the clinic. Look, really, I'm not sure about... You're not this. hurting anybody, Miss Boulogne. Suppose you just tell us and we'll take it from there. Well, as I said, it, it was two weeks ago. A man came to the clinic. He wanted to be vaccinated. Did he give his name? Yes, but it wasn't Frank Loring. He gave the name of Michael Walsh. I thought he looked familiar, but I couldn't place him. What was the reason for the vaccination? He needed an international certificate of vaccination. It's required by law for anybody going abroad. Oh, he was leaving the country. Well, I guess so. He wanted the certificate. I administered the vaccine. He came back five days later, and the doctor entered the result on his card and signed it. That's all I know. What made you connect this Michael Walsh with Frank Loring? I really don't know. I didn't until this morning. I remember thinking I'd seen him before, and then when I saw that story this morning about Mrs. Loring, the name just came into my mind. You'd only seen Loring once, ten years ago? Yes, but as I said, it was my first job, and I I was impressed at the time having him for a patient. Why impressed? Well, I knew he was an actor. I'd seen a couple of shows he was in, read his name in columns, things like that. Did this Michael Walsh look like Frank Loring, as you remembered him? No, he didn't. I I can't explain it. Well, it seemed worth a try, anyhow, John. Wait a minute, Grant. Let's not chuck it out so easily. I've been reading this file on Loring. Played a lot of character roles. Expert on dialects and makeup. A man like that could change his appearance very easily. Something about him, the way he moved, the tone of his voice. 
Something registered with this girl. He'd have recognized her, too, when he went to the clinic. She was impressed with him. She had a reason to remember. He didn't. I, I feel a little foolish. And I feel a little curious. How about you, Grant? I've been curious all morning. So curious, I checked the steamship and airline. And? And a man named Michael Walsh sailed on the SS Castillo six days ago. She runs between Boston and Santiago, Chile. You know when she reaches the Panama Canal? Yeah, the day after tomorrow. That's plenty of time for you to get down there by air. Yeah, with enough to spare for a stopover in New York and a chat with Mrs. Loring. Expense account item two, $11.30. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford, Connecticut and the Greenwich Village section of New York, where Mrs. Frank Loring was living in a bohemian fashion. It was evening and the party was in full swing when I arrived. The apartment door was wide open, so I just walked in. Somebody shoved a glass into my hand like they used to do it at the local movie houses on dish nights. Wow. You must be Linda's boyfriend. Oh, must I? I knew it the minute I saw you. She always goes for the same type. Musician, aren't you? They always are. What do you play? Ring Olivio and double on Parcheesi. <laughs> oh, a funny one, eh? Well, Linda said when you got here to tell you the benefit is going to run late, so make yourself comfy and wait. She won't be here until 12. I'm Freddy. You must be a poet. How did you know? I'm psychic. Now, what's the party for? Oh, Marsha's celebrating. She's going to get a quarter of a million dollars. Just because her husband, Frank, disappeared. She ought to be happy enough just to be rid of him. Don't be so bitter, lad. It'll throw your rhymes out of meter. I helped her get over him. I helped her. Anytime she wanted anything, all she had to do was call little Freddy. Now she's getting all that money and she'll just run out. Oh, she wouldn't do that to you, would she? Oh, no. That's how much you know about women. <laughs> she's going to Chile, South America. Oh, now that's an interesting bit of information, Freddy. She thinks I don't know about it. The airline called to confirm a reservation while she was out shopping this afternoon. Uh, which one of those lovely ladies uh, is Marsha Loring? Those? Hmm. She doesn't look like any of them. Marsha's out in the kitchen fixing sandwiches. She needn't think she'll get any help from me. Oh, maybe I can lend a hand. Listen, mister, you've got a girl coming. Oh, oh, sure, Linda. Well, uh, she told me to give Marsha a message. Uh, besides, you don't want to talk to me. Interferes with your brooding. I'll see you later, Frank. <laughs> well, hello, come in. I'm making sandwiches for the starving multitude. I know. I came in to help. How are you on opening bottles? Champagne. But for those peasants, beer. It's it's right there. The opener's on the hook. Oh, we're in business. What are you, a party crasher, or did you come with one of the girls? A crasher. Well, the breed is improving. We uh, both know some of the same people, though. Like who? Who's been hiding you from me? Fellow up in Boston. I don't know anyone in Boston. Not even Michael Walsh? Get out of here. Now, listen, Mrs. Loring. I said get I... out. You weren't invited here. You don't belong here, so... What is it, Marshal? What happened? What did he do? Keep your rompers on, Shakespeare. I told you not to bother her. You... You music... Look out, Freddy! Oh, no! I came out of it lying on the cold stone of a basement areaway. And then I went in search of a diner. Telegraph office. Expense account item three. Eighty cents for breakfast and aspirin. Item four, a dollar twenty for a telegram advising that payment of the Loring claim be delayed until my investigation was completed. Item five, seven dollars and sixty cents. Cab fare to the international airport. And item six, four hundred and fifteen dollars. Plane fare and incidentals to the city of Colon. Panama Canal Zone. As usual, it was raining in Colon. The SS Castillo had reached port slightly ahead of schedule. I was waiting to go through the locks when I made my way aboard. It was almost midnight. I located the name of Michael Walsh on the passenger list posted in the lounge and then made my way to the inside cabins on B deck. I knocked on the door of cabin B64. There was no answer. May I help you, senor? 
You the cabin steward? See. Si. I'm looking for the passenger who occupies this cabin. Oh, Senor Walsh is not here. He's gone ashore. And this downpour? See. Si. Look. Here's five bucks. All you have to do for it is to bring me the biggest towel you can find and open this cabin so I can wait inside. Gosh, yes, senor. But if you are waiting for senor Walsh, he will not be back. Why not? He's booked through to Santiago. When he went ashore an hour ago, he took his baggage with him. I helped him with it. You know where he went? No, senor. He was most anxious to get ashore as soon as our lines were fast. I see him. Ship's wireless take any kind of cablegram for him in the past 24 hours? See, si, see, si, I delivered one to him in the middle of last night. He was most urgent, I think. He seemed most concerned. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Thanks. I knew that Frank Loring, alias Michael Walsh, wasn't going to be easy to find. Away from the ship, he was likely to have a third name. And since he was an expert with dialects... There was every chance he'd adopt a different nationality. I thought about it as I made my way through the narrow, rain-swept streets. I seemed to be the only man without shelter in all of Panama. But I wasn't. Do you have a match, senor? Huh? Oh, I could hardly see you. Yeah, yeah, I got a match. I doubt it will light in this rain. Uh Uh-huh. You don't appreciate the rain, senor? In the rain, I always get what I want. The turistas, they never refuse Jose. Hey, that isn't a cigarette in your hand. No, senor. It is a gun. You join me in the doorway, no? Well, I'd rather die than say no. Now, if the senor has some little thing he wishes to give Jose for a gift, Jose will be most grateful. I don't have much cash, but this wristwatch is worth a couple of hundred. Oh, see. Oh, that's a very nice one. I will like that. He bent his head slightly to look at the watch, and his gun hand dipped automatically. I brought my hands up to undo the watch strap, stepped quickly to the side, and let Jose have a left in the solar plexus. Now, now, drop it. Very well, senor. If you insist... That's better. You are... You are going to turn me over to the police, senor? Well, that depends. Oh, senor. The jail here is very bad. Jose does not like it. I tell you what. You help me and I'll help you. What kind of help does the senor need? Suppose the police or somebody were after me. Suppose I had to get out of here without using my passport. How would I do it? From Colón? There is no way, senor. Too many Americano officers. There must be some way out. Thirty miles down the coast is Puerto Bello, senor. It was once the hiding place for pirates. In Puerto Bello is a cafe called the Geisha Girl. The Geisha Girl? Si. And the proprietor is senor Kamamoto in Japanese. (laughs) He is very good at making people disappear, senor. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account item seven. Twenty dollars. Flat rate. 
to the native taxi that slithered its way down the miserable, muddy road to Porto Bello, Caribbean stronghold of the old-time pirates. It was a port of intrigue, an international black hole, a Western Hemisphere counterpart of Shanghai, or Calcutta, or Suez. And at the bottom of the hole was the Geisha Girl Cafe. <laughs> Uh, you look lonesome, mate. Maybe it's because I want to be. I don't know you, and you don't know me. Let's keep it that way. Now, that ain't no way to be. Especially here in Portobello, where we're all friendly, like. Uh, you looking for Kamamoto? What are you, a cop? Well, I've been a lot of things, Governor. Never a cop. What's the matter? Start on a little trip and forget your passport? Let's say I lost it. What are you doing? Running a private embassy? Yeah, I'm sort of a missioner for people in trouble. You look like in trouble. I'll talk to Kamamoto about that. Where is he? Try the storeroom back there. Uh, it ought to be worth the price of a drink, eh? Thanks. Here, drown yourself. It's oh, nice of you, Governor. Kamamoto? Ow. Hey. Anybody in here? Oh, matches. For those uh, of honor uh, that we won't need a match. Oh. Oh, oh well then, Suki. Uh, you may read now. Uh, I will tie him up. I came to in a room filled with packing cases and lit by a feeble candle. Two men were seated on a couple of small barrels. One of them was the Cockney who had spoken to me in the bar. The other was a Japanese. Are you feeling uh, better, Mr. Dollar? How... How did you know my name? Oh, from your uh, American uh, driver's license? Is that all he had on him? Oh, well, uh, there was some money which I uh, would find most useful... Well, you were carrying the exact amount required to pay for your uh, passage, Mr. Dell. Over a thousand dollars? That's pretty high fare. I, uh, I am a charitable man. My rates are based upon uh, what my passengers can afford to pay. An unscheduled uh, ship line is expensive to operate. Uh, uh, so you will be taken aboard the uh, Kiramatsu uh, shortly. You will sail at uh, 4 a.m. For where? You will be put ashore somewhere in uh, South America. Venezuela, possibly, or Brazil. I'm not your only passenger. Oh, no. No, you are not. Uh... Well, uh, how about uh, untying me, as long as we're friends? Well, uh, are you uh, will be untied when you reach your uh, destination? Oh, now, wait a minute. I can see the point here where somebody might give you away, but why aboard ship? Well, uh, our fugitives from the law are uh, a risky cargo, Mr. Dollar. The uh, South American nations are rather uh, thorough about their coastal patrol. So, uh, if you are tied up, we can make certain you are, you are not caught. What do you mean, Kamamoto? Well, simply that you're, you're hot cargo, Mr. Dollar. And the only way to carry hot cargo is to be certain that you can uh, uh, dispose of it in an uh, emergency. Uh, <laughs> If we are challenged by a patrol vessel, uh, you'll be uh, weighted down and uh, thrown overboard. It was dark when they carried me aboard and left me still trussed in the deck cabin. Then the Kira Matsu pitched and rolled her way into the open sea. I knew that Loring was on board someplace, and I knew something else. Kamamoto had lied to the Cockney about what he'd found when he searched me. He had more than a driver's license. He had my insurance company credentials and my passport. Then the door opened and I got something else to think about. Buenos dias, Senor Dollar. Jose, how did you get here? <laughs> After you left me, I ran into another Americano with no race watch but much money. <laughs> he was kind to me. He gave me money to leave the country when I told him about the bad jails. 
Well, how come Kamamoto is letting you run loose? Why, you are the only one who is tied up, senor. I do not think they intend for you to finish the trip. Hmm. Uh, how many other passengers are there? Besides us, three. A man and a woman came just before we sailed. That's two. Who's the other one? A man, a man with a white suit and a hat. A Cockney accent? What is that? He sounded like an Englishman? Oh, yes. He is English. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. How many in the crew? Kamamoto and five seamen. It is a very small boat. Yeah, yeah, I can feel that. Look, Jose, I gave you a break with the police. How about giving me one? I'm a businessman, senor. No sentiment. A thousand dollars. Guaranteed by an American insurance company. If you cut these ropes and lend me your gun. Cash, senor. No credit. Too much book. I haven't got any cash. Kamamoto took it all. Too bad. Maybe next time. There isn't going to be any next time for me. Ever buy a sweepstake ticket? See? Si. Well, then take a chance on me. Come on. How about it? All right. But when is the time for the drawing? To see if my ticket wins. As soon as you get these ropes off. But let's do it now. This tub may get to my stop any minute. Jose cut the ropes and gave me his gun. There was an oil slicker hanging behind the cabin door, and I slipped it on for cover. The crew on deck was too busy to be counting noses in the storm. I edged my way forward to the main cabin, grasped the door handle, and crashed in. Dollar! Now, let's not get jumpy, anybody. I'm wet and I'm mad, and I've been pushed about as far as I go. Well, good for you, Governor. Glad to see you up in the box. You can drop the accent, Loring. And stop flexing your fingernails, Freddy. Now, what's the matter, Marcia? You get too nervous to stay home and fix sandwiches? I didn't have to stay. My lawyers can collect for me. Now, what? Loring looks pretty alive to me, even with that cockney accent. I'm more alive than you're going to be. Don't be a fool, Loring. You're more of a clay pigeon than I am. You've been practicing for the part for seven years. What are you talking about? You think you were going to get to spend any of that insurance money? You think I'm not? Ask Freddy. How about it, Freddy? I don't know anything. I just came with Marsha because she asked me to. Freddy's a nice boy, Loring. He writes poetry. And he'll do anything Marsha asks him to. Won't you, Freddy? What are you trying to do? Wait a minute. I want to hear this. Yeah, you ought to. Before your hearing stops altogether. Maybe you've been dead for seven years, but your widow hasn't been putting flowers on your tombstone. You stop talking about Marsha. You see, Loring, Freddy gets mad when I talk about Marsha. Freddy loves Marsha, don't you, Freddy? Yes. You ever take a look at his eyes, Loring? If Marsha said the word, he'd put a knife in you in a minute. Think it over, mister. Michael Walsh turns up dead in South America, and Mrs. Frank Loring and friend Freddy go back to Greenwich Village with a quarter of a million bucks. Only this time, they'd have nothing to worry about. Don't listen to him, Frank. Why not, Angel? He sounds like a pretty smart guy. We've waited seven years for this. Do you think I'd have anything to do with this little idiot? I've used him, that's all. Marsha. You see, Freddy? she get rid of you, too, after a while. Ma- There'll always be somebody else coming along to open the beer bottles. I was kind of wondering how Freddy got in on this little trip. I was wondering why we kept something between ourselves for seven years, and then you spill it to him. I was frightened, Frank. I knew Dollar was after you. That's why I wired you. I couldn't come down here alone until I was sure we'd be together. We'll be together, and we'll stay together until the money comes. Then maybe I'll have some ideas of my own. Give up, Loring. You're never going to get that money. Yes, I am, Dollar. Kamamoto's standing right behind you, the curtain between this cabin and the next one. Oh, don't uh, turn, Mr. Dollar. Now, let me have that gun, Dollar. All right, Kamamoto. Now, let's get rid of him. Oh, are you close, Mr. Dollar? Why, Kamamoto? Why don't we bargain a little first? I'm afraid you are not in a uh, bargaining position. How much is he going to give you for dropping me? You'll get five grand, Dollar. Oh, you're dealing with a real cheapskate, Kamamoto. I'm worth more than that. I could shut you up right here. Please, you... Mr. Loring. Uh, let the gentleman speak. And do not use that gun unless I see so. This is my ship. You took my credentials before, Kamamoto. You know who I am. Yes. How much did Loring tell you he was going to collect? Be stalling, Kamamoto. Get rid of it. I warned you, Mr. Loring. I will decide who leaves the ship, and when, and how. Suppose you tell me the amount of the policy, Mr. Nora. A quarter of a million dollars. He's lying. It's only 25000 Is it, Loring? i tell you what I'll do then, Kamamoto. Put us both ashore back in the canal zone, where I can get him into the hands of American authorities, 
And my company will pay you $25,000. And I'll make it $50,000, Kamamoto. $50,000. I bid sixty. Do I hear seventy? Come on, Loring. Bid. I can go the whole quarter million. Won't cost my company any more either way. I'll kill you, Dollar. Uh, no. <laughs> Loring and Kamamoto fired at the same time. Both of them were hit, but only Kamamoto went down. Loring turned to Marcia. You wanted him. You can go together. <laughs> All right, Dollar. That ends everything. Now I'm around to you for sure. Oh, I wouldn't count on it, Loring. This time I've got a friend in the doorway. What he says is true, senor. Senor Kamamoto was no longer using his gun, so I took it. Besides, you have only one bullet left. I have five. You kill Mr. Dollar, and I will have to kill you. You're cooked, Loring. Your wife's dead. You couldn't even get the money if you could get away. All right. Here. You can have it. Come on, hit me in the side. It hurts. Maybe I can patch it up a little. I'd better just rip your shirt. I loved her. She always wanted things more than an actor could give her. Whose idea was it? Hers. I hid out like a dog. She sneaked up to Boston to see me. Maybe once every six months after the first year. The rest of the time I was without her. I guess she wasn't lonely. Yeah. Some women never are. And that about finished it. Expense account, item eight, sixty dollars, miscellaneous expenses. Expense account item nine, one thousand dollars as promised to Jose. Item ten, four hundred twenty-one dollars and eighty cents. Plane fare and incidental expenses from Colon, Panama Canal Zone, back to Hartford. Total expenses eighteen hundred and seventy-nine dollars and eighty cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment... Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Joel Murcott with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were Stacey Harris, Jeanette Nolan, Sidney Miller, Mary Jane Croft, Elliot Reed, John McIntyre, and Howard McNear. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... 
Johnny Dollar. Dupree, Johnny, down at International. Oh, hello, Paul. Nice to hear your voice again. How are things? Oh, about the same. Hey, Johnny, would you like to come over to my office and meet a girl? She pretty? Very. Interesting? Very. As a matter of fact, she just told me the most interesting thing I've ever heard. Oh, yeah? What's that? She just told me that she was dead. I better come over. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, Delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the International Insurance Corporation, International Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention Claims Division. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Madison matter. Expense account item one, dollar and thirty cents. Cab fare downtown to the International Building. I went up to the tenth floor in Paul Dupre's office to find him sitting across the desk from a tall, dark-haired woman in her early thirties. She was pretty, she was quiet, she was well-dressed. Oh, hello, Johnny. Come on in. Hi, Paul. Uh, this is Mrs. Walker, Mr. Dollar. How do you do? How do you do? Sit down, Johnny. Make yourself comfortable. Uh, Mrs. Walker came to see me this morning with a most unusual story. Something Johnny. about being dead? Yes. Mrs. Walker, Mr. Dollar will be handling this matter for International. I wish you'd tell him exactly what you just told me. Well, there really isn't much to tell you, Mr. Dollar. It's just that I'm legally dead and my husband has collected on my insurance policy. Uh, what's your husband's name? Uh, Frank Madison, Dr. Frank Madison. I took the name Walker when it happened. It was my maiden name. My married name is Thelma Madison. Where does your husband live? In Los Angeles. I uh, made a file check before you came over, Johnny. We issued a straight life policy on a Thelma Madison in Los Angeles, April 23rd, 1945. According to this, Mrs. Madison passed away June 5th, 1951. Claim was filed by the beneficiary, husband, Dr. Frank Madison, June 7th, and paid on the 10th of that month. Frank Madison, uh, that's your husband? Hmm? Yes. How much was the policy? Full claim, $10,000. Who adjusted it? A local man, Los Angeles office, uh, McCarthy there. How about a death certificate? Oh, yeah, here's a photo stat. Uh, cause of death, coronary thrombosis. Here. Thanks. This is signed by a Dr. Willis Reed, Mrs. Walker. Do you know Dr. Reed? Yes, he's a friend of my husband's. They share medical offices. Suppose you tell me how it worked. Well, one night Frank had a patient who was in pretty bad shape. A girl had been drinking somewhat and saw his shingle and just came in the office. She said she was feeling badly. I was there helping Frank, acting as receptionist. The girl had a heart failure in the examining room. You mean she died? Yes, there was nothing anybody could do. It was one of those things. Anyone there besides you and your husband? No. Well, how did all this work out? Well, we looked in her purse and found an address for her in Jersey City. No Los Angeles address? No. So we put in a long-distance phone call to the place in New Jersey. It was an apartment. We talked to the manager there. I see. He told us that the girl's mother had died very suddenly two days before and that her daughter was out in Los Angeles and he'd been trying to locate her to ask her what to do with the body. What was the girl's name? Wanda Thompson. Go on. Well, the man we talked to on the phone was quite upset. He didn't know what to do about the mother who died in his apartment building, and he told us that the daughter was all she'd had in the world. In other words, Wanda Thompson was completely alone. Yes, as far as we knew. Uh -huh. I see. Well, we didn't tell the man that she was dead, too. When Frank hung up the phone, he turned to me and said that we were in luck. I asked him what he meant, and he, he told me his idea. You mean to use her body? Yes, he... Called Dr. Reed and asked him to come over. Dr. Reed had never seen me, and he made out the death certificate. In your name? Yes, that's right. 
And your husband collected your insurance? Mm-hmm. Why? Well, he needed money. It seemed a good way to get it without too much trouble. Well, what was supposed to happen? Well, I don't know. We didn't plan that far. I mean, I thought that Frank would eventually close his practice and come to New York and we'd be together again. Is that where you've been all this time? In New York? Mm-hmm. And your husband never joined you? No. Did he write to you? Yes, for a while. Do you have any of the letters? No, I'm sorry. I... Do you know why he stopped writing? No. Why he never joined you? No. Is there any way that you can prove you're Thelma Madison? Well, not here in Los Angeles, I could. How? Well, people there know me. No friends I've had all my life. Were you ever fingerprinted? No, I don't think so. During the war, uh, did you work in a defense plant, maybe? No. Did you ever have a postal savings account? No. How about a California driver's license? No, I'm sure I don't have my fingerprints on file anywhere. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to furnish me with a list of names, people who'd identify you if asked to? People in Los Angeles? Yes. Yes, I would. You've been living in New York under the name of Thelma Walker since June 1951. Is that right? Yes. Where? 2218 East 57th Street. I still have my apartment there. Have you been working? Yes, as a laboratory assistant, Hyde Park Stations Incorporated. My boss is Mr. Platt. Oh, I uh, I put in a call to them earlier, Johnny. Mr. Platt said he's employed an assistant named Thelma Walker for the last 16 months, but uh, she hasn't been in for a week or so. I described this woman to him, and he said it sounded like her. Uh-huh. Did you get any of the insurance money, Mrs. Walker? Not a dime. Were you supposed to? I suppose so. Would you say that this whole thing was your husband's idea? Yes. Well, you're the one who seems to have lost all around, Mrs. Walker. Well, what did you expect to get out of it? Well, I... I did it for Frank. What about Wanda Thompson and her people, if she has any? She hasn't. Very few people in this world are without somebody, somewhere. Would you be willing to sign a statement containing all the information you've given me here today? Yes. You realize that if what you tell me is true, that you'll be criminally charged? Yes. By five o'clock in the afternoon, a statement had been prepared. Thelma Walker signed it without hesitation. I talked with Dupre in the outer office. Well, Johnny, I don't even have to go up to legal to know that every word of this will have to be verified before we can take any action. Well, if half of it's true, we're in business. Oh? She didn't give us any good reason for coming here. Well, maybe she has a conscience. She wouldn't have done it in the first place if she had. In the second place, she couldn't have lived with it for almost two years. And in the third place, there's an awful lot of coincidence. Yeah, yeah, but... Suppose it's true. Well, then it's the neatest thing since the ball bearing. What worries you most? What I said before. She might be a crackpot with a good imagination. Well, let's find out. Expense account item two, $38.14, transportation, Hartford to New York City. I checked my bag at the airport and took the limousine as far as the Waldorf. Expense account item three, three dollars, cab fare and tip, to 2218 57th Street, Thelma Walker's residence. I talked to the manager. This is her apartment, Mr. Dollar. I see. How long has she lived here? Mm, July, 1951. Good tenant? Very. Quiet. No drinking or parties. Wish we had more like Mrs. Walker. Do you know her very well? Just as a tenant. You ever talked to her? Not much. At Christmas time, we had a drink together down in my apartment. She seemed uh, all right. What do you mean? Well, normal. Oh, yes. Does she have any friends in the building that I could talk to? No, she doesn't. One thing she keeps to herself, minds her own business. Uh, may I ask where she is now? In Hartford. New Hartford Hotel, if you want to talk to her about anything. I'll remember that. You mind if I look around? I'll have to stay with you. I found nothing in Thelma Walker's apartment that would help verify or disprove her story. An hour later, I located Mr. Platt, the proprietor of the Hyde Park Laboratories where Thelma Walker worked. His answers concerning her conduct, habits, and attitude were identical with those of the apartment house manager. 
I checked with two people who worked with her. The same. By midnight, I was back out at the airport. Expense account item four, $2.25. Long distance phone call to Hartford. Here's your party. Hello? Hello? This is Johnny Dollar. Oh, hi, Johnny. What'd you find out? All clear here. Her story checks out about living in New York. Uh Uh-huh. Well, we better go on with it then. Oh, I have some news. I I talked to the coroner's office in Jersey City. Oh? Uh, Mabel Claire Thompson, age 61, died there June 3rd, 1951. The body was unclaimed and the county buried her. They were unable to locate her only known kin, a daughter, Wanda Thompson. She's believed to be in Los Angeles. See if you can find a picture and some prints on Wanda Thompson. All right, Johnny. Expense account item five, $185. Transportation, New York to Los Angeles. I arrived at 8.35 in the morning. By 9.35, I was in my room at the Stadler sleeping. At four o'clock in the afternoon, I awakened, shaved, and had something to eat. There was a special delivery airmail folder for me at the desk. It was from Paul Dupre. It contained a front and side view of Thelma Walker, along with a sample of her fingerprints and handwriting. Expense account item six, $15. Car rental, so I could get around a very big Los Angeles. I caught a woman by the name of Quincy just as she was having a bite of dinner. Please excuse me for eating like this while you're here, Mr. Deller, but I'm in a terrible hurry tonight. I have a date. Oh, that's all right, Miss Quincy. I'm intruding anyhow. No, not at all. You say you're from an insurance company? That's right. I thought perhaps you could help me. I'll try. What do you want? Well, I'd like to have you look at this. Mm-hmm. You know the woman in this picture, Miss Quincy? Well, she looks terribly familiar. Do you know her name? I... let me think. Yes, I know that girl, of course. That was Thelma Madison. Frank Madison's wife? Yes, poor Thelma died a year or so ago, very suddenly. How well did you know her? Oh, we played bridge together occasionally. We went shopping. I used to work for Dr. Madison as a receptionist. How long ago was this? Mm-hmm. A couple of years ago. I quit to take the job I have now. But you did know Mrs. Madison? Oh, yes, of course. She was in the office a lot of the time. And you're absolutely positive this is a picture of her? Well, yes. Is there any doubt? Well, we just want to be sure. The poor girl's been dead almost two years. Aren't you sure? Yes. You know, I don't think you've been exactly telling me the truth. I just had your name on a list, Miss Quincy. I was told you'd be able to recognize a picture of Thelma Madison if you saw it. Oh, who told you that? I'd rather not say. So mysterious. You want some coffee? No, thanks. Well, you look nice enough. I'll say that. Oh, thank you. Uh, Miss Quincy, when did you hear about Mrs. Madison's death? The day after it happened. I dropped in to see Dr. Madison about some things I'd left there, and he told me what had happened. It was quite a shock. She was always so healthy. I see. Did you go to Mrs. Madison's funeral? No, there wasn't one. Dr. Madison had her body cremated. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying outdoor sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
The Los Angeles police had a missing person report on Wanda Thompson dated June 21st, 1951. They'd been unable to get any leads as to her whereabouts. The reports had been filed by a man named Rexford. I looked him up. He lived in a small house off Laurel Canyon Drive. I told him my business. Insurance? Uh, Investigator. Oh. Well, come on in. Hey, sit down. What can I do for you? I understand you once knew a girl named Wanda Thompson, Mr. Rexford. Yeah, that's right, I did. So tell me you know where she is. No, I couldn't say that exactly. Oh, you're looking for her, huh? Yeah. You uh, been to the police? Yes. You filed a missing person complaint on her? Yeah, but they never did find her. Was she a good friend of yours, Mr. Rexford? Yeah, sort of. She was a nice little kid, came from some place in New Jersey. How long did you know her? About three weeks or so. How did you happen to meet her? I met her in a restaurant. She sat across from me. It was kind of crowded, and I don't get the wrong idea. It was just that we began talking, and we wound up going to a movie together. I saw her quite a bit for a while, and then she just up and disappeared without a word. That's about it. Do you remember when you last saw her? Sure. It was my birthday, June 5th. Went out and took in a play and had some drinks and food. I took her home, and she uh, lived in a room over on, uh, I think it was Berendo Street. 1480 West Miranda? Yeah, yeah, that's a little sort of court. That's the last I saw of her. Called a couple of times. The landlady said she hadn't seen her around, and I went over there. We went in the room, found all of her things there, but she was gone. Finally got worried and went to the police. Uh-huh. She drank much? No, no, no. You think something happened to her? Well, I don't know. I mean, anything could happen, but... Why would a kid like that just walk away from all her clothes and things and not let anybody know about it at all? Hmm. Did she know many other people in town? Well, I told the police that I didn't think she did. I never heard her talk about anybody else. I knew she'd only been here for a little while. She, she, she came here for her health. Oh? Yeah, some kind of heart trouble. Needed the weather or something like that. Did you tell this to the police when you reported her missing? No, should I? Did she go to a doctor here? Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw him a couple of times while I knew her. Was his name Madison, by any chance? Dr. Frank Madison? Yeah, that's it. Dr. Madison. He was the guy who was taking care of her. I spent another hour questioning Anthony Rexford. As far as he was able to remember, Wanda Thompson's heart condition had not been a serious one. Or at least she had explained it that way to him. After I left Rexford, I checked with the telephone company about the phone call Dr. Madison was supposed to have placed to Jersey City the night of Wanda Thompson's death. They had no record of any such call being completed. I decided to try Dr. Madison himself. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? I'm an insurance investigator, Doctor. I understand you once treated a patient named Wanda Thompson. Wanda Thompson? Wanda Thompson? I don't remember. What did I treat her for? A heart condition. Oh, well, soon find out. Thompson. Wanda. Wanda. When was this? Oh, almost two years ago. I don't have the exact dates. Hmm. Well, I don't have a Wanda Thompson in my files, Mr. Dollar. Was it something important? Pretty important. Well, she might have come in once for some little thing. I wouldn't make a history of that, necessarily. A man she once knew here told me that she came to you a few times. Hmm. Could have been another Dr. Madison? No, she told him it was you. That's funny. Well, say, now, wait a minute. You say this was two years ago? About that. My wife was acting as receptionist for me then. She wasn't too good at keeping records. Oh, you suppose I could talk to her and ask her? My wife is dead, Mr. Dollar. Oh. I'm sorry I can't be of more help. I thought every doctor kept a record of all his patients, even if they just came in with a nosebleed. As I said, my wife wasn't too efficient at her job here. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you did say that, didn't you, doctor? What is this, Mr. Dollar? My chance to get a look at you. What do you mean by that? I'll come right out and say it, doctor. You should have kept a file on Wanda Thompson. You should have kept that above all other things. 
The fact that you don't have one is going to make me believe a lot of things that I haven't really believed up till now. What things? What on earth are you talking about? I talked to a woman in Hartford, Connecticut, four days ago who told me her name was Thelma Madison. She said she was your wife. She said that Wanda Thompson died in your office one night and that you identified the body as your wife's. What? And what's more, you collected $10,000 worth of insurance on her. Here's her picture, Doctor. Is this your dead wife? Well, all right, I'll tell you. It is your wife, and she's still very much alive. And the story she told me in Hartford is pretty much the truth. I've never seen this woman before in my life. Mm, that's funny. Fourteen people in Los Angeles who knew her pretty well have seen that picture, and all of them say her name is Thelma Madison, that she was your wife. I've talked to every one of them, and I've got statements from them to that effect. And what's more, I have a rather long statement from Thelma Madison herself. Tells the whole story. Would you like to read it? No. Then uh, maybe you'd like to make a statement yourself. I have nothing to say, Mr. Dollar. No, I didn't think you would, Doctor. On the strength of the evidence already assembled, I preferred charges against Frank Madison and had him taken into custody. He refused to talk with the police or with me about any of the charges of which he was accused. He was held without bail pending investigation. Expense account item 7, $2.20, telegram. I wired Dupre to bring Mrs. Madison to Los Angeles as soon as possible in order to avoid a lengthy extradition procedure. They arrived the following day. I interviewed her once more. You say Frank's in jail? Yes. Oh, I suppose I'm to be arrested. Well, so far we have enough evidence to prove conspiracy against you two, and we'll prosecute to the limit on that. There'll be some other charges against him, business with the body and so on. Yes. But there's something else here I want to get straightened out. Let me read this to you. A girl whom we later found out to be Wanda Thompson walked into the office on the night of June 5, 1951, and complained of feeling ill. She had been drinking. My husband took her into the examination room, <clears throat> excuse me, where she died a few minutes later of a heart condition. Those are your words on this sworn statement. Yes. Let me go on. I had never seen or heard of Wanda Thompson until that night. I was with my husband when he placed a phone call to her home in Jersey City. He spoke with a man there who managed an apartment house, and so on. Mrs. Madison, that call was never placed. I was in the room when Frank made it. The phone company has no record of it. Were you in the room when Wanda Thompson died? No. Did you know that she was a patient of your husband's before that time? No. Well, I found out. I'll tell you, Wanda Thompson was one of your husband's patients. She didn't just walk in and drop dead. I talked to a man who knew Wanda Thompson. She told him about going to your husband for treatment. How do you explain that? I didn't know it. You said you were acting as receptionist. When she gave you her name, didn't you look into your index to see if you... No, no, I didn't at all. Now look, Mrs. Madison. A lot of these things you told me have been true. But a lot of them don't make sense. Well, you wouldn't know anything about any of it if I hadn't come to you. Well, maybe that's so. Well, why do you think we've gone to the expense and trouble of checking all this? I'll tell you. Because it was just too good to be real. A girl, alone and friendless in Los Angeles, dying of a heart attack in a doctor's office. A doctor who needs money and has a wife who's heavily insured. It's too much for us to take. Even with a signed statement, it's too much to take. Wanda Thompson was a patient of your husband's. She came in his office one day like anybody else. You or your husband took her personal history. And you noticed that she only had one relative in the world who'd be worried if she died. A mother way back in Jersey City. What are you talking about? I'm talking about a premeditated, planned murder. That's what I'm talking about. When that mother died suddenly, there was nobody to worry about poor little Wanda Thompson anymore. Nobody to ask questions about her. Am I right? Yes, you're right. Do you want to tell me about it? Wanda had been in to see Frank twice before. He knew all about her. That night when she came in the office, she said she'd just received word that her mother had died suddenly. 
She asked for something to make her sleep. Frank took her back in the examination room. Go on. A few minutes later, he buzzed me to come back. Wanda was lying on the table, dead. Mm-hmm. Frank looked kind of strange. Crazy. He said that Wanda had a sudden heart attack and died before he could do anything. Well, I knew it wasn't so. There was a hypodermic on the stand. He'd given her something. I just didn't think he'd go that far. Hadn't he discussed something like that with you before? No, I swear he hadn't said a word to me before that night. And he had it all planned when he called me back in the examination room. He called Dr. Reed on the phone and told him that his wife was very ill and asked him to come over and help out. When Dr. Reed got there, he showed him that poor girl and he said it was me. And that's how Reed signed the death certificate? Yes. Where were you all this time? In Frank's office, I heard every word. But you didn't say anything? Well, no, I... I was too stunned by it all, I guess. When did you leave town? That same night. Frank made me. He, he said he'd handle everything. I accused him of killing Wanda, and he said that she just died there. But I know it wasn't so. Okay. You want a cigarette? Yes, please. Here you go. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, I'm glad it's all over now. I'm terribly glad. Expense account item eight, seventy-three dollars and fifty cents. Board and room while in Los Angeles. Expense account item nine. $205, plane fare to Hartford. Expense account total, $525.39. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself often to Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Joseph Kearns, Lillian Bayef, Parley Bear, Virginia Gregg, Tom Tully, and John McIntyre. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. WBBM FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment John Lund as Johnny Dollar. Is this Joe Benson? You call me? Oh yeah, Lieutenant. I'm from Federal Underwriters. All the way from Hartford? Yeah. 
They sent me to get a report on the National Savings and Loan holdup. Oh, I see. How's the watchman? Well, he died about a half hour ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Shot three times. Hardly had a chance. Did he ever regain consciousness? Yes. Long enough to give us a make on one of the four guys who heisted the place. Well, that's something. Look, uh, if you want a report, you better come on down and get it firsthand. I'll be there in ten minutes, Lieutenant. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment... Plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Federal Underwriters Incorporated, 223 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Dameron matter. Expense account item one, $240, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to San Francisco. I arrived ten hours after the news of the National Savings and Loan holdup reached the office. Lieutenant Benson was waiting for me when I got to the city hall. Yeah, you're just in time, Dollar. My men picked up Bernie Manners a few minutes ago. He's down the hall. Manners? He the one you got an identification on? Yes. Watchman looked at some mugs we pulled from the files and spotted him right away. Said Manners was one of the four men who did the job. Oh, it's quick work. Uh, Shall we go on down? Yeah, sure. What about this, Manners? Well, he's a two-time loser. 25 arrests on his card. All the way from narcotics violation to armed robbery. We'll see what he has to say before we check out his mama sheet. How'd they get him? Uh, When the watchman made him while we put out an APB... One of the units spotted him because he was going into a saloon. Yeah, this way. Oh. Have any trouble? No. They uh, find anything on him? Two dollars and forty cents. No gun, nothing. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you got a smoke? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm fresh air. Yeah, here you go. Oh, thanks. Well, uh... What do you think of our weather out here? Oh, pretty nice, pretty nice. We're still having snow. <laughs> I haven't been east in 13 years. Forgotten what it looks like. I don't know what you guys are talking about. I didn't have nothing to do with nothing. This matters? Yeah. Sergeant Friedman, Johnny Dollar. Hi. Hi. Hello, Bernie. Hello, Lieutenant. Well, let's have it. Of what? A story on the National Savings and Loan job. I don't know anything about the National Savings and Loan job. Four men walked in there about midnight last night, shot the watchman, cracked the safes, and got away with $65,000. Now you know about it? I don't know anything. What are you guys trying to hang on me? Where were you last night, Bernie? When last night? Between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. I was in my room, sleeping. Can you prove you were sleeping last night in your room? Who can prove that we're sleeping? And a landlady, somebody like that. I don't know. What do you know? Huh? About the national savings job. Nothing. I don't know nothing. Look, Bernie, you can make this thing a whole lot easier. I can? Now, who worked it with you? Who were the other three men in on it? Oh, come on, Bernie. You were always pretty good at talking. I'm not going to tell you anything. I don't have anything to tell you. How are you making a living these days? What? What do you do for a living? Oh, I've been driving a truck up the last week. Yeah? Where? Coast trucking outfit. 
Did you quit? I was fired. Why? I got in a beef with the boss. Check that. Yeah. Lieutenant Benson and Sergeant Friedman continued to question the suspect. He refused to admit any part in the burglary of the National Savings and Loan Company or to name any people who were connected with it. An hour went by. He still refused to talk. Two hours. Uh, I'm getting tired. So am I. All of us are tired, Bernie. Now, look, why don't you open your face so we can get some rest? Huh? I've told you I didn't have anything to say. <sighs> Who's this joker? Me? My name's Dollar, Bernie. I'm from the insurance company. What's he doing here? Worrying about you and your friends. <laughs> you don't have to worry about me, Dollar. I'll try not to. I uh, thought maybe you was a lawyer. Do I get to see a lawyer? What do you want to see a lawyer for? To get out of here, that's why. You aren't getting out of here, Bernie, you know that. Uh, now, tell us all about it. Come on, Bernie, you know it's all over. We got enough to take you into court right now. Uh, don't give me that. Uh -huh. Don't you believe it? No. Hand me that. Yeah, sure. There you go. Thanks. You know what this is, Bernie? No. It's a notarized statement from the watchman that was killed. His name was Fuller. I talked to him just before he died. You know what this says? It says that you were one of the four men who robbed the National Savings and Loan Company last night. Listen. Me. Please state your full name. Him. Henry Fuller. Me. Where do you live? Him. 235 22nd Avenue. Me. I understand that you are seriously hurt. Is that true? Him. Yes. Me. Do you believe that you are about to die from injuries you have received? Him. Yes. Me. Have you any hope of recovery from the effects of these injuries? Him. No. Listen, I... Shut up, Bernie, and listen. Me. Who caused the injuries from which you are suffering? Him. One of the robbers. Me. Is this a picture of one of the men who caused your injuries? Him. Yes. He was looking at a mugshot of you, Bernie. There were four witnesses in that hospital room when Fuller made this statement. It's a positive identification on you. Well? Can I have a glass of water? Later, maybe. Who were the other men? I don't know what you're talking about. Questioning went on. Another hour passed. Everybody got pretty tired. Manners still admitted nothing. It was the usual method of interrogation. Hammer away. Hammer away. Sooner or later, he'd spill something important. Lieutenant Benson knew his job. Once more, Bernie. Who were the other men? For the 20th time, there were no other men. There were four of you, Bernie. Why didn't we play bridge? Tell us what you did all day yesterday. What? Start with from the time you got up. I'll try to remember. Yeah, we're all interested. Well, what is this? Go on, Bernie. Tell it. Well, I got up about ten. I fooled around all day, and I got to bed early. Very nice. What do you want me to tell you? What you did all day, who you were with, where you went. Oh, it's... And after you tell us that, you can tell us how you worked on the National Savings and Loan Office. I'll tell you nothing, nothing. All right, what's your name? What? What's your name? Bernie Manish, you know my name. Where do you live? I told you. Tell us your address. 2020 Army Street. Who worked with you? Nobody, nobody. Yeah, just a minute. Vince? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that'll do it. Yeah. That was about you, Bernie. What about me, Lieutenant? What about me? Guess what the crime lab found tucked behind one of the cushions in the front seat of your car? Oh. 
$20,000, Bernie. You didn't hide it very well. I didn't think you'd be looking. Did you use your car? Yeah. Who were the others? Eddie Page, Jack Ivers. One more. Yeah, the guy was called Chick. I didn't know him. Chick one. Just Chick. He figured the whole thing. Uh, who contacted you? Eddie. He put me in on. But Chick ran it. Where can we get hold of Chick? I don't know. Uh, what about ADP? I don't know. Jack Ivers. No. It won't do you any good to lie now. Buddy. I'm not lying. I just don't know where you can get hold of any of them. Uh, what'd you do after the job? Oh, we all got in my car and beat it. I let them off near the Fairmont. All three of them? Yeah. That way you split the money? No, we did that before we left the loan company. Look, I, I'm, I'm tired. Now, one more thing. Who shot Fuller? This chick. Are you sure? Well, he was the only one who had a gun. Sure, I'm sure. Why did he shoot him? I couldn't figure that myself. We're all leaving the place. The watchman was all tied up and it was no trouble. Chick walked over, stuck the gun in his back and let him have it. Bernie Manners gave us a description of the man known only as Chick. It was pretty much the same as the description given by the watchman. A check through the moniker files revealed a possible 23 persons who answered the general description and background of Chick. Manners was shown a picture of each one. Couldn't identify any of them. I went back to my hotel and went to bed. The next morning, I was with Lieutenant Benson. They checked the slugs taken from Fuller's Barney. Any luck? Now, they came from a forty-five automatic revolver. Looks like it might be a Colt. Well, that checks with what Manners said. Yeah, but nothing in our files on the gun itself. Manners is in the mug room now. If this chick ever did time in any California prison, we'll have him on file. The hard way, huh? Hard case. Man's been killed. What about the other two, Page and Ivers? Ivers was released from San Quentin three months ago. The parole office gave us an address for him on Turk Street. Quinlan Friedman went out there, but the people who run the rooming house say Ivers hasn't been around for two days. I've got the place staked out. What was he in San Quentin for? Grand Theft Auto. Did four years. That the only time he fell? Mm-hmm. Page has had a little more experience. He's older than Manners or Ivers. He's a two-time loser. Both convictions were for armed robbery. Police in Denver wanted for questioning, too. Any leads on him? No local address. He has a sister who lives in Eureka. Police there are talking to him. Should be getting something pretty soon. Communication's been broadcasting this every 30 minutes all night long. I left Lieutenant Benson so I could talk with the auditors who'd been working with the people at National Savings and Trust. By that time, they determined that $68,000 had been taken in the robbery. I spoke to the claims adjuster who'd flown in from Hartford and the officials of the company. I explained the situation with the police and the recovery of $20,000 of the stolen money. They agreed to suspend their claim pending the arrest of the other three suspects and the possible recovery of the entire loot. Expense account item two, 10 cents, phone call. I checked with Lieutenant Benson about four o'clock. Hi. Hi. You're just in time. We got a lead on page. Oh, yeah? 1485 Clare Street. I'll meet you out in front. Right. Expense account item three, $1.35. Cab fare to the address on Clare Street. Hi. Hi. In there? Yeah. You want to be in on this? If it's all right with you. Okay. Friedman's covering the back entrance. Quinlan's in the lobby. Let's go. Hey. How'd you get it? Eureka police talked to Paige's sister. Said she'd been writing him here under the name of Ernest Lawyers. Oh. Uh, won't take it over there. Yeah. Who's there? Uh, looking for Mr. Lawyers. You Mr. Lawyers? Yeah. What do you want? Package. Who from? Well, it's, uh... Mrs. William Redding. Eureka, California. I have to sign for it. Okay. You want to see I... You alone, Page? Uh, who are you? Police. Get your hat. Come on, let's go. Want to take a look over there, Don? Yeah. What is this? Bernie Manners spilled it all. Look out. He's got a gun. Drop that, Page. Oh, 
Oh, good, mister. Well, you lousy cut. All right. All right. Come on, get up. Put your hands out. All right, let's go, Paige. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Sergeants Quinlan and Friedman took the suspect, Eddie Page, downtown. I drove over to the emergency hospital with Lieutenant Benson, where they patched up the cut in his temple where Page had slugged him with his gun. After that, we returned to headquarters. Sergeant Friedman met us outside the interrogation room. How do you feel, Joe? Oh, headache. And what about him? Real quiet so far. Mm, fine. We went over the apartment. Now, you'll be happy about this, Dollar. More money? 15000 stuck in a suitcase. Hey, your insurance company's doing well so far. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see about Tough Boy. Remember me? I remember both of you. How's your head? I'll get over it. How's your chin? I'd like to get at you again. Kind of like to get at you. That's all he's been saying ever since he landed. You're tied in with Bernie Manners and Jack Ivers on this thing, Page. Am I? Yeah. And that's enough for us. I suppose you're going to send me to prison. I suppose we are. <laughs> Some talk. Who's Chick? Chick? The other guy. I don't know. Where's Ivers? I don't know. Bernie had to stay in here six hours. How long are you going to take, Paige? As long as you like. We've got all the time in the world. So have I. You know, we found your cut of the job in your room. Bernie's already told us about you. You're not going to admit anything, huh? Why should I? Man was killed on that job. As a murder charge to go along with everything else. Do tell. You can make it easy on yourself, Paige. <laughs> Easier for you. Okay. That's the way you want it? Friedman. Yeah. You and Quinlan stay with this bird. Stay with him if it takes all night and all day and all night. I want to see how long he can last. Well, now okay. You're... Come on, darling. Well, what now? I'm hungry. Expense account item four. Six dollars and thirty-five cents. Drinks and dinner for Lieutenant Benson and myself. After eating, we returned to the interrogation room and the questioning of the suspect, Eddie Page. Although he knew there was enough evidence against him to make a burglary and homicide charge stick, he still refused to admit his part in the burglary or to give us the full name of the man known simply as Chick. About ten o'clock that night, a man who ran a drugstore on Geary Street telephoned that he thought he might have some information that would help. I drove over there with Lieutenant Benson. Foggy. Yeah, sure is. Oh, good evening. Can I help you, please? Uh, we'd like to talk to Mr. Smith. Yeah. Oh, 
You're the police? Well, I'm Smith. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Benson. This is Mr. Dollar. Uh, how do you do? You said you had something that might help, Mr. Smith? Indeed I do, Mr. Dollar. Indeed I do. I read all about the burglary in the papers yesterday, and, well, I have this. Hmm. A bill wrapper from National Savings and Loan. Yes. Now, where'd you get this, Mr. Smith? I found it on the floor, right here in the store. You know who dropped it? Uh, yes, I think so. Who? Well, a man who was in here earlier. I think he dropped it. What did he look like? Well, he, he was tall. He was kind of husky. Oh, he was about 35 years old, I'd say. He wore kind of a dark hat and a trench coat. You ever seen him in here before? No, just tonight. What did he buy, Mr. Smith? Quite a few things. Well, like what? Well, three bottles of scotch. And some mixer, and some ice, and some cigarettes. Uh-huh, I see. Oh, when did you find the wrapper? Uh, right after he paid me for the things. What size bill did he give you? It was a 50. You still have it? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, could we look at it, please? Well, surely. Yes, this way. Here you are. Thanks. No, huh? Brand new. Uh, did you happen to notice if he left in a car, Mr. Smith? No, he was on foot. When I found the wrapper on the floor and then remembered the newspaper story, I ran outside to take a look to see which direction he went. He walked right across the street. Do you mean he might possibly live around here? I think so. Like, uh, like right there, you see? He went into the Alden Hotel. How long ago was this? Oh, my, that was not over 15 minutes ago. Hey! What? That, that's him, just coming out on the street there. Get back. Can you see his face? No, no, not yet. Is he one of the men you're looking for? I don't know yet. Sounds like it. Lieutenant. Yeah? Take a look. Jack Ivers. Let's go. Uh, you. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, call downtown. Hey, you. Hold it up just a minute. He's going for the alley. Yeah. Ducked right in there, I think. Yeah. Be careful, Johnny. Okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Throw out the gun, Ivers. You don't have a chance. Down! Yeah. He's going to try for that fence down there. Yeah, let's go. He can't see us in the shadows. And he made the fence. Yeah, come on. See anything? Oh, too dark. Somewhere in here. Hey. Over there? Yeah. Anything? No. The apartment house. The one in the back door. Yeah. Get down. You okay? Okay. Ivers! This is your last chance! He'll get hurt if we don't stop him. That did it. What's it look like? Oh, he's done for. Well, I better phone in. Jack Ivers, one of the suspects connected with the burglary of the National Savings and Loan Office, died instantly while attempting to escape arrest. While we waited for the coroner's men to arrive, we searched his body and found $12,000 of the stolen money concealed in a money belt around his waist. I accompanied Lieutenant Benson to the Alden Hotel, where we learned from the desk clerk that Ivers had checked in the previous day using the name of David Ward. The clerk said that he shared the room with a man who'd registered as Charles Daly. Daly was still in the room, as far as the clerk knew. We went upstairs. Well, this is Chick. It's been a good day's work. Yeah. Uh, 210. Yeah. Here we go. Could have sneaked out. Uh, let's find out. Well, <laughs> I'll be. <laughs> Drunk? 
As you can get. <laughs> That's the way I like to pick them up. Quiet. The man passed out in the hotel room was identified as Chester Dameron, Toledo, Ohio. A check with authorities there revealed he had a criminal record covering 17 years. His nickname was Chick. Along with Eddie Page and Bernie Manners, he was indicted on charges of burglary and murder. The remainder of the stolen money was found in his hotel room. All told, 99 and 39 one hundredths percent of the loot was recovered, excepting what Ivor spent for whiskey. Pretty good for federal underwriters. Expense account item five, $63.30. Miscellaneous while in San Francisco. Item six, same as one. My plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Total expense account, $551.10. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar... Brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role, and was written by E. Jack Newman, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Bill Johnstone, Clayton Post, Bill Conrad, Peter Leeds, and Howard McNear. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Many of the war orphans of Korea are dying of starvation and exposure. Without your help, they cannot live. We can send them food through CARE, the American Package Sending Relief Agency. One $10 CARE food package will feed four children for a month. Send your contribution to CARE's local office or to CARE New York or CARE Los Angeles. This is the CBS Radio Network. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Ed Quigley, Johnny. Are you free? If you mean am I available, yeah. What's up, Ed? Uh, remember Mark San Antonio? The bootlegger? Yeah, sure. What about him? Well, somebody shot him this morning. Shot him to death in St. Petersburg, Florida. Oh, yeah? Great Eastern Fidelity set up a trust two years ago for San Antonio's daughter. They want a full report before they come across. I see. They know who killed him yet or why? No, not a thing, Johnny. Just that he's dead. When can you leave? As soon as I can get a plane. Good. Good. 
The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment... It's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Great Eastern Fidelity and Life Insurance Corporation, 6th and Jordan Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the San Antonio matter. Expense account item one, $162.03. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to St. Petersburg, Florida. I arrived exactly ten hours after I received the call from Ed Quigley. The rainy weather there was as bad, if not worse, than the weather I just left. I checked in at the St. Petersburg Hotel, shaved, showered, had a meal, and started in. My first contact was a police officer, Lieutenant Benjamin by name. A big swarthy man who seemed to know what he was about. I, uh, I don't quite get this, Dollar. What's your part? Just that my insurance company would like a full report on everything that's happened. Oh, you mean a report separate from what we have? Yeah, that's about it, Lieutenant. Well, it's their dough. They can spend it any way they want to. What can I do for you? Well, maybe we can help each other, Lieutenant. If you'll sort of let me tag along and see what's what on the case. <laughs> we'll see. Well, San Antonio bought a big place over on the south end of town 11 years ago, just after he was released from Alcatraz. He's lived there ever since. Quiet, minding his own business, keeping his nose out of trouble. Yeah, so I understand. Well, as long as a man does that, even a man with a background like San Antonio, as long as a man does that, we don't bother him, he doesn't bother us. Well, today was the first peep we ever got out of him. What happened? Seems at 6 o'clock this morning he phoned into the station and said that somebody was watching his house. Prowl car went out to have a look around. He told the officers that two men had been hanging around the front of his house, but they got away just before the car showed up. Uh huh. He give a description? Yeah, yeah. Both about six feet, dark, wore dark overcoats and hats. San Antonio didn't recognize either of them. The officers put the description on the air and tried to find them, but they didn't have any luck. Now, San Antonio wasn't the kind of a bird to get excited about a couple of guys staking out his place. He pretty well knew how to take care of himself and handle trouble. Yeah, but you say that uh, he hadn't been in trouble or asked for any around here. That's right, too. And I'm sure he didn't want any either. So his call was treated like any other prowler call. We investigated, didn't find anything, and promised to keep our eyes open. Mm hmm. The uh, cook came on duty about 8.30. She went in the kitchen, made him some breakfast, took it up to his room, and she found him dead. He'd been shot twice with a Luger. The lab has the slugs now, it was a close range job. Well, then the surest bet is the two men that San Antonio reported watching his house, huh? Well, that's about it. Wish we could find them somewhere. What about the cook? Uh, she just worked their days fixing his meals and taking care of him. San Antonio must have been past 60. He was 67. <laughs> I guess he was beginning to show a little tread. A man who's lived the kind of life he has and done the things he's done is bound to show some wear and want some rest sometime in his life. According to her, he spent his days painting... Painting? Yeah. Mark San Antonio? Every room in the house covered with pictures he's done these last few years. Oil's pretty good, too. And when he wasn't painting, he was listening to records. All kinds of heavy stuff in the way of music around the place. Now, you hardly figure a bootlegger like San Antonio thinking of anything like music and art. Hardly ever. Yeah. Well, and all the time he was in action running booze up in New York and getting himself in trouble with the tax people, he was bound to step on a lot of toes and get himself a lot of enemies. The kind of people who wouldn't forget. You, uh, 
you talk to him much? Oh, yes. Now and then I'd meet him on the street or in a store. He seemed pretty gentled up. Hmm. How'd he live? Apparently he saved something from the old days. A house he paid for in cash. The Bank of New York used to send him a statement every month. I suppose he had some arrangement with them. Well, that's about it so far. I see. Well, I sure appreciate the information. It's okay. When I get any more, I'll let you know. Crime Lab's still working on some of the stuff in his room. Maybe we'll get something there. Mm-hmm. Say, uh, do you mind if I talk to that cook? Oh, that's your privilege, Dollar. Her name's Olson. She's staying at the San Antonio house during all this. Okay. Uh, San Antonio's daughter blew into town this afternoon. She's at the house, too. What does she have to say? Oh, nothing. She she didn't even know Mark San Antonio was her father until your insurance company told her. Didn't know? No, no. She's been living in Philadelphia all these years with an aunt. All very legitimate. The girl's been using the name Randall. Edith Randall. Yes, sir. How do you do? Uh, you Mrs. Olson? Yes, sir. My name is Dollar, Mrs. Olson. I'm from the Great Eastern Fidelity people. You suppose I could speak with Miss Randall? Oh, I don't think so, sir. She's not feeling well. All of this has been quite a shock to her. I see. Well, then I guess my trip out here tonight was for nothing. Well, you come tomorrow, Mr. Dollar. Please. Mrs. Olson? Mrs. Olson? Yes, Miss Randall. Who is it? It's uh, Mr. Dollar. He's from the insurance company. I... Insurance company? Yes. I'd like to talk to him, Mrs. Olson. The woman who stood at the base of the iron grill stairway was tall and dark-eyed. She came toward me smiling, showing a frank, wide, happy mouth. Young kind of face that could have been 20 or maybe 30. Mrs. Olson excused herself and we were alone. I wanted to talk to someone who might be able to give me a little more information about all this. It's all quite new to me. Well, I'll tell you what I can, Miss Randall. Yes, I'm sure you will. From what Mr. Hirth and the insurance offices told me on the phone, I'm to be quite well off because this man was murdered here today. You mean Mr. San Antonio? Yes, Mr. San Antonio. They tell me he was my father. <laughs> to awaken one morning and discover you're not one person, but an entirely different person. I mean... I'm the daughter of a famous racketeer who's been murdered. You seem to me like a very nice person. And so do you, Mr. Dollar. Will you tell me all about this, please? Well, just our part of it, Miss Randall. Let's see, uh, you're 26 now, is that right? That is. Well, 26 years ago, your father was on trial for income tax evasion. Just before he was convicted, he set up a trust fund with my insurance company... To provide for you. It's been paying money for your support and education all these years. According to the condition of the trust, the rest of the money reverts to you now. It comes to well over $50,000. And that's all there is to it? Yeah, except for this. You mean my father... It's so strange to say that. My father's murder? Mm-hmm. I suppose I'm grateful to my father... I suppose I should be grateful. I can't say that I'm particularly sorry about his death any more than I would be if any human being died violently somewhere. How strangely life treats us sometimes. How very strangely. You know, you've somehow made me feel comfortable in this house. May I offer you a drink? It was strange for me, too, because... I felt comfortable in the house. Over the drinks, we talked of Mark San Antonio. I told her what I knew of his life, of his activities up until the time he'd been sent to Alcatraz. She told me how she'd been reared, far removed from anything that might have connected her in any way with the San Antonio name. Altogether, it was a revealing conversation for both of us. She'd never imagined any part of the kind of life her father had lived. And I never imagined that it was possible for anyone to get away from a man like San Antonio. For the road, Johnny? All right. 
How long will you be in St. Petersburg? Till all this is straightened out. You mean you'll be here until they find out who killed him? Mm Mm-hmm. How about you? Oh, I really don't know. I really don't even know why I came here exactly. Yes, I do. I wanted to see him. See what he looked like. What kind of a life he led here. Did you see him? No. I suppose I can if I want to. But I have seen what kind of a life he had. He was just an ordinary man, wasn't he? Have you noticed the pictures he's painted? Mm Mm-hmm. May I ask you something? Well, yes. How do you feel about him now? Is this for your report? Mm, For myself. Since you've been here in these last two hours, I've begun to think of him for what he was. My father, I mean. I'd like to know why he was killed and who did it. Will I see you again? I hope so. Edith. Yes? I hope so very much. So do I, Johnny. I left her at the door that night with a warm sensation inside of me. Something I certainly hadn't expected in the routine business of investigating a murder case. The next morning I was back at the house talking to Mrs. Olson. She gave me all the information she could remember about San Antonio's activities up until the time of his death. Same information she'd given the police. All of it accurate, but lacking in any possible clue as to the identity of his slayer or slayers. I had breakfast with Edith there and then went back downtown to spend a solid 12 hours in the company of Lieutenant Benjamin, who had still not located or identified the two mysterious men. However, there were other developments. Say, this may be something. Oh? San Antonio's partner in the old days, Palalici, was murdered in Newark last night. Timmy Palalici? That's the one. Any details? No, just that he was shot to death with a Luger. When the slugs taken from San Antonio's body were compared with those that killed Palalici and were proved to have been fired from the same gun, the case took on new proportions. Every available bit of information regarding the two ex-big shots of the 20s was located, read, and re-read. It meant activity in such cities as St. Louis, Chicago, New Orleans, and Buffalo. But no new information as to the identity of the killer. Johnny. Hey, what is it? You're, You're shaking. Hold me. Hold me, please. I suppose I'm being a terrible fool about it all, Johnny. But they've been after me all day. Cheap little things. A newspaper syndicate wants me to write my exclusive story as the daughter of Mark St. Antonio. Fairy princess, daughter of racketeer. Hey, hey, now take it easy, honey. Even Hollywood called. Some producer saw my picture in the paper and offered me a contract. He says he has a script already. Come on, come on now, come on. I'll try. Women are fools, aren't they? I shouldn't have come here. I shouldn't have shown up at all. Then what would I have done, Edith? Then what would I have done? Make yourself a drink, Johnny, and I'll put on a new face. It had become apparent to me in the five days I had known her and the five days that she'd known of her father that she'd grown to love him, or the memory of him. She stated it very simply. Everyone needs a father. If you find out you have one, or had one, really, well, you love him. We were walking up the gravel path of the house when she said that. I suppose I was thinking of how nice it would be to kiss her at the door when I heard someone behind me. Ah! I twisted, trying for the gun in my inside pocket, but there was nobody to shoot at. At least nobody I could see. Why me? Why me, Johnny? Why? Edith died right there, and I lowered her to the ground.
friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good any time, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Ten seconds after Edith Randall died in my arms, I was stumbling down the gravel path that led from the house to the road. It all happened so suddenly and violently that I can't say that what I did from there on or what I felt was entirely rational. All I know is that a car was parked at the deep end of the gateway and two men were just climbing into it. Hey, hey, you two, stop! 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 Get out of there. Both of you. Get out with your hands up. I'm hit. I'm afraid to move. Get out! Come on. I'm coming. I come. All right, you two. Come on, come on. Uh, No use on him, mister. He's used up. You got him real good. You... I, I need the dog. Stay where you are. Mr. Dollar! Mr. Dollar! What is it? What's happened? Go phone the police, Mrs. Olson. Oh. I'll get over here right away. Who are they? What is all this? Go on, do what I tell you. Hurry. All right, Mr. Dollar. All right. You... You pretty tough fella. What's your name? Giuseppe Rico. Who's he? He was my brother. Giovanni. <laughs> I need the doctor. <laughs> Listen. Tell it to me. Tell it to me right now. There's no policeman around to cover you. Nobody but you and me. If you don't tell it to me now, you'll never tell it to anybody. Now tell it. Tell it. Never, never. I die first. I had one bullet left in my gun. I set the barrel back against his temple and pulled back the hammer. I think I really meant to go through with it. And for the first time, I noticed that my shoulder was covered with blood. My head began to ring, and I had to let go and straighten up. That was not the thing to do. Oh! Hello there, Dollar. Huh? Oh, Lieutenant. Quite a night, this one, huh? Yeah, but... Oh, you stopped one, boy. You were sure curled up when we got there. Edith? I'm sorry, Dollar. I thought I might have been wrong. No, you weren't. How long am I slated for this place? Well, the doctor says you can get out when you want to. Feel like talking? They were just there, and they shot her. That's it. Which one? I don't know. They were together. That's enough, isn't it? Sure, sure. Same Luger that killed San Antonio and Palalici. Just trying to pin it down a little more. We can't get much out of the one that's left. Let me ask him some questions, Lieutenant. Easy, easy. I know how you feel about her. Just lie back there now. (sighs) Did he say anything at all? No, nothing more than his name and his brother's name. Found papers on him that say they're from New York. Police in New York are looking him up right now. So far, they haven't been able to find any connection with San Antonio. Hmm. People like San Antonio and Palalici make enemies, but, but that girl, it doesn't figure. 
And those two flew here from New York just to get her. Yeah, yeah. Dollar, you talked to her a lot in these last few days. What'd she say? Nothing that has anything to do with this. You know yourself, she didn't even know who her father was till he got killed. Well, that could have been an act. No, it wasn't. I knew her well enough to mm. tell you that. Yeah, well, why would they gun her down? Why the trip? That Rico boy you're holding in the jail hospital has the answer. Get it from him. Yeah, we will, Dollar. We will. Oh, there's someone. Hey, just a minute. Sure. Oh, Dollar. Huh? Maybe I spoke too soon. Rico died five minutes ago. As far as my investigation of the San Antonio case went, could have ended right there. The Luger found in the dead Rico brother was the same gun that had fired fatal bullets into all three victims. I got my release from the hospital and late that afternoon walked into Lieutenant Benjamin's office. Dollar, I don't get it. Don't get what? Here. This just came from New York on the Rico boys. Oh? Came to this country when they were 18 and 21. Both of them were naturalized citizens. Records? Not a thing. No trouble ever. Oh, that's funny. What else? Well, that's about it. Police there can't seem to locate their old man. He disappeared a week ago. Lived on the east side somewhere. He a naturalized citizen, too? Oh, that's another funny thing. He's taken out his papers and was due for examination with the immigration people this week. They're looking for him, too. Um, when are you leaving? Tomorrow afternoon on the one o'clock plane. Well, come on, I'll buy you some dinner. We had dinner together and talked about the case. It had been a strange one. The deaths were useless, the motives unknown. The killers weren't even associated with their victims. I parted company with Lieutenant Benjamin and went back to my hotel to trouble it out with sleep. About 11 o'clock, I had a phone call. Johnny Dollar. Hi, Dollar, this is Ben. Oh, what's up? Old man Rico just walked into the city morgue. He wants to take his two sons back to New York for burial. Twenty minutes later, I was standing in the coroner's office when Lieutenant Benjamin led a small, wizened old man into the room and sat him down in one of the chairs. Gave him a glass of water, offered him a cigarette. Old man refused. No, 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 senor, no. Oh. Oh, thank you. Mr. Rico, this is Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Rico? I read of you. You killed my boys. You saw? Yes. They tried to kill me. Yeah. I know. I know. Uh, it's a bad. Why, Mr. Rico? It, it is simple. You was in the way. I don't mean about me. I mean about Edith Randall and Palalici and Mark San Antonio. Why? I take the water now, please. Why? Do you know why? See. Si. And tell me. They're all dead now. I'm still alive. Pietro Rico was held in custody for the immigration officials. He refused to talk about his sons or any of their activities. He just stayed in his jail cell, silent, non-committal to all visitors, including the chaplain. I don't suppose we'd ever have gotten the story of it, except that the will of Mark San Antonio disclosed that before her marriage to him, his wife's name had been Maria Rico. Yeah. More questions, Mr. Dollar? No, I've got some answers. Mark San Antonio's wife was your daughter, wasn't she? Uh... Wasn't she? She. Well, is that all you have to say? I not talk. Well, and I do, Mr. Rico. Because your daughter had a daughter. A lovely, wonderful daughter. That your two sons killed. I happen to know that girl. She had to die, too. Why? Paralici, San Antonio, and her. They had to die. All are bad. All of us are bad at one time or another. Who made them die? You? 
See, who gave you the right? I'm the father. When a daughter marries a bad man, only bad can come of it. He came to our village many years ago and he took her away. He and the men of Palalici help him. It live with me all this time. I live only to destroy him for that. I destroy him and the other man and the girl through my sons. Why the girl? She could not have been good from a bad man. A vendetta. Was that it? If you like, vendetta. He was a bad man who did bad things. Bad man. I smoke now. You got a cigar? The disposition of old Pietro Rico is up to the immigration authorities. I didn't stay around St. Petersburg for all the complex examinations that would have to be made to test his sanity. I had enough of St. Petersburg. Expense account, item three, hotel and board, $79.30. Item four, hospital, $168.13. Item five, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $573.49. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself often to Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were John McIntyre, Joe Kearns, Jeanette Nolan, Virginia Gregg, and Jay Novello. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Floor wet. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Philip Shaw, Johnny. Oh, fine. What have you got for me? Mr. Dale Martin is insured with National. He owns a gym, one of those bodybuilding places. Man was killed there. When did it happen? This morning, about an hour ago. Now, we don't know if it's an accident or not. The police are over there now. Anything to work on? Nothing. That's why I called you. Better get over there right away. I'll do it. But I don't take off my shirt. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. 
Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the blackmail matter. <laughs> Expense account item one, one dollar and forty cents. Cab fare and tip for ride from my office to Martin's Gym. After receiving what little information there was from you by phone, I arrived at 1215 at 1084 6th Avenue in the heart of downtown. On the second floor, I found Dale Martin, a very nervous Adonis, seated at a desk in his office. A policeman at the door informed me that a Lieutenant Nathan of the homicide detail had stepped out for a minute and the coroner was expected soon. Mr. Martin? Yeah? I'm Johnny Dollar from the National Insurance Company. Oh, that's the outfit I'm insured with. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm here. I want to get the facts in case there's any claim. Now, tell me, what happened? I don't know. I went back to the locker room to check on the towels, and I found him lying on the floor. Found who? Uh, his name's Royal, Frederick Royal. He's been coming up here for over a year. Well, why did you call the police and not a doctor? Because I think he was murdered. Why murdered? Well, I've seen a lot of accidents around this gym, but never saw anything like this. It, it wasn't an accident. What makes you so sure? Well, it looked like his neck was broken. I don't know how it happened, so I called the police. That a publicity's going to ruin what little business I have. Murder always ruins something. You got any idea who might have done it? No. Who was in the place when you discovered the body? My three assistants and three fellows working out. They all still here? Yeah, all of them. Nobody else left or came in? But just the cops, but business is real slow. Does everybody know about it? No, I took the body and put it back in the rub-down room. Haven't even told my boys. Well, the officer at the door won't let anybody leave, so let's have a look at the body and see what we can find out. Martin left one of his boys to answer the phone, and everyone else was keeping busy wrestling with weights as he led me through the locker room. The one man was taking a shower. At the end of the room, he unlocked the door, and we walked in. The smell of rubbing alcohol was strong enough to give you a hangover. There were white curtains separating two rubbing tables. The first one was empty. In back of that curtain, Mr. Dollar. Okay. Not very pretty. Mm -mm. Circus rubber man would need vulcanizing if he turned his head that far. Busted neck, all right. You wish the coroner would get in and take him away. It hurts me seeing his head hanging like that. Why don't you move him? Oh, no, sir, not me. I caught a good from the lieutenant for moving him in here. Well, don't worry about Mr. Royal. He can't feel a thing. <laughs> Lieutenant Nathan arrived with the coroner, and the latter confirmed our diagnosis. Nathan had Martin keep his clients and assistant muscle men busy. They started comparing biceps and forgot anybody else was there. Nathan was an old friend, so I didn't have to convince him that I was there on business. You saw the corpse, a dollar? Yeah, it took a pair of pretty strong hands to do a job like that. Yeah, that makes everybody around here a suspect. Got any ideas? Yeah, you'd have to know a man pretty well to let him get that close to you without starting something. Yeah, somebody could have been rubbing a kink out of his neck and got carried away with his work. Yeah. Why don't we start asking some questions? Yeah, I'll go out and round up everybody. Might as well start at the beginning. Nathan herded everyone together and the questioning started. The men were very unhappy. This bad publicity that couldn't be helped. Mr. Robert Wells, songwriter, Mr. Michael Darling, car salesman, and the third and last, Mr. Patrick Mullins, jeweler. (laughs) 
Three prosperous men, three prosperous denials. The assistants came next, the three men who worked for Martin. First, Bernie Carroll, the man who'd instructed Fred Royal, the one who'd put him through his exercises and sent him in to take a shower before he cooled off and got stiff. Sure. I worked him out and sent him in the shower like always. We tell him to take a good long hot shower to relax the muscles. Isn't that right, Dale? That's right, Lieutenant. That's the way it works. Bernie left him, went over to start on Mr. Wells. Bernie's a pretty strong boy. Yeah. Any one of us could have gone to the locker room at one time or another, Lieutenant. You found him, didn't you, Mr. Martin? Yeah. Why did you happen to go back to the locker room at that particular time? I do it every day, checking a towel, soap, see that everybody has everything you need. Question after question, trying to nail down alibis, trying to make them stick or tear them apart. According to everybody so far, it it was a big mystery. Next man, Jack Olson. Yeah, I went back by the locker room several times. Why? Well, there's an electric coffee maker on a table against the wall back there. I want to get some coffee. Mm-hmm. The other times? Well, once to look at the appointment board and see what's coming in, later to get some chalk for my hands. Chalk for your hands? Yeah. Keeps your hands from aspiring, making blisters, you know, when you're working with heavy weights. Mm. You're fairly new here, aren't you, Jack? Mm-hmm. Three weeks. How'd you know that, Dollar? Well, the other boys all have heavy calluses. They don't use chalk. You know quite a bit about this weightlifting stuff, huh? Oh, sure. I used to lift candy bars when I was a kid. All right, all right. Call in the last one. The last man, Johnny Morgan, and his story was no different than the others. Yes, he'd walked back past the locker room. No, he had not slipped in and popped Mr. Royal's neck while he was preparing to take his shower. The coroner removed the body, and all the rest went down to the precinct to sign formal statements. They were all released and sent home, pending further investigation. I hailed a cab and rode home with Dale Martin. Would you like some apple or carrot juice? Well, I'll try anything once. It's good for you. Yeah, I figured that. You didn't kill him, did you, Martin? Don't be silly. If it was the best customer I had, I wouldn't kill off, kill off my business. Here. Thanks. You have any ideas, Dollar? Nope. How long did you say Fred Royal had been coming to your gym? Over a year. What do you know about him? Not much. He was a wolf like the girls. Always talking about the gal he was out with the night before. I got tired of his gab. I put him straight. You know what business he was in? Whatever it was, he had a lot of money. Wore a new suit every time he came around. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, just a minute. For you, Dollar. Oh, thanks. Hello? I got something on the dead man. Got a record. Blackmail. You know where he lived? We're checking. Oh, wait a minute. Now, Martin, you wouldn't by any chance know where Fred Royal lived, would you? Well, I uh, bill to him every month. I got my books here in the apartment. I'll get the address. Oh, Nathan, Martin's got his address. I found something else in his personal effects. Key to a safety deposit box. Boys are checking to see which bank. Here's the Mm -hmm. address, Dollar. Fred Royal, 673 East Weeping Willow Circle. I told Nathan I'd meet him at Royal's place. I downed my liquefied carrots, said goodbye to Martin. Half an hour later, the lieutenant and yours truly, Johnny Dollar, were tearing Mr. Fred Royal's apartment to pieces. Ah, nothing. Hey, I came up empty, too. Hey. What's the matter? Here's a date book. Good. Maybe we've been working on a holiday. See, here's a name, Barbara Carroll. Carroll? That's the name of one of Martin's muscle trainers, Bernie Carroll. Mm, same name on some of the other pages. The fifth, Barbara, six o'clock. Again on the second, Barbara, eight o'clock. Again on the 28th and the 22nd. Wonder if there's any connection. Oh, it might be his sister. Let's give it a try. Bernie and Barbara Carroll. Sounds like something they'd play at the palace. Well, let's go see their act. <laughs> Here's the apartment. They live with that new fellow. Jack Olson. Yeah, yeah, the quiet one. Uh-huh. Police. Yes? I'm Lieutenant Nathan Homicide. This is Johnny Dollar. How you do? How you do? We'd like to talk to you, Miss Carroll. Well, certainly, Lieutenant. Come here. Thank you. I was just making some lemonade. Would you like some? Yeah, thanks. It is pretty hot out. 
Maybe you'd like something stronger. No, thanks. The lieutenant's on duty. I, uh, I guess you've heard about the accident. Like your lemonade sweet, Lieutenant? Medium, please. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Your brother didn't mention anything about your going out with Royal. He was probably protecting his little sister. The lieutenant found your name written in Royal's date book. I've been out with him six or seven times. You know what his business was? He never discussed it. Did you ever meet any of his friends? No. Did he ever mention any of the other fellows at the gym? At the gym? I don't think so. Uh-huh. Jack Olson lives here, doesn't he? That's right. Whose picture is that on the piano? Oh, that's Jack's father. You don't have any idea why anyone would want to kill Royal, do you? No. How did uh, Jack Olson happen to move in here with you and your brother? Bernie asked him to. When he went to work for Martin, he was living in a terrible place. One small room. I told Bernie he could move in here if he shared the rent. Mm -hmm. How well did Olson know Royal? He'd seen him at the gym. Seen him here when he came to pick me up. Mm. Where's Olson now? Working, I think. Well, thanks, Miss Carroll. We'll be talking to you again. More lemonade? Later, maybe, Miss Carroll. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Three in the afternoon. Out of Barbara Carroll's cool apartment and down in the blistering street. The thermometer crowding 90 and the humidity sticking to us like a steaming blanket. Ugh, I feel awful. Terrible day to solve a murder. I want to go look through some newspaper files. What for? That picture on the piano. Jack Olson's father? Yeah. I've seen it someplace before. It's a news story connected with it. Yeah, I'll drop you off. i got to get back to the precinct, see if the boys have found the safety deposit box that fits Fred Royal's key. Nathan dropped me off with a newspaper, and I went down to the morgue to do some hunting. The air conditioning made the job easier, and by four o'clock, I was headed for Nathan's office. We found the bank and the safe deposit box. Oh? Anything turn up? Yeah, yeah. Royal was doing some pretty fancy blackmailing. Here's a bundle of evidence and a list of names. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, I can understand why someone would pay to keep these out of circulation. Yeah. Lousy battalion. Huh? What'd you find out? Here. Mm, newspaper clipping. Oh, picture of Jack Olson's father. Same as the one on the piano. Prominent banker leaps to death. William Barrett. William Barrett? The boy's name is Olson. That's what he calls himself. William Barrett. Barrett. Give me that list we got out of the deposit box. i just been looking at it. William Barrett's name is on here, all right. Ooh. That article you've got on his suicide mentions that he left a son and a wife. Yeah. Well, let's go pick up Jack Olson or Barrett or whatever his name is. Well, it might not have meant a thing, but at least we had found one person who had a strong connection with Frederick Royal other than socially. The boy who called himself Jack Olson was the son of one William Barrett, deceased, and one of Fred Royal's blackmail victims. Barrett had jumped off a tall building, 
and according to the newspaper, he had left no reason for his actions. There was a possibility that Fred Royal's blackmail had driven him to it. And if that was so, his son would have had a very strong reason for wanting to break Mr. Fred Royal's neck. We climbed into a squad car and hurried back to Barbara Carroll's apartment, where Jack Olson lived as a boarder. Now let's go. Hey, wait a minute. Well, what's wrong? Jack Olson, coming out of the building. All right, we pick him up on the street. He's hailing a cab. Come on, let's see where he's going. Wouldn't it be easier to just ask him? Oh, stop trying to ruin my afternoon. You know, there's nothing more relaxing than a pleasant drive through quiet, peaceful old New England. We started tailing Jack Olson's cab. Across town. Along the Merrick Parkway. Across a bridge. He's headed for Long Island. Well, your Connecticut badge won't be much good over there. We kept going across the sound, past the outskirts of a couple of waterfront towns, and onto a long highway. Pretty expensive cab ride. Pretty expensive. Pretty important. Yeah. Well, they're turning off on that road. Hope we don't lose them. We took the road to the right off the highway and spotted the cab up ahead, pulling into the entrance of a large white building. The sign over the tall iron gate read, Lakeview Sanitarium. We waited for him to go in. Yes? Is there something I can do for you? I'm looking for a man. Oh, any particular man? Uh, who's in charge of this place? Uh, Dr. Fedder. Well, run him out, please. I want to talk to him. Which one of you is the patient? Patient? Can't you tell? Look, just go get Dr. Fodder. Fedder. Oh, Fedder, okay. Go get him and tell him Lieutenant Nathan wants to talk to him. Lieutenant Nathan? Uh, of the cavalry. Huh? Oh, well, I'll get him right away. <laughs> Lieutenant. Hey, <laughs> you think that's funny, huh? Oh, well, I liked it. Let's see what kind of a reaction it gets out of Dr. Fetter. Cavalry. Nice thing to say in a place like this. Uh, Lieutenant Nathan? Yeah, that's right. I'm Dr. Fetter. Oh, this is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? How do you do? Now, are you related? No, but we've been friends a long, long time, haven't we, Nate? Yeah, I'm a police officer, Doctor. Oh. We've been following a man. He came in here a few minutes ago. Is that right? The Lieutenant thinks he might be a killer. I is can he... handle this, Dollar. Huh? Doctor, I'm with Central Division Homicide. This isn't my territory, but I'd appreciate it. Uh, which one of you is the patient? Oh, now, now, look, this is getting a little ridiculous. Here are my credentials. Oh. The man we want came in here a few minutes ago. Well, Mr. Barrett is the only one... And his real name is Barrett. Who's he seeing? His mother. What's wrong with his mother? Mrs. Barrett is seriously ill. Have anything to do with her husband's suicide? Everything to do with it. I doubt if Mrs. Barrett will ever recover. We went back out to the car and tried to put it all together. Jack's father had jumped off a roof. He was being blackmailed and couldn't take it. The shock of his suicide had driven Mrs. Barrett into a permanent breakdown. And Fred Royal had been responsible for the whole thing. Motive enough for Jack to get a job with Dale Martin so he could get his hands on Fred Royal's neck... Cavalry. Oh, stop groaning. Tell me what you think of my theory. We still need a confession. We'll get it. Mind if I make a pest of myself and ask how? Let's ride back to town and see Dale Martin. You're going to come up and take a workout and a rub tomorrow, huh? That's right, Martin. And I want you to make sure that Olson takes care of me. Did he do it, Dollar? I think so. But why? He seems like such a nice kid. He had a pretty good reason. But we need a confession, and Dollar has an idea how to get it. I want Olsen working on me through the whole workout, especially when I get on the rubbing table. You're in pretty good shape, Mr. Dollar. Well, I'm carrying a few extra pounds. Oh, I will knock that off of you in a hurry. 
Don't try to talk while you're using the pulleys. Hi. Hi, Martin. He's in pretty good shape, Mr. Martin. Now, let's see. Uh, better not do too much on the stomach the first day. I'll see you later, Mr. Dollar. <sighs> nice fellow, Martin. Yeah, very nice. Tell me, have you uh, found out anything about Mr. Royal's death? Oh, the police have got a few ideas. <sighs> Lieutenant and I went up to see your roommate's sister. Yeah, Barbara told me. I hope you don't suspect her. She kind of liked Mr. Royal. She wouldn't have any reason to kill him. All right. Let's go back to the rub table before you cool off. You don't mind going in there, do you? No. Why should I? Oh, some people are funny about rooms where there has been a dead person, you know? It doesn't bother me, Mr. Dollar. Martin's got all his towels piled on the other table. I can move them if you like. Oh, no, no. It doesn't make any difference. Royal wasn't killed in here anyway. All right. Up on your back. Yeah. Give me a good brisk rub. Let me relax for about ten minutes. All right. Slide down a little. Yeah. Uh... What'd you do before you came to work for Martin, Jack? Oh, not much. Went to school, finally decided to look for a job. Found this one. You ever study this sort of thing? No. No, there's really not much to it. Martin shows us how to use the machines to help the clients and rub the neck and back. Well, then all you need is a good build, a strong pair of hands, huh? Yeah, yeah I guess so. Your family live in Hartford? No. I noticed the picture of your father on Barbara's piano. Fine-looking man. He's dead now. Oh, sorry. So am I. Your mother still living? No. Oh! Oh, I'm sorry. Am I rubbing too hard? No, no, it's okay. (laughs) Well, you certainly got the strength for the job. Yeah, I'll turn off the vibrator and just use my hand. The police find out anything about Mr. Royal? Yeah. He was a blackmailer. Oh! I'm awfully sorry. I'm a little nervous today. Maybe I'd better get one of the other fellows to finish a rub. Oh, no, no, no. That's all right. I'm just a little tied up. The neck is stiff. Try and relax. Guess I keep thinking about Royal and his broken neck. You think I might break yours, Mr. Dollar? <laughs> well... Wouldn't be hard. If I was good and relaxed, you could snap it in a second. Yeah. Guess I could. So Mr. Royal was a blackmailer, huh? Yeah. Had a record. They're the foulest people on earth. Yeah, they certainly are. They can ruin a lot of lives. Probably why he was murdered. You think he was blackmailing someone here in the gym? Oh, not necessarily. Well, if he wasn't, then no one in the shop would have a motive for killing him. Well, I've got a theory about that. I think someone in this gym hated him so much that they waited until no one was looking and Royal was all alone. And they slipped in on him and twisted his neck until it broke and he strangled. Why would they hate him so much if he wasn't blackmailing him? He might have been blackmailing someone very close and dear to the killer. Maybe the person Royal was blackmailing couldn't stand it. Committed suicide. It's an interesting theory. Take your family, for instance. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You weren't relaxing. Supposing Royal was blackmailing a member of your family. Your father, for instance. I can't rub your neck unless you relax more. Maybe your father couldn't take it. Maybe he couldn't pay him anymore. And instead of disgracing his family, he committed suicide. Just turn your head a little to the side, Mr. Dollar. That better? Much. If that happened to my family, Mr. Dollar, I guess I would kill Mr. Royal, not mind a bit. How does your father die, Jack? He jumped off a roof. Now, if you just turn your head a little more, I'll try to pop your vertebrae, huh? We followed you out to Long Island yesterday, Jack. I'm going to adjust your neck, Mr. Dollar. It's better if you relax so it won't hurt. Uh, Well, if you wanted to, you could pop it anyway. I couldn't stop you in time. No, I don't guess you could. Now, now the other side, huh? 
Did you kill Fred Royal? Yes. Relax. All right, Mr. Dollar. Let's go down to the police station. Lieutenant's outside with Martin. After you, Mr. Barrett. Nathan took Jack Barrett down to the station and got from him a signed confession. I went with Martin. And with every drink, I saw another Barrett. So, finally, I gave it up and came up here to my office. Expense account. Item two. Four dollars and fifty-three cents. One-fifth of very dry gin. Martin forgot his health and hygiene for a couple of hours and finished what I didn't drink. Item three, sixteen dollars seventy-five cents. Cab fare for a ride up through the country. All by myself. Expense account total, twenty-two dollars and sixty-eight cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment... Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were Edgar Barrier, Hi Averback, Hal March, Jim Nusser, Tony Barrett, and Virginia Gregg. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. New York Police Department calling. Mr. Dollar, will you accept the charges? Uh, yeah, put them on. Just a moment, please. Ready with your call to Hartford, Connecticut. Go ahead. Hello, Dollar? That's right. This is Sergeant Papish, robbery. I have a notation here. You're the one to contact in the case that came up. Allied Adjustment Bureau? Well, I've done a lot of work for him. What's it about, Sergeant? Well, we've recovered a mink coat you were looking for about six months ago. Oh? Yeah, stolen from a party named Jacoby in Rochester. The Jacobys are in Europe right now, but the furrier's already identified it as the one he sold to him. Jacoby? Rochester? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. It was insured for $5,000. There's some other things taken in the same hall. A watch, rings, bracelet. That's the job. So far, we just have the coat and the girl who was wearing it. What does she say? Nothing. 
So far, she's got a couple of bullet holes in her. Maybe I better get down there, Sergeant. Room 212, Sergeant Papish. Right. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Allied Adjustment Bureau, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Rochester theft matter. Expense account item one, one dollar and sixty-five cents. Person-to-person collect call from Sergeant Papish, New York Police Department. Item two, thirty-two dollars and fifty-six cents. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City after clearing authority to resume on the Jacoby case. It had been stalemated six months before when the Rochester police and I were unable to recover any part of the item stolen from the Jacoby residence. I arrived in New York at 1.35, dropped my bags off at the New Weston, then went directly to the Metropolitan Police Station. Uh... Hello, uh, I wonder if you could help me. I'm looking for Sergeant Papish. I'm Papish. Oh, Johnny Dollar, Sergeant. Oh. Thanks for coming down, Dollar. Have a chair. Oh, thanks. Your mink coat's in the crime lab. They're looking it over. Uh Uh-huh. We still haven't found out much about the girl who was wearing it. What's her name? Yeah, just Jane Doe for now. We didn't have her prints on file here, but we're waiting to hear from Washington now. She's been unconscious ever since we picked her up. Pretty bad shape. What exactly happened? I came in as a complaint about uh, three this morning. woman over on 57th Street telephoned about a disturbance. The prowl car went over to the address and found this girl lying in the entrance to the apartment house wearing the mink coat. She'd been shot twice. Uh Uh-huh. No one in the apartment house seemed to know her or had ever seen her before. We asked about the neighborhood. No dice. But we did find out how she got there. Oh, the lady across the street said she saw a man drive up sometime after midnight and unload the girl from his car. She uh, was able to give us a fair description of the car and the man. Yeah. Nice. But nothing definite. No license number or anything like that. Could be any car and any man from what she said. Got an APB out, of course. Was there a purse or anything? Nothing. The dress she was wearing came from a store downtown. Hundreds just like it. The coat was the only item that might have helped, and it turned up listed in the stolen property file. How about jewelry? Small diamond ring on her little finger. When I looked over the list of things taken in that Jacoby robbery, it doesn't fit any of those. You can look at it if you want to. I'll take your word for it. I suppose the insurance company paid off the claim. Yeah, the whole thing. Well, at least we have the coat back for you. Maybe we'll get a line on the other things when this girl regains consciousness. If she does. Pretty bad, is it? Yeah. Nice looking girl, too. Only about 25 or so. Excuse me. Sure. Robbery, Sergeant Pabish. Oh, let me get it down here. Two thirteen West. Right. Okay, see you there. Bye. Just got an answer from Washington. They able to identify the girl? Yeah, dress and all. She had a postal savings once. Name's Eileen Madden. You mind if I go with you? Yeah, come on. Maybe you'll get back all of your loot. Uh, 
I accompanied Sergeant Papish to the address for Eileen Madden. It turned out to be a fairly nice apartment in a fairly nice neighborhood. By the time we arrived there, a full crew of technicians were at work giving the place a complete check. Sergeant Papish introduced me to a tall, heavy set man. This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company, Walt. Sergeant Walter. All right. How are you, Sergeant? Oh, fine. I'm afraid we haven't done any good for you so far. Haven't found anything here to go with that mink coat. Oh. Have you talked to anybody around here yet? Just getting started on it. The lady who lives across the hall might be able to help us. Where is she? In there. Her name's Ethel Stromberg. Mrs. Okay. I'll take it here. All right. Uh, are you Mrs. Stromberg? Yes, I am. I'm Sergeant Papish. This is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? How do you do? How is poor Eileen? Not very good, Mrs. Stromberg. She's still unconscious. Oh, dear, that's terrible. Just a terrible thing. Where is she? I'd like to go to see her if it's possible. She's at the police emergency hospital right now, Mrs. Stromberg. I'll have them phone you when she can see people. Well, thank you. What an awful thing. How did that happen? What's that all about? Now, maybe you can tell us something about her, Mrs. Stromberg. Where she worked, how she lived, what people she knew. Oh, dear. How long have you known her? Well, I moved in here about five months ago. I met her the very first day. Mm-hmm. Nice girl? Oh, yes, very nice, very nice girl. Quiet, she minded her own business. Do you know where we can contact her family? No, I can't help you there, Sergeant. I... I know they live somewhere in California, but that's about all. She talks about them now and then. How about her friends here in town? What about them? Did she talk about any of her friends to you? What do you mean? Well, she's a pretty girl, young, boyfriends maybe. Yes, she did talk about them now and then. Do you suppose one of them had something to Mrs. do? Mrs. Stromberg, Eileen Madden was dumped from a convertible last night after she'd been shot. A witness described the car as possibly blue or black in color, white top, white sidewalls. She said it was a late model Cadillac or Buick. Do you know if any of Miss Madden's friends drove a car that comes near that description at all? Why, yes. Yes, I saw him pick her up one night. I was just coming home. Uh, Saw who pick her up, Mrs. Stromberg? A man she called Bill. Bill who? I really don't know his last name. She didn't introduce me to him. But she talks about him. He drove a black Cadillac. Can you tell us what he looks like? Well, he seemed very tall. As tall as Sergeant Papish here? So about your height, very nice looking. He seemed quite big. Husky, sort of. Very nicely dressed, too. What color was his hair? I don't know. He always wore a hat. I, I think it was dark, though. His eyes? I don't know. About uh, how old, would you say? Oh, I'm no good at this, but uh, I say between 30 and 35. Mm, seems to fit what we have from the witness. Yeah. Uh, this bill, would you say he had money? Oh, yes, I would say so. He drove that nice big convertible. He always dressed so nice. And he gave Eileen pretty nice things. Do you know if he ever gave her any jewelry? I don't know. I don't think so. Eileen would usually run across the hall and show me when he sent her something nice. I don't remember her ever showing me any jewelry. I just talked to the hospital. How is she? Just coming around. I think you'd better go over there and talk to her if you're gonna. Is she bad? They think she's dying, Mrs. Stromberg. Think she'll make it? Uh, hard to say right now. Sometimes they rally. She must have been in that doorway a half hour or better before we got to her. Mm-hmm. She said anything, Doctor? No. You, know, you might have to wait a little while for her to come around. I see. I'll tell you both. Ask what you have to know quick. Two minutes is about all I can give you with it. Sure, Doctor. Oh, you better put your cigarettes in that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, Miss... Okay, boys. Is she conscious? Yeah, she can hear you. Are you Eileen Madden? Is Eileen Madden your name? Yes. Yes. You're seriously hurt, Miss Madden. Can you tell us how it happened? 
Miss Madden? No. Bill shot you? Yes. What's Bill's name? Where can we find him? I... 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 Doctor, watch it. Nurse, hand me that. Sorry, fellas. There was nothing I could do. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> With our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Eileen Madden died at 3.35 in the afternoon without giving us the full name of the man who shot her the night before. I stayed with Sergeant Papish and Sergeant Walters as they continued their investigation of her death and the appearance of the mink coat covered in policy number 27M55567, issued to Roland J. Jacoby, Rochester, New York. The apartment where she had lived yielded some information. Here it is. Letters from Robert J. Madden in Riverside, California. Looks like her father. Okay, we'd better notify him. This might be the best lead. What's that? This picture. Found in one of her closets. Let's see. Hmm. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Love, Bill. He loved her all right. Yeah. Anybody identified this yet? That Mrs. Stromberg's supposed to be here right now. What time you got? Oh, half past. She said she'd be here at six. Anything on the bullets? They didn't check with anything in our lab. Ballistic says it was an Army 45. The old 1911 model. Pretty good gun for killing. What gun is it? Oh, I got the wrong room at first. Oh, come in, Mrs. Stromberg. You remember Sergeant Papish and Mr. Dollar? Yes. Do I have to answer more questions? Not many more. Oh, I'm just all worn out. I can't get over this terrible thing happening to Eileen. Did you get in touch with her family? Business office is doing it right now. Oh, dear, what a terrible, terrible thing. Mrs. Stromberg, have you ever seen this man before? Oh, yes, that's Bill. The man Eileen's been going with? Yes. The man who drives the black Cadillac convertible? Yes, that's him. But did he do this terrible thing? It looks that way, Mrs. Stromberg. Oh, dear, dear. <coughs> Sergeant Pavish. Yeah. Yeah, right. Goodbye. Did Eileen Madden ever mention to you that she had been married? Why, no. She never did. Was she? In the state of New York in 1951. Just found out from vitals. Divorced? Yeah. Her ex-husband's name is Bill. Bill Powers. <laughs> Sergeant Papish, this is Mr. Dollar. Uh, how do you do? What's the matter? May we come inside, Mr. Powers? Sure. Well, what's this all about? 
Do you know a woman named Eileen Madden, Mr. Powers? Yeah, sure. We were married once. Why? Eileen Madden was shot to death last night, Mr. Powers. Eileen? Yes. What? Are you sure? I... We checked her prints. Oh. oh. Shot? Yes. Who? Oh, what happened? I... Well, how, how could a thing like that happen? That's what we're trying to find out, Mr. Powers. I, I can't believe it. I mean, dead. Have you seen her lately? Well, yeah, I, I saw her last week. Had a drink together. Are you sure it's Eileen? We'd make sure before we came around to news like this. Uh, Mr. Dollar represents an insurance company, Mr. Powers. Miss Madden was wearing a stolen coat when we found her. Stolen coat? Yes, a stolen mink coat. Was uh, she ever in trouble anywhere? I don't care what she was wearing. I didn't never steal anything. She was a fine girl, a wonderful girl. I was a fool to ever let our marriage go on the rocks. Can you come with us, Mr. Powers? Where? We need a positive identification. Sure. Sure, Sergeant. I'll be right with you. Want to smoke? Thanks. Well, he isn't the bird in the picture. No. Did you see the car in the driveway? Yeah. 51 Caddy black convertible. On the way to the city morgue with the ex-husband of Eileen Madden, we tried to get more information from him regarding her activities up till the time of her death. Power seemed so distraught that he could only speak of their short marriage and the reason it had ended. It was an old and especially sad story of a man who couldn't provide well enough for a beautiful wife. However, once he'd seen her body at the morgue and identified it, he seemed to get better control of himself. We all walked across the street for coffee. I hope you get whoever did this, Sergeant. I hope you get him fast. We sure want to, Mr. Powers. Why would anybody do that to Eileen? Why? Maybe you can help us answer that. Oh, you're just interested in that coat you say she was wearing. Well, mister, I don't believe she was wearing a stolen coat. What do you think of that? I'm just looking for the facts, Mr. Powers. I'd like to prove what you just said as badly as you'd like to have it proved. But we have to start somewhere. You can understand that. I, I suppose so. You told us you saw her last week for a drink. That's right. Have you been seeing her right along? Yeah, sure. Did you know that she's been going with somebody else? Sure. And uh, you know Bill? Bill Chambers? Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know him, but she talked about him a lot. Is uh, this Bill Chambers, Mr. Powers? Yeah. Yeah, that's him. I thought you knew You're that. sure this is him? I'm sure. This picture was in her place. I went there one day and saw it and asked her who he was. I mean, told me all about him. What did she tell you about him? Why, she said she was going with him. She she told me that he wanted to marry her. Said he had lots of money. Did she tell you where he works? No. Or what kind of work he does? No. You know where we can get in touch with him? No, I don't know that either. I say... Do you think he might have done this to her? We'd like to talk to him. I, I know she's been going with him for a few months, what she told me. And you've been seeing her the same time she was seeing Chambers? Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. She didn't want to marry him. She wanted to marry me again. Do you know what kind of a car Chambers drives? Cadillac. Thought you never met him. Well, she told me about his car. <laughs> it's another thing. I went out and bought one myself. I thought it might do me some good with her. Mm-hmm. Were you at home last night? Yeah. Can you prove it? Yeah. <laughs> I was home. She was out getting killed. The name William Chambers was checked through the New York police files. They listed 24 persons who more or less fit his general description. It took two days to locate and talk with all of them. Neither Mrs. Stromberg 
Now, the witness who had seen the body dumped from the car could identify any of them. An all-points bulletin regarding the suspect and his car had been issued as soon as we'd learned his name. Same results. Nothing. On the third day, the pawn shop detail turned up two more items that had been taken in the Jacoby robbery. There they are. Huh. Watch and ring. Jacoby stuff? Case numbers on the watch checkout. The ring's engraved. Where'd they wind up? Shop on 3rd Street. The proprietor says it was sold yesterday. Man who sold them signed the buy book James Agenian. How about his description? Fifth chamber's down the line. Well, at least he was still in town yesterday. Yeah, but his stuff's been on the hot sheet for a long time. If he's had any experience at all, he knew he was taking a chance trying to unload it. Probably trying to raise cash to get out of town. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> Gave him an address on Polk Street. A vacant lot. If he keeps on trying to unload it, I'll have all the loot back. If he keeps on trying, we'll keep on trying. Well, they found his car. Where? Used car lot in the Bronx. He sold it at 10 o'clock this morning. At the used car lot, we learned that a man answering the description of William Chambers had driven in that morning and offered a black 51 Cadillac convertible for sale. The used car lot manager had finally settled on a price and made out a check. He reported that the man had seemed extremely nervous and anxious to make a quick deal. The car was impounded and examined. A full set of fingerprints on the steering wheel and dashboard gave us a positive identification of William Chambers. William Carlson, alias William Carls, William Charles, Walter Cameron, male, Caucasian, age 33, 178, 61... Let's see, 14 arrests, two convictions, both car theft. Quite a lad. Aren't they all? (laughs) Doesn't look like a killer, though, does he? I don't know. What's a killer supposed to look like? The search to locate William Carlson, alias William Chambers, extended to all parts of the city. The associates and relatives listed in his criminal file were contacted and questioned. All of them denied having any knowledge of his whereabouts. In the meantime, two more pieces of stolen property connected with the Jacoby theft were recovered by the pawn shop detail. Each of the pawn shop proprietors identified the mugshot of the wanted man. He'd used different names in each instance. The handwriting was the same. Each address had to be checked out. I went with Sergeant Papish to the one he had given on 78th Street. It was not a vacant lot. Hello? Hello. We're looking for William Courtney. You found him? Huh? Cops? Yeah. Come on in. Hold still. I'm clean. Checked me through the buy book yesterday? Yeah. Your name's Carlson, isn't it? William Carlson? Yep. We've been looking a long time for you. I know. Yesterday, I decided I'd let you find me. I get my right address. You want to get your hat? Sure. Look, I didn't mean to kill Eileen. I I didn't mean to at all. I want you to know that. We'll talk about it downtown. No, no, we won't. I'm not talking to anybody downtown. I'm talking to you two right now, and that's it. So you better listen. Okay. I've been doing pretty good with these house jobs. Real good. Enough to buy myself a nice car, get some clothes, get around a little bit. I work all alone. I met her. I liked her. I wanted to marry her. I did. I, re- I really did. We went out the other night, and I gave her the mink coat for a present. I thought that it sent you. She didn't want to take it. She told me she was going to marry some guy she'd been married to before. I, I let her have it. That's all? That's all. That's it, mister. I could have run. Sold my car. Been getting rid of a lot of odds and ends I have around. I decided not to, after all. I don't want to run. Okay, let's get with it. I remember, I let you get me. I wrote my address right down where I knew you'd check it out. Okay. And there's no more talking. You two got it all straight. What's the matter with you, anyway? You got it all? I mean, about everything? I... Yeah, I've got it. Okay. Hey, wait a minute. You yeah. guys are too late. I... I took it when I heard you knock on the door. Where's the phone? It's too late, I tell you. It's in my stomach now. It's 
Too late. Not for me, brother. I handle plenty of babies, just like you. Not too late. Grab him, Miff. Yeah, I got it. Go. Look out. Ah, shut up. You're going to stand trial, baby. Sergeant Papish had handled attempted suicides. A lot of them. And in the five minutes before the arrival of the emergency ambulance, he managed to force William Carlson to take an antidote that saved his life. the Jacoby theft items were found in and around the apartment of the suspect, along with other stolen property listed with the New York police. All of the articles on the enclosed list have been impounded and will be available following the trial of William Carlson. Expense account item three, hotel and board while in New York, $88.65. Item four, same as item two, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $155.42. Remarks? Please file a copy of the above report for the information of William Powers in regard to his ex-wife, Eileen Madden. I think this is what he wanted. Well, that's it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment, Plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, John McIntyre, Jim Nusser, Jeanette Nolan, Victor Perrin, and Bill Johnstone. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Why let your floors get scuffed up? Beacon Wax stops floor scuffing. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Frank Preston, Baltimore Liability. Oh, hi, Frank. How's it going? Okay, I guess, Johnny. Say, are uh, you tied up? No, not at the moment. What is it? A bad check out. It's out on the West Coast. It's been giving us a lot of headaches lately. Uh huh. Hotel in Monterey, another one in Santa Cruz, and this morning I had a wire from one of our clients who runs a place in Santa Barbara. $4,500 worth of claims already, and all in five days. Sounds like a very busy man. Uh, that's something else. It isn't a man, it's a woman. A woman? And you've got to stop it, Johnny. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Baltimore Liability and Trust Corporation, 418 Virginia Boulevard, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Emily Braddock matter. Expense account item one, $158.16. Plain fare and incidentals, Hartford to Santa Barbara. My mid-morning arrival was timed for the sun and the sea to show off a sizable and pleasantly crowded harbor, some sprawling hotels, two lush green golf courses, and acres and acres of snug, expensive homes. At the police station, my contact, a Sergeant Lopez, was out, so I went over to the Harbor Inn and met the victimized hotel operator, Glenn Sheridan. Tall, gray-haired, slacks, sports shirt, suntan, and sandals. <laughs> On the face of it, you'd think I'd been in the hotel business 20 minutes instead of 20 years, the way that woman took me. Well, she's done the same thing in several other nice hotels up and down the coast, if that's any comfort. Well, it isn't. I suppose the thing that bothers me most is that if she walked through that door right now and told me none of it was true, I'd probably believe her. She was that good. Mr. Dollar, she was the best. Why, she pranced in here as big as life, and I, she probably didn't have a nickel in her purse. What's more, for the whole four days she was here, she didn't break her stride once. What do you mean? Well, only the best of everything. Oh. She gave you a check for $813, is that right? Uh, painfully right. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And I took it, no questions. <laughs> Every night in the dining room, she'd order champagne, special dishes. I've seen my share of grifters and bad check artists, but she tops them all. Perfume, clothes, luggage, conversation... And a very pretty woman, Dollar. Beautiful, in fact. She checked in alone, registered as Mrs. Robert Payne Beverly Hills, right? Mm-hmm. Did it strike you as odd that a woman would check into a place like this, a resort hotel, alone? No, she wasn't alone long. She met other people. Became friends with at least a half a dozen guests in the place. Uh-huh. The way she was throwing my money around, why not? She picked up all the tabs. Well, ordinarily, I'd have been suspicious under those circumstances, Mr. Dollar, but she threw me off right from the very start. Well, how's that, Mr. Sheridan? Well, she showed up about midnight, came in a cab that was just loaded down with expensive luggage. Probably wrote a bad check for that someplace. Yeah, probably. She came swinging in the lobby with a cabbie following her and told the night clerk she wanted to see me. When I came down to the desk, she yelled, Sherry! Ran up and kissed me and asked how my wife was. Can you beat that? Nope. She acted as though we knew each other. And one of those tricks your mind plays on you in this business, I actually thought I remembered her from someplace. I see. She registered as Mrs. Robert Payne. Said she was on her way back from Lake Tahoe, wanted to rest up. Something about just getting a divorce and being awarded 3000 a month alimony. That impressed me. Well, it didn't impress anyone, Mr. Sheridan. Well, I did make a check. She gave her home address as Beverly Hills, and there was a Robert Payne listed there. Later on, I found out he's in Europe with his wife and children. But his name was in the book. Yeah, and that was enough for me. Oh, she had a wonderful four days here, I'll say that for her. Getting back to that part about her looking familiar. Well, there's nothing in that, Dollar. I did think I had seen her before, and of course she helped me think it, but I was too embarrassed to press the matter with her, I guess. Do you have a copy of her hotel account? I'd like to look it over. Yeah. The police have the check she gave me. It was drawn on a bank in Beverly Hills. Was it uh, personalized? No. Maybe I should have thought something of that, huh? Uh -huh. Well, here's this much. I can't stand to look it over. It makes me kind of sick. $813. 
I spent another hour with Mr. Sheridan as he distastefully covered the items on the bill she'd paid with a bad check. Later that afternoon, I met with Sergeant Lopez, who reported a woman answering the same description had passed bad checks in Burlingame, Santa Maria, and Ojai. Expense account item two, $114.85. Transportation to Monterey and Santa Cruz, where I interviewed the other two clients who had filed claims. Their stories were much the same as Sheridan's. Expense account item three, $4.15. Long-distance phone call. That you, Johnny? Yeah, Frank. All the claims are pretty solid. The police have no line on this... Don't come home. Oh? Hop down to Malibu Beach. She's done it again. At a place called the Seaside Inn. The guy who runs it found out it was bad 15 minutes after she left. That was this morning. I don't expect any miracles, but if you get down there right away, maybe you can get on her trail. Well, I'll try. Expense account item four, $38 even. Transportation Santa Barbara to Malibu. I didn't even bother to listen to a disgruntled hotel proprietor repeat a story I knew so well, but went directly to the sheriff's station and Sergeant Pell's. Well, that's about the picture. She was at the inn for four days and checked out this morning. She used the name Bradley, Ellen Bradley. She can't be too far ahead of you now. No. There might be a break on this one, too. While she was at the inn, she took up with one of our local residents, a man by the name of Garland. Lives over in the colony. He drove her into town this morning. Have you talked to him? I can't find him anywhere. He has a house over in the colony. The colony? Yeah, uh, that's uh, down the road a piece. They call it that because a lot of movie stars built beach homes there a long time ago. Movie colony, you know? Oh, yeah. Is this Garland an actor? <laughs> yeah, when he gets work, which isn't very often, I guess. Mainly, he keeps suntanned. We're trying to locate him now, and as soon as we do it. Oh, excuse me. Sure. Sergeant Pell. Yeah, right away. Garland's home now. I went with Sergeant Pells to talk with Garland, who was in trunks and sunglasses in front of his house. A healthy, muscular, handsome man in his mid-thirties. He was a little stunned by the news we brought him. Ellen, a phony? Sergeant, are you sure about this? Well, you can ask the man at the seaside inn. He got the check. And Mr. Dollar here has been looking all over the state for it. Uh Well, come on, let's go up into the house. All right. I thought I knew her pretty well. Did you meet her out here or did you know her before? Oh, I met her at the seaside inn the first night she was here. Go ahead. Thank you. Now, sit down. Like something to drink? Uh, No, thank you. Not now, thanks. Understand you drove her into Los Angeles. That's right, I took her in this morning. Where did you take her? Beverly Glen Hotel. Did she check in there? No, she just dumped all her luggage. She told me she didn't know whether or not she'd have to go to Chicago tonight. Something about a house she owned there that had to be rented or sold. Did you leave her there? No, she made a phone call. Said she had to meet a lawyer. Yeah? She say where? Yeah, a bar in Hollywood. uh, Topper on Coinga. So I drove her over there and left her. When was this? Oh, three hours ago. About one o'clock, I guess. Uh, How was she dressed? Oh... Black strapless job. Uh Uh-huh. Did she mention any names? Tell you anything about herself? Yeah, she told me that six months ago, a little two-year-old boy was killed in an automobile accident. She said that was the thing that broke up a marriage to this Bradley guy. Uh Uh-huh. Said she needed to believe in something again, that she needed someone to believe in her. Well, I figured her for a pretty nice person, just having a little fling. Even with what you've told me, I believe that part of it. Why? Because she told me, and she cried a little when she was telling me. Oh, I don't care how you look at me. I, I don't think anyone could invent a story that tragic without some sort of basis. Well, maybe you've got a point, Garland, but a good liar can see a story in a newspaper, adapt it to his own needs, and uh, maybe even cry a little about it. Well, I still believe it. You know, Mr. Dollar, you ought to try believing what people tell you sometime. Yeah, I'll try it. Next time I have two weeks off. What? In my business, they call that a vacation. Well, what'll it be, gents? Police. 
Uh-huh. I'd like to talk to the man who was on duty here at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Oh, that's me, Sergeant. My name's Lenny uh, Pollard. Anything wrong? No, just routine. Well, can I get you something? No, to... thank you. We're trying to locate a woman who's been using the name Ellen Bradley. We were told she was in here around 1 o'clock today. Oh, uh, I don't recognize that name. About 5'5", five, five, dark brown hair, brown eyes. Wore a black strapless summer dress when last seen. 30 or under. Uh-huh. No, no one like that. One o'clock's a pretty quiet time. In fact, all afternoon's been quiet. No woman like that's been in here at all. You've been here all the time? Yeah, on duty since 11 o'clock. That's when we open. Uh, you sure this is the right place, the top of it? Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry. Wish I could help you. When we got to the Beverly Glen Hotel, a worried clerk was still wondering what to do with the 14 pieces of luggage Ellen Bradley had left there earlier. No, she hadn't phoned in and given him any instructions. No, she was not registered at the hotel. Sergeant Pels made arrangements for a man to cover the lobby in case she showed up to claim her things. By 8 the next morning, the Central Identification Bureau in Sacramento made a positive identification on a thumbprint taken from her room at the Seaside Hotel. She was identified as Emily Miles Braddock. Her nearest living relative was a sister, Elaine. Address 112 East Orange Avenue, Los Angeles. You! You down there? Yes. Who are you looking for? Elaine Braddock. Are you Miss Braddock? What do you want? I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Well, I don't want to buy nothing. I'm not selling anything. I'm an insurance investigator. You sure you got the right party? Elaine Braddock? Come on up, mister. Just open the door and come on up. Come on in. Come on in. Want to see me? Here I am. What do you want to see me about? The gray-haired woman who had cackled at me from the second story was sitting in a wheelchair by the window. My name's Johnny Dollar. I'm here about your sister. Oh, Emily, huh? Yes, we're trying to find her. Has she been around here? We know she's in the Los Angeles area. Emily was here a little bit yesterday afternoon. Where she's gone now, I don't know. Have no idea. How long was she here? Oh, she stayed maybe two or three hours. I hope I don't ever see her again. She's no good. Well, how did she get here? By car? Cab? I don't know. Just standing at the door yesterday, the same as you, all of a sudden. Well, how did she leave? Walked. Tried to borrow some money from me, but I wouldn't give her none, so she had to walk. Did she make any phone calls or see anybody else while she was here? She made a call. Any idea who it was? No. Did you happen to hear anything she said on the phone? No. Showing up here just like that after not writing or letting me hear from her all the time she was away. Getting herself in trouble with the police. Being in jail. Ten years ago when I got hurt, she promised she'd take care of me. Look how she's done it. I have to live on the county. You know that? I got to live on the county and nobody cares about me. Is she, is she in bad trouble? I'm afraid so. Well, how bad is it, mister? Oh, ten years, maybe. Ten years? Ten years? Yeah, two was bad enough, but ten. What'd you say your name was? Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I hope you don't catch her. Even if she kills someone, I hope you don't catch her. And I hate her. You're only young a little while, and that's all you got. Ten years in prison, and she'd... She'd come out worse off than I am. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. 
The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime. And the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. That afternoon, a follow-up came on Emily Miles Braddock. The completed folder included a mug shot that showed a woman of 30 years with dark brown hair, wide-set eyes, a well-formed nose and mouth. I took it with me when I went back to see Tom Garland. Oh, hi. Hi. Mind if I come in? Oh, what now? Your friend. Oh, what about her? I've been thinking about what you told me about her yesterday. That's nice. Here. Take a look at this. That's her, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's her. Can we talk now? Okay, come on in. Her name's Emily Braddock, not Ellen Bradley. Up until two months ago, she was in the state correction home for women, serving a two-year term for grand theft. Here, take your picture back. I'm not pushing my weight showing it to you, Garland. But you're a little stubborn about what you want to believe about her. If she lost a baby, as she told you, she was in prison when it happened. I thought I'd better prove this lie. All right, so you proved it. You mind if I sit down? No, help yourself. Thanks. Well, do you have anything else to tell me? Well, I suppose I do, since you don't want to seem to... You don't seem to want to tell me anything. I've been on this case almost a week now. In that time, I've talked to eight different men who have met Emily Braddock... And one woman who knew her by her real name and for what she really is. Garland, every one of those people came out on the short end of things with her. Now, just a minute, Dollar. I've looked at I this don't... mug shot. I've heard these men describe her, and I think I can understand why. It's not hard to imagine this face set off with a nice hairdo, some earrings, makeup, and the works. This sister of hers I met this morning lives in a very crummy neighborhood. A family home. She's all Emily has left. Or vice versa. Emily walked out on her. Well, if it's as bad as you say it is, why shouldn't she? For one reason, her sister's a hopeless cripple. But even she would protect Emily. You're my only hope. What? This woman can get away from us right now. She's smart and clever. She can go right on doing the same thing she's been doing all along. Oh, she'll get caught eventually. But, but because I know her and she passed a few bad checks doesn't mean that I'm responsible in any way. You know that. You're right, it doesn't. But you're involved just the same. You're different from a hotel man who's been tilted. You're a boyfriend. True, just a four-day boyfriend. But a woman like that can do a lot of damage in four days' time. Why are you here, Dollar? What do you want? I'm here to disillusion you, Garland. Because I don't think you're disillusioned enough right now. Now, wait a minute. I you're don't... You're a perfect stranger that... to me. I don't know you from a Grand Rapids chair. But I'm doing you a favor telling you that Emily Braddock is a crook and a thief and a forger... And that everything she ever told you was a lie. Now and then a woman walks into a man's life that he'd sell his soul for. But don't ever do any business along those lines with this baby, because all she'll do is give you a bad check for it. She's trouble in a great big way, Garland. And you know it as well as I do. Well, what do you want me to do? Apologize for meeting her? I'll be satisfied if you tell me why you lied. Garland, Emily Braddock never went to that bar you were talking about earlier. You didn't drop her off there. No one there had even seen her. And she's the kind who could walk into the World Series with 50,000 other people around and still be noticed. Where is she now? I don't know. I won't buy that. Not from you. Now, let's try once more. Where is she? What did you do with her after you dropped the luggage off at the Beverly Glen Hotel? Where did you take her? She phoned you from her sister's house yesterday afternoon, didn't she? Right after I'd been here with Sergeant Pelz. Garland... You should see that sister. Ellen's but... in Santa Monica. Where? 
At a little hotel called El Tonquis. She's registered there as Evelyn Brady. Where's your phone? It's over there. Operator. Sheriff's office, please. Thank you. A dollar? Yeah. A dollar could it be fixed so that she wouldn't know that I told you? Could be. All of this beats me. I, I don't understand it. What? Oh, what you've told me is true, I know, but... An hour ago, she called me up and said, Tom, I love you. That sounded true, too. I, I told her I loved her, and now I'm turning her in. What kind of a crazy world do we live in? Twenty minutes later, Sergeant Pels and I were in the rickety elevator in the El Tanquis Hotel. A place as dingy and old as the Spanish name it bore. A little different from the swank hotels where our suspect had lived so gaily. Pels was thinking of it, too. Yeah. Some joint this is. Yeah. What was it, 518? Yeah, it's down this way, I think. This one kind of harpoons you a little, huh? Hmm. Yeah, I suppose so. There are a lot worse things than passing bad checks and telling lies. But the way she handled it, no one even raised an eyebrow. Yeah. Yeah, I hear this. Yes? Emily Braddock. Beg your pardon? I said, is your name Emily Braddock? You must have the wrong room. My name's Evelyn Brady. Sorry, miss. You're the one we want. I'll have to change into a dress. I'll check the room. Excuse me. What's this all about? I think you already know. I have no idea. What is it all about? Bad checks. There must be some mistake. All right, miss. Go ahead and change. We'll wait out here. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. We'll have to keep this open a little bit. Oh? You can dress behind it if you want. If that doesn't suit you, well, we'll take you down like you are. Thanks again. Two windows on the outside, no ledge. Firelighters across the court. Any luggage? A little makeup kit. Dollar? Yeah? Now that you've seen her, what do you think? Well, I'm only human. Too bad she's a crook. Emily Braddock was held at the sheriff's office in Malibu. The officers who questioned her reported that she steadfastly refused to admit any part of some 16 counts that had been filed against her. I wasn't surprised to learn this, but I was surprised when she sent word that she'd like to see me before I left town. Hi. Here you're about ready to beat it. Uh Uh-huh. You're the one who talked to him, aren't you? Talked to who? Tommy Garland. He told you where I was, didn't he? Sure, he did. I thought you wanted to tell me something. You thought wrong. The same as all these others around here. I'm not going to tell you or anybody else anything. Police are like hotel men. You figure out their little system and then you beat it. If you say so. I don't have a lot of time. We could be pretty good friends, you and I, if this hadn't come up. I mean, a drink or something together. We'd have looked nice. Oh, look, Emily. You're the one who got him to tell where I was. And he asked you to fix it so I wouldn't know. Oh, yeah, Tommy would do that, I know. What I don't know is what you said to him. How did you get him to tell? Is that all you're interested in? It's not asking anything. Well, I told him just what you are. A thief. A crook. That sold him? Well, he told me where to find you. I guess it did. (laughs) I must be slipping. He slept a long time ago. When you walked out on that sister of yours, when you thought you could talk and look your way into anything you wanted. I didn't know I thought that, but if you say so, whatever I've got, it's worked. Has it? Two years, the last time. Whatever you get this time will be longer, no matter what you say or don't say. I'm not in a courtroom yet. That's where it happens. Not in a lousy jail. We'll see about that. You're just as bad and just as dumb as the worst of them. Any day you believe that. 
Mm, like it says in the manual. When a woman suspect is to be interrogated, remember that the strongest appeal to her is in her family connections and moral outlook. Question her regarding these. Stinking cops. Just stinking cops. You never give up, do you? Hardly ever. Stinking cop. <laughs> Emily Braddock goes to trial next month. I won't be there, but six clients of Baltimore liability will be. <music> Expense account item five. Miscellaneous, $265. Item six, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total... $738.32. Remarks. The next time I go after a check artist, I hope it isn't a good-looking woman who feels that there's no one in the world she can't dominate. This last one scared me, even if she was behind bars. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment... Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar... Brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were James McCallion, John McIntyre, Bill Conrad, Stacey Harris, Jeanette Nolan, and Joan Banks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Shelley Thomas in Federal. Well, you're up early today. I've already been at my desk for two hours. How'd you like to work on one for me? What's it about? In cold, hard claim cash, it comes to exactly $12,482.16. That's interesting. What does it mean? Somebody's been filching a lot of merchandise over in Toledo, and it's beginning to hurt. Could you get over there and have a look around? Sure. But it sounds like a police job to me. Well, I don't expect any miracles, Johnny. I just want a good factual report on the whole business for my clients. See you in an hour. John Lund in the transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Federal Insurance and Claims Adjusters, 2044 Appalachian Drive, Hartford, Connecticut. 
The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Costain matter. Expense account item one, $49.15. Plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Toledo. En route, I read over the details concerning the case. 37 stolen merchandise claims had been filed and paid off in what looked like a first-class shoplifting epidemic in Toledo. I parked my two bags at the Commodore Perry Hotel and went over to the main police station. A Lieutenant Sturgis was in charge. Sit down, sit down. Thanks. Federal insurance and claims adjusters, huh? That's right. You're here to find out what we've been doing about all this shoplifting, is that it? Well, we represent the insurance companies who've had to pay off on these theft claims. Yeah, sure, I see. Well, uh, where do you want to start? Well, let me see. How about this mommy dress shop, Lieutenant? Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, let's see. Uh, February 10th. Proprietor, Mrs. Bancroft, registered a complaint with us that a dress and a coat were missing from the Storax. She's... Yeah. Well, we went over there and talked to her about it, made out the report as another shoplifting job, and put a description of the coat and the dress in the hot sheet. Mm-hmm. Dress wholesaled at $113. Coat had a fur trim. Went at $395. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Looked a little better than most shoplifting jobs to us. We had it in mind when we got another complaint three days later from a place over on Oak Avenue. That'd be, uh, Milady's Shoppy? Yeah. Uh, Negligee and a silk robe. Yeah, we covered that one, too. Both of them came to $286. Yeah, same thing as a mommy. Clerks hadn't seen anyone, didn't know anything. The week of the 15th, we had two more complaints. On the 23rd, three complaints. They've been coming in regular ever since. I think the last one was three days ago. Always the best stores, always expensive merchandise. We rounded up every known shoplifter in our files, and we've had our store personnel at all of our lineups. No one's been able to make an identification so far. First, we thought it was a plain, expert shoplifting done by a well-organized gang. Looks that way. Not so much anymore. Did you notice on your list there that all of these items are for a woman? Yeah. Uh, dresses, coats, blouses, cosmetics, millinery, costume jewelry, and so on. Now, what we didn't pick up until about a month ago is that all of the articles of clothing that have been taken are for a woman who wears a size 10 dress. Hmm. That is a funny one. Yeah, and it rules out a gang right away. There's pattern to it, but... I'm going to have someone else tell you about that. Yes, Lieutenant? Let's see if Sergeant Beidler's in. Right. 99 times out of 100, a shoplifter will take anything he or she can get her hands on, regardless of cost, size, color, or anything else. So we don't think this is the work of an old-timer, either. You mean somebody's just gathering up a nice wardrobe at my insurance company's expense? Something like that. If any of these stolen articles have been sold or disposed of, we'd have a lead by now. The stuff has been on the hot sheet for months. We've covered pawn shops, secondhand store. Yes? Sergeant Bidler on two. Right. Hello, Sergeant. How's it going? Fine, thanks, Lieutenant. Now, there's a man in my office named Dollar. I'm sending him down to see you. in the department reacted a little differently than the men to all this. How's that, Sergeant? Well, when they went over the stolen property sheets, they were first impressed, of course, by the fact that all of the clothing was for someone who wore a size 10. The other thing, though, was the good taste. Well, a lot of thieves have good taste, I suppose. <laughs> this one seems to have not only good taste, but a pretty exclusive taste. You mean the expensive places that have been robbed? Well, that, but even more. You see here... Uh-huh. On March 4th, one green suede coat missing from Toll's Apparel Shop, and here on the 13th. A brown organdy dress from the Commodore, and here. Cocoa-colored sports coat. Yeah? Hats and gloves in green and brown, beige, sometimes yellow. No other colors. Well, what does it mean? Any woman who restricts herself to these particular colors in dressing, green, brown, beige, cocoa, yellow must have a very definite coloring of her own. We think a redhead with green eyes. Well, you know best about that. But uh, why green eyes? Couldn't they be blue or brown? <laughs> yes, they could be. But there's been a particular emphasis on green in the coats and dresses that have been stolen. And besides that, there's the cosmetics. Did you cover Jaegers? Jaegers. Um, let me see. No. 
Well, Jaeger's is a very plush cosmetic store here. Nothing but perfume and makeup. They reported March 2nd, a whole box of green eyeshadow had been stolen from one of their counters. And green eyeshadow only goes with green eyes? Yes, whereas blue eyeshadow would fit a person with either blue or brown eyes. Now, at the same time the eyeshadow was taken, several tubes of lipstick and rouge were also stolen. Both of those items contained orange tinting. That gives us another reason for thinking the eyes are green. I'm convinced. <laughs> a redhead with green eyes. Oh, and it's a short hair, too. It is? <laughs> look at my hair. I am, Sergeant. With a short hair, do like mine, I'd look rather ridiculous in a big picture hat that requires a hair frame. But a small hat, one with a tight contour, would be all right. Hey, I'm coming around. The case millinery story. <laughs> yes. Four hats. Total value, $185? Yes, those hats that were taken from cases were small, especially designed for a woman with a short hairdo. We think that some of the costume jewelry that's been stolen ties in with the clothes, too. Uh-huh. Well, how does it stand right now? Well, we've had our troubles on this one. It's impossible to tie up the manpower it would require to cover every dress and apparel shop in town, not to mention the department stores. Sure, sure. We're doing the next best thing. No store has been taken a second time, so we've spotted a dozen police women from my department and as many stores around town that still hasn't been hit. And they're posing as clerks. How long has this been going on? Since Monday. Maybe we'll get a lead this way. Yeah. Sergeant, this is just a wild one, but suppose a red-headed woman with green eyes isn't doing it after all. Suppose somebody's doing it for her. We've thought of that, and it looks like a possibility. None of the personnel we've questioned in any of these stores has been able to say definitely whether or not they saw anyone with red hair on the premises or around the shop to fit the time incidents of the particular robbery. I see. And there's another thing we're working on, too, beauty shops. Oh? She's a redhead, and she's got all of these expensive clothes. It's a good bet she keeps herself up. You know, has her hair and nails done regularly. Yeah. We've covered about 50 different beauty salons in town, the best ones. Told them the kind of woman we're looking for and given them an idea of what she'll be wearing. Well, if she's still in town, something should break pretty soon. I'd like to go over the original complaints, if it's possible. Main filings on the second floor. Ask for Sergeant Kelly and he'll give you what you want. I'll do that. Thanks a lot. After a full day and a half of studying the crime reports... I wholeheartedly agreed with Lieutenant Sturgis and Sergeant Beidler. Since none of the stolen articles had appeared in any of the usual places for disposal, I was convinced it was not the work of an organized gang or of a previous offender. All clothing that had been taken was the same size and a small variety of colors, and as Sergeant Beidler had pointed out, suited only to a certain type of woman with definite physical characteristics. Red hair, green eyes. Johnny Dollar. I think we've got something here. What? The lead on one of the coats. I met Lieutenant Sturgis in the police garage, and we drove over to Toll's apparel shop on West Oak Street. One of the clerks there had phoned in and reported she'd seen a woman wearing a green suede coat that had been stolen from the store a month before. The clerk's name was Alice Emerson. I'm sure it was the coat. Well, how can you be sure of that, Mrs. Emerson? Well, it was the only one like it in the entire store. Uh -huh. And as far as I know, in Toledo, it, it had a gathering at the back and gold buttons. I just knew that coat the minute I saw it on her. I just knew it. Oh, this was about a half an hour ago, you say? Yes, I was on my lunch hour, and I was eating at the Westgate. The cafeteria? Yes. She was about three people ahead of me in the line. I didn't remember at first that the coat had been from us, but when I sat down to lunch, I recalled it. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. I really didn't know what to do exactly. Then I thought, well, I'd better make sure it is the coat, you know. I wouldn't want to make trouble for uh, what, anyone. What did you do? Well, she had a table over by the wall eating her lunch alone. So I finished my lunch, and I walked over near her, and I took a good look at the coat. <laughs> it was our coat, all right. The one that was taken from that rack over there. I was going right out on the street and call a policeman, but I guess she got a little suspicious of me looking at her the way I did, and she got up and left. What did she look like, Mrs. Emerson? Oh, she was a nice-looking woman. About my size. 
30 or so. Very nice. What color was her hair? Dark. Very dark. Dark? Black, you mean? Or dark brown. I don't know which. Did you happen to notice the color of her eyes? No, no, I didn't, but she wore glasses. Horn-rimmed. You're certain it's the same coat? Oh, I'm positive. Have you ever seen the woman before? No, never. At least I don't think I have. Nothing familiar about her at all? No. Did you happen to notice which direction she went in when she left the cafeteria? No, I, I don't know where she went. She just got into a taxi cab. I went with Lieutenant Sturgis to the offices of the taxi cab company that covered Metropolitan Toledo. There we began checking the way bills as they came in. Since less than an hour had elapsed from the time Mrs. Emerson called in, we didn't have to go through too many of them. At the intersection of Oak and Westgate, which was right in front of the cafeteria, cab number 418 had carried a fare to a hotel apartment house called the Colonial on the east side of town, Yondota Street. We spoke with the driver of the cab on the phone when he checked into the office. He remembered the fare. A woman in a green suede coat. Try that. Yeah. Hello, can I help you? Police. Oh? Now, sometime in the last hour, a cab brought a woman to this address. We'd like to talk to her. She's about 5'4", uh, about 30, dark hair, wearing a green suede coat. You know her? Well, now let's see. Wore horn rim glasses? Well, I've got 175 apartments here. Uh, wait, a, a green suede coat? Yeah. Well, Miss Jones. Jones, huh? Yes, Lillian Jones. She just checked in two days ago. Alone? Yes. What apartment is she in? Uh, 1429. Shall I ring her? No, no, never mind. We'll just go on up. From the description we gave the desk clerk at the Colonial Apartments, he identified our suspect as Lillian Jones, apartment 1429. She'd come in approximately 20 minutes before we'd arrived. As far as the clerk knew, she was still in her apartment. We took the self-service elevator up to the 14th floor. Now, it'll be down this way. Hey, wait. 1410, then it goes to 21. Yeah. Oh, the corridor. Oh, yeah. Lillian Jones? What do you want? Police. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, just a minute. May we come in? We can talk here. It'll be easier inside. Here's all right for me. Let's go inside, Miss Jones. Okay. What's this all about? A woman who works at Toll's apparel shop saw you in the Westgate cafeteria at lunchtime today. She said you were wearing a coat that was stolen from them. She's a liar. I don't even know where Toll's apparel shop is. She was pretty certain about it. I've been here all day. I had my lunch here. Anybody with you? What do you mean? Did you eat alone? Sure, I ate alone. Miss Jones... We can get the woman from Tolls to come over here and identify you. Say, listen. And we can get the cab driver who brought you here to identify you, too. It'd all be lying. I've been here all day. You prove it? Sure, I can prove it. Clerk downstairs said you just came in about 20 minutes ago. He's lying, too. It's a green suede coat. You have a green suede coat? No. Listen, you just get out of there. Where's the coat, Miss Jones? I don't know what coat you're talking about. A green suede coat. Now, what'd you do with it? I don't have a green suede coat. Do you have any objection to our looking around? You bet I have. All right, we'll get a search warrant. I'm afraid you'll have to come with us, Miss Jones. I'm not going anywhere with anybody. Get out of here. Get out of my apartment. I'll make plenty of trouble for the both of you. Come on, Miss Jones. Lillian Jones had a record of one previous arrest two years before. The charge, grand theft. She'd been released for lack of evidence. 
Her profession was listed as a domestic. The sales lady from Toll's apparel shop appeared and positively identified her as the woman she had spotted in the Westgate cafeteria wearing the stolen coat. The cab driver who'd driven her from the intersection of Westgate and Oak to the Colonial Apartments was called in. He also identified her. She still refused to admit anything, maintaining that she hadn't left her apartment all day. Lieutenant Sturgis took a detail of men to her place to search the premises. I stayed with Sergeant Beidler while she questioned Lillian Jones. Why won't you tell us what you did with the coat, Lillian? I don't know what coat you're talking about. Honest, I don't. Mrs. Emerson saw you wearing it at the cafeteria today. The cab driver saw you wearing it. The clerk at your apartment desk saw you wearing They're it. They're all liars. I don't own a green suede coat. You people have no right to hold me like this and ask me all these questions. I haven't done anything. What did you do with the coat? There isn't any coat. Where'd you hide it? I want a lawyer. Can I call a lawyer? Tell us about the coat. You stole it from Toll's apparel shop on March 4th. Isn't that right? I don't know anything about Toll's apparel shop. I told you. It's on Oak Street. I'll drop in and say hello sometime. What about the other thing? What other thing? You know what we're talking about, Lillian. Why don't you get it off your chest? We'll find out sooner or later. <gasps> Who are you working with? I want a lawyer. Where's it hidden? I want a lawyer. You can make a statement now and save yourself a lot of trouble. I want a lawyer. <laughs> We continued to question Lillian Jones regarding the green suede coat. She denied ever having such a coat in her possession. However, at 3.45 that afternoon, Lieutenant Sturgis returned with his detail of men. They had found the coat, stuffed into a clothes hamper. I took it over to the shop, and the people there positively identified it as the one stolen on March 4th. Yeah? Yeah, it had their label and one of their stock tags in the pocket. Well, that should do it. I don't know what we've uncovered here, though. There wasn't anything else in the apartment to fit any of the other thefts. Yeah? Well, you can hold her on this. Oh, sure. I'll have her booked in right away. Lillian Jones was charged with grand theft. Before she was taken to the main jail, she admitted that she had stolen the coat. But not from the apparel shop. From the home of a family by the name of Costain. She said she'd been employed there for two weeks as a domestic servant. Mr. Costain was a civil engineer with offices in downtown Toledo. They informed us that he'd already left for his home, so we drove out there to interview him. It was a large, 12-room place on the edge of town. A servant took us into the living room. A few moments later, a tall, gray-haired man in his early 50s made an appearance. I'm Mr. Costain. I'm Lieutenant Sturgis, Mr. Costain. This is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? Police? That's right. They hate to bother you around dinner time like this. Quite all right. Sit down, please. Thanks. Uh, We're holding a woman downtown named Lillian Jones, Mr. Costain. I understand you employed her at one time. Lillian Jones? Oh, the maid, yes. Is she in trouble? We're just checking her story. I see. She was in possession of a green suede coat at the time we took her in, Mr. Costain. Mm Mm-hmm. She insists that she took the coat from your home. Why would she say a thing like that? Well, we don't know. We thought maybe you could clear that up. I have no idea what she's talking about. I fired her last Tuesday, I believe it was. That was the last I saw of the woman. Was she very angry when you fired her? Not particularly. It's just that she didn't work out here very well. I gave her two weeks' pay, told her to go. It's a green suede coat with gold buttons down the front. I don't know where she got it, I'm sure, but I know she didn't get it here. Funny she'd tell us she stole it from here? Yes, it is. I don't know why. Is uh, Mrs. Costain at home? Mrs. Costain passed away last February. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have a daughter? No. We have to check into all these things, you know. Oh, I understand. I wish I could help you. Uh, You can if you will, Mr. Costain. How's that? Would you mind dropping into my office tomorrow and taking a look at the coat? I don't know what good that would do, but I'll be glad to do it. You just might recognize it. Perhaps it belonged to Mrs. Costain. Possibly. Although I don't remember it. Room 212 in the main building. All right, Lieutenant. I'll be there in the morning. Fine. Sorry to have bothered you, but not at all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Did you see it? The color print on the piano? Yeah. A red-headed woman with green eyes. (laughs) 
A check in the neighborhood revealed that the Costains had been living in Toledo less than a year. Before that, they'd lived in Detroit. Financially, they were in the upper income bracket. The house was completely paid for. There were two expensive late model cars in the garage. The Office of Vital Statistics informed us that Mrs. Costain had died on February 6th of a heart condition. It also noted that her hair had been red, her eyes green. Lieutenant Sturgis, robbery. Oh, yes, of course. I see. What, are you going to be home? Bye. Arnold Costain. Yeah? Yeah, he just changed his story. He said he did know that Lillian Jones stole that coat when she left the house. You give any reason for not admitting it when we were there? No, just wants to see us. I'm afraid I've caused you some trouble on this. Oh, we don't quite understand why you didn't tell us about it last night. It's rather simple, probably rather silly. I have a devil of a time keeping servants here for some reason. If a notice got in the paper I'd accused one of them of theft, well, I'd have a difficult time getting another one there that way. That coat's worth over $600, Mr. Costain. Yes, I know. It belonged to my wife. And you let it go like that? Oh, I'm insured for personal loss. Did you report this to your insurance broker? Oh, yes. Did you file a claim? Yes. What's your broker's name? Mr. Levant. He has offices in the Metropolitan Building. When did you report the loss? On Wednesday. You mind if I call him and check this? I don't see why that's necessary. I've just told you what I did about the matter. Oh, we're still puzzled, Mr. Costain. That coat was reported stolen from Toll's apparel shop last March 4th. Hmm. That's absurd, of course. Mrs. Costain bought that coat for herself a week or so before her illness. Did she handle it or did you? What do you mean? What did she pay for it, or, or were you billed? I... I suppose I was billed. I don't recall. Are you insinuating that Mrs. Costain might have stolen that coat? No, Mr. Costain. Your wife was already dead when that coat was stolen. Oh, no. You're wrong. What do you mean? Edna's not dead. She'll come back. And when she does... When she does, I'll have all these things for her. The things... I denied her before. Denied her? Yes. I always told Edna she was too extravagant, that she didn't need all those expensive things. Well, you, you could have bought them. Why did you steal them? I always denied her the things she loved. When Edna went away, I don't know what came over me. I mean, a loneliness seemed too much somehow. And I'd go out during the day from my office and wander through the stores, stores that she used to love very much. And whenever I had the opportunity, I stole the thing she always wanted. What did you do with them? They're in Edna's bedroom, hanging in her wardrobe. Would you like to see them? Expense account item two, $75.25, board and room while in Toledo. Item three, $62, miscellaneous. Item four, $41.10, plane fare back to Hartford. Expense account total, $227.50. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were Hal March, Hi Aberback, Edgar Barrier, Virginia Gregg, Mary Lansing, and Peggy Weber. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Charles Lyon 
inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Roger Stern, Dollar. Oh, hello, Mr. Stern. What can I do for you? We insure Mr. James Forbes. He was killed last night. It looks like an accident, but there's always the chance it might not be. Can you take the job? Sure. How about the details? Well, come on down to the office as soon as you can, and I'll give you what we've got. I'll catch the first train out. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry... A stick of Wrigley Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley Spearmint gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, Treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will, too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Intercontinental Indemnity and Bonding Corporation, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the James Forbes matter. Expense account item one, $13.95, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. After receiving from you the details regarding the death of James Forbes, I registered at the Madison Hotel and went directly to the 5th Precinct Police Station and interviewed Lieutenant Arthur Parkhill, who was handling the case. Well, there really isn't much more to tell, Mr. Dollar. Other than what you know. You're convinced it was an accident? I'm convinced he fell over the edge of a 110-foot cliff, but it looks like an accident. Certainly doesn't mean the case is closed, but so far there's no motive for murder. There's a wife. Yeah. Mr. Forbes had quite a bit of money. That's an understatement. Mr. Forbes was loaded. And Mrs. Forbes gets everything, including a half-million-dollar insurance policy. Look, that's the first thing we considered, but just because her husband's got money and a great big fat insurance policy... Now, wait a minute. I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job. Now, we've checked the wife. Checked her good. The way it looks, she liked being married. She was in love with her husband. When he went over the cliff, she was in the house. Four servants can swear to it. He just fell over the cliff. According to everything we can find out, he took long walks every night along the cliffs by the ocean. Last night, it was unusually foggy. Certainly possible he got too close to the edge, missed his footing, and did a high dive. How about suicide? Uh-uh. At least there's no reason we can come up with. Good health, business doing better than it ever has. Textiles, isn't it? Yeah, biggest in the country. There's absolutely nothing that indicates suicide, especially no suicide note. There usually is. Uh huh. The Forbes estate is out on the island, isn't it? Yeah. Gonna take a run up? Yeah, I thought I might. Well, thanks for your help. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar. Let me know if you come across anything. (laughs) 
Expense account item two, 75 cents. Cab fare to a garage where I rented a car and drove out to the island. The Forbes mansion stood in the middle of a lot of acreage along the shore at the northeastern tip. Yes? I'd like to see Mrs. Forbes, please. I'm afraid Mrs. Forbes is seeing no one. Tell her Mr. Dollar is here. I believe Mr. Stern from my company called Mrs. Forbes and told her I was coming out. Uh, Mr. Dollar? That's right. If you'll wait a moment. Sure. Take your time. Mrs. Forbes will see you, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Mrs. Forbes was expecting you, but neglected to tell me. Mr. Dollar, ma'am. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I'm Mrs. Forbes. How do you do? Won't you sit down? Thank you. Mr. Stern called, said you were coming out. He seemed to think it was necessary. Yes, routine. Unfortunately, in a matter like this... I understand. Better to get it over with. I suppose so. Just a few questions. What time did Mr. Forbes leave the house last night? Right after dinner, around nine. I understand he was in the habit of taking walks. Yes. Last night was the same as any other night. Yes. He seemed uh, all right? He was fine. Wonderful spirits. Who found him? The police. Did you call them? Yes, after he'd been gone longer than usual, I began to worry. By twelve o'clock, I sent William, my butler, out in the car to look for him. When William returned, I had him call the police. They didn't find him until morning. You're convinced it was an accident? My husband didn't commit suicide, Mr. Dollar. Did he have any enemies? No. No one killed him, Mr. Dollar. Now, if you don't mind, I really don't feel too well. Of course. There's just one more thing. Yes? I'd like to take a look at the place, the the spot. I'll have William show you. Thanks. I'm sorry I can't be of more help, Mr. Dollar, but there's really nothing to help you with. My husband was killed in an accident. He wasn't murdered, and he didn't commit suicide. My husband was a fine and wonderful man. I loved him very much. Of course. I'll call with him and have him show you the way down to the cliffs. It's been nice meeting you. This is a terrible thing, William. Yes, sir. How long have you been with the Forbes? Uh, Ten years, sir. Theirs was a good marriage. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, About another hundred yards, sir. Now, you can stop here. Right over here, sir. They found Mr. Forbes right down there, sir. Hmm. Long drop. Yes, sir. Well, I guess under the right circumstances, it'd be pretty easy to miss your footing along here. It was very foggy last night. Yeah. Well, come on. I'll drive you back. Uh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Uh, Mr. Dollar, I don't know quite how to say this. I've nothing ready to go on except, well, uh, I'm not convinced that Mr. Forbes' death was an accident. Why aren't you? Uh, It's hard to say. Uh, Until this morning, until some time after they found him, I didn't think it could be anything else. Uh, When the police questioned me, I didn't even consider another possibility. But Mr. Forbes has been taking walks at night, every night ever since I came to work. He's walked in all kinds of weather. He knew those cliffs from one end to the other. Well, people take showers in the same shower year after year, and still a certain percentage of them slip and break their necks. It's not just the walks and the fact that Mr. Forbes was so familiar with these cliffs. It's a lot of little things that have happened over the past two or three months. Nothing really definite. Uh, uh, Telephone calls. What kind of telephone calls? Several times Mrs. Forbes has made calls. Several times I happened to overhear part of the conversations. They were affectionate. Affectionate? Yes, I I thought she was talking to Mr. Forbes. But several times I discovered through dinner conversations between Mr. and Mrs. Forbes that she hadn't spoken to him during the day that he'd been out of the city. Well, it, <clears throat> it's really awfully hard to explain. Just how affectionate were these calls? Quite affectionate. You think Mrs. Forbes has been playing around? I don't know, sir. But in the last few months, when Mr. Forbes left, she'd informed me she was going to town to visit with friends. 
and she'd very seldom return until the day before Mr. Forbes was supposed to be back from his trip. Why, on one of these occasions, Mrs. Weatherwax, the woman Mrs. Forbes was supposed to be visiting, came to the house calling on Mrs. Forbes. Well, from her conversation, I gathered she hadn't seen Mrs. Forbes for some time. Did you say anything about it? Huh, to whom? To Mr. Forbes? Certainly not. I didn't think that much about it at the time. Hmm. Anything else? Uh, no, sir. But I suddenly felt that I must tell someone. Uh, sir, if Mrs. Forbes should find out, she'd surely dismiss me, and I couldn't blame her. I won't say anything. Thank you, sir. Well, come on. We'd better start back. I do hope I haven't started something I'll be sorry for. Do me a favor. Well, certainly. If Mrs. Forbes gets any more of those phone calls, see if you can find out who's on the other end of the line. I'll try. You can reach me at the Madison Hotel. Yes, sir. I drove William back to the house, then headed for the city. It was close to five o'clock when I got back to my hotel and called Lieutenant Parkhill. I told him about my conversation with the butler, and he was interested. He agreed to do some more checking on Mrs. Forbes' friends, especially the men. Expense account item three, seven dollars and fifty cents, dinner. After which I took a short walk, then returned to my hotel to get a good night's sleep. I was just turning off the light when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. This is William, Mr. Dollar, the Forbes butler. Oh, yes, William. Uh, Mrs. Forbes received a phone call about half an hour ago. You find out who he is? Uh, no, sir. Well, that's not going to help much. Uh, I thought you could discover his identity. How could I do that? Uh, Mrs. Forbes just left the house. I overheard her agree to meet the party in the city. Where in the city? Well, I don't know, but I thought you could intercept Mrs. Forbes as she comes off the George Washington Bridge. William, you have the soul of a Sherlock. Yes, sir. Mrs. Forbes is driving the gray Cadillac sedan. License number 6A31593. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley Spearmint gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, the lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> It took me five minutes to get back into my clothes and make it down to my car. Twenty minutes after that, I was parking at the city side entrance of the Washington Bridge, waiting for Mrs. Forbes to show up in her gray Cadillac. I waited about a half hour. She came off the bridge doing a little better than the speed limit and turned south. I started tailing her. I stayed about a block behind, and Mrs. Forbes led me across town. Suddenly, at the corner of 41st and 5th, she pulled up to the curb and a man stepped up to the car, quickly opened the door and climbed in. They drove away and I continued to follow. I followed for about another hour while Mrs. Forbes just drove around, obviously headed for no place in particular, just talking things over with her passenger. About 11.30, she made a left turn, cut back across town and pulled up in front of an address on 108th Street. Her passenger got out, said something, threw her a kiss and went into the building. After Mrs. Forbes had driven out of sight, I went down to the building the man had entered and looked through the glass door. He was going into an apartment at the end of the hall. I checked the apartment number, 1D. The nameplate on the mailbox outside was Roger Phillips. Now, I don't know, Roger. 
Roger Phillips, Dollar. Name's familiar, though. I'll check on it. Where are you? In a drugstore in the corner. Hey. What? Cab just pulled up in front. Of the drugstore? No, no. 953 East. I can see it through the... Hold it. What? I'll call you later, Lieutenant. My man just came out. He's getting into the cab. Goodbye. The cab was two blocks away and turning left by the time I was able to follow. It led me across town to the waterfront in a small, tired saloon named the Blue Toad. I watched while my man paid off his driver, then I followed him into the dive. The Blue Toad was one room, a few tables and a bar. The customers were off the waterfront, seamen and stevedores and bums with saltwater faces and an occasional tattoo. The air smelled like stale beer, live bait, and bad tobacco. I watched my man cut his way through the heavy blue haze and sit down. Another man sat at the table, a short man with a dark face. I found a table near the door, gave my order to a waiter with a crusty apron, and relaxed to see what was going to happen. Hello. Huh? Oh. You alone? Oh. Yeah, but uh, I'm, uh... Buy me a drink, huh? Sure. Well, what'll it be? Champagne. Huh. Doesn't that get a laugh? Was it supposed to? Well, if I was a nice-looking guy, wearing a nice-looking suit, and I just walked into this dump, and a dame like me ordered champagne, I'll forget it. I was just trying to start a conversation. You started it. I work on a percentage. Buy me a scotch and I'll leave you alone. Relax. I'm not expecting anybody. Thanks. You got any influence with the waiter? I ordered a drink ten minutes ago. He's probably out in the alley. It's not well. About this time of night, he can't stand the smoke and goes out to stock up on fresh air. He'll be right back. What's your name? Jane. You should be, um, Mike. A bill? Yeah, you look kind of like a mic. Why? I don't know. Feeling you get when you look at some people. Some people look like certain names. It's Johnny. Johnny? Doesn't fit? I guess so. Who are you watching, Johnny? What makes you think I'm watching somebody? Because you are. You've been watching those two guys in the back. Okay. Cop? Uh-uh. The good-looking one just passed Timmy a bundle of money. You know the little dark guy? Forget it, huh? Tell me about Timmy. Tell me about Johnny. I'm not a cop. Nope. A cop would know all about Timmy. The good-looking one's leaving. I'm interested in Timmy. In Timmy or the money he just got? Both. You're not a stick-up man, Johnny. Not a bit. I'd like to help, but Timmy finds out about things. Timmy's a bad boy. Hasn't got a friend in the world. <laughs> Not even me. You leaving? Yeah. Oh, here. Buy some champagne. Thanks. Bye, Johnny. Outside, the air was fresh and clean. I got into my car, lit a cigarette, and waited for the dark little man named Timmy to come out. In about five minutes, he did. He crossed the street and climbed into a car. He drove west, and I followed. About ten blocks later, I stopped and watched Timmy park in an all-night garage, then crossed to a hotel called the Bayview. He went in. I found a phone and called Lieutenant Parkhill. Jimmy? About five feet nine, dark complexion, dresses a little too sharp. Mm. Timmy Collins. Now, what about him? Bad boy. Yeah, so I've heard. Assassin. Nobody's been able to prove it. I didn't even know he was in town. He shouldn't be. Why not? Oh, it was an old rap. Forgery. Huh. You find anything on Roger Phillips? Oh, uh, yeah. Socialite playboy. Makes the columns about once or twice a week. Never very flattering. Does he know Mrs. Forbes? Oh, he might. Runs around in that circle. He's been in town for about a year now. He comes from... What's the matter? Just gonna say he comes from Cleveland. Yeah? Just remembered. So does Timmy Collins. Did you check on Phillips in Cleveland? Now the kickback hasn't come in yet. Won't get it till tomorrow morning. Only thing we've got on him here is what I've already told you. What are you gonna do about Timmy? Let him alone for a while. 
Stake out the hotel, see what he's up to. What are you going to do? Go back to my hotel and get some sleep. I'm bushed. And I'll talk to you in the morning. Yeah. Expense account item four, $2.65. Breakfast the next morning with Lieutenant Parkhill at a waffle shop across the street from the precinct. Roger Phillips skipped Cleveland owing a lot of money. The Cleveland report gives him a clean police record, but one thing's pretty interesting. Most of the money he owed was for gambling debts. Owed it to Timmy Collins. Huh. Unless we've wandered too far out in left field, I got a hunch Timmy killed Forbes. Met him on that lonely road by the cliffs and gave him a shove. Yeah, I have the same hunch. Mrs. Forbes falls for Phillips, and together they plan to eliminate the husband. Phillips makes a deal with Timmy, maybe agrees to give him a big interest on the debt when he marries Mrs. Forbes and gets his hands into all that money. Does Phillips have enough money to pay for a job like that? Well, if he doesn't, he probably borrowed it from Mrs. Forbes. It was a big stack of bills. Why don't you check with Mrs. Forbes' banks and see if she withdrew a large amount in the last couple of days? All yeah, right. Or oh, want some more coffee? No, I think I'll make a call on Roger Phillips. Maybe I can force this thing out in the open. What are you going to tell him? Enough to scare him, get him into action. When people get frightened, they get careless. Yeah, but they can get dangerous, too. You watch yourself. Oh, like a hawk. Roger Phillips was still sleeping when I knocked on the door. I kept pounding till he opened it and squinted at me through puffy eyes. I introduced myself, and he showed me into a well-furnished small apartment. He put on some coffee, lit a cigarette, and sat down on the couch. Oh, it's a little early for me, uh, Mr. Uh, Dollar. Yeah. Sit down. The coffee won't take long. You're an insurance investigator. That's right. Well, I don't understand. What do you want to talk to me about? Mrs. Forbes. Mrs. Forbes? You know her, don't you? Mrs. Forbes. Well, I know one Mrs. Forbes, a casual... I'm not going to play with you, Phillips. I'm talking about the Mrs. Forbes who picked you up last night and gave you a large amount of money. Look, I I don't know what this is all about. I think you do. I said I didn't. I was in my apartment all last night. Nobody picked me up and certainly nobody gave me any money. You went to a dump called the Blue Toad and you met a man named Get out of here. You're in big trouble, friend. I know all about Cleveland and Timmy Collins and Mrs. Forbes. And I think when Mrs. Forbes finds out about the deal you made with Timmy, she'll tell me everything. We'll see each other again. Oh, uh, your coffee's boiling. Well, I'd given him the bait. A lot of hunches, but from his reaction, I was sure I'd scored. I went downstairs, crossed the street to the drugstore... Waited five minutes to give Roger enough time to make his calls. Then I slid into the phone booth and made a call of my own. Yes, sir. Mr. Forbes, residence. William, this is Mr. Dollar. Oh, oh, yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. I I was just going to call you, sir. Did Mrs. Forbes just receive a call? Yes, sir, just a moment ago. It was from the same man. She's going to meet him. Meet him? Where? By the cliffs. Phillips had taken the bait. Only two people could implicate him in Forbes' murder, Mrs. Forbes and Timmy, and he'd called Mrs. Forbes to meet him by the cliffs. I put in another call to Lieutenant Parkhill. That's right, Johnny. The stakeout has a tap on Timmy's phone. Phillips just called him, said to pick him up as soon as he could. Phillips told Timmy there was trouble, that some guy named Dollar had found out about the whole setup. (laughs) Shame on him. We want to stop a couple killings. We better get right out there couple of killings. Sure. Phillips lets Timmy take care of Mrs. Forbes, then he takes care of Timmy. It's the only way he can protect himself. I'll pick you up in five minutes. Oh, by the way, uh, I checked with the bank. Mrs. Forbes made a withdrawal the day before yesterday. Ten thousand dollars. The lieutenant was as good as his word. In five minutes, he pulled his squad car up in front of the drugstore, and I got in. Now, you want to wait for Timmy to pick up Phillips and then tail him? Now, we know where they're going. Better if we get there ahead of time. Right. The drive was fast. We swung off the main road on the island and headed up the private one to the Forbes estate at about 2.30 in the afternoon. 
Halfway to the house, we spotted Mrs. Forbes walking along the road by the cliffs. We stopped. She looked startled as we got out. Hello, Mrs. Forbes. Good afternoon, Mr. Dollar. You've met Lieutenant Park here. Yes, mm-hmm. hello, Lieutenant. I was just taking a walk. To meet Roger Phillips. I beg your pardon. Oh, we know all about it, Mrs. Forbes. All about what, Lieutenant? Your husband's death. Who killed him? Why he was killed. I'm afraid I don't understand. My husband was Roger Phillips will be along any minute. The man he paid to kill your husband will be with him. I think he intends to kill you. This is the most ridiculous... Mrs. Forbes. Roger Phillips left Cleveland owing a large gambling debt to a hoodlum named Timmy Collins. Last night you picked up Mr. Phillips and gave him $10,000, which he in turn gave to Collins. And we think he made another deal with Timmy. After he married you, he could pay off his gambling debt with interest. Might as well tell us about it, Mrs. Forbes. He doesn't care about you. You and Timmy are the only ones that can implicate him. And he's on his way here right now to see that you don't. I don't believe you. Well, then find out for yourself. We'll duck the car behind those trees and give you plenty of protection when he gets here. Find out for yourself. Park Hill drove the car off the road behind the trees, stayed hidden, and waited for Phillips and Timmy. Mrs. Forbes stood quietly looking out to sea, her hands at her sides, bunched into small fists. She stood like that, not moving, even as the car came down the road, heading right for her. She turned and saw the car bearing down on her and picking up speed, and then she knew we weren't lying. But still, she didn't move, and the lieutenant and I went to work. The car was about 50 yards away when we stepped into the road. Timmy was driving and saw us the same instant Phillips did and tried to put on the brakes as we raised our guns. What a mess. Yeah. I'm sorry it worked out that way. He was going to kill me, wasn't he? He sure was. You want to tell us about it? Oh, yeah. It doesn't make much difference now, does it? No. I'm afraid it doesn't. Expense account item five, $25.88, car rental and gas. Expense account item six and seven, $93.75. Hotel bill, train fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $148.48. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Larry Thor, Jack Moyles, Bob Griffin, Mary Jane Croft, and Jean Howell. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. of 
Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Nelson Price, Johnny. Oh, yes. How are you, Mr. Price? Fine. Got a job for you. You'll have to go to the West Indies. The West Indies? Near Haiti, St. Ledger. Mr. Claude Sheldon holds a big policy with us. We insure him, his wife, and his farm. They've had a lot of trouble. It's going to cost us a lot of money, and we think an investigation is necessary. Come on down to the office, and I'll give you as much as I've got, Johnny. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will, too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office International Insurance and Bonding Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the voodoo matter. Expense account item one, $206.40. Plane fare and incidentals from New York to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. After receiving from you the necessary information concerning the insured, Claude Sheldon. After landing, I checked into the hotel and waited for Claude Sheldon as prearranged. I waited for about an hour. Come in. Mr. Dollar? That's right. Mr. Sheldon? Yes. I've been expecting you. Claude Sheldon pushed himself away from the door, grabbed a chair and dropped into it. Took in long, deep breaths and smiled a very slow, weak smile. I would have been here sooner, but... There's been more trouble. More trouble, eh? Well, my company told me a little about it, but you better give me your own story. Certainly. As you know, I am a farmer. Yeah. My place is near Saint Leger. A number of other farms in the vicinity, all doing very well until several months ago. First, it was fires. The cane fields burned. One by one, the cattle became sick. Then some of the farmers grew ill and died. <laughs> Can I get you something? Please. Some water, please. <laughs> Have you been to see a doctor? I'm afraid a doctor can't help. <laughs> there you are. Thank you. <laughs> Have you any idea what's wrong with you? Yes and no. My Christian religion fights it, but my life on Haiti has taught me deep respect for it. Respect for what, Mr. Sheldon? Voodoo, Mr. Dollar. Oh, I know just what you're thinking. But a doctor in Haiti has examined me and my wife and the others. He can find nothing wrong. Voodoo, Mr. Sheldon? Oh, I don't expect you to understand. It's hard for me... Perhaps there is something else. 
I hope you can find out. Well, I'm afraid I can't buy the voodoo theory, Mr. Sheldon. There is one thing. Immediately after my wife and I became ill, I received an offer from my farm. A very low offer from a saint Leger banker. I investigated and found it had been made in the interests of one Arthur Cotswold. Arthur Cotswold. I eat his biggest planter. Extremely wealthy. Even after the sick cattle and the fires and everything? Yes. That's why I became suspicious. The other farmers <coughs> received similar offers. More water? <laughs> Perhaps I... I don't think I... <laughs> Mr. Dolly. Mr. Sheldon. I called the hotel desk for a doctor, but by the time he'd gotten Sheldon to the hospital, the patient was dead. The authorities were called in and I was questioned. A preliminary examination was made on the dead man, but the cause of death remained a mystery. So an autopsy was ordered. I told the chief of police to forward the report to me as saint Leger and left for the Sheldon farm. Expense account item two, five dollars American for a beaten up taxi to take me ten miles into the country. A crowd of natives was standing in front of the Sheldon house as we drove up. I didn't know what it was. No one said a word, but something was wrong. I could feel it. I walked through the crowd and up to the house and stopped cold as the door opened. Who are you? I'd never seen anything like him. A native who was a good seven feet tall and must have weighed at least 300. Me, Bimba. Who are you? Me, John... I mean, uh, I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. You from the United States? Yeah. I'm supposed to investigate the trouble here. Me, no. Master Shelton, tell me. I, uh, saw Master Sheldon about an hour ago. He did. How the... How do you know he died? You come in, house. All right. What are all those people doing out there? They're friends. Madame, she died, too. Bimba led the way into the bedroom, where Mrs. Sheldon lay on the bed covered with a fresh white sheet, her eyes closed in death, her face drawn and tired. Bimba told me that she died about an hour before, and a cold chill ran up my back. I remembered her husband lying on the floor of my hotel room about an hour before. Bad voodoo. Is that why the cattle are sick and the fields burned? We oui. bad voodoo. Mr. Sheldon thought a man named Cotswold might have something to do with it. Mr. Cutswell, big man. Very powerful. What are those drums? For Madame and Master. The voodoo. Good voodoo. Give blessing for spirit. For Madame and Master. I see. I want to talk to the police in saint Leger. Who do I see? Me take you. Right then, I inherited Bimba. And if there was going to be any trouble, the giant servant would certainly help to make up for any lack on my part. The first thing I wanted to do was to contact the authorities in saint Leger, And Bimba told me my man was Inspector Georges. Bimba saddled up two horses from the barn, and together we rode back to saint Leger. Bimba pointed out the inspector's office and waited in front while I went in. Ah, uh, oui, monsieur Dollar. The Sheldons were a very fine family. I knew them very well. How did everybody know they were dead? On IT, things of such nature are never a secret. The natives know. Voodoo? Being a stranger to IT, Monsieur Dollar, I expect you to be a skeptic. But you're not? Let us say I've been in IT too long to be one, huh? Hmm. Do you know a man named Cotswold? I would suggest you forget Monsieur Cotswold. Why? Monsieur Cotswold is a very prominent man. Yes, so I've heard. He is the largest plantation owner in the West Indies, a self-made man with a considerable temper. I'll mention it in my report to my office. Eh bien, as you wish. But Monsieur Cotswold is looked upon by the people of Saint-Leger with a great deal of respect. It is my opinion that you should avoid him. 
First, because I am certain you will not be in sympathy with your motives, and second, because the opposition you will encounter will be far-reaching and much too difficult for you to handle. What if I come up with something incriminating? Oh, for your sake, I hope you do not. Oh. What do you do here in saint Leger, Inspector? I am the law, Monsieur Dollar. But uh, you wouldn't like it if this Cotswold were guilty of breaching that law? If Monsieur Cotswold has broken the law, it would certainly be my duty to arrest him. But I am not considering the arrest, nor the necessary steps that would have to be taken to prove the guilt. Dangerous steps, Monsieur Dollar. One might trip on those steps. And break his neck. For ten years I have been the law. If tomorrow Cotswold decided it was time for me to relinquish my position, I should probably retire. So you prefer the middle of the road, eh? <laughs> it is much easier to see what is ahead. You can always get run down from behind. Uh-huh. I do as much as I can to prevent that possibility. No, again, my suggestion that you forget... Monsieur Cotswold. I left the philosophical inspector and went back to Bimba, still sitting outside on his horse. Every time I looked at him, it was like a little kid spotting the Empire State Building for the first time. He smiled a mouthful of white teeth and leaned over to give me a hand up. He caught me by the wrist and lifted me into my saddle as though he was hoisting a small bundle of laundry. The inspector... He say, forget me, sir, Cotswold. What? Stand up. Oui, monsieur. Oh, forget it. What do you think I should do? Me think you do what you want. And you know what I want. Oui. You want to go see Mr. Cotswold. The inspector says I shouldn't. You go anyway. You think it's a mistake? If you're afraid. But you're not. You're not strong like Bimba, but you're a good fighter. I don't like to fight, Bimba. Bimba know that. We go see Mr. Cotswold. We swung our horses around and Bimba led the way up a long, narrow road, surrounded on both sides by sugarcane fields. Somewhere, from not too far away, I heard the drums start again. Bimba straightened in his saddle and looked off to the north. He began moving his shoulders slowly keeping time to the steady rhythm of the drums. Then he began to sing softly. What does that mean, Bimba? It means in your language, it is our Papa who passes. Papa? Papa Dambala, the great source. Voodoo. We. Oui. I later must leave you. Today, Wednesday, is the day of Papa Dambala. He turned back to the north and continued his little chant until we reached the beginning of a long high fence, running along next to the narrow road. Bimba leaned down and swung open a big gate. Then we rode up the path that led through the Cotswold property until we reached the house. Sitting back between two huge trees was the Cotswold mansion. Bimba stayed on his horse, and I climbed down and walked to the front door. Mr. Della, watch out for Mr. Jocelyn. He guard Mr. Cotswold. Thanks. What do you want? I'd like to see Mr. Cotswold. You do, huh? What are you doing here, Bimba? I wait for Mr. Found himself a new governor, huh? You must be that dollar fella. I must be. Well, come in. Mr. Cotswold's been inspecting you. Jocelyn wasn't a very small man himself. Looked as though he was capable of handling just about any situation that might come up. He led the way into a large paneled study, and I met Arthur Cotswold. The drums had stopped. I know why you're here, Mr. Dollar. Well, then that should make it a lot easier for both of us. For some reason, the farmers are suspicious. Their fear is divided between me and voodoo. Sheldon convinced some that I might be responsible. And of course you're not. Of course. 
Sheldon thought you might want to get control of the other farms in San Leger. I simply tried to help them. With their cattle sick and their crops gone, I had my banker make them an offer. What would you want with sick cattle? I could use the land. You think the cattle will get better and the crops won't fail if you control the land? I intend to do away with the sick cattle. I have no use for the crops. Hmm. Have uh, any of your cattle been affected? None. That's pretty strange. Haiti is a strange land. And on this point, I would most certainly give you advice. Go home, Mr. Dollar. Leave well enough alone. Well enough is pretty bad, the way I see it, Mr. Cotswold. And I'll leave after I've gotten a few answers. Mr. Dollar, I am not a patient man. I've gone out of my way to give you some healthy advice. Heed it, for your sake. I won't forget it for a minute. You persist in this investigation? I get paid to persist, Mr. Cotswold. Friends, you know Wrigley's Spearmint Gum is a delicious treat that millions enjoy all year round. It's good to chew almost any time and any place. In warm weather, you'll enjoy especially the refreshment that Wrigley's Spearmint Gum gives you. When your mouth feels hot and dry, or when you're feeling warm and tired, chewing Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a pleasant little lift. It cools your mouth, moistens your throat, and refreshes your taste. Besides, chewing on a good smooth piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum seems to add enjoyment to whatever else you're doing. So enjoy it at home, at work, wherever you are. And remember, Wrigley's Spearmint Gum is a swell treat to take along on picnics. Get plenty for everybody. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I left Arthur Cotswold, picked up Bimba, and he led me back to town. On the way, I got an idea. When we arrived in town, I sent Bimba back to the Sheldon farm. Then I went in to talk to Inspector Georges. The inspector had received a wire from the authorities in Port-au-Prince concerning the autopsy on Sheldon. I had no idea the authorities in Port-au-Prince were interested in this affair. Hmm. May I see that? Oh, Miss Hmm. Hmm. Well, here's something pretty interesting, Inspector. Mr. Sheldon died of a disease known as brucellosis, commonly known in cattle as Bangs disease. I read the account. Ever heard of brucellosis, Inspector? <laughs> I'm not a medical man, Monsieur Dollar. Undulant fever. Sheldon and his wife probably caught it from their sick cattle. But well, yeah, then you have solved the mystery. No, no, not quite. I want to find out why all the cattle belonging to the small farmers got sick and not the ones belonging to Mr. Cotswold. What do you intend to do? I think those cattle were infected and the cane fields burned deliberately. If the cattle were infected, there might be some of the brucellosi still around, and I'm going to find it. And uh, I think you'd better issue a search warrant and come with me. Ah, no, Monsieur Dollar. The middle of the road, remember? I think you'd better start modifying your policy, Inspector. Unless you want me to get in touch with Port-au-Prince and... Ask that you be held as a material witness in a murder case. I will issue the warrant. I uh, kind of thought you would. I will issue it, but you certainly don't think it will be able enough to get you into that house. No, but it'll make it legal. I sent Bimba back to collect some of his friends. They're going to help us get into that house, Inspector. Oh, I would take no part in violence. They won't even be with us. It'll be easy to search the Cotswold place if Cotswold was out fighting a fire. A fire? Oh, just a harmless fire. But far enough away so that Cotswold will think it's his cane fields. Oh. Well, I don't agree with such methods, Monsieur Dollar, but uh, as long as it's a harmless fire, I will issue the warrant. Well, welcome back to the gutter, Inspector. The view isn't much, but you can't miss where you're going. (laughs) 
When we reached the Sheldon farm, we saw a crowd of natives standing out in front. Again, something was wrong. We piled out, pushed our way through the crowd, and inside the house we found what it was. Lying in the middle of the room was Bimba. He was almost dead when I knelt beside him. I... I talk to friends. They light fire for you. Thanks. Now I go to Baron Samter. Dambalo way to take me. You have been stabbed? Yeah. Got him from behind. Never would have faced him. You stay. You see, wait till Lena take your mort. See what? It's a ritual. It means taking the spirit from the head of the dead. He wants you to see it. You stay. You believe voodoo. All right, Bimba. I'll stay. You see. Believe. Bimba. No, 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 no. He is dead. The next few hours I'll never forget. The natives came into the house and placed Bimba on a bench. Then the ceremony began. They carried live pigeons, olive oil, 30 pieces of fat pine wood, a pair of chickens, and some coarse cornmeal. They covered Bimba's body with a saddle blanket, killed the chickens roasted the cornmeal and put it in a large white plate. The pine wood slivers were lighted and held like candles. Then a man they called Doné took the white plate in one hand and the pot with the chicken in the other and approached the fire, chanting a strange dirge. Then, as Donay finished the last line of the chant, the body of Bimba sat straight up with straining eyes, bowed its head, and fell back. The inspector and I drove over to Cotswold's house and waited while the moon climbed up over the clouds and the drums in the distance tangled my nerves into knots. After an hour of waiting, a dull glow to the south started the expected commotion in the Cotswold household, and we climbed out of the car. Oh, Mr. Cotswold! The time for you! Get the servants! Get the servants! Get everyone out there to fight that fire! Hey! Get the servants! Get everyone out there to fight that fire! It worked. Yeah. Give them a few minutes, and we'll go into the house. Now. Now. The inspector and I took the Cotswold house apart like a well-trained wrecking crew and came up with exactly nothing. Well, Monsieur Dolan. Isn't there a barn out back? Oui. Then let's go. The drums were louder now, and the dull glow of the fire had nearly vanished. The inspector took one end of the barn, and I took the other. We worked toward each other. And just about the time I was ready to give the whole thing up... Monsieur Dolan. You find something? This... Huh. A hypodermic for cattle. That's not enough. And this, I found it under that box. A bottle. Might not be anything. Ah, but we could take it back to town and have it analyzed. Well, that's about all we can do. This is the only thing we've got. Let's go. I'm afraid not. Stand right where you are. Hello, Mr. Cotswold. You know the inspector, don't you? For a number of years. I must say, I didn't expect this of him. I have a search warrant, Monsieur Cotswold. Oh, very interesting. See if they have any weapons, Cotswold. Right. I assure you we are well within our rights. This warrant is... Shut up and raise your hands. Better do as he says. A commendable suggestion, Mr. Dollar. But I'm afraid you've learned prudence a little too late. I never argue with a gun. They both got guns, Mr. Cotswold. You're making a serious mistake. I'm afraid the mistake is yours and Mr. Dollar's, Inspector. Get the bottle and the hypodermic. Yes, sir. Is that the stuff you've been infecting the cattle with? It is. You see, you really should have taken my advice and returned to the States. And I'm surprised at you, Inspector. I really thought you were more sensible. Sometimes a man finds his pride and does the best thing. <laughs> and this is the best thing. Perhaps it sounds foolish, but I think it is. You know, of course, that I cannot allow either of you to live. Tell me something. 
Who killed Bimba? I think Jocelyn can answer that. Uh, but enough conversation. I'll leave the details in your hands. Yes, sir. Goodbye, gentlemen. All right, start walking. Jocelyn, you won't... Shut up. Now do what I tell you and start walking. The drums have stopped. Just keep moving right out the gate. What about the drums? What does it mean? I don't know. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Coswell! Uh, uh, All right, both of you, start running for that house. Go on. We ran into the house with Jocelyn right behind us. He ordered us to go ahead of him and into the dark study. And that's where we found Cotswold, stretched out on the floor... His dead eyes staring up at us. His mouth open in a soundless scream. His neck had been broken. Ah, mon Dieu. Who's here? Monsieur Dollar. Who is it? Who's in this room? (laughs) No, no! Get away, get away from me, you're dead! (laughs) You won't believe it, and to this day I'm still not sure... But there in the darkness was a huge man, and he looked exactly like Bimba. Jocelyn shot him six times, and he kept right on coming. Then he grabbed Jocelyn and crushed him like an eggshell. (laughs) By the time we'd collected our wits, the giant had disappeared through the door and into the night. Monsieur Dollar, I think I'll sit down. Uh, Was it... Was it Bimba? I don't know. I don't want to know anything. I just want to get on the first plane back to the States and relax for a week in a tub of hot mud. Well, there it is. It certainly looked like Bimba. If you're inclined to believe in voodoo, perhaps it was. I talked to some of the natives before I left and didn't seem unusual to them. Cotswold was a bad man and Bimba had come back from the dead to avenge his people. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm telling it to you just the way I saw it. Or am I? Well, anyway, it's the inspector's problem. Expense account items three and four, $250. Hotel bill, plane fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $461.40. If you want any more information, you can contact me at the Greenbrier Rest Home. I'll be the third mud pie from the left. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in today's cast were Tudor Owen, Parley Bear, Roy Glenn, Ben Wright, Bill Conrad, and Jester Hairston. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
This is the CBS Radio Network. WBBM FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Philip Martin, Johnny. Oh, yeah. How are you, Mr. Martin? Fine. Got an assignment for you. Something interesting? Well, I think you'll like it. Our company insures a Miss Nancy Shaw. That's a familiar name. If you go to the movies, it should be. Oh, that Nancy Shaw? Mm Mm-hmm. She was robbed of a hundred thousand in jewels. Think you can handle it? Well, I can try. Say, for an assignment like this, I might even consider waiving my expense account. You're kidding. Yeah, I sure am. I'll see you at the office. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley Spearmint gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste... Plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Nancy Shaw matter. Expense account item one, $193.80, plane fare and incidentals between Hartford and Los Angeles. I arrived at the International Airport at 11 a.m., hired a car and drove directly to Santa Monica where I registered at a hotel. Shortly after that, I drove to the Santa Monica police station and introduced myself to Sergeant James Dodd. Oh, I've been expecting you. Your company sent a teletype. I understand this isn't the first of this type of robbery. No, I've been three others. Same M.O. Always knows the setup of the house. Goes directly to whatever he or she is after. Why, you think it might be a woman? Uh Uh-uh. But you never know. Each time it's been wealthy families, twice people in the picture business. Here's a list of the articles stolen. Hmm. Quite a list. Any of the stuff shown up yet? Not yet, but it will. Miss Shaw was robbed night before last. Sunday, huh? maid's night out. Each one's been like that. Always the maid's night off. Always the people are out to dinner or something. Whoever it is, very well informed. I've got to run out and talk with Miss Shaw. Nice girl. You'll like her. Malibu, number 915. Straight out the highway, turn in the gates at the colony. I'd better call and tell her you're coming down or you'll never get past the patrol. Patrol? Yeah, the association that protects the homes in the colony. They check everybody that comes in the gates. What about the thief, then? Well, I think he parked on the highway down from the colony, walked down to the beach, and busted in the Shaw place from the back way. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Sergeant. Sure. Anything else? Happy to help out. Took me about half an hour to reach the colony at Malibu, where the patrol at the gate stopped me. Evidently, Miss Shaw had informed them of my coming, because they passed me through. I drove slowly down a narrow street fronted on one side by beautiful homes that faced a long white strip of beach. I was met at the door of number 915 by a maid who showed me through the attractively furnished home to a glassed-in cabana overlooking the ocean. Nancy Shaw, one of the biggest stars at the box office, rose to greet me. She was wearing a white sunsuit, and as she walked toward me, I had the sensation my hair had caught on fire. Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Uh, How do you do, Miss Shaw? Sergeant Dodd called, said you were coming down. I uh, just left him. Nice cop. Sit down. Make yourself comfortable. I'll uh, try. Something wrong? 
It's a little warm. How about a drink? Fine, fine. Bernice? What'll it be? Anything with a thermostat in it. Gin and tonic? That'll do it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Bernice, bring Mr. Dollar a gin and tonic and I'll have the same. Yes, ma'am. It's a wonderful house. Thank you. I wouldn't live anywhere else. But isn't it quite a drive to the studio? Oh, well, when I'm working, I'm generally up around six. Hardly any traffic. I get there in 25 minutes. Cigarette? No, thanks. Tell me about your work, Mr. Dollar. Well, there's not much to tell. I'm a freelance investigator. Insurance company's got a job. They call me and... And you investigate. That's about it. Like your work? Well, it has its compensations. For instance? Well, for instance, Nancy Shaw in a sunsuit. Well, thank you. It says on your insurance report that you've never been married. Is that so unusual? In your case, I'd say it was. I've come close. What changed your mind? Men. Oh, sorry I mentioned it. Oh, I'm not. I think men are wonderful. But marriage isn't? Under the right circumstances, it's great. You married, Mr. Dollar? Uh-uh. Why not? Let's talk about the jewels that were stolen, huh? <laughs> All right. Have the police found out anything? No, not much. Oh. Michelle? Oh, yes, Bernice? Mr. Asher just called. Say he was on his way down. Oh, thank you. Uh, tell the gate man to let him in, huh? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, sir. The patrol at the gate isn't generally this cautious, but since the robbery, they're checking everyone. According to my report, you were robbed of a ruby pin, two diamond rings, a pearl choker, four gold bracelets, two diamond watches, three... Well, here's the list. Hmm. Is it correct? Yes. Yes, that's correct. The items were stolen night before last. Yes. Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Do you have to ask me a lot of questions? Well, it's the usual procedure. If you're expecting company or something, I can come back some other oh, time. Oh, no, no, no. I, uh... I just thought, as long as we've got to spend some time together, we might as well be comfortable. We can go out and sit on the beach. Well, that sounds fine, but, uh... Don't you like the beach? Oh, I love it, but I'm not exactly dressed. Oh, there's plenty of trunks in the guest house. Should be some your size. I met her on the beach. She changed from the sun suit to a red bathing suit. She was stretched out in the sand, her face turned up to the sun, and her blonde hair spread out around her shoulders. Hi. Hi. Here. Spread out this towel. Get yourself some sun. Okay. You're a little white. More of a pearl gray, I'd say. <laughs> ah. Trunks look fine. I hunted high and low for a pail and a shovel. Gonna dig in the sand? I don't think I've been out on the beach like this since I was eight. I had a pail and shovel then. Seemed only fitting and proper. <laughs> Might be fun at that. Oh, Sure. Didn't you used to build castles with moats around them? Let the ocean come in and fill them up? No, I didn't get to the beach much before I came to California. Then I was a little old for building castles. Oh, you're never too old to build castles. But then there's always some guy who comes along, you know, running as though he was in training for a four-minute mile. Never sees your castle and plump. Runs right over it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've had it happen. But you said you never built castles. Not in the sand, but I've built them, and they've got stepped on. You can always build another. I did, another, and another. And now you're living in one, a big, beautiful one, right on the beach. Mm-hmm. What's your castle look like, Mr. Don? Oh, I design all kinds. Sometime when I've got a pail and a shovel, I'll show you. And the name is Johnny. All right, Johnny. Sometime you build me a castle. Sure. Hey, you've got a visitor. Huh? Guy just came out of your house. He's headed this way. Tall, dark, looks like an ad for strength and health. Exactly. Hmm. Dave Asher. Old friend? Nope. We're engaged. Oh. Hello, Dave. Didn't Bernice tell you I was coming down? Yes, she told me. This is Mr. Dollar. 
How do you do? This is Dave Asher, Mr. Dollar. He's happy to meet you. Really? Ah, oh, don't sulk, Dave. Tell Mr. Dollar you're happy to meet him. Why? Because it's too nice a day to put up with one of your moods. Is this guy the reason you haven't been available for the last few days? I only met Mr. Dollar an hour ago. Then you won't miss him. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Have a nice trip. I don't think you get the point. Oh, sure I do. You're unhappy, so you're leaving. Mr. Dollar, maybe you don't know it, but Miss Shaw and I are engaged. I know it. Dave, for once in your life, try to act I drove like... all the way down here to see you. I haven't seen you since Sunday night, and there's a few things I like to settle. In private. Now, maybe you get the point, Mr. Dollar. I'm not leaving. You are. Oh, now, this is really too no, much. No, wait a minute. Maybe I'd better you go. You stay right where you are, Johnny. Oh. Oh, it's Johnny. Yes, it's Johnny. My family thought it up. You're a pretty funny man, huh? Now, you listen to me. You just go right back out to your car and drive yourself away from me. I'm not leaving until he does. I beg your pardon. You're leaving, and you're leaving right now. Now, turn around. You're serious? I was never more serious in my life. Now, get off the beach. We're through. Fine. Hi. I'm sorry, Johnny. Cigarette? Thanks. It's rather... It's rather unpleasant. You want to borrow my shoulders? Oh, it's been coming to this for a long time. I don't know why I didn't stop seeing him sooner, except that I... Really didn't know him for the first few months. You know, party manners, impress the lady with a well-oiled line. I guess I was being as insincere as he was. This is a town for insincerity, Johnny. It's like the first house I bought. Beautiful. Lived in it for six months before I discovered the termites had eaten away half the foundation. Who is he? Well, just a rich young man. Spoiled disposition. He was with you the... The night you were robbed? Yes. Mm -hmm. We had a big fight. He took me home. It was over then. I knew it. And I have to admit I was a little dewy-eyed over having made one more mistake. (laughs) And when I discovered the jewelry was missing, uh, it was just too much. I must have cried for two whole hours. I have to go to a party tonight, Johnny. Dave and I were invited. What'll I do? Have a headache? That's too easy. He'll be there with someone. What are you doing tonight, Johnny? No plans. Will you take me to the party? Gonna show him you don't care, huh? I don't want to show him anything. I'd like to show myself. I play a lousy second fiddle. You don't have to play anything. Just take me to the party. When you get bored, say good night. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley Spearmint gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, the lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I guess it wasn't a very big party by Hollywood standards, but it frightened me. About 150 guests, producers, stars, and some odds and ends that always show up at a party like that. Dave Asher was there, guzzling champagne as though the Texas drought had hit Beverly Hills. About midnight, the party was under full steam, and Nancy led me outside, where a long walk stretched out over half an acre of lawns and wound around a big lighted swimming pool. Having fun? Well, I'm a little out of my element. I thought being together might make the difference. 
Being with you is the nicest thing that's happened in a long, long time. But I'd rather be sitting on the beach. Yes, that would be nice. Johnny? Hmm? Kiss me. Well, what was that for? Does it have to be for something? Well, doesn't it? I guess so. I wanted you to kiss me. I thought it might be nice. It was. Let's get out of here. All right. Well, 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 well. Hello, Dave. Goodbye, Dave. Going someplace? Yes, we were. Why don't you be a good boy? I want to talk to you, funny man. Dave, please. Let him get it off his chest. Yeah. Yeah, it's good for one to get something off one's chest. Right? If you say so. I do. I do. I say so. Johnny. It's all right. Sure, Nancy, it's all right. Funny man can handle himself. Can't you, funny man? Look, Sonny. Whatever it is you've got to say, say it and get out of my way. I don't like you. Great. I'd hate to be your first friend. And I don't care much for your date, the little glamour gal. Big movie star, Miss Nancy Shaw. Be careful. Yeah? Please, Johnny. Okay. Get out of my way, Mr. Asher. (laughs) I don't think so. Well, then it's about time you got your first lesson. Occasionally, you're bound to run into guys like me. And what do I learn? To wish you hadn't. Can he swim? Like a fish. Let's go sit on the beach. Let's. We left while young Asher was pulling himself out of the pool and drove back to the beach. Turned out to be a lovely evening after all. We sat on the beach and talked about things until we couldn't think of anything else to say. I left as the sun was rising behind the Malibu Hills and drove back to the hotel and crawled into bed. I'd promised to see Nancy for dinner, so I set the alarm and fell asleep. It was about four in the afternoon when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. This is Sergeant Dodd. Oh, oh, how are you? I just catch a little snooze. You have a big night last night? Well, I don't know. Nothing special. Why? You made the papers, front page. Huh? Yeah. It says here you knocked some young socialite into a swimming pool. Oh, I better get up. Anything new on the case? No, I thought maybe you might have something. What do you know about this guy you belted last night? He didn't drown, did he? No, but we've been doing some checking on him. Any particular reason? Well, we're checking everyone that's even remotely connected with Miss Shaw or any of the others who've been robbed. Well, all I know is that he used to be engaged in that to, uh, Miss Shaw. His name is Asher. Dave Asher. And, oh, yeah, she said he's got a lot of money. Oil wells. Yeah. Not a one. What do you mean? I mean, he looks like a phony. Nobody's ever heard of him. He's certainly not in oil. Does he have money? Yeah, but not as much as he pretends. Three months ago, he didn't even have a bank account, and he was living in a $7 a week room. Huh. Just thought you might be able to tell me something more. No, I can't. But I'll see what I can find out. Okay. Give my regards to Miss Shaw. I'll do that. Seems like a real nice girl. Yeah. Yeah. A half hour later, I pulled up to the beach house, got out, went down the steps to the front door and rang the bell. It had been a long time since I'd felt like that. I was really looking forward to seeing her again. Oh, Miss Shaw isn't in, Mr. Dollars. Well, she's expecting me. Miss Shaw isn't seen anyone for the next few days. She told me to tell you she was sorry. Now, wait a minute. Please, Mr. Dollars. What's the matter with you? What's wrong? There's nothing wrong, sir. Please, let me close the door. Your apron's torn. You've been crying. What's happened, Bernice? Nothing. Then I'll find out for myself. Nancy! 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 Nancy, are you in there? Johnny. Open the door. Please. Go away. I can't see you. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. I'll... I'll call you. Open the door. Oh, please, John. Nancy! Go away. Are you going to open the door or do I break it in? Johnny. 
I didn't want to see you. I didn't want any more trouble. <laughs> Honey, who did it? Oh, please. Please don't do anything. Don't say anything about it, please. The publicity would be awful. Come on. Sit down. Oh. oh. Have you seen a doctor? No. Bernice called him. He should be here any minute. He won't say anything. Who did it? Oh, Johnny, please forget it. Asher. Please, please. All right. Come on. You stretch out. Oh. You got any sleeping pills or anything? It's in the cabinet. <laughs> Here, take a couple. Come on. Now you just relax till the doctor gets here. You'll be all right. All right. You just take it easy. Okay? Okay. Is she all right, Mr. Dollars? Who beat her up? Was it Mr. Asher? Yes. Yes, he got here about an hour ago. I tried to stop and he hit me. He was crazy. He kept huh. hitting her. I found this on the floor after he left. Huh. Quite a diamond. Yes, sir. Hard cut. About two carats. He yelled, screamed like he was crazy. He was just terrible. Is she all right? Yeah, yeah. I want to use the phone. Yes, sir. I didn't want to keep you out, Mr. Dallas. But Monsieur was scared you'd do something. Somebody's got to do something, Bernice. You going to call the police? Yeah. I guess you have to. City Hall. Sergeant Dodd, please. Thank you. Robbery, Sergeant Dodd. This is Johnny Dollar. Oh, yeah. You got that list of stolen goods handy? Well, right in front of me. Why? Check it and see if there's a two-carat diamond. Oval, pretty deep. Wait a minute. Bernice. Yes, sir. You know those people that have been robbed in the last three months? Yes, sir. Monsieur and me were just talking about it this morning. Were they all friends of Monsieur's? Yes, sir. Monsieur was saying how funny Johnny? it was. Wait a minute, Bernice. Yes, Sergeant? There's no single stone on the list, but there's a ring, platinum setting with two small rubies, square cut on the side, and a two-carat diamond that fits the description. Oval, deep. Yeah. Look, Dodd, Dave Asher just beat up Miss Shaw. She's a mess. Doctor's on his way over now. Wait a minute. Bernice, what were you going to say? You said that Miss Shaw... She said how fun it was that all the people who were robbed, that she was over there to their house just before it happened. Dodd. Yeah? I think Asher's our boy. I think he went to those houses with Miss Shaw and cased them good. Found out what night the maid was off and anything else that might happen. Okay, but how about Miss Shaw's house? Asher was with her the night of the robbery. Then he's working with someone. He gets the layout, someone else does the job. Well, we can certainly run over and pick him up. Get him on an assault charge anyway. Yeah. I want to see Mr. Asher again. <laughs> Sergeant Dodd gave me Asher's address in Santa Monica Canyon and said he'd meet me there. I looked in on Nancy, who was getting drowsy. Then I told Bernice I'd check back to see what the doctor's report would be and then left for Asher's place. Yeah? Get up. I said get up! Let me go. You're out of shape, Dave. You should train on men for a while. You broke my nose. You're lucky. Now, where did you get this ring? Where did you get it? I... I, I bought it. Where? From a guy. What guy? Just a guy. I don't know him. He, he wanted to sell it, and I bought it. Is there anything the matter with that? Yeah, you're lying. Now, listen to me. I want some answers. First, where did you get this ring? I told you. Can you hear me? Yeah. You've been going to parties with Miss Shaw, casing the house, and someone else has been doing the jobs. Right? Okay. Hey, no, no, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a, wait a minute. Am I right? 
Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Who are you working with? Name's Fisher. Stanley Fisher. Where is he? He, uh, he lives at the Shelton Hotel on Ocean Drive. Where's the loot? He's got it. Why did you beat up Miss Shaw? I don't know. I, I just got mad. I don't know why you, why I did it. Don't you ever do anything and, and you don't know why? Oh, yeah, sure. But this isn't one of those times. Well, I guess I should have knocked. Oh, hello, Sergeant. He's your man, all right. I heard. Works with some guy named Stanley Fisher. Yeah, we know him. Small-time thief I'll have him picked up. I'm sorry about the mess. Asher and I had a slight difference of opinion. <laughs> Forget it. Why don't you get back to the beach and see how Miss Shaw's doing? I'll take care of things here. Thanks. Miss Shaw was fine. Took her a few days to get up and around. So naturally, I stayed in town until Dodd put the finishing touches on the case. Then I went down to the beach and gave her a full report. And now you've got to leave. I'm afraid so. I don't particularly want to. I guess it's better. Why? I don't know. Do you? Sure. So I can come back. Will you? The next time my expense account brings me to California. I will personally rob every house in the neighborhood. You do that. Well, I'm going to catch a plane. Johnny, come here. Nancy. Huh? Are you sure my hair isn't on fire? Well, that was that. Expense account item two, $115. Hotel bill and incidentals. Items three and four, two hundred ninety-five dollars eighty-five cents. Car rental, plane fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total six hundred and four dollars and sixty-five cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store... Stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Thelma Johnson, Peter Leeds, and Vic Perrin. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. John Old Maynard, Johnny. 
Oh, hello, Mr. Maynard. Haven't talked to you in a long time. Want to go to work? Sure. What is it? We insure a Miss Isabel James, Tulsa, Oklahoma. She's been killed. How? Murdered. Like you to leave as soon as you can, Johnny. Won't take me long. See you at your office in an hour and you can fill me in on the details. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Isabel James matter. Expense account item one, $103.65, plane fare and incidentals between Hartford and Tulsa, Oklahoma, after receiving from you the necessary information concerning the case. I arrived in Tulsa the next morning, registered at the hotel and went directly to the police station where I introduced myself to Captain Clifford Kissig. Yeah, got a teletype from your company. Said you'd be in this morning. Good trip? Fine. You're investigating the Isabel James murder. That's right. I was hoping you could give me some help. I'd sure like to, but it's got us stumped. We've had three others like this already. Three others? Yeah, all the same. Isabel James was the fourth. Looks like Tulsa's got a Jack the Ripper. All with their throats cut? Yeah, four killings in the last three weeks. You're after a madman. Yeah, pretty smart madman. Haven't got a lead. Not a one? Always picks a lonely spot, never a witness, never anyone who saw anything or heard anything. What's he use, a knife? The lab thinks it's a razor, straight razor. Got the town a little jumpy. I can understand. But we'll get something. Sooner or later, the killer will make a slip or somebody will tell us something. What happens in the meantime? We just got to pray there ain't no more killing. Hmm. How far is Dawson from Tulsa? Not very far. Going over to see the dead girl's uncle. Yeah, he's the beneficiary. Mm Mm-hmm. I found the policy in her belongings. I was the one notified your company. You know the uncle? Had him come down and identify the body. Uh, How much does he get? Ten thousand. Well, he can use it. Just an old farmer. Well, I'm going to run over and see him. All right. Uh, how long are you going to be in town? Well, I'm being paid to investigate a murder. I guess I'll be around until somebody catches a killer. <laughs> Captain Kissig advised me where I could rent a car, and a half hour later I was driving a small coupe out of the Tulsa city limits heading for Dawson. The dead girl's uncle, Morley Parrish, lived a few miles east of Dawson in an old rundown farmhouse that was in the middle of six or eight acres of parched earth. He was a man in his late fifties, weather-worn and thin. He met me at the door with a look of suspicion. What do you want? Mr. Parrish? Yes? My name is Dollar. I represent the insurance company that covered your niece's life. I'd like to talk to you about it. About what? About your niece, her death. She's dead. What's there to talk about? You're the beneficiary. You got $10,000 from the insurance company. Come in. <clears throat> Sit down. Uh, I get, um, how much you say? $10,000. You want a drink? Well, I don't... I got a jug of whiskey. I've been saving it. <clears throat> you say your name's, uh... Dollar. 
What company you work for? National Life and Casualty. I get ten thousand dollars. That's um, right. I had to have a swig. <coughs> oh my, you swallowed wrong, huh? Yeah. Oh, well, give me that. Ah. Ah. <coughs> well, no wonder. I didn't shake it up. Shake it up? Oh, I sure. <laughs> Got to shake it to make it smooth. <laughs> you sure that didn't come with a fuse in it? Emmett Willis made it himself. Brung it by last month. Here, you try it now. Well, I really don't think oh, I... Oh, go ahead. You got a bad sample. Okay. You see how much smoother it is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you just got to shake it up. No, I'll have one. Ah, yes. Oh, my. Yeah, well, that, that's right. Tasty. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about your niece. All huh? right. Let's talk. You know why anybody would want to kill her? No, it's that fellow that's been killing all them other girls, ain't it? Yeah, I guess so. That's what the police say. Well, it seems to me he don't care who he kills. Just as long as it's a girl. <laughs> Another swig? No, no, thanks. Your niece left you when she was 16, didn't she? Yeah, I'll take my niece again. Yeah, yeah, 17, 17, I began. She ran off to Tulsa. You see her much after yeah. that? Not much, maybe once, twice a year. When was the last time you saw her? Uh, the other day in the morgue. No, I mean before that. Yeah. Oh, my. Well, that was about a month. She didn't write or... Oh, look, Mr. Police, they ask all them questions. I know it. And you got to ask them all over again, huh? If you want to get your $10,000. <laughs> well, okay. No, she didn't write. She never wrote. At least in the last five or six years, she never wrote. <laughs> when she first got to Tulsa, she used to write now and then. Last time I seen her, she didn't say nothing about what she was doing or who she was seeing or anything. So I can't very well help you find out who killed her. <laughs> Come on, have a swig. No, thanks. I'm in a rented car. Yeah, suit yourself. And once I open the jug, it gets finished. <laughs> then you better finish it. Naturally, I will. <laughs> oh, 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 man, oh, man. Delicious, huh? Oh, you bet. I left before he finished the damage on. It was getting dark, and he stood on the porch, leaning against a post and waving goodbye between the last few swallows. Back in Tulsa, I went to the hotel, where I took a hot shower, then stretched out on the bed to relax for a few minutes before going out to dinner. I smoked a few cigarettes and had just about decided to have some food sent up to the room when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. This is Clint. Huh? Captain Kissick. Oh, hi. Got back from Dawson about 40 minutes ago. What'd you think of the old boy? Quite a character. Thought if you weren't doing anything, you might like to drop down to the station. You got something? Yeah, just picked up a suspect. Might be our man. What makes you think so? He was following a girl. She spotted him and got worried. When he got too close, she began screaming and he ran. She gave us a pretty good description and about 15 minutes ago, a couple of the boys picked him up. The girl identify him? Yeah. Said he was the one who followed her, all right. Well, it seems to me you're going to need more than that. Well, we might have it. When the boys searched him, they found a straight razor in his pocket. Coming down? Right away. His name's Story. S-T-O-R-E-Y. Alvin Story. He hasn't said anything interesting. But you think he's it? Yeah, I think so. Nothing definite except the razor and his actions, but I just got a hunch. What's he say about the razor? Not much. Admits it's his. Says he was just carrying it in here. You're just taking a walk. Yes, sir. That's right. I was just taking a walk. And you weren't following the girl. Huh? I told you I wasn't. I told you I was just taking a walk. If the girl thought I was following her, well, I can't help that. I wasn't. I was just taking a walk, like I said in the first place. Hello, Captain. Hello, Alvin. Back with someone to relieve Sergeant Haddock? I'm not tired, Alvin. Well, you're gonna be if you keep on like this, because I've told you the truth, and I'll just keep right on telling it all night if you keep asking me. Have a cigarette, Alvin? I told you I don't smoke. Honest, Captain, this is just a waste of time. I've told you the truth, and you're just a waste of your time with all these questions. We've got a lot of time. Now, let's go through it again, Alvin. 
Where did you get the razor? Why well, I bought it. Where? At a hardware store. You can check it. I bought it at a hardware store about three weeks ago. I used it to shave with. Not to kill anyone. Honestly, I didn't kill anyone. I'm not the one you want. I'm not that person that killed all those women. We never said you were, Alvin. But you think so. Just because that girl thought I was following her. Oh, well, weren't you? Well, no. I told you I was not following that girl. You were on your way home. Yes. You told me before. That I was on a way to a show. Yes. I wasn't on my way home. Keep asking me all these questions. I get confused. I made a mistake. What show were you going to see? Well, I... What show? Oh, no one in particular. I was just going downtown to see what was playing. You were headed downtown? Yes, to see what was playing at the shows. The girl says you were following her. Well, I don't care what the girl says. She's lying. I wasn't following her. But you were walking behind her. Yes, I... I might... Yes, I was probably walking behind her. Well, she was going in the other direction from town. Well, then I wasn't behind her. I tell you, I was going... Police sergeant named Haddock kept working on the suspect, quietly, persistently. Alvin Story, a tall, frail-looking man, dressed in blue jeans and a leather jacket, sat behind the table trying desperately to be calm and anticipate the sergeant's next question. After half an hour, the captain and I left and went upstairs to his office where he fixed coffee. Cream and sugar? Black will be fine. Well, what do you think? I don't know. He's a strange one. Yeah. If I had to pick types, I don't know. It's hard to tell about anybody in a police station. Maybe he was following the girl. She starts screaming her lungs out and he panics. The law picks him up, finds a razor on him. Maybe he's not the killer at all. But he knows he looks guilty, so... He gets good and scared. Hmm. Guys act awful funny and make a lot of mistakes when they're scared. He just carries a razor around with him. Well, isn't it possible? Oh, yeah. But I still think he's our killer. Well, I have to admit I'm inclined to agree with you. But there's always a chance he's not. You never know. Kissing. Yeah. Okay. Well, we know now. Story? Yeah. He just confessed. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, the lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley's spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley's spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley's spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley's spearmint. Chewing gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Alvin Story still sat at the table in the dim, bare little room. He looked tired, but he looked relieved. A stenographer was set up at one end of the table, while Sergeant Haddock leaned against the wall and smoked a cigarette. Captain Kissig crossed to the table and sat on the edge of it, facing the suspect. Can we get this thing over with, Captain? Can we finish it up and let me go lie down? Well, the stenographer's ready. Tell us about it. Well... What's there to tell? I killed them. I killed all of them. Isn't that enough to say? That's what they'll hang me for. Anything else I say won't make any difference. Why'd you kill them, Alvin? I don't know. You know something? I really don't know. I I just wanted to. First one, I, I saw her and I just wanted to. I, I guess I thought about it before I saw her. 
Yes, I, I, I used to lie in bed and think about it. I used to dream about it, too. I used to wake up and feel like I'd really done it. Sick all over and scared. I felt so terrible. All like I feel now, kind of. Yeah. It's like a dream now. Right now, it's like a dream. But it isn't. Tell us about the first one. Do I have to? It'll help. It's kind of hard to remember exactly. I bought the razor and I waited for it. On Garvey Boulevard? I guess so. Try to remember. Yeah, it, it was Garvey. It was late at night. What night? The night of the 11th? Maybe. I, I think so. I, I think it was Tuesday night. That's right. And I killed her. You knew her? No, not really. It's hard to explain. Well, did you know any of the other three girls? Two. No, with the last one, it makes four altogether. No, three. Now, think about it a minute, Alvin. There, there were... Only three. I ought to know. Three girls. No, now, now, try to remember, Alvin. I don't have to try and remember anything. There were three. Just three. One, two, three. I know. Why would I want to lie? I'm not saying you're lying, Alvin. I, I, I even just... know the names. I cut the pictures out of the paper. Tell me the names, then, Alvin. Well, certainly. Mary Knapp, Virginia Vitello, and Thelma Greer. I know all of them. I, I kept a record. What about Isabel James? Who? Isabel James. Oh, yes. She was in the papers the other day. That's right. Somebody killed her like the others. I read about it. I thought it'd be blamed on me, but it didn't make any difference. One or ten, what difference would it make? For a half hour, they questioned Alvin's story. Time and time again, he admitted the three killings. And time and time again, he denied any connection with the fourth, the murder of Isabel James. <laughs> Expense account item two, $4.95. Breakfast for Captain Kissig and myself. After which, I returned to the hotel and crawled into bed. A lie detector test would be given to Alvin sometime late in the afternoon, so that gave me at least six or seven hours to catch up on my sleep. I left a call at the desk, turned over, and closed my eyes. Johnny Dollar. Three o'clock, Mr. Dollar. Oh, uh-huh, thanks. And a Mr. Parrish has been waiting in the lobby to see you. Parrish? Yes, sir. Mr. Morley Parrish. He's been waiting over an hour. Okay. Send him up. Yes, sir. Come in, Mr. Parrish. Have a seat. Thank you. I've been waiting downstairs for over an hour. Oh, I'm sorry. But I was up all night. I told the desk not to disturb me until three. Oh, gee, that's all right. I know you city fellas don't like to get to bed much before the sun comes up. <laughs> I didn't mind waiting. I was with the police. Oh? I've been working with them on the death of your niece. Oh, is that right? Well, uh, that's the reason I come to Tulsa to see you. I was wondering when I was going to get the, uh, get the money. Well... <laughs> see, I got a chance to get me a right smart section of land. Trading the place I got now, plus 8000 It's a real good buy. Oh? Well, Mr. Parrish, it might be some time before you get the money. Oh, well, how come? Oh, there's a routine that has to be followed. I have to finish my investigation. You're still then... investigating? Oh, sure. You see, your niece's death is still unsolved. Well, is that fellow that's killing all them other girls? It so... certainly looks that way. You... you mean you got to catch him before you can pay me? No, but I've got to make sure that he's the one who killed your niece. You think maybe he isn't? Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Perry. Well, she got killed just like all them other girls. Not and... exactly. Huh? I said not exactly. You see, the razor that killed your niece and the razor that killed the other girls aren't the same. Well, how do you know that? The police laboratory report. They can tell if it was a different razor? Oh, no. Come on, Mr. Donner. Maybe I ain't the brightest. It's a fact, Mr. Before. Parrish. How do you think they knew it was a razor in the first place? Not just a very sharp knife. Oh, they can tell, all right. Well, maybe the killer ain't using the same razor. Yeah, we've considered that, but 
We can't tell. He hasn't killed again. Maybe he never will. You mean I might never get my money? Well, now, Mr. Parrish, it's not quite that bad. I want to see you get your money. You've certainly got it coming. But I can't honestly recommend payment to my company until the case is solved. What do you mean, until you catch the killer? That, or until we're certain the same man that killed the others killed your niece. Well, it seems to me you got to catch him to prove that. It... Yeah, unless he kills again, with the same razor he used on your niece. Then we can be pretty sure that he's changed razors. Well, maybe he's got uh, two different ones. He... Mm, maybe. Uh, well... You have to go? Yeah, i got to be getting back. As long as I ain't going to get the money right away, there's no sense in hanging around. Don't be discouraged, Mr. Parrish. Just as soon as I'm convinced the killer's changed razors, you'll get your money. Yeah, Dollar, we just gave Troy the polygraph test. According to our experts, Troy killed all the girls except Isabel James. Look, Captain... Morley Parrish was just in my room. I gave him a cock and bull story about his niece being killed with a different razor. A different razor? I think maybe he did it for the insurance. Read all the stories in the paper about the killings and decided to kill his niece. Uh, and then everybody just chalk it all up to Alvin's story. Right. Only I didn't tell him that Alvin's story had been arrested. Explain about that different razor. Parrish left here thinking he wasn't going to get the 10000 until I was certain the same man killed his niece to kill the others. He thinks your police lab proved that Isabel James was killed with another razor. And he quickly came up with a solution that the killer had changed razors or had two of them. So what? I think he'll go out and prove it. What? You mean you think... I think he's simple-minded enough to try and kill someone just to make it look like the killer has changed razors. Well, I sure hope you're wrong. Well, so do I, but it's the only way we could prove anything. Where is he? He just left. But holy cow, if you're right and he's wandering around... Relax. Relax. He'll go back to his farm in Dawson first. What makes you think so? He has to get the razor, doesn't he? Ten minutes later, Captain Kissig picked me up in his car, and we drove well over the speed limit getting to Dawson. Just west of old Morley's farm, we pulled off the road and turned off our lights. Well, the house is dark. Where is he? Still on his way from Tulsa. We got here pretty fast, Captain. Yeah, we did, didn't we? Come on. Let's walk down to the house. He have a car? I don't know, but I doubt it. I didn't see one the last time I was here. Dollar? Hmm? What if you're wrong? What if you've guessed wrong? What if he did have the razor on him? Well... That's a pretty good question. The night was warm with a big red moon. We walked down to the old farmhouse while a coyote howled way off in the distance. We found a spot by the side of the house where we could see the road and still be hidden in the shadows. We waited for Morley Parrish to come and get his razor. About an hour later, the old man came walking down the road and went into the house. After a few moments, a light flared in the back room. We could hear him moving around, then the light went out. Hold it. Who's there? Who are you? It's me, Mr. Parrish. Mr. Dollar? Yeah. This is Captain Kissig with me. Uh, what do you want? Just came down to see you. Well, I got business. I got to be going. In a minute. Uh, there's a drink in the house, another jug behind the stove. Go on in and make yourself comfortable. <laughs> I'll be right back. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Perry. Well, look, I got to hurry. Where are you going? I got business uh, in Dawson. You going to walk? Oh, sure. I always walk. <laughs> I hitchhike if I get a lift. We've got a car. We'll give you a lift. No, I don't want to put you in no trouble. No trouble. Mr. Parrish... What did you pick up in the house? Huh? What, oh, nothing. I... What have you got in your pocket? One, nothing. 
Uh, no, what do you want? You ain't got no right to do... Do you own a straight razor, Mr. Parrish? You better give it to us, Mr. Parrish. And be careful how you do it. I've got a gun pointed at you. Well, you knew it all the time, huh? I had a hunch. Uh, I hear you. Hmm. Is this the one you killed your niece with? Yeah. You were going to kill somebody else. Oh, there ain't no difference after the first one. and I sure could have used that money. Gee. Man, oh, man, that was a wonderful little farm, but I... Oh, I just guess you can't beat them scientific police methods. <laughs> I sure thought I had it all figured out, too. Gee, I wish... Oh, we going to go now? Yeah. What's going to happen to my farm? They'll sure hang me, and I ain't got no relatives the to take care of. The state will take care of it. Come on. Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Why don't you just sneak back later on, get that jug? There's no sense in wasting it on some stranger who wouldn't appreciate it. We took old Morley Parrish back to the station where he gave us a complete confession. He'd killed his niece for the insurance the way I'd figured. When we told him that Alvin Story had confessed that afternoon, old Morley just shook his head and said something about policemen being a whole lot smarter than most folks give him credit for. Expense account item three, $11.80, dinner for me and Captain Kissing. After which I returned to my hotel, turned in and got a good night's sleep. Expense account... Items four and five, eighty-nine dollars and forty-five cents, car rental and hotel bill. Item six, hundred and twenty-five dollars and nineteen cents, plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, three hundred and thirty-five dollars and four cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Joe Duvall, Parley Bear, Howard McNear, and Clayton Post. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. WBBM FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment John Lund as Johnny Dollar. Philip Martin, Johnny. Hold on, Mr. Martin. Got a job for you. Fine. Man named Carl Nelson is insured with our company. He was killed. How? Shot to death. 
got a police record, small-time hoodlum. Beneficiary is a woman named Gilkerson, Maud Gilkerson. Uh-huh. She disappeared. Police think it probably has something to do with Nelson's death. Want to see what you can find out? Sure. All right. Get down to New York as soon as you can. Contact Lieutenant Korchak at 11th Precinct Homicide. He'll give you all the help he can. I'll get right on it. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley Spearmint gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Nelson matter. Expense account item one, $15.36, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon and after registering at the hotel, went directly to the 11th Precinct Police Station where I introduced myself to Lieutenant Korchak of Homicide. Uh, how much does your company insure the frog for? The frog? Uh, Nelson. He was called the frog. He, he looked like one. Oh? <laughs> he was insured for 10000 And Maud Gilkerson gets the money. Do you think she had something to do with the killing? No, I think she knows something about it. Any theories about why he was killed? Nothing definite. The frog was a hood, long record, did time twice, been in every racket from the numbers to stick-ups. You know, you don't generally get anything definite on a killing like this. Some of the boys wanted him dead. Who or why is hard to tell. He's been associated with Ellis Hartje for the past year or so. That's pretty big company. Yeah, Hartje's about as big as it come. Probably got unhappy with a frog and had him eliminated. Have you questioned Hartje? Sure, but just as a matter of routine. If Hartje had something to do with it, it's going to be tough to prove. Well, I guess the first thing to do is find the beneficiary, Maud Gilkerson. Well, that's not going to be easy. We've done a lot of looking. Well, I got a friend in town that just might be of some help. Do I know him? Probably, but... I'd rather not mention who it is. He doesn't get along very well with cops. <laughs> not many people do. My friend's got a king-size allergy. But for the right people and the right price, he can be very informative. Well, good luck, Dollar. Thanks. I'll let you know if I come up with anything. Expense account item two, two dollars and thirty-five cents cab fare from the precinct to Skid Row and Hetz Hilarity, a saloon that always looked as though it wanted to collapse when the sun hit it too hard. Inside, I found Wilbur Truitt sitting at the almost deserted bar, sipping muscatel through a glass straw. <sighs> Hello, Wilbur. Bucko. You are indeed a sight for sore eyes. And, Bucko, my eyes are sore. Pull up a heifer white and rest yourself. Can I buy you a drink? Oh, noble prince, a king among kings. You've come in the nick. Can you buy me a drink? If it were not so early in the day and my spine not yet limber, I would bend and kiss your feet. I'll just take a rain check. Innkeeper, a flagon of your best amber tonic. Oh, Bucko, I've missed you. Do you realize what with economic conditions such as they are, that your absence has been the bane of my existence? Goodwill is a thing of the past. Wilbur. I once looked upon mankind with a warm smile and a kind heart. But I find it difficult to keep from becoming a complete cynic. 
people are pinching pennies completely out of shape. Soon the exchequer will be filled with a gigantic mass of unrecognizable copper. Why, a year ago I was averaging as much as 50 cents a day. A whole bottle. Maybe it's your pitch. My pitch? Sir, my pitch is a thing of beauty. An excursus of cogent puissance. A compassionate discourse on human suffering. Okay, My okay. pitch would tear the heart out of Mephistopheles himself. Wilbur. Uh, yes, Buckle. Where can I find Maud Gilkerson? You know why my eyes are sore, Buckle? No. Why are your eyes sore, Wilbur? I had to brave the morning sun. Things had become so desperate, I pawned my dark glasses. Oh, I'm sorry. If things don't improve, I may have to part with my glass straw. The only sure method of deriving substance when in the throes of the shade. Maud Gilkerson is worth a bottle. Granted. In fact, I'd venture to guess that the lady is worth uh, two bottles. Mm, you're probably right. I'll have to call her. I'm staying at the Yorkshire. She may not want to see you. Tell her I've got 10000 for her. I beg your pardon. Tell her the frog left a $10,000 insurance policy and she's the beneficiary. Good Lord, perhaps I was wrong. There are still a few good deeds left in the world. Sure. I just gave you two quarts worth. <laughs> Expense account item three, $2.60 for a cab back to the hotel, where I went up to my room and smoked a half a dozen cigarettes while I waited for Wilbur Truett to call. Around 4.30 in the afternoon, the phone finally rang. Johnny Dollar. Bucko? Yeah, Wilbur? I finally contacted the party. She's not happy. Did you tell her about the insurance? The first words out of my mouth. But it seems Mr. Nelson's insurance is not enough to bring color to her cheeks and a smile to her ashen lips. What does she want? Some insurance of her own. What do you mean? She's hiding because her life's in danger. She has no money to leave town. She'll make a deal with you. Go on. Enough money to leave the country. You said town. A logical progression. The town first, then the country. Believe me, Bucko, her plight is worth considering. What will she give me in exchange for the money? That is her own personal secret, but she told me to tell you it's worth every cent. All right. Go to 107 River Street, the last room at the back of the hall. Tell her Wilbur sent you. Right. Thanks, Wilbur. <laughs> put on my hat and coat, crossed the room, and opened the door to go out into the hall. But I didn't make it. There, standing on the other side of the door, about to knock, were two ugly-looking men dressed in loud jackets. Your name Dollar? Yeah. Mind if we come in? What would happen if I did? We'd come in. That's what I thought. Then why'd you ask? I make little bets with myself. I want to talk with you for a few minutes, Dollar. Okay. Okay. What are you doing in New York? It's a nice town. Want some advice? Not especially. Make a little bet with yourself you're going to get it anyway. I'm a lap in front of you. Then here it is. When Bert asks you a civil question, give him a civil answer. Okay. Ask me a civil question, Bert. What are you doing in New York? It's a nice town. <coughs> oh! Why, you... Hold it. you will just belt you again. With a broken arm? You're pretty tough, huh? All in how you look at it. If breaking his arm is being tough, then that's the best name for it. Okay. We don't want any trouble. <laughs> that's a funny line. I won't ask you no more questions. That'll save some time. I'm just going to tell you. Lay off a Nelson, Kelly. You understand? Yeah. You said lay off the Nelson killing. Good boy. Because if you keep nosing around, somebody will just have to come down and investigate the dollar killing. Understand? Yeah. You said somebody will just have to come down and investigate the dollar killing. Fine, fine. Now that you understand, we'll be going. Nice meeting you both, informally, like this.
Expense account item four. Three dollars and twenty-five cents for another cab that took me down to 107 River Street. The address was an old two-story frame house that faced the water. I went in and walked down the dark hall to the back room. Who is it? Wilbur sent me. What's your name? Dollar. Come in. Are you Maud Gilkerson? Yeah. Wilbur said you'd make a deal. That's right. But I want to know what I'm getting in return. Look, Sonny, take my word for it. You're getting more than you're paying for. Now, how much did you bring? I got a couple of hundred. A couple of hundred? That's all I had on me. If you want more, I'll have to get it. Sonny, I got to get out of the country. This is enough to get you out of town. If what you've got is worth it, I'll send you the rest. Not on your life. When I leave this room, nobody's ever going to hear from old Maud again. You've got 10000 coming from Nelson's insurance policy. Uh, how long will it take to get it? Well, that depends. First, I've got to report on Nelson's death. I've and... got to get out of here as soon as I can. Another day or so, they'll find me. Well, it'll take at least three weeks before... Three weeks? Sonny, if I stay here, I'll be buried in three weeks. What are you scared of? Dying. I don't like the idea. I don't blame you. How soon can you get me some more money? How much more? Five hundred. What am I buying? I'm not telling you anything until I get the money. Okay, then we'll just forget it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm not trying to be tough, but what I got is too hot to go around shooting my face off about. How do I know if I tell you that you won't take it to the cops? You don't? Well, Wilbur said I could trust you. That's right. Okay, okay. I'll tell you. But give me the 200 on account. There you are. Okay, thanks. Uh, you want a drink? No, thanks. Mind if I have one? Go ahead. I don't usually take this stuff, but I, I need it. <coughs> oh, Frog left me 10000 huh? That's right. Nice guy. Nasty disposition, but he was okay. You didn't know him, huh? No. Well, he's been with the outfit about a year now. The outfit? Boss Harchie. Alice Harchie? Yeah. The frog done pretty well for himself. Until lately. Yeah, he, he always worried that hit him in the head. He was always planning they shouldn't. You know how it is with small guys like the frog. You never know when something goes wrong and the outfit sends word to hit you in the head. Frog always worried about getting hit in the head. Ah, oh, but he was smart. While he was alive. Yeah, yeah. He, he figured as long as he was smart like he was, he'd fix it so Hachi would never be able to hit him. Frog was in on most of the stuff hachi has been setting up in this town. Not big in it, you know, but in it. And he kept his eyes open. Found out too much and they killed him for it? Yeah, but it wasn't only what he found out. It was what he collected. Collected? Enough evidence to send Hachi and his boys away for a hundred years. Maybe the chair even. Did Hachi know it? Sure. Frog told him when he found out he was hot. He told Hachi if he got killed, the stuff would go to the D.A. And you've got it. I got it. Why didn't you give it to the D.A.? Well, even if they send Hachi up, he's got friends. I'd be dead before he went to trial. You want another 500 for... And that's dirt cheap. Especially when the dirt's liable to be in my face. How long do I have to get it? Well, just as soon as you can. Like I said, I ain't got much longer. You found me and you ain't got connections like Hachi. Oh, they'll find me. I'll have the 500 in an hour. Okay, okay. I'll make arrangements. Uh, wait a second. Here. What is it? Well, what does it look like? It's a key. You've been okay with me, so I'll trust you. It's a key to a locker in Grand Central, number 415. That's where the package is. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, the lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley's Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy all the time. 
Enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. After Maud Gilkerson gave me the key to the locker in Grand Central, I left the old house on River Street and started back for town. It was getting dark and there were no cabs in that section, so I headed west for the busy traffic. I'd only gone about a hundred yards when a car pulled away from the curb about a half block behind me. A big black car with the lights off. I thought about the key in my pocket and the evidence in the locker that would send the biggest hoodlum in the country away for life. I had to get rid of the key before they caught up with me. I turned a corner and there, a few feet in front of me, was a blind man. A beggar sitting with his legs folded and on his lap a tin cup with a stack of pencils. Bless you. Thanks. I'm going to need it. Hold it, Tyler. Well, good evening. Get in the car. Get in. In the back seat. Just don't take advice, do you, Dollar? You didn't say anything about taking a walk. I told you to lay off Ben Nelson, Kelly. Who says I didn't? You dug up Maud Gilkerson. Who? <laughs> oh! I told you. When Bert asks you a civil question... Give, give him, him a, a civil, civil answer. answer. Okay. So I dug up Maud Gilkerson. So what? What'd she give you? A lot of double talk. She gave me nothing. I think you're lying. But we let a couple of the boys off to talk to her. They'll find out. What happens in the meantime? We drive around while the goon searches you. Then we go see someone who wants to have a little talk with you. Okay, goon. Search him. Get down on the floor. Is that your name, goon? Get down there. I should have guessed. What? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Bert drove us around. The goon made me strip down to my socks while he searched my clothes. When he didn't find what he was looking for, he swatted me across the back of the neck, told me to get dressed. Then Bert drove us across town to a big apartment house that overlooked the river. Bert parked in the basement garage, and I was led into an elevator that took us to the penthouse. Alice Harji, the czar of the underworld, looked up from his evening paper. This is Dollar, boss. Did he find more? Yeah. Ernie and Frank are with him. Uh-huh. Well, sit down, Mr. Dollar. All right. Bert told me he and the gun paid you a little visit this afternoon, eh? If you can call that a little visit. The gun get rough? Don't tell me he can do something else. <laughs> You're kind of fresh, huh? I'm ripe enough to know I don't like getting pushed around. Sometimes you've got to take a pushing around to understand things. I don't take a pushing around from you or anyone else, Harjee. You think you've got a choice? Not at the moment, no. If I want you to take a beating, you take one. I'll make up for it. You ain't making up for anything. Now, you've got to understand, I'm running things, see? You ain't going to say nothing about what happens or what don't happen. So you just try and relax and take what comes, huh? You cooperate. It's going to be nice. He didn't have anything on him. Nothing, huh? I went over him good. He didn't have nothing. She tell you where it is, Dollar? What? You know what I'm talking about. Whatever it is, the frog left for Maud Gilkerson. I found Maud Gilkerson to tell her Nelson left her $10,000. Now, she didn't say nothing about me. Not a thing. She didn't say anything but thanks and get out. He was in with her for about 10 minutes. So it took her 10 minutes to say thanks and get out, huh? Look, what do you think she said to me? That's what I want you to tell me, Dollar. How can I tell you something when there's nothing to tell? I located Maud Gilkerson to tell her that Nelson... Okay, 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 you said that. I don't know what you're so worried about me for. Or an old dame like Maud. What can we do to a big man like you? Make me mad. Nello. Yeah. Uh Nah. 
All right, take care of it. Yeah. Now, that was Zerny. Maud, tell him anything? Yeah. She told him that she gave Dollar a key. Is that right, Dollar? She gave you a key? She told him she gave him a key to a locker in Grand Central Station. Is that right, Dollar? She told him the locker number was 415. The stuff was in a locker. Is that right, Dollar? Do me any good to say no? No. The goons searched me. He didn't have no key on him, boss. All right. All right, where is it, Dollar? I haven't got it. Take him somewhere and find out what he'd done with it. Yeah. Let's go, Dollar. You're making a mistake, Archie. Nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar. The goon and Bert took me back down in the elevator, hustled me into the car, and drove me back across town to a warehouse in the Bowery. In a small room on the second floor of the warehouse, the goon went to work while Bert stood by with a gun. Where's the key, Dollar? I don't know. <laughs> and you're the guy that was going to bust my arm. Be a whole lot easier if you just tell us. I can't tell you about something I haven't got. <clears throat> oh. The goon worked on me until I passed out. Then he threw some water in my face and started working on me again. Oh, he knew his job. It hurt, but it didn't kill me. When I was coming to for the third time, the phone rang. And Bert left the room to answer it. I knew this was the only chance I was going to get. When the goon leaned over me with a bucket of water, I grabbed the cuffs of his trouser legs and pulled. I staggered up to my feet as the goon started up off his back. I kicked him as hard as I could in the face. I grabbed the heavy bucket and stumbled over to the door. Just as Bert came back from the phone call. Hey, goon. Ask me a civil question, Bert. I tied them up as best I could, then took Bert's gun and the car keys. I found my way out of the warehouse, climbed in the big black sedan, and drove across town to the block that ran into River Street. All the way, I kept my fingers crossed that the blind man with the tin cup and pencils would still be there. Pardon me. Yes? I came by here a little while ago and dropped a key in your cup. Oh, yes, I found it. Uh, uh, here it is. I'd like to buy it back. Buy it? Yeah. Here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I guess I'd better be going. It's beginning to rain. No, it isn't. It's just bleeding out. I wheeled the big car back across town to the 11th precinct and caught Lieutenant Korchak just going off duty. He took one look at my face, mumbled something about careless truck drivers, and sat down to listen to my story. Bird and the goon? Yeah. I left them in a warehouse. They won't stay tied up long. The boys that picked up Maud Gilkerson were named Ernie and Frank. Ernie Phillips and Frank Seller. I'll have them picked up. This key could bust this town wide open. I hope you're right, Dollar. A lot of people have tried to get hard, <laughs> Let's go down to Grand Central. Right. Oh, uh, about Maud Gilkerson. What about her? They uh, fished her out of the river about an hour ago. Yeah, okay. Give me the key. Here. R.G. knows about this locker. Ernie and Frank forced Maud to tell them before they killed her. You sure? They called Harji while I was in his apartment. He told me. Ah, let's see what we've got. Huh. A package. Korchak, look out! Huh? I'd seen them just as they came around the corner. The goon was grinning through the teeth I'd kicked out, and Bert had a big lump on the side of his head where I'd nailed him with a bucket. Everyone came out with their guns all at once. Korchak jumped to one side, and I dropped to my stomach while I squeezed out all six shots from the gun I'd taken away from Bert. 
When the smoke cleared, Korchak was down, but he was smiling. He'd caught one high on the shoulder, but Bert and the goon were through being bad boys. The goon was dead, and Bert didn't have far to go to catch up. The wagon cleaned it up, and Korchak and I got ourselves patched up at emergency. They wanted to keep us in for observation, but Korchak had waited too long to get Harji, and nothing was going to stop him from making the arrest. I didn't want to miss it either. Korchak collected a squad, and we paid a visit to the penthouse. Think he skipped? Stakeout said he hasn't left the building. Come on, Harji, open up. This is Korchak, and I got a present for you. Get back. Come on in, Korchak. I got a little something for you, too. You know, I'm kind of glad he wanted it this way. I'll shoot the lock, and then we go in. All right, hit the door. You all right, Dollar? Yeah, sure. Is he dead? He sure is. Expense account items five and six. The two hundred dollars I gave to Maud, which they never recovered, and a dollar fifty for the two bottles I gave to Wilbur, who recovered three days later. The contribution to the blind man is on me. Expense account items seven and eight. Seventy-five dollars and ninety-five cents. Hotel bill, train fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total three hundred and one dollars and one cent, and multiple bruises. Yours truly. Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful. And there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Victor Rodman, Joseph Kearns, Herb Butterfield, Jim Nusser, James McCallion, Martha Wentworth, and Bill Conrad. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Henry Conrad, Johnny. Hold on, Mr. Conrad. How are you? Fine. Uh, Can you take a job? No trouble at all. Well, this is it. On Thursday of last week, we got a call from the New York police. They'd confiscated about $100,000 worth of rare gems. A man named Wells had been murdered, and they found the jewels in the water pipe beneath the sink. Your company insure Wells? No. One of our clients in Europe was robbed about three months ago. The same jewels? We think so, but we can't be positive. They've been 
removed from their settings and some of the larger ones have been recut. The police are holding Mrs. Wells and she claims the jewels are rightfully hers. She says neither she or her husband knew they were hidden in the water pipes. Well, unless it can be proved the jewels were stolen, she's just liable to end up with them. Possession, huh? Yeah. It's a funny one. When can you start? I've started. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley Spearmint gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, World Insurance, and Indemnity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Stanley Price matter. Expense account item one, $21.85. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City after receiving from you the necessary information concerning the case. I arrived in New York at 10 o'clock that morning and went directly to police headquarters where I looked up Captain Fred D. in charge of robbery detail. Now, uh, sit down, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Glad to help you any way I can. Well, if it isn't too much trouble, I'd like the whole thing from the beginning. Sure. Last Thursday, we got a call from a man named Price, Stanley Price. Said if we came to 956 East 114th Street, we'd find 100,000 in stolen jewels. Then there was a shot, and the line went dead. When we got there, we found the dead man. Wells? Yeah, Robert Wells. Shot twice in the head. You're holding the wife? Not since 8 o'clock this morning. We've got no evidence. No murder weapon, nothing. And of course, she swears she knows nothing about it. Your company thinks the jewels belong to one of their clients. Yeah, but they've been taken out of their settings and recut. Such a good job, they can't be identified. Hmm, only one thing that ties in... Wells returned from Europe last Tuesday. Been over there for about three months. The robbery was abroad. Yeah. Got anything on the man who gave you the tip? Stanley Price? No, nothing much. We know a Stanley Price. We think it's the same man. He's small-time hood. Picked up a couple of times. No convictions. Been making book lately, but we can't prove it. Can't find him anywhere. We got an APB out on him. And you released Mrs. Wells? Yeah. She living in the same place? Well, she went back to the apartment. She's still there. We got it staked out. Well, it seems to me the first thing to do is find Stanley Price. <laughs> We'd like to. I've got an old friend that knows all about small-time bookmakers. I'm going to drop by and have a talk with him. Anyone I know? Oh, probably. But he'd be hurt if I mentioned his name. <laughs> Hope you make out. Now, what about the wife? You going to see her? After I take care of a few details. What's she like? You won't mind a bit. I left headquarters, checked into a hotel, then made arrangements to rent a car. At 12.30, I was pulling up in front of a brownstone in the village where an old friend lived. His name is Henri Duval, abstract painter and lover of Paris. Mutuals. Henri. Who, who is he? Come on, Henri, open up. Go away. It's Johnny Dollar, Henri. I don't trust no one. My landlord is a man of many voices. I'm not your landlord. Do you remember my... 
Scalzano? Cross my heart. Johnny, <laughs> mon ami, Johnny. I haven't much time. I need a favor. I save you. I save you. Hello. For you, a portrait costs only um, $50. No pictures, Henri. No pictures? Ever heard of a man named Price? Stanley Price? No. Paid your rent? Uh, same answer. I have a small $10 bill here. Mon ami, you would attempt a lowly bribe? Well, what do you know? Here's another ten. Uh, you, you know, I would ask you to stay for lunch, but Greenbaum will not even let me look in his delicatessen window anymore. Twenty-five? Uh, bien. But I only do it because I have the love for Greenbaum. Show a little interest in Stanley Price for a minute. Stanley Price. Here. <laughs> Peasant. He's a bookmaker? Hmm. Of a sort. He owes me eleven eighty. Marianne in the eighth at Ayalia by eight lengths. Mon Dieu, such a filly. Henri. Stanley Price. Ah, oui, oui, the low life. Where can I find him? Je ne sais pas. Henri? But it is the truth. Scout's honor? But of course. If I knew where the peasant was, would I not collect my 1180? But of course, Scout's honor. Uh, look, you see? You're only holding up one finger. Uh, Le Cobb Scout. Oh. When was the last time you heard from him? When he took my two dollars that wins for me the 1180. And then he was in the fish business. Fish business? Ah, oui, oui, oui. I know because he brought me two elevators which I promptly made into a magnificent bouillabaisse for my landlord. <laughs> Terrible. The stew? I mean, no, me, no, me, no. Just the fish. Uh, believe me, those two elevators were so old, they remembered Jonah. Was he selling fish? No, 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 no. He was not selling fish. He was not selling fish. He was catching them. He had a boat. When I went down to collect my 1180, the boat was not there. Where did he keep the boat, Henri? Uh, <laughs> a disgusting place. It was called... Uh, uh, oh, a schooner landing... A place like that simply should not be. Do you know why? Stinks. Mm. Well, thanks, Henri. Oh, but, but you, you are leaving. Yeah, you can unlock the door. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Hello. Bonjour, mon ami. Vive la force. I climbed back into the rented coupe and drove to the waterfront where I finally located Schooner Landing. A lot of small boats were tied up in slips, and an old man sat outside a shack at the head of the dock, sunning himself. Hello. Hello. You run this landing? Yep. You know a man named Price? Stan Price? Yep. Yep. Seen him lately? Nope. When was the last time you saw him? You a cop? Nope. That's too bad. Why? He owes me a week's rent on a boat. Skip out? Yeah. Understand he was fishing down here. That right? Yep. Yeah. How long ago did he rent the boat? Two weeks ago. When did he skip out? About a week. Anything unusual about things that he did? Well, he weren't no fisherman. Why do you say that? Yeah, he didn't know the first thing about it. Fishing, that is. When he first rented my boat, he used to go out for two or three hours, come back with a couple of fish... Didn't have no gear to speak of, no live bait. Just a pole. Well, didn't that seem kind of strange? Weren't none of my business. He had a license. You mean a regular fishing license or a commercial? Yep. Commercial? 
Yeah. Did he do anything unusual the last day he was down here? Well, don't know. He went out about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and was back here about 6.30. Only thing unusual about that, uh, it's a funny time to do fishing. What date was that? Week ago, yes. Oh, no, no, wait, no. It's, it's a week ago tomorrow, Wednesday. Oh. Thanks, Pop. You sure you ain't a cop? Yep. G-man? Nope. Don't say no more than you have to do. Nope. Bye, Sonny. I left Schooner's Landing and made a beeline to the Bureau of Licenses, where I located the fishing license that had been issued to Stanley Price. It had his picture on it, and the clerk allowed me to take it. I thanked him, then climbed back into my car and headed for 956 East 114th Street and Mrs. Wells. Yes? My name is Dollar. What can I do for you? I get tongue-tied when I stand in a hall. You want in? That's it. Why? Ever see this picture before, Mrs. Wells? Come in. The uh, man in the picture, who is he? Don't you know? I've only seen him once. Oh, won't you sit down? Thanks. Where did you see this man, Mrs. Wells? He came to see my husband. He was leaving just as I arrived. Your husband say who he was? No, mentioned something about some business he had with him. Well, if it makes any difference to you, this man in the picture is Stanley Price. Oh, the one the police are after. The man they think killed my husband. The man who called and told the police about the jewels your husband hid in the water pipe. You're from the police? No. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. Your husband just got back from Europe a week ago, didn't he? Yes. By boat? Yes. What day did he arrive? Last Wednesday. You know, I don't think I've ever seen a man with such attractive eyes. They're really very unusual. <laughs> nice hair, too. So curling. I'll stop back when I've got more time and we'll straighten it out. I'm leaving? Yes, I'm going home and have another talk with Dad. Well, in case I might want to get in touch with you... I'm staying at the Shelton. Oh, uh, by the way, what time did your husband's boat dock? Five o'clock. Thanks. Sure. Say hello to Dad. I finally managed to get down to my car and drive back to the hotel. I called Lieutenant D and briefed him with what had happened to date. Then I went downstairs to get some lunch. As I crossed the lobby... Don't turn around. What is this? Just keep looking straight ahead. I want something. I was just going to have some lunch. It'll keep. Will it? I haven't got much time. Give me the picture. Oh. Let's have it. And if I don't? Then you get shot right in the lobby of the Shelton Hotel. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley Spearmint gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, a lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Let's have it. Well, it's the only one of me on a bare rug facing east. What'll Mom say? The picture of Stanley Price. Okay. That's being smart. 
Now you stay put. Count ten before you turn around. Believe me, Dollar, I mean it. I'll kill you if you move before ten. You're being pretty silly, Price. They'll pick you up sure. I don't think so. Oh, by the way, Henri Duval says to thank you for the 1180. Uh, 1180? Oh, yeah, tell him it was nothing. It sure wasn't. Start counting. One, two, button my shoe. Three, four, close the door. Five, six, pick up six. I counted to 20, just to be on the safe side. Any guy who'd stick a gun in my back in broad daylight in the middle of a hotel lobby was pretty desperate. I finished counting, put in a call to Henri Duval, then headed for the robbery division and Captain D. Right in the hotel? Yeah, not ten minutes ago. I had that picture of Stanley Price from the fishing license. Well, I don't get it. What's so important about that picture? Certainly not the only one of Price. We got mugs on him in the file. I got a big hunch. My boss said it was important to prove those jewels were stolen or have somebody positively identify them. That if this wasn't done in a certain amount of time, the jewels would automatically go to Mrs. Wells. Well, that's right. Under normal circumstances, if we couldn't prove they were stolen or that they belonged to someone else, we'd have to turn them over. But there are enough extenuating circumstances. Uh, the killing of Wells, the way the jewels were hidden in the pipes, a robbery in Europe, and Wells' subsequent return a short time later. We can hold on to them for a long time. Don't. What? Do me a favor and turn them over to Mrs. Wells. I think it'll bust this thing wide open. That's a big order. Look, the guy who stuck me up in the lobby knew I had the picture. Somebody had to tell him where I was staying. Only people who knew that were you, Mr. Conrad from my company, and Mrs. Wells. All right, Mrs. Wells told Price. It wasn't Price. It wasn't? Not unless he paid Henri, uh, that is a friend of mine, 1180 in the last couple of hours. Maybe he did. He didn't. I checked. Look, I, I'm sorry, but I'm confused. Yeah, so am I a little. But I figure something like this. Wells arrived last Wednesday by boat in the afternoon around five. That's right. Stanley Price was being a fisherman then. Okay. He'd rented a boat, taken out a fishing license. The day that Wells arrived, Price went out in the afternoon, stayed about two hours, came back, and then disappeared. Then Wells shows up with a sink full of jewels. Right. Probably had him on the boat. Avoided customs by dropping them overboard, and Price picked them up. Yeah, and Price could have killed him for them. Oh, it doesn't make sense. Wells was killed in his own apartment. Yeah? If Price picked up the jewels out of the water, why go to Wells, give him the jewels, let him hide them in the sink, kill him, leave without getting them, and then call the police? I'm convinced. Another thing. The pickup was pretty carefully planned. Wells couldn't have done it all by himself. He was in Europe. Somebody here had to plan it. Someone who knew Wells had the jewels. The wife. Yeah, looks that way. And the guy who stuck you up wasn't Price. Maybe there's a third party. Yeah, could be, but I doubt it. I'd like to go down to the morgue and take a look at Wells. Sure, I'll call him. Okay, Charlie. Uh, uh, didn't help his face. How'd you get an identification? A wife. This isn't Wells. It isn't? This is Stanley Price. You sure? The picture on the fishing license. This is the same guy. I'll have Mrs. Wells picked up. And miss out on the big catch? Let me take the jewels over to her. It'll look official. Insurance company agent and everything. The captain was reluctant, but he agreed. We went back to headquarters, and he presented me with 100,000 in jewels. I left for Mrs. Wells' apartment, followed by two of New York's finest. The captain was agreeable, but cautious. The boys staked out across the street, and I went into the building and up to the apartment. Hello. I spoke with Dad. Was his advice sound? Oh, he just said there were bound to be days like this. Then come in. Is this going to be uh, business? I come bearing gifts. Oh? I'm afraid the police can't keep these any longer. Uh, the jewels? Mm-hmm. There you are. I don't understand. Well, there's a little law after a certain but time. But the last time I talked with the police, they said they could impound them until my husband's murder was cleared up. 
No, afraid not. You mean I just get them? No strings? Not a one. Uh, Mr. Dollar. Mm hmm? Sit down. Sure. Now, you work for the insurance company, don't you? Uh huh. Well, my husband wasn't insured. Oh, he should have been. Not that you need the money now, but just suppose you hadn't been lucky enough to have your sink stopped up with all those nice little jewels. If my husband wasn't insured, why are you mixed up in this? You really want to know? Uh huh. My company thinks those jewels were stolen from one of our clients. I just can't stop looking at your eyes. They're even bluer in this light. Honey. Mm hmm? Get to it. All right. I think something's real wrong. Wrong? Mm hmm. I thought maybe you'd like to tell me what it's all about. Well, you've got the jewels. And what do you think I'm going to do with them? Well, that's up to you, isn't it? Your company thinks these jewels are stolen, and you're just turning them over to me. Can't do anything else. <laughs> Mr. Dollar. Johnny. Uh, Mr. Dollar, it's too easy. Disappointed? Well, suspicious. I've been around a little while. Somehow I guessed that. And I think you're trying to put little Lois in a bind. Really? Yeah. And even if you've got the prettiest eyes in the whole wide world, I'm not going to let you. You have something in mind? Mm-hmm. Good night. What? Oh! It landed right behind my right ear. I don't know what it was, but it was hard and it was cold. Whoever was on the other end of it had moved up behind the couch while Lois had kept me occupied. I went right to sleep and stayed that way for about ten minutes. When I came to, I was all alone, except for a large swelling that was getting big enough to wear a hat. I stumbled downstairs and looked for the two policemen on stakeout, but they disappeared too. So I found a phone booth and put in a call to Captain D. Uh, they're, they're tailing the wife. Stillman just checked in and said they were with her downtown. She's doing some shopping on Fifth Avenue. She's a decoy. She's leading your boys away from Wells. Where are you? In the Wells apartment. I got slugged about ten minutes ago. Wells must have been in the apartment the whole time. After he put me to sleep, the wife probably left by the front door and led your boys downtown while Wells left by the back way. Huh. You can bet he's got the jewels. He'll try to get out of town. I'll have every exit from the city covered. Okay, but he's smart enough to know that. When you're through, meet me at Schooner's Landing. Schooner's Landing? Yeah. My guess is Wells is going to take a boat ride. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon when I arrived at Schooner's Landing. The old man was walking up from the slips. Hello, Sammy. Pop. Which boat was Stanley Price renting? That one. Just getting ready to go out. I just got through gassing her up. Fella paid me Price's back rent. Wait, 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 there's something wrong? Uh, dollar. Good afternoon, Mrs. Wells. Bob! Drop the gun, Dollar. Drop it! The police are right behind me. Okay. Sit down. You taking him? He's an insurance man. He's going to be our insurance. If the police try anything, I'm going to shoot you, Dollar. Hold the gun on him while I get us out of here. I thought you were shopping on Fifth Avenue. I was. Those two policemen that were following me probably still think I'm trying on lingerie. That's what happens when the police force hires gentlemen. How's your head? Uncomfortable. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll bet. Boys. Yeah? Take over the wheel. Keep it headed right for the breakwater light. Know anything about boats? They float. It's going to be a long ride. It'll be pretty rough when we hit open water. You're Robert Wells, aren't you? That's right. How'd you figure it? I saw Price in the morgue. Your wife identified him as you, but the picture on the fishing license showed he was Price. You didn't know whether I was working with the law or not, but you had to get the picture to give yourself enough time to get out of the country. I knew the damage it could do if it got to the police. Why did you kill Price? He wanted 50% to fence the stuff. I said no and then caught him phoning the police. Had to kill him. So you put your papers on him and told your wife to identify him as you. The jewels were in the pipes under the sink. I knew the law would be there in ten minutes, so I had to take a chance they wouldn't find him. 
Bob, there's a boat coming up pretty fast. So what? Uh, I hate to spoil the party, but I think it's the Coast Guard. Bob! Shut up and stay with that wheel. But it looks like the police. Shut up! All right, Dollar. Get up on the bow. Oh, I'll get seasick. Mo! I want him to see you. Look, I don't swim very well. How about if I take this life preserver? Put it down. Sure! Bob! 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 <laughs> stay right there, honey. Stop your boat! Heave to! Better do like the man says. Come on, Dollar, stop that boat! All right, all right. Keep your barnacles on. Expense account item two. Eight dollars and seventy-five cents for a big dinner that made up for the lunch I'd missed. After that, I went back to the hotel and got myself 12 hours of a good night's sleep. Expense account item three, the $25 I'd bribed Henri Duval with. The last time I saw him, he was in Greenbaum's delicatessen, spending the money with his arm around Greenbaum. They were both smiling. Expense account items four and five, $42.15, car rental and hotel bill. Item six, $15.65, train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $113.40. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were John Stevenson, Kenny Delmar, Jay Novello, Howard McNear, and Mary Ship. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. For your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Philip James, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. James. Got a job for you. I'm available. This is an arson case. We insure the business of a Mr. Lester Matson. Plastics. Old factory burned down. $700,000. Police found definite evidence that rules out accident. How was it set? Some kind of high-octane fuel. Any suspects? No, not yet. Lieutenant Ridgeway at New York headquarters will fill in the details. When can you leave? Oh, a couple of hours. Fine. Good luck, Johnny. Mind if I break in here for a moment to say a few words? Just the other day, I was having lunch with a group of newspaper reporters. We were talking about the government and what goes into its operation when a thought struck me. It's a funny thing, I said... They call one branch of the government the State Department, 
when it handles all of our foreign affairs. Can any of you fellows explain that? Well, one of the reporters who writes political news piped up and said, actually, the State Department does more than handle foreign affairs. It also publishes all of the laws that have been passed by Congress and issues all the passports and visas for anyone traveling outside the United States. Well, just then, the waitress brought us our coffee, and she entered the conversation. Don't forget, she said, if you're ever on a quiz show, you can maybe win a trip to the moon by telling them that the State Department has the job of making sure the great seal of the United States doesn't get lost. And it acts sort of like a governmental Emily Post, too. While she was making out our checks, she added this bit of information. Did you ever hear of the Division of Protocol? That's part of the State Department, too. It's the outfit that makes sure foreign diplomats who visit America get introduced the way they should and get seated in the right places at official dinners and things like that. Well, after she gave us all that information, we tipped her and went back to work. And now I think it's time we got back to our program. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lester Matson matter. Expense account item one, seventeen dollars and fifty-five cents. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived in New York, registered at a hotel, and rented a car, which I drove to police headquarters. Lieutenant Ridgeway was a tall, nice-looking man with a pleasant smile and a firm handshake. Glad to help you as much as I can, Mr. Dollar. Sit down. Thanks, Lieutenant. Now, how much do you know so far? Only that the Matson plastic factory burned down. Not all the way, but nearly. And that you suspect arson? Positively. We made our report to your company, Mr. Uh... James. Yeah. He told me about the high-octane fuel. Mm-hmm, and a ten-gallon can. Night watchman heard the explosion, but by the time he got there, the fire was out of control. He could see the can and the fuel burning. He could smell it, too. No suspects? No, not yet. Any leads? The owner. You think he did it? No, no, he couldn't have. He was with his daughter at a dinner party. And you think he had someone else? No, 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 I don't think so. But you said he was a suspect. No, no, I said I had a lead. He's it. Something wrong, Dollar. I don't know what it is. First, I just put it down to the natural behavior of a man who just lost his business. Later on, when I talk with him further, well, I can't really put my finger on it, but I think he's hiding something. He knows something about that fight. He's scared. And that's it? Yeah, that's it. I'm pretty sure he didn't have anything to do with it. It's too successful. Nice bank account, wonderful home, wonderful daughter. Well, the factory was really worth a whole lot more than what he'll collect on the insurance, wasn't it? Well, that's what Mr. Uh... Your boss. Uh, James. Yeah, James. That's what he said. The assets of the business were in the millions. Yeah. Well, if anything, this will really be tough on Matson. Have to build again. Dyes, molds. Well, I think I'll stop out and see him. Yeah. Let me know what you think. I'll do that. The Matson home was across the river in Jersey. A big white colonial with a long circular drive that led up to the front door. A butler showed me into a spacious study, and I was told Mr. Matson would be down shortly. While I waited, I walked around and cased some of the first editions on the bookshelves. Oh. Hello. Hello, I'm Christine Matson. I'm Johnny Dollar, Miss Matson. I'm waiting for your father. Oh? Yeah. I'm uh, an insurance investigator. Insurance investigator? About the fire. Oh, yes. You have a beautiful house. Well, thank you. Beautiful. Wonderful collection of books. Mm, yes. I don't imagine one person could read them all. Not in a lifetime. No, I suppose not. Do you like to read, Mr... Uh... Dollar. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so bad with names. So am I. Yes, I like to read, but I don't get much time. Been playing tennis, huh? Mm-hmm. Just got back. Do you? Not anymore. I used to play a little... Well, I, uh, I guess I'd better get upstairs. Nice meeting you. It's nice meeting you. Will you be staying, I mean, will you be around for any length of time while you're investigating the fire? Well, that's hard to say. I hope so. Yeah, hello, Chris. Oh, hi, Dad. How was the game? Fine. 
Mr. Dollar? Yes, sir. I'm Lester Matson. How do you do? You two have met? Yes. Yes, I was just on my way upstairs. See you later, Dad. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Well, uh, your company notified me you'd be coming down, Mr. Dollar. Uh, you have a seat. You're uh, an investigator. That's right. Well, the police have already made a pretty thorough investigation. Yes, I've talked with Lieutenant Ridgway. Well, I can't tell you any more than I've already told them. You were at a party the night of the fire? That's correct. It's all in the report. With your daughter? Yes. When did you find out about the fire? When I arrived home. I... Mr. Dollar, I explained to you... That you said everything to the police, yes. That's right. There's absolutely nothing I can possibly add... Mr. This Matson, point. you're insured with my company for a lot of money. Hmm. Hardly what I lost in the fire. I'm aware of that. But I have a job to do, and this is an arson case. That's what the police say. A night watchman says so, uh, too. He could have been mistaken in the excitement. He could very Mr. easily... Mr. Matson, what difference does it make? It makes a great deal of difference. Your factory burned. You've suffered a considerable loss. I certainly have. I can understand how that would make a difference. But a fire is a fire. If you didn't have anything to do with it... I most certainly did not. Then why so much concern about whether it was deliberately set or not? Well, wouldn't you be concerned if somebody deliberately set fire to one of your factories? About the fire, yes, but buildings burn down all the time. Fires are started deliberately all over the country. I am sure this one was an accident. Well, accident or the work of a pyromaniac. If you're clear, you'll get the insurance. You, uh... You think this is the work of a pyromaniac? Seems like a pretty reasonable assumption. But you're sure it was an accident? Oh, I... I don't know. I, uh, just don't like the idea of a fire like that being started deliberately. I admit it's a little frightening. Yes, yes. You have to understand. A business like mine, so many inflammables, it's a little terrifying to think someone would deliberately start a fire. Well, what if it had happened during working hours? That's not very probable. Well, I've read about fires in hotels, people burned to death, deliberately started by some madman. Yes, the firebug would have a good chance in a hotel. He wouldn't be seen so easily. Most of the people in their rooms, and he could get in and out easily. And most of those fires are started during the night sometime. But a busy factory in the daytime isn't very likely. Hmm. Well, I, I sincerely hope you're right. I'm just going by the records. Well, you see, I, uh, I have two more plants. Let's hope I don't turn out to be the exception to the rule. I doubt it. Now, if you don't mind, Mr. Matson, I've still got to make a full report to my company. Oh, uh, certainly. I'll give you all the information I can. Lieutenant Ridgway had been right. Something was troubling Matson. Until I had suggested the possibility of a fire bug, he was determined to convince me the fire was simply an accident, and he'd been resentful of the impending interrogation. Then the pyromaniac angle had given him some kind of an out, because he'd relaxed immediately. While I questioned him about the details of the fire, he seemed actually cheerful, he even resurrected a few old bromides that I politely chuckled along with. But he told me nothing I hadn't already learned from the lieutenant, so I thanked him, shook his hand at the front door, and climbed back into my car. As I drove off, I felt sorry I couldn't have seen the daughter again, because it was certainly a sight worth seeing again. And again. I arrived back at the hotel, went up to my room, and put in a call to Lieutenant Ridgway. What'd you think? Yeah, something's bothering him. Yeah, yeah, I know, but what? Did you ever mention the possibility of a fire bug having been responsible for the fire? To Matson? Yeah. No, I don't think I did. Well, I mentioned it to him, and he liked it. What do you mean? Until I did, he was determined to call the whole thing an accident. When I suggested a pyro, he made a complete about face. Oh, he was subtle about it, but he forgot the accident theory. That's right. Yeah. He seemed actually relieved. Oh. What do you think it means? I don't know. It could mean he knows who started the fire. If he thought we were looking for a pyro and not some specific person that could incriminate him, that would account for his letting go of the accident theory. I see. He agree with the pyro theory and hope we do the same. Oh, what could he gain? Financially, he ends up in a hole. Yeah. 
Insurance doesn't figure. Oh, no, he's loaded. Got all the money he needs. And it's something else. Somebody started that fire, and I'm pretty sure Matson knows who and why. Yeah, now all we've got to do is find the who and why. Well, I don't mind working on the case for a while. Have you seen his daughter? Uh, yeah. Maybe she started the fire. Well, why would she do that? She's the type that could. I just met her for a minute, and I'm still smoldering. The lieutenant suggested a stakeout for Lester Matson. I told him I'd check with him later, took the cold shower, changed, and went down to the hotel bar to freshen up a bit. It was about 4.30, and I was pretty fresh when a page came wandering through calling my name. He told me I was wanted on the phone. Johnny Dollar. This is Christine Matson. Mr. Dollar? Yes. Hello. I found out where you were staying from your company. Well, that's nice. Why did you find out where I was staying from my company? But it's very important that I talk to you. All right. Where are you? I don't want to meet you at your hotel. I, I have to be very careful. Well, so do I. That's not what I mean. If certain parties saw me with you, my father's life would be in danger. Is this about the fire? Yes, it is. Would you meet me at the corner of 5th and 115th Street in a half hour? Sure. I'll be in a cab. I'll pick you up. I'll be the guy with the fire extinguisher. You know, many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? He has been called a lawyer by profession, a fighter by choice, and a politician by force of circumstance. And he was outstanding in all three fields. In 1788, at the age of 21, he was appointed public prosecutor for the region which is now Tennessee. As president, he was the first to introduce the National Convention for the nomination of presidential candidates. During his campaign for the presidency, his opponents attempted to smear him by an unwarranted attack on his wife, Rachel, who never recovered from the ordeal and died just before her husband's inauguration. If you don't have his name by now, here's one more clue. During the Battle of New Orleans, as Major General of the Army, he accepted the help of the pirate Jean Lafitte. Who was he? Andrew Jackson, 7th President of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. As long as the lovely Miss Matson was picking me up in a cab, I left the rented car behind and charged up expense account item two. One dollar and sixty-five cents for cab fare from the hotel to Fifth and 115th Streets. It was getting dark by the time I arrived. I waited for about ten minutes until Christine Matson's cab pulled up at the curb and she opened the door for me. Go ahead, driver. Well, good evening. Is this a terrible inconvenience? Oh, not a bit. Where are we going? I just told him to drive around. Mr. Dollar, my father's being blackmailed. In connection with the fire? He had nothing to do with the fire, Mr. Dollar. But he knows who did. Yes. They burned the factory to frighten him, to make him pay the blackmail. You mean someone's shaking him down? Well, about a week ago, he was approached by two men. They demanded he pay them a certain percentage of the profits from his business. In return for the percentage, they guaranteed him protection. So he didn't pay, and they set fire to the factory? That's it. Why didn't he go to the police? Well, he was frightened. Well, he couldn't have been too frightened if he refused to pay them. He was frightened for me. He thought maybe he could bluff them by not paying, but he didn't want to take a chance and go to the police for fear they might really do something serious. Losing a million-dollar business is pretty serious. He tried to bluff them, and it didn't work. Now he's really frightened. He knows they mean business, and they've told him if the police ever find out, they'll do something a whole lot worse than just start a fire. Do something to you? That's what Dad's afraid of. And you're not? Of course I am. Aren't you taking a pretty big chance telling me about it? Well, you're not the police. 
and I have been very careful. I was hoping you could help without it being necessary to start a wide-open police investigation. You're not giving the police much credit. If you'd told them the same story, they'd have kept it completely undercover. Oh, I thought about it, but too many people would have to know about it. And then there's always the chance of someone saying something or, or a slip-up. How do you know about all this? Well, my father told me, of course. Just like that? Daughter, darling, two men have been trying to oh, blackmail me? Oh, silly. He said nothing at first. He kept it from me. But you see, my father and I are very close, Mr. Dollar. We've never had any secrets. After the fire, when I saw how disturbed he was, I made him tell me. Does he know you've come to see me? Oh, no, no. He made me promise not to tell anyone. Well, I just had to. He's agreed to pay the men. You know what that means. Mr. Dollar, will you help? Well, I'll do what I can, but it's going to be tough without your father's cooperation. And you'll never be safe until these men are caught. He's afraid of what might happen before they're caught. Why, if they find out... There's no middle of the road in something like this. He's got to understand that. I think he does, but... Well, he'd rather lose everything than lose me. I'm all he's got. And he's pretty important to you, isn't he? More than anything in the world. Without his cooperation, I doubt if I'll be able to do much. And if he gives in to this, a man like your father, it'll keep growing until it kills him. Well, what do you want me to say? Tell the driver to take us to your father. Say it's all right for me to talk to him. All right, Mr. Dollar. She looked as though she might cry, but she didn't. She gave the driver her address, then sat back in the seat and kept looking straight ahead while the cab headed across the bridge for New Jersey. Expense account item three, $11.75 cab fare, which I insisted upon paying after we arrived at the Matson home. The butler met us at the door, and Chris led me into the study where her father rose to greet us. Hello, Dad. Uh, hello, my dear. Mr. Dollar? Good evening, Mr. Matson. Dad, I told Mr. Dollar. I had to. Believe me, Mr. Matson, it's the best thing. Chris? Yes. My dear girl, this... This can be very serious. Dad, it's already serious. I know, I know, but... but tell me, do you intend to bring in the police, Mr. Dollar? I promised your daughter I wouldn't, unless it was absolutely necessary. I see. Uh, you you know everything? Yes, Dad. I told him everything. But you've said nothing to the police as yet? No, I haven't. Oh. Mr. Dolly, if these men find out that you know... Who are these men, Mr. Matson? Mr. Dollar, I would like to tell you something. In the past... I've always confided in my daughter. This time I hesitated because of the, the possible consequences. But nevertheless, I, I told her. I did so with the provision that she keep the affair a complete secret. Oh, Dad. Uh, I, I'm not angry, my dear. Believe me. I'm sure you did what you thought was best. Unfortunately, you just didn't realize the gravity of the situation. Certainly I realized Dear, it. Dear, you couldn't have. You couldn't have. These men aren't fooling. They've already destroyed a million-dollar business. It was just lucky there wasn't anyone in the building. So you're going to give them what they want? Yes, Mr. Dollar, I am. You can't win. I'm not expecting to win. I'm just thinking of my business, my family. What would you do in the same situation, Mr. Dollar? I think you'd do exactly what I'm doing. I don't think so. That's easy to say. Look, Mr. Matson, I know you're in a tough spot. You said these men aren't fooling, and you're right. They'll do anything to scare you into paying their blackmail. They'll burn down a building, threaten you and your family, even kill if it comes to that. But you wouldn't do what I'm doing? Maybe, if I had some assurance, it would stop there. But don't you know what happens once you give in to them? Don't you think I've thought about that? Don't you think I've considered every possibility? They'll bleed me and bleed me until there's nothing left. I realize that. But there's no alternative. It's that or... You're or... afraid they'll kill me. Chris. 
Chris, you're my whole life. Well, then, Dad, consider me a little. Consider? Good Lord, that's what I'm doing. That's all I'm doing. Not now. What about a year from now? Two years? Five years? Well, Dad, if you give in to these men, what will it do to you? What will you have left five years from now? The business doesn't matter. I'm not talking about the business. We can both get along without the business if we have to. We did once, we can do it again. I'm talking about you. What will happen to you if you give in to this terrible blackmail? There'll be nothing left of you. It'll kill you. Mr. Matson. in some states there's a death penalty for kidnapping. But this kind of blackmail is worse than that. These men kidnap the one thing that people like you and me can't live without. Freedom. My daughter's life is worth my freedom seven days a week, Mr. Donner. If that happened, I'd just as soon be dead. Daddy, it would ruin you, and that most certainly would ruin me. There'd be nothing left of us, nothing of what we had. We'd, we'd just be alive. Makes a lot of sense, Mr. Matson. I hope you'll see it and help me get these men. But whether you do or don't, I've got a job. I'll try to steer clear of the police as long as I can because I made a promise to your daughter. But I'm going to try and get those guys. They have to be gotten. Dad, please. I don't know, Chris. I... All right. Oh, Dad. Who are the men, Mr. Matson? <laughs> Shot tore through the window and caught Matson in the chest. It was a swell punctuation point for my pep talk on freedom. Before Matson hit the rug, I was on my way to the study door with my gun in my hand. Outside, I circled to the spot near the window where the gunman had been standing. I stopped and listened. From inside the house, I could hear Christine Matson phoning for a doctor. And from not too far away, toward the front of the house, I heard a car start. I ran out to the drive and spotted the car pulling away about 50 yards from the house. Get back in the house, Chris. But Dad's bleeding. I can't stop the bleeding. How bad is it? I can't tell. I called Dr. Phillips. Well, get back in that house and wait. I got the car, but there's a man in that car with a shotgun. He may still be able to use it. Now, go on. I started down the driveway for the wrecked car. It was on its side, wrapped around a big oak. The only thing moving was the right front wheel, still spinning slowly. I reached the car and looked in. The shotgun, twisted by the impact, lay on the floor. And the man who'd fired it was halfway through the windshield, his life running out all over the hood. The driver's seat was empty. Don't move an inch. I'll turn around. Hand your gun back over your shoulder. Okay. I'll walk back to the house. Police will be coming any minute. I just want a car. I want to miss the Matsons. How far do you think you'll get? It's not how far I'm going to get. How far we're going to get. You're an insurance man. You're going to be my insurance. You're going to get us just as far as you can. It all depends what your life's worth to the law. I couldn't see his face. He kept behind me with his gun pointed at my back. We went around to the other side of the house to the garage and stopped. He shoved the gun hard into my spine. Open the door. As I started to open the big garage door, a car swung in the driveway, and we were suddenly framed in the glare of its headlights. I knew it was the doctor. The man with the gun in my back didn't. He turned, expecting the police. <laughs> doctor? Yes. Your patient's in the house. Lester Matson lived and later identified both men as those that had tried to shake him down. They both had long records. Both had done time. The man with the shotgun was named Ernie Starbuck. The other, Stan Cole. Starbuck they buried in Potter's Field, while Cole looked unhappy. 
Not because he'd lost a partner. More because he'd gained a new one. A cellmate in Sing Sing he'd have to put up with for the rest of his natural life. After the doctor said her father was out of danger, I went back over to Jersey to say goodbye to Christine Matson. Do you have to go right away? Well, case closed. Expense account likewise. You, um, you live in Hartford? Yeah. Sometimes I drive up that way. Oh? That would be nice. When does your train leave? 4.30. I don't catch that one. There's not another one until 12.15. Oh. Will you be saying goodbye to Dad? I thought I'd stop by the hospital on my way to the station. Are you going in to see him? Mm-hmm. Drive in with me. We can see him together. Maybe have a quick drink afterwards. I don't like quick drinks. No. Johnny. Yeah? Would it make so much difference if you took the later train? Oh, it sure would. But, uh, I'll take it. Expense account items four and five, $103.75 car rental and hotel bill. Item six, $19.80 train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $154.50. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were John Larch, Bill Lillian Bayer, Hal March, and William Johnstone. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring John Lund, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Ray Kemper, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Kemper. Are you available? Oh, very much so. We insured a Mrs. William Post, New York City. She was killed last night. Yeah, how? Murdered. A private detective named Paul Sachs and a lawyer named George Simon found her in her apartment. She'd been stabbed to death. Any suspects? Yeah, her husband, William Post. Lieutenant Roseman of the 5th Precinct is handling the case. Contact him, he expects you. Okay, I can leave in an hour. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley Spearmint gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley Spearmint gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the William Post matter. Expense account item one, $18.90, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived in the afternoon, registered at the hotel and rented a car, which I drove to the 5th Precinct Police Station, where I met Lieutenant Roseman, an old friend. I haven't seen you in a long time, Johnny. How's it going? Oh, can't complain. You're a lieutenant now. Getting up in the world. Hmm. Well, how about filling me in on this Post killing? Sure. The woman's name is Teresa Post. Married to William Post. Thank him. She was found last night in her apartment, stabbed four times. Gag shoved in the mouth, apartment robbed. A private detective named Sachs found her, huh? Uh Uh-huh. And uh, Mrs. Post's lawyer. George Simon. Right. They both arrived at the apartment about the same time. Both had appointments with the victim. They got worried when she didn't show up. Found the janitor and he opened the apartment for them. They discovered her lying on the floor in the bedroom. What was missing? According to her husband, all her jewels, about $15,000 worth. Also a cloth coat. My boss said you were considering the husband. Yeah. Three days ago, they had an argument and separated wife was filing for a divorce. She'd suspected Post playing around for some time, so she hired Sachs, a private detective. Sachs got the evidence, and she confronted her husband with it. He moved out and into a hotel. Sachs and the lawyer were supposed to meet her at 8 o'clock so that Sachs could turn over the evidence on her husband to the lawyer. Well, what makes you think it's the husband? Well, robbery looks phony. The jewel's okay, but the coat, the cloth coat, the only item of clothing that was stolen... Yeah? There was a full-length mink and a stole left in the closet. Oh, mm-hmm. The husband got an alibi? Sure. The woman he was seeing. The one who busted up the marriage. Oh, who is she? Well, the name of Hughes. Jane Hughes. Lives at 109 West 61st Street. And she claims Post was with her at the time of the murder? The victim had been dead about three hours. Killed around five in the afternoon. Hughes' woman swears Post was with her all afternoon from about one... Till late that evening. How'd the killer get into the apartment? That's another thing that makes me suspect the husband. No evidence that shows the killer broke in. No way he could get in a window. The apartment's on the eighth floor, and a fire escapes at the end of the hall. Well, I'd like to talk to the people involved. Oh, sure, Johnny. What do you want to start with? The man who found the body. I'm Sachs and Simon. I'll take Sachs first. Roseman gave me the address of the private detective, and I drove over to 52nd Street where I located my man. Paul Sachs was small, with a sour look and a wet handshake. What can I do for you, boy? I'm investigating the Post murder. Uh Uh-huh. That's, uh, well, well, well. Insurance man, huh? That's right. She insured for much? I forgot to ask. Yeah, probably is. Old man's loaded, boy. When did Mrs. Post retain you? Oh, about a month ago. Well, the fifth, to be exact. Wasn't too hard. The old man was pretty open about it. He was careful, all right, you know. Stayed to the more discreet places, but uh, he was... Well, you know how those fellas are. Last one to think someone's checking up, so they aren't as careful as they should be. Want a drink? Uh, no, thanks. I was lucky. Lucky? Yeah. Made me up in full before the old man cut her up. Sure you don't want a little belt? Uh, no, it's um, a little early. Eh, don't blame the old boy much, though. 
How's that? I mean, that little bit of fluff he was chasing around with. Mighty nice. Oh, yes, sir. Mighty nice. Hey, I got a couple of pictures here. Cops have got duplicates. I uh, keep these for the family album. <laughs> uh-huh. You think Post killed his wife? Oh, yeah, sure. He certainly had the motive. Threw him out and was going to take him for everything. I've been in on things like this, boy. You know, a man like me gets mixed up in all kinds of things. Murders like this, cut and dried. I'll tell you what. He made his mistake by taking that coat and leaving the mink. Stupid mistake. Real stupid, boy. The police say she was killed around five in the afternoon. Yeah, that's right. Well, she was cut up something off. Where were you at five, Mr. Sachs? Uh, me? Oh, nothing personal. <laughs> You're barking up the wrong private detective, boy. I didn't have no motive. I was right here in my office. Didn't finish work till around six. I've got other cases, you know. Can you prove you were in your office? Can I prove... Well, boy, if I gotta prove it, I'll prove it. But there ain't no motive, boy. Why would I want to kill her, huh? You ain't thinking, boy. When you've been investigating as long as I have, you won't run around asking ridiculous questions like that. Yeah, I should be ashamed of myself. Well, Mr. Sachs, it's been a real pleasure. You gotta go, boy? Yeah, I'm afraid so, but it's been charming. Good. You need any help? Just give me a call. Oh, I'll do that, boy. My next stop was the office of Mr. George Simon, attorney at law. The surroundings were a little different from Sachs's private pig pen. A big suite of offices with a big suite of secretaries. George Simon greeted me with a professional smile and offered me an overstuffed chair. Yes, I arrived at Mrs. Post's around five minutes to eight. My appointment was at eight sharp. When did Sachs arrive? He was already there, waiting in the hall. He said he'd just come up in the elevator but that Mrs. Post had not answered his ring. Lovely fellow. You met him? Yes, a few minutes ago. Well, we waited in the hall, thinking that Mrs. Post was late and due to arrive at any minute. Ten or fifteen minutes later, I got worried. I knew how important the meeting was, and I couldn't understand why she'd forget it. I had talked to her that afternoon. What time? That I talked to her? Oh, I'd say around three. She seemed uh, all right? Well, she wasn't particularly happy about the situation... They'd been married for seven years. But other than that, nothing else seemed to be bothering her? If it was, she didn't mention it. All right, you waited for about five or ten minutes. Uh, yes, yes. Then I then I located the janitor and had him unlock the door. We found Mrs. Post in the bedroom. I called the police immediately. Did Mr. Post know that you were meeting with his wife? I have no way of knowing that. Do you think he killed her? No, I don't think he's the type to kill anyone. Mrs. Post was certainly going to get a sizable settlement. She was going to ask for one. And Mr. Post knew that she was. I believe she told him. She mentioned to me that she had. Uh, How large a settlement? We hadn't arrived at any figure. I was supposed to meet her and this private detective. I was supposed to look over the evidence, and then we were to discuss future plans. Uh, Where were you at five o'clock, Mr. Simon? Here in my office. I was here all day except for lunch. All right, sir. Thank you very much for your trouble. Glad to help. But I don't think Mr. Post killed his wife. Well, I can't disagree with you. You don't think he did? I can't agree with you either. You see, uh, I just don't know yet. See you later, Mr. Simon. The next person on my list was Miss Jane Hughes the reason for the marital rift between William Post and his wife. She lived on the seventh floor of an attractive apartment house on West 61st Street. And when she opened the door for me, I could understand how any man might stray a little that Jane Hughes smiled at him once too many times. Hello. Can I come in? You might, if I knew who you were, what you wanted. The name is Johnny Dollar. What do you want, Johnny? Just a little talk. Any special subject? William Post. Goodbye, Johnny. And uh, Mrs. William Post. Didn't you hear me, Johnny? I'm an insurance investigator. Oh? Lieutenant Roseman thought I should talk to you. I thought you were a reporter. Well, now can I come in? Just put one foot in front of the other. Well, thanks. I'll try it. I didn't mean to be rude, but you understand about reporters. Oh, you weren't rude. Have a seat. Thanks. Why are you investigating me, John? 
Oh, routine. That's all routine. I'm just going to tell you the same thing I told the police. All right. Bill, Mr. Post, was with me most of the afternoon. How long have you known Mr. Post? About six months. We're just good friends. Yeah. I know. It's not like that at all, Mr. Dollar. We're just good friends. Okay. Oh, that's a shame. I'm afraid you'll have to leave. Mr. Post? Would you mind going out the back way? Well, I've got to talk to him sooner or later. Make it later, huh? Well, generally, I'm a gentleman, but... But uh, this time, you'll make an exception. Might prove interesting. All right. Why don't you answer it? Sure. Mr. Post? Who are you? Johnny Dollar. What are you doing here? Bill? Yes? Mr. Dollar's an insurance man. Insurance? I'm with Columbia or Risk. Oh, uh, don't close the door. He wants to talk to you. At my office, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. That's the way you want it, Mr. Post? Exactly. Now get out of here. You've got no business Mr. here. Mr. Post. Get out. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley Spearmint gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, the lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. On the police list, William Post was the number one candidate for the killing of his wife. On my list, he was just a wealthy banker with a dead wife, a seductive girlfriend, and a nasty personality. I'd run into many a nasty personality in my travels, so I let the incident roll off my back and drove over to the Park Avenue apartment where Mrs. Post had been murdered. In the basement, I located the janitor, a bent little man who was working on the plumbing and singing a flat chorus of Dixie. Hey, Pop. Yep, Tom. Pop. He's not far. Pop. Yeah. Are you the janitor? Mm-hmm. What's your name? It's Pete. You want to do me a favor, Pete? Pete Kellett. Who are you? My name is Johnny. When Johnny comes marching home again, hurry! Hurry! When Johnny comes marching hey, Pete, home Pete. again, hurry! Pete! Hey, Pete. Pete, I want you to do something for me. I don't know you. I'm an insurance investigator. Yes. You got a pass key to number eight? Well, have you? Number eight? Where the woman was murdered. Oh, I'm busy. When Jenny comes to me, she's home again. Pete, Pete. Oh, Pete, Pete. Pete. Hey, Pete. Pete. I want you to let me into number eight. What for? Because I'm investigating Mrs. Post's murder. Can't. It's all right. I'm working with the police. Who'd you say he was? My name is Dollar. You said it was Johnny. That goes in front. It's Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny. That's a funny name. When Johnny comes to my kitchen home again, Henry. Henry. There ain't nothing for you to see in number eight. I just want to look over the place. Why? I just want to take a look around. I don't want to go up there. Well, then give me the key. I can't. I got ten dollars that says you can. Make it twenty and I'll let you look over number three. Folks are out of town for a couple of months. I just want to get into number eight. Okay. Thanks. 
You opened the door last night for Mr. Sachs and Mr. Simon, didn't you? Who? How long have you worked here? Oh, I don't know. I guess I worked here. Oh, let me see now. Oh, my. I just worked here. Oh, for just a long time, I guess. That's all. You uh, knew Mrs. Post? Yes, yes, I knew. Have you ever seen Mr. Sachs or Mr. Simon before last night? Uh, who? The men you let into Mrs. Post's apartment. I saw them last night. I never saw them before. Not even once I never saw... Oh, I didn't like that one of them. Oh, he, that one with that squinted face. He squinted it all up and he had those dirty teeth. Sachs. Who? The one that squinted his face all up. Oh, I didn't like him. Well, thanks, yeah, Pete. I didn't like Mrs. Post either. Why not? I just didn't like her. She... Sweet, sweet chariot, come and carry me home. I let myself into number eight and took a good look over the whole place. There was still blood on the bedroom floor, but everything else had been cleaned up. And there was nothing that gave me any ideas. The mink coat and stole were still in the closet. I went back downstairs to give Pete his keys, but the funny little man wasn't around. I left the keys on a bench near the furnace, went back out to my car and drove to the hotel. I showered, shaved, wrote the first half of this report... And then started to go downstairs to have dinner. Johnny Dollar. Roseman, Johnny. You got something interesting on the post case. Oh, good. Somebody pawned that cloth coat late this afternoon. You know who it was? No, I'm just on my way down to the pawn shop to get a description from the pawnbroker. You want to meet me? Where is it? 945 East 185th Street. I'll see you there. <laughs> I climbed back into my car and drove uptown to the pawn shop. Lieutenant Roseman was already there, talking to the pawnbroker. And the answers he was getting were very interesting. You remember the man who pawned the coat? Oh, yes, he was a kind of small, funny-looking fella. He didn't say much, just handed me the coat and took what I gave him. You know, I remember the circular, what you sent. Seems strange, a man like that having such a nice coat. I thought, right away, that was stolen. Uh, The man was small? Yeah, uh, kind of stooped over. Anything else? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. He had a habit of zinging to himself all the time, under his breath. The first good lead. Roseman and I drove back to Mrs. Post's apartment and went down in the basement, where we found Pete Keller to sleep on an old cot. Hey, Pete. 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 Come on, wake up. Yeah. What do you want? You remember me? Should I? I was down here this afternoon. Oh, I guess I do. You remember Lieutenant Roseman? Uh, was he with you? Yeah, come on, Pete. We're going down to the station. Now? Yeah. You uh, pawned a coat late this afternoon. Huh? A cloth coat. Uh, the one that was stolen from number eight. You pawned it. I don't know nothing about no coat. Let's go, Pete. Right now? Right now. Uh, okay, but I ain't had much sleep. That plumbing, it keeps a man awake all night. Uh, just let me get my shoes. Uh, I got shoes and you got shoes. Oh, God's children got shoes. I got shoes. We took Pete Keller down to the precinct and questioned him for half an hour. But he refused to admit that he'd ever pawned the coat or that he knew anything about it. The pawnbroker was sent for, and we all went down to the lineup for an identification. Pete Kellett was in the first line. Third man. Number three, murder. Number three, step out. Number three, you. Uh, You're number three, aren't you? Well, if you'd like me to be. Uh... Then step out. Oh, sure. Uh, is this okay? Just answer the questions. Do you mind if I sit down? Just stand right there and face the front, hands at your sides. Oh, I'm awful tired. The plumbing keeps me awake all night. What's your name? Uh, I said, what's your name? Lieutenant. Oh, it's yeah. Pete. That's the man. The Pete Pete Keller? is the where one that pawned the coat. Oh, what do you mean? You sure? I mean, oh, where's your place of okay. Oh! Sergeant Hanley. Yes, Lieutenant. Number three, hold for interrogation. Okay, you step back in line. Me? Yeah, you. Oh, I thought you wanted to hear where I was Step coming. back. My goodness. 
We had a positive identification. The pawnbroker had pointed out Pete Kellett as the man who'd pawned the coat. We took the little janitor down to the interrogation room and worked on him for five long hours. But he didn't crack. Pete. Huh? Why don't you save us all a lot of trouble and admit it? What? Bet you killed Mrs. Post. Oh, why should I admit that? You want me to tell the truth, don't you? Oh. Pete. Uh, yes. You did pawn the coat, didn't you? Yes. Okay. Where did you get it? Uh, from Mrs. Post. And you stabbed her? No. Then how did you get it? Well, she give it to you me. You expect us to believe Why, that? Why, sure. Why didn't you tell us this in the first place? Well, I thought if you knew, you'd think just what you're thinking. She gave you the coat? Uh, yes. When? Well, a couple of days ago. You told me you didn't like her. I didn't. She gave you a nice coat like that, but you didn't like her? No. Then why did you take it? Why not? Now, look, you... Lieutenant. Yeah? Come here, man, will you? Can I go? You move a muscle and I'll bust you. Oh. I tell you, Johnny. Yeah, yeah, I know. But after all, he's... He's nuts. There's a more polite term for it. He's nuts and he's guilty. You want to find out if he is? I know. I mean guilty. Find out and eliminate all this questioning? How? He's scared of that room. He wouldn't take me up to number eight, although he gave me the key. I think we can scare him into a confession. I'll try anything. Of course, there's a chance he's telling the truth. If he is, I'll eat your shoulder holster. Well, turn him loose. Send him back to his job. Well, what's that going to do? You just hang around and watch. Roseman agreed to continue questioning Kellett for another half hour while I got things ready, then release him and take him back to the Park Avenue apartment. I left the precinct and drove to Jane Hughes' residence on West 61st Street. Oh, you'd better leave. Look, this is very important. Who is it? It's me, and I'm coming in. Now, Dolly, you listen up. No, you listen. I don't like you, Mr. Post, but I've got a chance to clear up this mess and get back to Hartford, so I'll be far enough away to keep from belting you in the teeth. Now, we think we know who killed your wife. Who is it? The janitor of the building. Old Kellett? That's right, but we've got to prove it. I'll need your permission and Miss Hughes' help. I can't let Miss Hughes get involved in anything that might in any way... Okay, okay, I'll see you later. Wait a minute, Johnny. What do you want me to do? Jane. It's all right. It's important to me. This hasn't been the most pleasant situation, Johnny, but regardless of what anyone thinks, I'm going to marry Bill. We're in love. I'll send you a box of rice if this works. What do you want me to do? I want you to be Mrs. Post. The dead Mrs. Post. What? Let him finish. I want you to go up in that apartment, dress like Mrs. Post, and call Kellett, the janitor. Tell him there's something wrong with the plumbing. Play it straight, as though nothing had ever happened. Are you out of your mind? You think the police that... will be there? No. Let's go, Johnny. I drove Jane Hughes to the apartment where Roseman was waiting. She got dressed in one of Mrs. Post's nightgowns and a robe, then buzzed the basement. Well, what about my voice? Just keep it low. Pete? Who is this? Mrs. Post. What? what? There's something the matter with the plumbing. Will you come up and fix it? Pete? Did you hear me? Yes. Will you come right up? Yes. Here he comes. Come in, Pete. What's the matter? You're dead. No, I'm not. Come in. And didn't I kill you? No, I'm all right. No, no, no. Something's wrong. No, you're dead. Stop being silly. Come in here. Well, if he ain't dead, if I didn't kill you the first time, I'd better do it now. Don't move, Pete. Yeah, well, Snap what? on the lights, Miss Hughes. Put down that knife, Pete. Is it all right? Yeah, yeah. Why, well, you ain't Mrs. Post. No. Well, then she is dead. I did kill her. That's right, Pete. Oh. 
I feel better. Pete had the jewels hidden in a bucket of paint in the basement. He finally explained that he was in the process of robbing Mrs. Post when she came home, surprised him, and he had to kill her. He didn't take the minx because he thought the cloth coat was prettier. I drove Jane Hughes back to her apartment, where a grateful William Post was waiting with open arms. And that was that. Expense account item two, $15.85 for a late dinner for Lieutenant Roseman and me, after which I retired to my hotel bed and slept for about ten hours. Expense account items three and four, $35.75, hotel bill and car rental. Item five, $16.55, train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $87.05. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Jack Moyles, William Johnstone, Benny Rubin, Charles Davis, Mary Jane Croft, Hi Everback, and Howard McNear. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hanley Conrad, Johnny. Oh, how are you, Mr. Conrad? Fine. Are you employed? Not at the moment. How about catching the next plane for Los Angeles? All right. What is it? We insure a Mr. William McEdwards. His home burned down last night and he was killed in the fire. Who do I see? C.H. Anderson, Beverly Hills Chief of Police. All right, I'll call the airport and make a reservation. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. 
And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, World Insurance, and Indemnity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amita Buddha matter. Expense account item one, $193.55. Plain fare and incidentals between Hartford and Los Angeles. I arrived at the Los Angeles airport the next morning, rented a car, and drove it to the hotel where I registered and put in a call to Chief Anderson at the Beverly Hills Police Department. An hour later, we were sitting in his city hall office. Lieutenant Hankins got the call at seven minutes after six in the evening, placed by a neighbor. The house was almost completely gutted by the time the fire department got it under control. Hankins found McEdward's body in the bedroom. He'd been alone in the house? Yeah. His wife returned about an hour later, found her husband dead. Swell homecoming. How'd the fire start? We're not sure. Started in the bedroom. One thing's pretty certain... It wasn't an accident. What do you mean? The first cursory examination by the coroner's deputy indicated the victim had burned to death. This morning, we got another report. Further examination at the morgue showed McEdwards had been stabbed. What? Mm Mm-hmm. Also hit over the head. Severe skull fracture. So you think McEdwards was killed first and the fire started to cover the crime? Yeah. That's how I came into it. Ordinarily, Lieutenant Hankins would handle the whole thing. Uh... This murder angle is confidential, Dollar, until the coroner files an official report. Sure. Any suspects? No, not yet. Well, thank you, Chief Anderson. I think I'll go out and talk to the widow. That's all right with you. Sure. Uh, But don't mention the murder angle. I won't. Where's she staying? With her mother in Encino. Yes? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'd like to speak to your daughter, if I may. What's it about? The death of her husband. I'm a special investigator for the insurance company. Well, Mr. Dollar, my daughter's not feeling very well. I know it's difficult, Mrs. Rizzinelli, but if it's at all possible, I'd like to see her. Get it over with. Get it out of the way. Oh, who is it, Mom? Oh, she's up. She was resting. Well, who is it? This is Mr. Dollar, honey. He's, uh... Uh, Is it about Bill? Yes, it is. He's a special investigator, an insurance investigator. Well, come in. Thanks. I was lying down, Mr. Dollar. I'll be in the kitchen. Nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar. Nice meeting you, Mrs. Rizzinelli. Well, won't you sit down? Thank you. You're with the insurance company? Yes, World Insurance and Indemnity. How can I help? Just answer some questions. I'm sure you've had your fill of answering questions by now. It's all right. Uh, You returned about an hour after the fire. Is that correct? That's right. Where had you been? I'd driven to Pasadena. Bill, he had to work so he couldn't go with me. A few days ago, Mr. McEdwards, that's Bill's father, returned from a location trip to Korea and gave us an antique... An old Chinese Buddha. We wanted to find out about it, so I took it to a friend of ours in Pasadena who collects Oriental art. A Buddha? Yes. Bill's dad found it in Korea and gave it to us as a sort of belated wedding gift. We'd only been married for six months. Uh, When did you leave for Pasadena? Oh, around four in the afternoon. I would have left sooner, but I had to clean house and fix Bill's lunch. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but it's still a little hard to talk about it. Just a few more questions. I'm all right. Did anything... Unusual? Well, anything your husband might have said before you left. Anything out of the ordinary that happened? I don't understand. Why do you think something unusual might have happened? Is there something I don't know about this, Mr. Dollar? No, no, it's nothing like that. I'm just checking everything. There was a fire. My husband lost his life. Are you considering that it might not have been an accident? I'm not considering anything. I'm just checking. Uh, This Buddha, where is it now? Charlie Wilkins, our friend in Pasadena, has it. He wasn't sure, but he thought that it might be very rare, and he asked me to leave it for a few days. Charles Wilkins? Yes. 
And your husband's father brought the Buddha back from Korea? Yes. Is uh, Mr. McEdward Sr. in the service? No, he's a production man for international pictures. He was making a documentary film in Korea. I'd like to talk to him. I think he's at the studio now. He lives on Beverly Glen. Well, I'll try to reach him at the studio. Thank you very much for your time and patience. Certainly. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. I left the attractive Valley home and drove back to the hotel, where I put in a call to International Studios for John McEdwards, the victim's father. His secretary told me he was at home, but that she'd deliver my message and have him call me. In about five minutes, McEdwards called, and I made an appointment to see him. I drove out sunset toward Westwood Village and turned north on Beverly Glen. John McEdwards lived in a small house in the middle of a lot of acreage. The reason for the acreage met me at the high closed gate. Four giant Great Danes faced me behind the steel fence. Their owner, a tall, wiry, middle-aged man, bounded down the steps of the house and ordered his animals to be silent. Uh, yeah. Be with you in a minute. Come on. Get over there. Come on, boy. Come on. Come on. That's it. My name is Mr. Dollar. Uh, wouldn't it be just as well if we talked out here? They won't hurt you. Come on in. Now, easy. Now, easy. Well... Ah, nice doggy. They're all right. Just as friendly as they can be. Ah, well, my gosh, they are. I'm McEdwards. Glad to know you, Mr. McEdwards. Oh, easy, boy. Sammy, Sammy, quiet. I'm just shaking his hand. Come on into the house. Fine. Sure hate to run into that pack if you weren't around. They wouldn't do anything unless maybe you tried to break in the house or something. There's an article in the paper not too long ago about some guy trying to break in the house. The owner's great dame spotted him going in the window and broke his neck. Broke his neck? Yeah. No, 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 Samson, you stay out. Samson? <laughs> yeah. Samson, Delilah, Cleopatra. Uh, I, I call her Patty. And the Duchess. Sit down. Thanks. The Duchess is the mother. She threw 12 her first litter. Uh, I, I kept three. Well, you didn't come here to talk about dogs. Can I get you a beer? No, thanks. You want to talk about Bill? Yes, yes. Wonderful boy. Terrible thing. I'm just trying to keep busy and not think about it. It's pretty tough. You raise a boy and see him through all these years? Yes, sir. What do you want to talk about? How long were you in Korea, Mr. McEdwards? About three months. I understand you brought back an old Buddha. Yeah. Why? I saw your daughter-in-law, she told me. How's she taking it? Pretty well, I'd say. Yeah, what a wonderful girl. Never thought Bill would get married, but... He sure picked the right one when he did. Tough, isn't it? Only been married six months. Tough on Pat. Mm. Tell me something about this Buddha. Well, it it was funny how I found it. I was helping build a dam. We had to block up a small stream and get the water to rise for a shot we needed. I was digging up some rocks a few yards away from the road, and I uncovered the old Buddha... It was in a box. Nice, neat hole. Your daughter-in-law said she took it to Charles Wilkins, that he thought it was very rare. Yeah. Why are you so interested in the Buddha, Mr. Dollar? Oh, just a casual interest. My company sent me out to investigate the fire, and when your daughter-in-law mentioned the Buddha, I got interested. Your company insured my son's life. That's right. You didn't know Bill, did you? No. Nice boy. Easy going. Never thought about insurance or things like that until he met Pat. Then he settled down. Best thing that ever happened to him. I'm sure you won't have a beer, Mr. Toller. Oh, no, really. Thanks, it's the same. Those darn dogs. There must be someone at the gate. Oh, it's, it's Pat. Hi. Hi. Oh, let me get back. Come on, come on. Shove him back. Hello, honey. Hi, Dad. Oh. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hello. 
Mr. Dollar, I just had a visit from Police Chief Anderson. He came just after you left. That's why you asked me all those questions. He told you? Yes, he did. What is it? Dad, the fire wasn't an accident. What? What? Well, Pat, what is it? What do you mean it wasn't an accident? Would you tell him, Mr. Dollar? If you'd like me to. What is it, Mr. Dollar? The fire wasn't an accident, Mr. McEdwards. Somebody deliberately... Bill was murdered. Oh, honey, honey. <laughs> Mr. Dollar. Yeah. But why? Mr. Dollar, do you think it had something to do with that Buddha? I don't know, Mrs. McEdwards. I'm trying to find out. Friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum while you work and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. John McEdwards walked me down to the gate and through the Great Danes. Then I drove to Pasadena and met Mr. Charles Wilkins, authority on Oriental art. I can't say absolutely. I'm still doing research. But I believe the Buddha to be the original Amita image Buddha. What does that mean? Well, in Buddhism, there's more than one Buddha. Each may have an earthly life, but there is never more than one in the world at any time. And Buddhas come into being at irregular intervals and only when there is a special need for their presence. In the Mayana system of Buddhism, there are 300 million Buddhas. But the Amita is one of the five Buddhas of contemplation. And the Buddha Mr. McEdwards found is the original Amita? Yeah, I'm almost positive that it is. <clears throat> I, I believe its origin dates back to sometime around 200 B.C. What would you say it's worth? Well, that would depend. To a responsible collector, uh, <laughs> really no way of telling. Well, let's say you were a wealthy, responsible collector, Mr. Wilkins. Uh, let's just say responsible. How much would you pay for the original Amita Buddha? Well, if I could buy it for, say, 150, maybe 200,000. 200,000 dollars? I would be getting a bargain. I would go as high as half a million if I had the money. Well, Mr. Wilkins, thank you. This thing is worth half a million? That's what the man said. Well, now, that's what I call a motive. Yeah. If the Buddha is really an art treasure, then the U.S. Customs Office is going to be very interested. That's their affair. I'm interested in who killed Bill McEdwards. Well, I don't know where this will take us, but at least it's a lead. Only real one I've had so far. We questioned all of the victim's associates, and what we could find out, he didn't have an enemy in the world. No love rivals, no discarded girlfriends, no money troubles, nothing. But he had the Buddha. Yeah. Question is, who knew he had it, besides his wife and father? Well, how about the location troop old man McEdwards was with in Korea? Mm-hmm. I'll check with the studio right away. Yeah. But it's not just somebody who knew he had it. It's somebody who knew the value of it. Somebody who's hep to oriental art, huh? Maybe the guy who buried it. Well, why would anybody stash a prize like that in a hole in the ground? Well, for safekeeping, maybe. There's been a war in Korea. Yeah, thanks for telling me. But say it was the person who buried the thing. Why would he have to steal it? He could just step up and claim his property. If he was the rightful owner. But suppose he stole it in the first place. Yeah. 
Well, I like guessing games as well as the next one, but it's time I got to work. Where are you going to start? First, the motion picture company, then we'll check all incoming passengers from the Orient last week. Ships, planes, military personnel. That shouldn't take more than a month. You got any better ideas? At the moment, no. Then I want another talk with Mick Edwards Sr. I thought I'd run out and see him this afternoon. Yeah, do that. If you turn up anything, let me know. Sure, if I do. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I was just finishing some dinner. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, don't be silly. Come on in and have a cup of coffee with me. If you haven't had your dinner, I'll be glad to throw on a couple of chops. No, thanks. I don't get hungry early. Have a seat. Thanks. You want some coffee, don't you? Yeah, that'll be fine. I'm not much of a bachelor. Wife died three years ago, and I still haven't got used to doing things like cooking, keeping house. Usually eat out. You take uh, cream or sugar? Black is fine. Pat was in a pretty bad way after you left, but she finally came around all right. That's tough. Yeah, it is. I wanted to talk some more about... Oh, darn. Excuse me. Hello? Well, yes, hello, dear. Yes, yes, she worked. She hadn't. Well, she left here about, oh, I'd say about 5.30, maybe quarter of six. Well, she might have stopped off someplace. No, 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 don't worry about it. No, she was just fine when she left. Oh, sure. No, uh, I'm all right, dear. Sure, sure, I will. Bye. Funny. Hmm? That was Pat's mother. She isn't home yet. When did she leave here? Oh, about two hours ago. Well, we're all on edge. Oh, I don't think there's anything to worry about? No. She's taking pretty well. When she left, she was fine. I talked with Mr. McEdwards for about another hour. He told me everything he could about the Buddha and his trip to Korea. He looked dead tired. His eyes were beginning to show the strain. I decided to say good night and forget the rest of the interrogation until the next morning when the phone rang again. Hello? Eh? What? I'm sorry, I didn't say... Yes, yeah, that's right. Y- yes. Uh, but, but, but wait... Hello, hello, hello. Something wrong? I'm not supposed to say anything. What was it? I think you're a nice guy, Johnny. Can I trust you? Certainly. They said not to tell anyone, but I've got to trust someone. I, I can't think for myself. Too much has happened. You, you won't take this to the police. I can't promise that. Well, I don't think you will after I tell you. I don't know who that was on the phone, but it was some guy, and and he said they've got Pat. What do you mean, they've got Pat? Kidnapped. Now, look, exactly what was said. Good gosh, you, you, you read about things like this, but you you never think they're going to happen. Now, take it easy. Oh, I'm all right. I, I just haven't had much sleep. I can't think straight. Now, the man that called. He said he had Pat. That she was all right for me not to say anything to anyone. Or she'd get hurt. He said for me to get the Buddha. And that is it. They said to get it and they'd see that Pat was returned home safely. What did they say to do with it? Just to get it. They'd contact me. What are you going to do? Get the Buddha. Wait a minute. Let me go. They might be watching. They'd know I told you about the phone call. They won't do anything to Pat until they get the Buddha. I'll call Wilkins. He's probably in the book. Well, don't you think it would be better if I went? Yeah, maybe it would. But I'm going to follow you. If anything happens, I want to be around. All right, let's go. Wilkins turned over the Buddha while I waited outside his house, watching for anyone who might have followed. The drive back to McEdward's home was uneventful. No single car stayed with us for any length of time from the freeway to Beverly Glen. 
While McEdwards opened the gates and drove his car into the garage, I parked in a secluded spot some 50 yards away from the house and walked back, where I met McEdwards at the foot of the front steps. You think we were followed? No, I don't think so. Well, I've got the bullet. What do I do with it? Wait till you hear from them. They said they'd contact you. Yeah. Think I should call Pat's mother and tell her what's happened? No, not yet. No sense in worrying her until we find out what's going to happen. But, Dad! Pat! Good evening, Mr. McEdwards. John McEdwards had visitors. Two men. One rather slight, fairly young. The other an enormous man, a good six and a half feet that must have weighed well over 300 pounds. The slight one held a 38 pointed in our direction. Pat started across to McEdwards, but the big man stopped her. Sit down. What is this? Allow me to introduce myself. Alan Sutka. And this is my friend, Don Roach. We've come for the Buddha. I let him in with my key, Dad. I had to... Sure. It's, it's, it's okay. Who's your friend, Mr. McEdwards? Yes, I warned you not to confide in anyone. This is Mr. Dollar. He's just an old friend. How unfortunate for Mr. Dollar. You've gone to a lot of trouble to get this Buddha. Indeed, I have. Nearly five years, to be exact. Now, what is your interest in this matter, Mr. Dollar? Purely professional. Are you a policeman? Not quite. I see. Mr. McEdwards isn't responsible for my getting mixed up in this. I was here when you called and forced him into telling me. As I said before, most unfortunate. Now, Mr. McEdwards, I'll take the Buddha. Not yet, you won't. Oh? Perhaps you don't understand. Yeah, that's it exactly. Which one of you bums killed my son? Killed your son? He was killed, Sutker. The fire didn't work. The police know all about it. Indeed. Come on, Mr. Sutter. Let's get this over with and get out of here. Patience, patience. You'll have to forgive my young friend. How did you know Mr. McEdwards had the Buddha? Its discovery made the Tokyo papers. I did some checking, found out when Mr. McEdwards was returning to the States, flew here to meet him. Why'd you kill my son? I don't mind telling you. Under the circumstances, I cannot afford to let any of you live. Your son discovered Roach here in the act of burglarizing his home. He protested too much. Roach had to kill him. It wasn't premeditated. We assumed the Buddha was in the house. We knew that Mr. McEdwards here had delivered it to his son the night before. Why, oh, you... Take it easy. Take Mr. it easy. Mr. Dollar's right. Should you get out of hand, Roach will shoot you on the spot. Now, if you don't mind, I'll have that Buddha. Oh, Dad. Without hysterics, if you don't mind. Just one more question. How did you know about the Buddha? Mr. Dollar... I've known about that particular Amita Buddha for many, many years. Another man knew about it also. And unfortunately, he was the first to locate it. His name was Wu Sung, an oriental collector. He discovered the Amita Buddha in a Tibetan temple shortly after World War II and stole it, then smuggled it out of Tibet and into Korea. I followed him and made him a handsome offer, but he refused to sell. He died under rather mysterious circumstances... But I didn't have the chance to leave Korea with the Buddha. The war. Very astute, yes. The communists suddenly attacked, and there was absolutely no way I could get the Buddha out of the country without someone discovering it. So you buried it? A few hundred yards from Wu Sung's home. I imagine the house has long since vanished from the face of the earth. I bided my time in Tokyo, waiting for hostilities to cease. But as fate will have it... Mr. McEdwards uncovered my prize. Mr. Sutker, you talk too much. I enjoy it, Roach. And after all, what good will the information be to our friends? Come on, let's get the Buddha. Yes. Now, Mr. McEdwards, you will either turn over the Buddha or Roach will kill you immediately. Give it to him. Here. Thank you. Now, if you'll all lead the way down into the yard, we'll proceed to my car and take a short trip. Oh, Dad. It's all right, honey. Now, if you please. Beautiful animals, Mr. McEdwards. I'm glad they were pinned up when we arrived. They could have caused no end of trouble. We still can! McEdwards had belted the big boy right in his enormous middle, and Roach stepped in and swung his gun. As McEdwards dropped, the dogs penned in behind the tall fences went crazy. Samson, the big male, went over the ten-foot fence like it wasn't even there. Before I knew it, I was up to my elbows in great days. Sammy! Sammy, let him in! Sammy, stop it! Hey, Delilah, get back there! 
Ah, are you all right? Yes, yes, I'm all right. Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Why didn't they go after me? They knew you were helping. <laughs> my face, my face, get a doctor, get a this doctor. This one's pretty bad. My How's face? the big one? Huh. You were right about Danes. What do you mean? The one you were telling me about that broke the man's neck. The fat man ran into the same sort of situation. He's dead? He sure is. Well, that's the way it should be. Samson was my son's talk. Expense account item two, $33.85 hotel bill. Item three and four, $299.75. Car rental, plane fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $527.15. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps you keep feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day, and we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were James Nusser, John Stevenson, Jeanette Nolan, Sammy Hill, Bill James, Herb Butterfield, Robert Griffin, and Edgar Barrier. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Next on WBBM, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. 47 degrees at 8 o'clock. WBBM, Chicago. WBBM FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Philip Martin, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Martin. Got a job for you. Well, Fine. We insure Mr. Alfred Chambers of Pittsburgh. He was shot to death yesterday. Murder? That's the way it looks. He'd rented a cabin in Michigan, Lachino Islands. Where's that? Oh, about 30 miles from Sault Ste. Marie. Right up near Canada. Yeah, that's right. His wife found him lying in the front room of the cabin, shot through the chest. The officer handling the case is Captain George Lane, Sault Ste. Marie Police. He'll be expecting you. I'll leave in the morning. <laughs> of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, 
Chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Alfred Chambers matter. Expense account item one, $45.95, plane fare and incidentals between Hartford, Connecticut and Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Expense account item two, 75 cents, cab fare to the local police station, where I introduced myself to Captain George Lane. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Mr. Martin from your company called and told me to expect you. How can I help? Well, to begin with, you can fill me in on the details. Sure. Have you ever been to the Snows? The Snows? The Chinook Islands. Oh, no, no. Well, there are a whole group of islands on the fringe of Lake Huron. Le Chinook means the channels. It's somewhat of a resort now, but very exclusive. People who go to the Snows have been coming up for years. They own homes on various islands and altogether a very respectable community. Alfred Chambers rented the Forester Cabin. It's one of the islands furthermost from the mainland. About uh, two miles, I'd say. He spent three days in the snows, and then his wife arrived from Pittsburgh. Mr. Schoenberg, fellow, has a boat rental service, took her out to the island, and she found her husband lying in the living room, dead, shot through the chest. Any suspects? Not a one. Mrs. Chambers told me she'd separated from her husband about a week before he'd come to the snows, but she couldn't have killed him. Schoenberg was with her all the time. And according to the coroner, Chambers had been dead for about 14 hours. Until the investigation's cleared up, I've been making my headquarters at the hotel at the Snows. I just came in to get the coroner's report. I was going back this afternoon, if you'd care to come along. Yeah, I'd like to. Any other homes on the island? Yeah, several. One about a half mile south, one on the other side of the island. This is where Mrs. Chambers found her husband. Mm-hmm. Lying on his face. The front door was open. He wasn't shot inside the cabin. He wasn't? If you didn't notice when we came in, there was some blood leading up the front steps. See? You can see where it trails in here. Staggered in from outside, yeah. huh? No electricity in the house. No, Coleman lamps. The uh, other two homes on the island have electricity, phones... But this place is nearly 60 years old. The owners never bothered to equip it with any modern conveniences. How did Chambers get to and from the mainland? Boat. Rented a boat from Schoenberg. When the coroner examined him, he noticed that his shoes were still damp. Later examination showed he'd been in the water fully clothed. That's funny. I think he was shot probably while he was out on the dock. Fell in the water and waded to shore. You say he'd been dead about 14 hours. That's right. Uh, make it about five in the evening when he was shot. Hmm. What time does it get dark? Oh, up here this time of year, it doesn't get dark till about nine o'clock. Twilight. Hmm. Shot in the chest. Mm-hmm. You recover the slug? Yeah, twenty-two, long rifle. Well, he was shot when it was light, and you think he was out there in the dark? I'm pretty sure he was out there. There was a thick mud on his shoes and on the pants. Now, that mud is on the bottom out there by the dock. In close here, it's more sand. And then to get completely wet like that. Yeah. Well, it doesn't seem likely that anyone could have shot him from the lake. No, they'd have to be out in a boat. That'd be taking a pretty big chance. And somebody on the island. Somewhere in the woods back there, huh? Probably. Someone could have landed on the island any place and walked here. Anyone here a shot? Yeah, I've talked with a lot of people. Some of them remember hearing a shot about that time. There's no telling where it came from. Shot on this lake, you can hear from miles. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd like to have a talk with Mrs. Chambers. Sure. Schoenberg can take us back to the mainland. You can drive my car over to the hotel. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I hope I'm not disturbing you, Mrs. No, Chambers. No, not at all. Won't you sit down? Oh, Thanks. Oh, it's a beautiful view. Yes, isn't it? Is this your first time up here? Yes, it is. Mine, too. 
And you're an insurance investigator. Yes. My company covers both you and your husband. Well, Mr. Dollar, just how can I help you? Answer some questions. I know it's tough at this time. Oh, I'll be glad to tell you anything I can. Captain Lane said that you and Mr. Chambers had separated. Yes, that's correct. May I ask why? Is it absolutely necessary? Your husband's been killed, Mrs. Chambers. Your separation might mean nothing, and then again... Well, it was another woman. Do you mind telling me about it? It isn't the most pleasant subject, but I suppose you have to know. About a month ago, Al admitted that he'd been seeing this woman. He said it was serious. We argued. It was a rather nasty argument. We considered separation then, but because of the publicity, we held off. Your husband was in the steel business, wasn't he? Yes. And we have two children. Things like this happen all the time, I guess. And I can understand. I saw the girl one night. She was very attractive. Quite young. I think Al told me she was in her last year in college. What's her name? Oh, I don't think it was her fault. She's young, and my husband was certainly a very attractive man. I don't think it was either of their faults, really. Things like that happen. It would be a shame to involve her now. She's already involved. This looks like murder. Anyone connected with your husband is involved. What's her name? Jane Elkins. I've never met her, but my husband told me she's a lovely girl from a fine family. A week ago, I wouldn't have cared whether or not she was involved in the scandal, but now... Oh, certainly I've suffered enough, and it'll be a terrible thing for my children. I thought a lot about the girl after I found Al. I hoped that perhaps she might be spared. She lives in Pittsburgh? Yes. Your husband left Pittsburgh when? A week ago today. He decided to take his vacation alone, think things over. Why did you come up here? I thought things over, too, Mr. Dollar. I decided to give Al his freedom. I talked with our lawyer, and he suggested I have one more talk with Al. I left the next morning. Did you tell your husband you were coming up? No. There was no way of reaching him. There's no phone on the island. The letter would have gotten here after I did. So you just packed and came up, huh? Yes. I only packed one bag. I wasn't planning on staying. When did you leave Pittsburgh? The morning of the 18th. You arrived the next morning? Oh, I arrived at the Sioux that night. I came to the Snows the next morning. You've never been here before? No. How did you know how to find the cabin where your husband was staying? Oh, I simply asked the man who runs the boat. I asked him to take me to the Forester's cabin. I see. Can you think of anyone who might want to kill your husband? A week ago. I thought about it. Anyone else? No. My husband was well-liked, Mr. Dollar. He was a very respected man. No business troubles? Oh, no. How long has it been since your husband was up here? Oh, well, let's see. He always used to talk about it. He used to tell the children he'd show them pictures. Oh, I guess it's about ten years ago. Yes, I think it was about that long before we were married. Well, Mrs. Chambers? Oh, must you go? I have to get back to Captain Lane. I've got his car. The captain asked me to stay until he finishes his investigation. Yes. Uh... I don't know anyone here. I was hoping you might have dinner with me. It's very good food. A pleasant dining room. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Chambers, but I... Excuse me. Yes? Yes. By all means, come right up. Well, I'll be going, Mrs. Chambers. I think you should stay, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? That phone call was from the lobby. It was Miss Jane Elkins... Friends, 
Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy the pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum while you work, and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Jane Elkins, the woman who had caused the separation between Mrs. Chambers and her husband, had called from the hotel lobby. Jane Elkins, the Pittsburgh college student, had suddenly turned up at Les Chenot's. Mrs. Chambers? Yes. Come in. We've never met, but I... My husband told me about you. This is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? Hello, Miss Elkins. I- I'm sorry. I didn't know you had company. That's quite all right. When you called, I asked Mr. Dollar to stay. He's investigating my husband's death. Oh? Sit down, Miss Elkins. Please. Thank you. I must say, your call certainly surprised me. When I heard you were in town, I thought about calling you sooner, but... Well, I, I understand. You were in town when Mrs. Chambers arrived, Miss Elkins? Oh, yes. I came up with some friends. They have a home on one of the islands. Mrs. Chambers, I didn't know Al... Mr. Chambers was coming up here. You didn't? Mrs. Chambers, I wasn't in love with your husband. I never have been. I must admit that for a while I I thought perhaps I was. You didn't know Mr. Chambers was coming up here? I had no idea until he arrived. How long had you been here before Mr. Chambers arrived? Nearly a week. You told him you were coming up? Yes. I I told him I wasn't sure about... I I said I wanted to come up and think for a while. Where were you when Mr. Chambers was killed? I don't know. I I don't know just when he was killed. I I heard about it. Um, Let's see, uh, Wednesday in the afternoon. When was the last time you saw him? I saw him Tuesday afternoon. That was the last time. He came into Cedarville. I met him at the drugstore. We talked, and he went back to the island. Had you seen him much before that? While you were up here, I mean? Yes, I saw him twice. Shortly after he arrived, and one time after that at the post office. Mrs. Chambers, when he arrived and we met, I told him I'd rather not see him while I was up here. The people I'm staying with know Mr. Chambers. They're from Pittsburgh also. Do I know them? The weather waxes? Oh, yes. You see, before I met your husband, I was engaged to their son, Charles. Is he here in the snows? Yes, we all drove up together. Does he know about you and Mr. Chambers? Yes. Did he know that Mr. Chambers was here in town? Yes, I told him. How did he take it? Not too well, I'm afraid. Miss Elkins, before my husband arrived, had you come to any decision? Yes, Maybe you won't believe it, but it's true. When your husband arrived, I told him... I said I thought it would be best if we forgot the whole thing. I wasn't in love with him, Mrs. Chambers. Not really. Miss Elkins, after Mr. Chambers left you that last time in the afternoon, what did you do? I went back to the house. Where was Charles? Was he at the house? No, I I don't think so. No, he was out. Mr. Dollar, you weren't suggesting... Just a simple question. Where was Charles? He was out in the boat. Alone? Was he alone? I don't know. Well, it's easy to find out. Mr. Dollar, if you'll excuse me, I really must be going. Oh, that's too bad. Will you forgive me if I run now, Mrs. Chambers? Charles' parents are giving a cocktail party this afternoon in, in my honor. I'm in anything but a party mood, but there was no way I could get out of it. That is... Without telling the weather waxers about... 
Yes, I understand. You run along. Thank you for coming to see me. Oh, Mrs. Chambers, if I could only tell you how sorry I am about everything. I know. Goodbye, my dear. After Jane Elkins left, I talked with Mrs. Chambers for a few minutes more, then made my excuses and drove to the Cedarville Hotel and registered there. I reported my findings to Captain Lane, who said he'd check on Jane Elkins and her boyfriend. Then I stretched out on the bed and tried to figure my next move. Well, it didn't take long to figure. I decided to crash the Weatherwax's cocktail party. Expense account item three. One dollar and a half. Boat rental and Schoenberg services as pilot. We made it in 15 minutes. Schoenberg pulled into a long dock where a veritable armada of small craft were tied up. The party was well underway. The guests were milling around on a long strip of white beach about 50 yards below a huge Georgian house. No one asked to see my invitation, so I grabbed a drink from a passing tray and looked around for Jane Elkins. I spotted her a few yards away talking to a stout, mustached party with a rich bourbon complexion. I stepped briskly up to her side. Uh, Jane Elkins, I presume? What? Oh. Uh, Jane, I wonder if I could have a word with you. Uh, old man, you won't mind if I steal the guest of honor from you, would you? Mind? I certainly do mind. I wouldn't think... Say, don't I know you? Aren't you Robinson Plumbing Supply? Uh, no, I'm Dollar. Insurance. Oh, insurance? Oh, well, uh, excuse me. I'll see you later, Jane. That always empties the hall in a hurry. What are you doing here? I've got a lot of questions that need answers. I don't want to make a scene, but if you don't leave this instant, I'll have you thrown out. You might as well talk to me as to the police. I'm a lot more sympathetic. The police? Yeah, the police. Now, just give me some answers, and I'll be on my way. What, what do you want to know? Well, that's better. What time did your fiancé come back here yesterday? I'm not sure. I think it was around 6.30. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, could you point him out to me? He's standing over there by the bar, the, the man in the green jacket. Well, he's a big one, isn't he? Now, Miss Elkins, what time did you return here yesterday? About 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock. You stayed here the rest of the afternoon? Yes. Where were you? Where? Were you in the house? You surely can't think that Take I... Take it easy. Charles is heading this way. Please, please go. Oh, not yet. Charles is the man I'd like most to meet. You two seem to be having a fascinating conversation. Mind if I butt in? Oh, butt away, Mr. Weatherwax. Uh, my name is Dollar. How do you do, Mr. Dollar? Fine, thank you. Uh, if you're through with my hand now, I'd like it back. How's that, Mr. Dollar? I might want to use it again sometime. Oh, sorry. Well, here, you can have it back. Thanks. Now, let me give you a tip. Next time you try that bone-crushing bit, watch out for a left hook. <laughs> Jane, just who is this little friend of yours? He's not a friend. Oh, no, not a friend. Something much more than that. Much closer. Much warmer. Get out of here, Dollar. Or so help me, I'll break you in two. I'll scatter you all over the beach. All right, all right, Mr. Weatherwax. I'll go. You told me what I wanted to know. You're a jealous man and a violent man. The perfect type. What are you talking about? Charles, he's a detective. He's investigating Alfred's death. Oh, why didn't you say so, darling? I'm not answering today. I'm asking. For instance, where were you yesterday afternoon? And do you own a twenty-two rifle? Chambers was killed with a twenty-two. The slug can be traced to the rifle it was fired from. They call it ballistics. Isn't science wonderful? Goodbye, Charles. Schoenberg and I took off from LaSalle Island, but instead of heading for center Cedarville, we turned into an inlet about a half mile down the lake where we could still see the weatherwax dock. We waited there for ten minutes. Then Charles Weatherwax appeared on the landing. He climbed into a small cruiser and headed south. He cruised to a spot about 300 yards off the shore of Baxter's Island, hove to... Stripped down to bathing trunks, put on a pair of underwater goggles, and dived in. He came up seconds later and then submerged once more. 
I told Schoenberg to pull up to him at top speed. When Charles surfaced again, he saw us bearing down on him and climbed hastily back into the boat. But before he could weigh anchor, we were alongside. Don't leave just yet, Charles. This is a gun in my hand. Yeah, I see it. Spear fishing without a spear, huh? What kind of fish are you after, Charles? All right. Start it up and head for the landing. And don't get reckless, Charles. I'm a fair shot. All right, Charles. All ashore that's going ashore. We regret this, darling. All right. Let's go up toward the house. We can talk better there. Come on, move, Charles. Move. This is far enough. All right, talk, Charles. What were you looking for out there in the sky blue water? I don't have to tell you anything. If you'd rather talk to Captain Lane, it's all right with me. But why not tell me? It'll look a little better on the record. I didn't kill Chambers, but I was with him when he was killed. Go on. I came over to tell him to stay away from Jane. But Jane said that she'd broken with him that same afternoon. Yeah, but I didn't know that then. We were standing out on the dock, he and I talking. There was a shot, and he fell in the water. And you just left him there? Well, he was dead. Oh, I'm afraid not. He made it to the cabin. Oh, well, I thought he was dead. I got panicky. I realized how bad it looked. Ran to my boat and took off. Then I remembered I had a twenty-two rifle in the cabin. I threw it overboard. Then today you made the crack about ballistics. It came to me what I'd done. I'd thrown away the one piece of evidence that would clear me. So I came back to find it. Well, it's a good story, but I don't buy it. I think you're... For a big man, he was very fast. He dived at me suddenly in a flying tackle, and I went over backward. I managed to kick loose from his grip, but the gun had been jolted out of my hand. He scooped it up and pointed it at my head. I jumped at him. He went over backward. I went over with him, grabbed the gun from his hand, and then stood up. Much the worse for wear. You're pretty fast, Dollar. Tell me something. Why didn't you fire? You had plenty of time. Why not? Maybe you're just not the shooting type. Maybe that tall story you told was true. It is true. Well, maybe I believe you. The only trouble is, if you didn't kill him, there's a good chance that Jane did. Are you crazy? Oh, I don't think so. Besides you, she's the only person I know of who had both motive and opportunity and no alibi. Oh, you're raving mad. What motive would she have to kill him? She says she told Chambers Tuesday that it was all over between them. She did. She says she did. But suppose it was the other way around. Suppose he jilted her. Ever hear the line about a woman scorned? All right. All right, I killed him. I didn't know that Jane had broken up with him. He got nasty and I shot him. I see. Where were you when you shot him? I was... St what difference does that make? I tell you, I killed him. Take me into the mainland, I'll make a full confession. Okay. If you say so. I say... Hey! That was a rifle shot. Came from over there beyond those trees. Yeah. Come on, let's go, halfback. You first. We ran through the grove of fir trees and came to a little cove not more than 200 yards off. A rowboat was pulled up on the beach, and beside it was a small boy with a 22 rifle. Hi. Hi. What's your name? Jimmy Bishop. What's yours? You live over on Fire Island, don't you? Yeah. What were you shooting at just now? Squirrels. Oh, they're all right to shoot. My father says they're pests. You come here often to shoot? Once in a while. Were you here Tuesday afternoon around five o'clock? Yeah, sure. I got two squirrels. I'm afraid that wasn't all you got, Sonny. Well, that's the way things work out sometimes. You think you've got a cold-blooded murder on your hands, and it turns out to be a young kid who shouldn't have been given a gun on his birthday. 
22 was checked by the ballistics department and proved to be the one that had fired the fatal shot. At the inquest, the jury returned a verdict of accidental manslaughter. However, it's doubtful if young Jimmy Bishop will ever want another gun as long as he lives. Expense account item four, $22 for hotel bill and transportation back to the Sioux Airport. Expense account item five, $43.85, plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $114.05. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps you keep feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley Spearmint Gum every day. And we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Hal March, Marvin Miller, Jeanette Nolan, Jane Webb, and Dick Beals. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. WBBM FM, Chicago. Chewing gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Donald Maynard, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Maynard. You employed? No, not a bit. Just closed out a case. Fine. Can you go to New York? Yeah, I guess so. What's it all about? Well, this company insures Maury Productions Incorporated. It's a film television company shooting in New York. The star is Philip Maury. Uh Uh-huh. Well, production stopped last Wednesday. We were notified that Maury had suffered a breakdown and couldn't continue for a while. It's costing us plenty. They've got a pretty big company. Cast and crew are all under contract and have to get paid. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, anything you can. The doctor definitely confirms the breakdown, but he says he's sure it's due to some personal crisis. See what you can find out. See if you can't do something to snap Maury out of it. Okay. Right away, huh? As soon as I pack a bag. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. 
So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Philip Morey matter. Expense account item one, $19.85, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. Item two, 75 cents, cab fare to a hotel, where I registered and called the offices of the Morey Production Company. I made an appointment to see Mr. Milton Gradkey, the producer. Expense account item three, 55 cents for another cab to Gradkey's well-appointed office on 45th Street. Really, Mr. Dollar, I'm just as concerned about this situation as the insurance company is. In fact, I'm probably a whole lot more concerned. A whole lot. Well, we've got a schedule to meet. We've got a sponsor and a network to account to. And if our star is sick, I... I just came down to see if I could help. It's a breakdown, Mr. Dollar. Who can help with a breakdown? Are you a doctor? You're a close friend, huh? Yes, yes, very close. I can't do anything. How could you? What caused the breakdown? (laughs) Such a question. What causes the breakdown? What causes breakdowns? Again, it's for a doctor to say I'm only a producer. Well, the company doctor felt it was something of a personal nature. Something more than just overwork. Well, I I know Phil is sick. He's really in a bad shape. And I know if he doesn't snap out of it, this show is going on the rocks. It may be personal, but that's not for me to say. Phil's had enough trouble in the past. Well, this time he could be ruined. Who's his personal physician? Ewing, Charles Ewing, the best man for this sort of thing. I got the best. I'd like to talk to him. He's probably over with Phil now. Oh, fine. I'll stop by. Oh, he, uh, he won't allow you to see Phil. You can't see him, Mr. Dollar. Okay, then I'll just talk to the doctor. Maybe Ewing's back at his office now. Why don't you, uh, go over to his office instead, huh? It'll be a whole lot easier if you go over to Mr. his Mr. Gradke. Yes? What's the matter? Don't you want me to talk with Philip Morey? He's sick, very sick. You sure that's all? Of course that's all. You got the doctor's report? Yeah, but if you don't mind, I'll check it myself. Your company may be in trouble, Mr. Gradke. But my company is paying for it. (music) Expense account item four. A dollar and twenty-five cents for still another cab. Philip Morey was residing in an apartment on Park Avenue. I had trouble getting by the doorman, the receptionist at the switchboard, and the elevator operator, but I got by them. I walked down the third floor of the building and knocked on the door to Philip Morey's apartment. Yes? Uh, Dr. Ewing? Uh, No, he just left. My name is Dollar. I'd like to see Mr. Morey. I'm sorry, no one can see Mr. Morey. He's quite ill. Who are you? What business is that of yours? I'm a special agent for National Life and Casualty. I was sent here to make a report on Mr. Morey's condition. Well, then I suggest you talk to Dr. Ewing. Now, wait a minute. Look, I told you that... Hey, Richard. Where, where's the beef? What's going on? Mr. Morey? Yeah? Phil, you better go on back in your room. Why? What do you want, Edward? My name is Dollar, Mr. Morey. Okay. What's it all about, huh? I told him you weren't seeing anyone. Yeah. He's from the insurance company. I don't want any. You already have it. I just came down here to wait see if I could help... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want any insurance. I'm a lousy risk. Phil. Well, no, no. Go on, fella. Beat it, you hear me? Go on. Okay, okay. Don't get rough. You're in no condition. Uh-huh. You think so, huh? Look, Mr. Morey, my company got a report that you'd suffered a breakdown. Yeah. Oh, good for them. It looks to me more like a 90-proof breakdown, and it smells like it, too. What's it to you? Plenty. My company's paying a lot of money while you're laid up. As long as it's a legitimate illness, they're obligated to keep on paying. And if I'm just drunk? I doubt if my company would think kindly of you, Mr. Morey. (laughs) Well, isn't that just too bad? Mr. Dollar, he didn't start hitting the bottle until last night. Just forget the excuses. Just drop it. 
And you get out of here now, huh? Go on, get out. Okay, okay. And tell your stinking company I'm going to stay drunk until we have another blue snow. Okay? It's fine with me. I'll send you a sled with a coffin on it. I was supposed to help Maury straighten himself out. But this wasn't just a breakdown. He was boiled to the eyebrows. And if you could go on past performances, it was an odds-on bet he'd stay that way. Expense account item five. A dollar and thirty-five cents cab fare from the Park Avenue apartment to the hotel, where I went to the bar to cool off. I had a fast one and was reaching for another when I was interrupted. Mr. Dollar? Hmm? Oh. I talked with Milt Gradkin. He told me you were staying here. Okay. Uh, first, let me apologize for what Forget happened. Forget it. Uh, can I sit down? Sure. Well, we really didn't meet officially. I'm Richard Long. I'm the writer-director on the series. Well, if Maury stays loaded, you're going to be out of a job. He just started drinking last night. Insurance doesn't cover a lost weekend. I'll have to report it. They'll cancel. It's going to be rough. His wife left him. Oh, that's the reason, huh? Yeah. She's going to sue. They've been trying to do everything we could to get Phil in shape. Well, from the way he looked, you'd better forget it. Well, if this one blows up, he's through. He's finished for good. It's happened before. Yeah. But isn't it too bad? Yeah, I guess it is. He's one of the biggest talents we've ever had in this business. And he's gotten into more trouble. Look, I, I'm not defending his mistakes, just his talent. If you're going to ask me not to make that report Look, to my Mr. company... Look, Mr. Dollar, I know you've got a job. I know your company can't be expected to keep on paying while Phil's in this condition. Well, I'm glad you understand. But they've paid up till now, and believe me, you've got my word. Until last night, Phil Maury hadn't touched a drop. Well, even if that's true, Maury's drinking now, and he looks like he's good for a long, long time. He's fallen off before, hasn't he? Yes. He lost his motion picture contract the last time, didn't he? Yes, but all that straightened itself out. It looked pretty crooked this afternoon. <laughs> this would never have happened in a million years if it wasn't for that wife. Well, that's another one of his patterns, isn't it? He's been sued by more ex-wives. Mr. Zoller, I've never said he was right. I, I never said any of the trouble was anything else but his own fault. But you don't know him. Not, not many people do. This guy is the most considerate, charitable... When he's sober... Listen, if you've got about 12 hours sometime, I'd like to impress you with some of the good things on the other side of the ledger. He's given Janet everything she could want. Sure, he was wrong. He should have belted her one and told her to keep in line. He's made the same mistake with every woman he's ever been involved with, and they've all taken him. Nearly everyone's taken him. Business managers, agents. You think them up, and they've had their fingers in the pie. But for a while, that was a pretty big pie. Sounds like fodder for a good psychoanalyst. Yeah, but... Well, Janet's leaving him was too much. Even as bad as he was, he didn't hit the bottle. He just kind of folded up, but he stayed on the wagon. Until last night. Yeah. Her lawyer called, and Phil got to the phone before I did. He was almost well, didn't care if he ever saw her again. The lawyer said lawsuit, and Phil headed for the bar. Well, a breakdown is one thing, but a drunk is something else. And he doesn't exactly have the cleanest record in the world. A couple of his binges turned into marathons. Well, I don't know what to do. That's why I wanted to see him. I was sent down here to straighten him out if I could. Get that dame to lay off the lawsuit and you can. Well, maybe she thinks she's got a case. The other wives did all right. Well, that's why he flipped. He just can't afford it. You got any idea how much alimony he's paying right now? Yeah, I've heard. And it's more than just the dough. This one's taking him. He's played it straight all the way. Gave her everything she wanted. Laid off the booze. Really, I know. He tried to make this one work. And why did she leave him? She figured it was the right time. He's going good. Still got a lot of money. She's a tramp. Does he think so? Well, he does now. I never said anything to him while they were together, and there was a lot I could have said, but, you know, you, you just don't do those things. No, it never helps. After she left him, I finally sat him down and gave it to him straight. He got sore, but he listened, and he started putting things together. She played around all over the place while she was with him, but she did it smart. It's the old story about the husband being the last one to know. And he took it? Yeah. And it helped. I really gave it to him, everything I knew. He must have made quite a study. Well, she threw a few pitches my way. Well, if you know all these things, why not let her take it to court? Sounds like you've got enough on her to stop any kind of a suit. Oh, no, no. I, I said she played it smart. It's all hearsay. She'd just deny it, and who's going to call her a liar? 
The guys she was mixed up with? Maybe. Uh Uh-uh. Not these guys. They were hand-picked. You said she threw a few pitches your way. Look, Dollar, Maury's my closest friend. What do you think I'm going to do? Well, I came down here to see if I could help. But it looks pretty hopeless. I don't know. He looked like he was headed for a wet evening. Anyone holding his hand? Yeah, I left Milt with him. We've been working in shifts. His wife's name is Janet, isn't it? Yeah. Where does she live? Uh, 55 West 125th Street. Okay. Why don't you wait for me here? You going over to see her? I'm supposed to save my company money, Mr. Long. Maybe Mrs. Morey can suggest something. Are you kidding? Yeah. But have you got a better idea? Good luck. Friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum while you work, and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I left Long in the hotel bar and ran up expense account item six, one dollar and forty-five cents, for one more cab to take me to Mrs. Philip Morey's apartment building. I buzzed for the elevator, and when it arrived, a man stepped out and brushed my shoulder. Sorry. I'd seen him before someplace, and while the elevator took me up to the fourth floor, I tried to place him. Oh, I couldn't remember. But for some reason, the man seemed to be important. I got off at the fourth floor, still trying to place the face, and walked down the hall to Mrs. Morey's apartment. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Morey? Yes? My name is Dollar. I'm a special investigator for national life and casualty. Insurance? Yes. Well, I'm sorry, but I... My company insures your husband's television production. Oh. You mind if I come in and talk to you? No. Come on in. I don't quite understand, Mr. Uh, Uh, Dollar. Mr. Dollar. Sit down, please. Oh, thanks. My husband's production company is insured? That's right. Insured for what? Oh, accidents, illness. Oh. Well, how'd you find me? Mr. Long. I see. I have to make a complete investigation, Mrs. Morey. You see, when your husband was taken ill... Taken ill? Well, that's the report that was turned into the company. (laughs) I guess you could call it that. What would you call it? He's plastered. You know what that means. I sure do. I left him. I'm going to get a divorce. Well, aside from your personal differences, if your husband is just drinking, if that's the reason that production has been held up, My company will cancel his insurance. So? He won't be able to get insurance from any other company. Look, Mr. Dollar, do you know anything about Phil? Well, just what I've read. Well, that's been bad, all right, but you've got to live with a guy to really get the full effect. You wouldn't believe it. Well, I understood he's been a pretty good boy until recently. Why don't you go talk to my husband? I saw him earlier today. How'd you like it? It was a little tense. Was he sober? Not even close. Well. But I understand he just started drinking. Oh, that's dandy. Do you think they're going to tell you that he's been blind for the last month? You can take my word for it. He's no good. I tried. I was number four, and I certainly tried to do everything I could to make it work. 
Well, if it was that bad, I can't blame you. But this will ruin him. He was ruined the day he was born. Oh, he'll get along. He's still got a lot of money. After all the alimony he's been paying out? Mr. Dollar, Phil has made over six million since he started in the business. He could still afford a dozen more wives if anyone will have him. Well, I'm glad to hear that you'll be taken care of. You bet your life I'll be taken care of. After all I put up with, I deserve to be taken care of. Taken care of good. Uh Uh-huh. Well... Oh, you don't have to go. Let me buy you a drink. Well, sure. What's your poison? Anything that's handy. Just uh, water it. Bourbon? Fine, fine. I suppose Richard Long told you what a terrible woman I am. He mentioned something about it. Yeah, he would. He's a jealous little fellow. There you are. Oh, thanks. Cheers. Sure. Richard tried everything he could to break us up. And what a heel. After we'd been married for only a couple of months, Richard started making the old pitch. How do you like that? Well, uh, I can understand it. Hmm. Thanks. But Richard's supposed to be Phil's closest friend. An attractive woman can fracture a friendship in a hurry, under the right circumstances. The circumstances were anything but right, Mr. Dollar. Well, can't blame a man for trying. Don't you have any scruples? A couple. But I left them back in the third grade. Insurance business, huh? Yeah. You make a lot of money? Enough. It has other compensations. Tell me about them. Well, uh, good drink now and then. I bet you meet a lot of interesting people. Oh, lots, lots. What'd you say your first name was? I didn't. But it's Johnny. Johnny Dollar. Mm Mm-hmm. Nice, expensive sound. You should get a load of my expense account sometime. I'd love to. You know, uh, I saw a picture of you once. Really? Yeah. In a bathing suit. I was a model before I met Phil. I had lots of pictures taken in bathing suits. I think this was taken just before you married him. It was on the front page. Showing you were the girl that was going to be the fourth Mrs. Morey. Oh, that one. Yeah. That was a rather good one. Rather. That book there on the table is just full of pictures taken while I was modeling. Oh? Oh, this one? Mm Mm-hmm. Browse around. Oh, I'd love to. That's a good one. Yes. Oh, and here's one. We need a whole bunch of these on the beach. This is the best one of the lot. Yeah, yeah. Nice, uh, nice tan. (laughs) Isn't that one cute? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Dollar. Hmm? How are you a drink? It just curdled. Let me build you a fresh one. Oh, no, thanks. I have to go. Oh, I'm sorry. You won't be, honey. I don't think I understand that, Johnny. I'll tell you all about it sometime. It'll give you a real kick. I left Mrs. Moray looking a little worried. And whether she knew it or not, she had a right to be. In one of the pictures she'd shown me, I'd spotted the man. The man I'd bumped into coming out of the elevator. And I remembered who he was. Expense account item seven, one dollar and forty-five cents. Cab fare back to the hotel, where I told Richard Long about the man in the picture. Eugene Sweet. Ever heard of him? No. I couldn't remember until I saw that picture. It was a big case in L.A. He was convicted and sentenced. Did three years for forgery. I was in on the case. Sweet. No, I don't know. And there was a girl mixed up in it. Janet? No, no. But it was an interesting setup. Sweet introduced the girl to a wealthy old man. The girl married the wealthy old man. Now, it seems the girl would have Sweet sign her husband's name to a check, then she'd fill in the amount and cash it. Not big checks. But after about four years, they added up. Well, a man named Swift introduced Phil to Janet. I never did like him. He used to hang around all the time. Phil got tired of him in a hurry and gave him a bounce. What do you look like? Oh, he was tall, kind of greasy around the edges, weighed about, I don't know, about as much as I do. Where does he live? I don't know. 
I've only seen him a couple of times since Phil got rid of him. Why, you think Swift might be this, uh, this sweet or whatever his name is? Well, it's a long shot, but you never know. I guess I could find out. Milt might know. Would Janet? Sure. She might. Why don't we ask her? Yeah. Why don't we just go back to her place and you have a look at that picture book? I'm with you. Long's car was parked outside the hotel. We piled in and drove back to Mrs. Moray's apartment building. We parked just in time to see a man enter by the front door. That's him, Swift. He just went into Janet's building. And he came out about an hour ago. You mean Swift's the guy you were talking to? Eugene Sweet. Arrested in Los Angeles in 1949. Well, come on. Well, it might be perfectly innocent. And a pig's eye. I bet that dame has been working the same kind of setup you told me Sweet worked with the other one. He doesn't do anything. How does he support himself? Well, if he's with Mrs. Morey, we can always ask him. We went into the lobby and waited for the elevator to come down. Long looked happier than a kid in an acre of new cement. And there was just a chance he had a right to be. The elevator arrived, and so did Milt Gradke, the producer, who came busting into the lobby from the street. Milt? Richard. Richard, I've been calling you all over the place. What's the matter? Phil, he's loose. I couldn't keep him in the apartment. Oh, no. I tried, but he got rough. He tried calling Janet, but she hung up on him. Then he went wild. You think he's here with Janet? Yes, and that's not the half of it. Come on, we better get up there. There's no telling what he might do. You know about it? What do you mean about Sweet? Who? Sweet. I'll tell you later. I thought you meant the gun. Gun? Yes, Phil's got a gun with him. On the way up, Long explained as much as he could to Gradke, and Gradke continued to apologize for not being able to restrain Maury. We left the elevator on the fourth floor and hurried down to Mrs. Maury's apartment. The door was ajar. Sounds like they're all in there. Well, what are we going to do? Well, if he's got a gun... He sure has. I'm going in. Get back. Get back. Get back. Put down the gun, Maury. Don't, don't come near me. Get back. I warn you. Don't anybody get near me. I, I swear I'll shoot. Well. Not even you, Dick, no. You too, Milk. Get back. Miss Dane. Miss Dane thought she was going to take me. She's not going to get away with it. Leo, no, please. no, no. I am through. Nothing's left. So I'm going to do it up brown. What, what do you think of this dame, Dick? Look. Look who comes to see her. His real name's Sweet. Eugene Sweet. Huh? What? That's right, Maury. He's done time. Yeah? <laughs> Maury, put down the gun. Uh-uh. It's a better than even bet that your wife's been pulling a fancy bit of hijacking, Miss Sweet. Huh? That's right. Tell him about it, you little tramp. Yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> Look, Phil. I want the whole thing. How did you take me? Come on. He introduced you to Janet, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he did. They had it all settled. She marries you, sticks around for a while, and Sweet, being a good forger, signs your name to some checks. Tell him, Janet. Yeah. Phil. Yeah. Phil, look, you didn't do wrong. You did everything right, for goodness sakes. Phil, nobody's going to blame you now. Yeah. Only put away that gun. Put it down, Mr. Morey. Stay back. Mr. Morey, yeah. these two men have a lot of belief in you. Yeah. They think you can straighten out in spite of everything that's happened. Now, nobody's going to blame you for anything unless you use that gun. <laughs> Frankly, what happens to you doesn't make any difference to me. It doesn't make any difference to anyone. It does to these two guys. Why don't you start thinking about somebody else for a change? Let's see you prove you're worthy of their friendship. Stay away. Give me that gun. Uh, now, come on. Uh, you're not whipped. Everybody gets in a slump now and then. Come on. Give me the gun, Mr. Moria. <laughs> By the time the cops got there, Janet and Sweet had told me the whole story. They admitted cashing Ford's checks to the tune of $300,000. And that wasn't counting what Maury had given her legally. If I hadn't recognized Eugene Sweet, Janet would probably have won a nice settlement to go along with everything else. Maury had written so many checks, he never would have noticed the extra ones. Oh, he was a setup. 
He spent money hand over fist, and his business manager would never think a dozen small checks a week were forged. Expense account item eight, $54, hotel bill. Item nine, $18.83, train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $99.38. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps you keep feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. And we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Joe Duvall, Sidney Miller, High Averback, Bill Johnstone, and Jeanette Nolan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Here Chicago's favorite shows on WBBM FM Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment John Lund as Johnny Dollar. Stanley Mitchell Dollar. Oh, how are you, Mr. Mitchell? I'm fine. Are you employed? No, not since last Tuesday. Then you can take an assignment. Fast as you can give it to me. Go to New York and see a Mr. Alan Saxton. He recently returned from Europe where he purchased a supposedly priceless painting. Supplied to our company for insurance on it. You said supposedly priceless. Is there a doubt? Yeah, a big one. Several experts have examined the painting. Claim it's a forgery. Saxton yelled foul all over the place. He paid 200000 for the article. Well, I do a little yelling myself. A whole group of experts are going to give the painting every test there is, and if it stands up, we're obliged to insure it. And if it doesn't, I leave before Saxton comes to a boil, huh? That's about it. I'll get right on it, Mr. Mitchell. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working... Driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will.
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Great Eastern Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Alan Saxton matter. Expense account item one, $21.65, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived at Grand Central late in the afternoon and went directly to a hotel where I registered and made arrangements to rent a car. Saxton resided in a quaint three-story house on an estate across the river in Jersey that looked impressive enough to be an annex to Fort Knox. An old cad butler met me at the door and led the way into a mahogany and leather study where I was left to wait for the master of the house. Mr. Dollar? That's right. <coughs> Glad to know you. Mitchell of your company called, said you'd be down. Yes, sir. Well, sit down, sit down. A cigar? Uh, no, thanks. Mm. Aren't you a little premature? How do you mean? <laughs> well, there'll be no positive confirmation in my painting till after it's been examined, you know. <laughs> when will the examination take place? <laughs> nasty cough. Yeah, it's nasty. <laughs> Well, I'm to turn the painting over to Mr. Uh, De Farmer from the museum tomorrow morning. I imagine he'll have it for a day or so. I understand you paid 200000 <laughs> I, I sure did. 200000 fat American dollars, Mr. Dollar. Have you any idea how long it takes to make $200,000, Mr. Dollar? Well, that kind of depends on who's making it. Uh, Me, I start getting senile around a buck ninety-eight. <laughs> Oh, Lord. If I keep hacking like this, I'll end up doing business in an oxygen tent. <laughs> You'd like to see the painting, Mr. Dollar? Sure. Yeah, come on. Mr. Dollar, if I've been swindled, I'm going to cause more trouble than a hungry snake and a rabbit pit. Who'd you buy the painting from? Who? One of the biggest, most respectable dealers in Paris is all. You ever been to Paris, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. In here. Hey, how about that Paris, eh? Oh, I rather enjoyed myself. <laughs> I, I rather did, too. <laughs> yeah, I've been there a dozen times now, and I never get tired of anything. Not anything, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> the last trip You're I met... You're a terrible old man. Huh? Oh, Barbara. I didn't see you. Obviously. Hello. Hello. This is my impish daughter, only child, spoiled rotten. Barbara. Johnny Dollar. Just going to show Mr. Dollar the painting. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. yeah. You don't really like it, do you, Mr. Dollar? Well, I really don't know much about it, Miss Saxton. Barbara. You don't care for it, Mr. Dollar? Well, I... I guess it's very good. G good. Dollar, that's an original Marshall. Marshall. Oh. They're beginning to call Dad the hacking sack. <laughs> yeah, hacking sack. Nasty little brat, isn't she? Who told you the painting was a forgery, Mr. Yeah, Sykes? A miserable little man named Lippert fancies himself an authority. Just jealous of what he is. Give his right clavicle for that painting. Ran around telling everyone how old Saxton got taken for 200 grand, miserable little cuss. Are you going to be in town long, Mr. Oh, Dolly? stop rolling your eyes. That's about as crude And that eye rolling went out with high button shoes. Uh, who did you say sold you the painting? Look out for her, Dollar. Get that tone. Are you going to be in town long, Mr. Dollar? I want to know. Uh, the painting? Uh, I bought it from René Francois, most reputable dealer in Paris. He's only going to be in town till after they establish my paintings of forgery. Isn't that right, Dollar? Uh, who? Uh, Ronnie Francois? You! I'm doing my best to save you from this designing female. Now, agree with me. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm only going to be in town until after... Then you can stay after... for dinner. He cannot. Why not, Mr. Dollar? Uh, well... Because uh, we haven't got enough food. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Now, you go on back to wherever you're staying, Mr. Dollar, and I'll get in touch the minute they finish with the painting. Now, take my word for it, Dollar. Quit while you're ahead. Stick around for dinner and you end up a cripple. Oh. Well, are you going to stay for dinner or not, Mr. Dollar? He is not. Seems like a nice fella. But he never played polo in his life. How about it, Dollar? No, just an occasional game of stickball. Stick... What position? Oh, mostly gutter. Wonderful. I was a gutter man <laughs> myself. <laughs> you were raised in Hell's Kitchen, Mr. you know. Mr. Dollar, please stay for dinner. No. You can talk over old times, bring back the good old days when you were out cracking skulls. You were going to leave. 
I am. Then show Mr. Dollar a Saxon's word is as good as his bond. Her bond. I'm a her. her she. Yeah, her. Sometimes I wonder. Come on, Dollar. I'll walk you to the door. You don't have to drag him. Mr. Dollar. Goodbye, Miss Saxton. Please. No! Look out! Ah, getting better, but you're putting too much of a curve on it. I hate you. <laughs> Come on, Dollar. You're quite a girl, huh? Yeah. There's nothing really wrong. Just spoiled. Got too much money. I'd ask you to stay, but you really seem like too nice a fella. Well, uh... Well, what? Just well. At the moment, that's about as glib as I can get. I left the Saxton house, shook my head a few times to get my brain turned around, and drove back to New York in my hotel. There wasn't much for me to do until the experts examined the painting. So I showered, shaved, got dressed in my other suit, and called a few numbers I'd collected during several investigations to see if I could get what looked to be a dull evening back on its feet. I struck out three times and was dialing the fourth when... Yeah? Come on in. Hello? Yeah, I come in? Well, uh... Yeah, yeah, sure. I hope I didn't interrupt an important call. No, no. Sit down. Thanks. Where's Daddy? Oh, he wouldn't tell me where you were staying, so I found out who he was insured with. I had to call his lawyer. Then I called your insurance company. Oh, I'm flattered. I'm determined. Daddy's liable to spank. I don't think so. He's really not the general he tries to be. He blusters and lays down the law, and we butt heads. And you get what you want. If it's important enough. Well, I'm sorry I spoiled your record. You haven't. Well, then my staying for dinner wasn't important. Oh, yes. Very important. Well, then you lose. Mm-hmm. If you can't fight them, join them. Well, that's a practical bit of philosophy, but I don't see quite how it applies. I've had no dinner. Uh-huh. You wouldn't accept my home-cooked invitation, so now it's going to cost you. My expense account just turned yellow. Where would you like to take me to dinner? Where would you like me to take you to dinner, shy Violet? <laughs> Maybe I'm not the most conventional type in the world. I'll go along with that. But I don't want to argue. Don't want to have to coerce you. Don't want you to do anything you don't really want to do. You just want me to take you to dinner. It's a nice way to start off an evening. Yeah. And you'll take me to dinner? Johnny? Expense account item two. $22.78 dinner at a small Italian restaurant. I'm pretty sure the dinner was excellent. But I'm positive that Barbara Saxton was more woman than I'd run into in a long time. Delilah was a Girl Scout by comparison. We got back to the Saxton home in Jersey about three in the morning, parked the car at the front door, and said good night. I had a wonderful evening. Will you call me tomorrow? Right after my two o'clock shock treatment. Weren't you happy? Well, I'm not quite <laughs> sure. I think we had a little too much to drink. Who had a little too much to drink? Okay. I had a little too much to drink. You're fractured. I love you, Johnny. Let's get married. Come on, dear love. Oh, I don't want to go in yet. I want to get married. Johnny, let's drive to some place where we can get married. No, I'm once more a clear-thinking, cautious bachelor. I can fix that. Now, well, I'm conscious. Want to bet? Oh, come on. Be a good little girl. Get out of that car and let me walk you to the door or I'll scream for help. You're mean. The word is coward. Yes. Now, come on, dear. No. All right. You're right. You're a coward. But a single one. Now, come on. Kiss me goodnight first. Barbara. Kiss me goodnight or I won't budge. I'll kiss you goodnight at the front door. It's a deal. <laughs> Where's your key? First. Now, honey. You promised. The front door. This is it. The old front door. Okay. Good night, honey. Let's get married. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Now. Shh. Now. Honey, the door was open. I don't want to go in. I'm not going to go Barbara, in. Barbara, look. No. I'm going to 
sit right down here. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, that's nice. Carry me, Johnny. Carry me to a minister and let's get married till death do us part. There. You're on your own. Good night. Johnny, you come back here. You can't leave me just standing here like this. Drink a big glass of milk and get some sleep. Johnny. Good night. What the... Johnny! Oh, Johnny! What is it? What's wrong? In the library, Dad! What? He's lying there. Hurt his head. It's all bloody. Friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum while you work, and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Barbara Saxton was hysterical. I had a slapper to calm her down. Then together we went into the darkened Saxton house where I found her father, Alan Saxton, lying on the floor, bleeding from a nasty scalp wound. Johnny! He's all right. Call a doctor. Oh. Come on, come on. Oh. Mr. Saxton. You can't stop him. Don't try to sit up. Oh. What? The picture. <coughs> You all right? Yeah. What happened? Oh. Oh, Dollar. Now you better stay right there till we get a doctor. Oh, just sit up. Oh. oh, my head. Oh, it doesn't look too bad. There's a lot of blood. My painting. Now, just take it easy. Now, he got it. Look, it's gone. Okay, okay, but don't try to get up. It might be a concussion. No, he stole my painting. Cut it right out of the frame. Who did? I don't know. A man. I heard something and came down. Servant's night off. Shouldn't have been anyone down here. What did he hit you with? A oh, flashlight, I think. Doctor will be right over. Dead? Traitor. I thought you were dead. I couldn't be. I'd feel better. You deserted me. <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake, stop that. I'm the one who got clobbered. He nearly scared me half to death. Well, I couldn't help it. What happened? Some dirty low life swiped my painting. No. Well, look. The marshal. Yeah, caught him in the act. Would have captured him, too, but he crowned me with his flashlight. Better get some hot water and a towel. But they have to take 50 stitches. Well, it's just a little cut. It is not. It's good for at least 50 stitches. Dear love. Yes, dear love. Get the hot water and a towel while I go oh. call the robbery details. Yes, John. Wait, wait. Yes, dear love. Yes, Johnny. He took me to dinner. Well, it's 3.30 in the morning. 3.35. What day? Tuesday. What time do you finish dinner? Look, while you're getting your suspicions up, the thief is putting a lot of miles between dollar, this house and dollar, the... Dollar, answer me one question. She didn't get you drunk and get you to marry her. I sure tried. But you didn't. No. Yeah, you're a lucky boy, Johnny. Oh, don't look so smug. You just think everyone wants to marry me for my money. Well, don't they? Not Johnny. I'm going to call the police. Wait, wait, wait. Just one more question. If you married my daughter, would it be for her money? In the first place, I'm not going to marry your daughter. Johnny. In the second place, if I did, it wouldn't be for her money. See? If I was going to marry her at all, it would be for your money. Johnny! Ah! Ah! <laughs> Barbara got a towel and some hot water, and I called the police. I stuck around while old Saxton gave his heroic side of the incident. Then I took off and drove back to the hotel, where I put in a call to the Paris branch of the company. I talked with Howard Gilbert and asked him to check on the departure of Rennie Francois. 
who, according to Saxton, wasn't expected to arrive in the States until late that afternoon. There had to be a good reason why anyone would steal a painting that had been publicized as a possible fake. Saxton wouldn't have the painting stolen, because without insurance, he'd just be out the 200000 he'd paid for it. Rene Francois might have a reason, though. Because if the painting was proved a forgery, his reputation would suffer, not to mention having to return the 200000 to Saxton. Well, Gilbert promised to wire the information regarding Francois's departure the minute he had it, and I left the hotel and headed across town to see an old friend, a continental stool pigeon with a way of knowing about such things as stolen $200,000 paintings. It was close to 5 o'clock when I rang his doorbell. Whoever it is, you're just being ridiculous. Allez, c'est bon. Henri, open up. Not by the hair of my little goatee. If I owe you money, come back at a respectable hour. It's Johnny Dollar. I don't believe it. Only my landlord or, or a vampire would go to such extremes. Look, Henri, I'm going to slip a little something under the door. Uh, another ten might convince me. Okay, but you'll never go to heaven. I'm convinced. Mon ami, <laughs> entre, entre. <laughs> eh, I miss you, Johnny. Are you that broke? Well, until this windfall, I was completely fractured. But, um, what can I do for you? Some information. Eh uh, bien, bien. Mais is this so important that you must seek me out before the, the sun has risen? You ever heard of a Mr. Alan Saxton? Saxton? He's been in the papers. Well, a few hours ago, someone hit him over the head and swiped a very expensive painting. Oh, is that the Saxon who recently purchased the supposed uh, Marshall? That's the one. Well, there was some doubt as to the authenticity of the painting. Experts were going to examine it today. He paid 200000 for it. Two? Marshall? <laughs> I would have painted him something far superior for, for much less. Who do you think would pull a job like that? Well, what is so special about a job like that? Break into a house, steal a painting? An amateur could handle it. No, no. It's a special job for a special talent. The thief knew his Marshaux. There were a lot of other paintings in that room. Well, but he could read, couldn't he? Marshaux certainly signed the work. Or if it's a forgery, whoever painted it certainly signed Marshaux's name. This painting wasn't signed. That's one of the reasons why there's some doubt about it. Uh-huh. Not only that, but why would someone take that painting when it's worthless until proven authentic? Mm -hmm. You have a point. I'm thinking of a European. Oh, Johnny, I wouldn't touch a job like this. Someone with an international reputation. Please, Johnny, I am innocent. Mon ami, please believe me. Someone who could possibly be hired in Paris, or if he happened to be in the United States, could be contacted. Someone that would know this particular Marshall and be qualified to break into the Saxton house. Henri? Wait, wait, wait. You have that knowing look. Well, I, you know, I was just thinking about my landlord. Sooner or later, he'll trap me. It's the law of average. So far, so far, I've cleverly avoided this ingenious... How much? Pardon? How much do you own? Oh, a paltry two months rent, $40. Okay. Yeah, but, but what sense is there in paying when it will only provide me with a legal claim to this disgusting dwelling? And I have no sustenance to keep me alive for longer than a week. Well, then just pay him for a week. You would have me starve? How much will keep you alive for two months? Well, I, I would at least like to take care of uh, Greenbaum's delicatessen. Ten bucks? Well, the, the exact amount is, uh, fifteen. Uh, Oh, you're lucky I've got an expense account. <laughs> you think I don't know it? <laughs> All right, who is he? Well, you might go to the Shelton Arms and inquire about a man named Gaston Chambry. It has been rumored that he arrived from Paris only yesterday. Who is he? Well, that is for you to discover. There are certain things I am bound by honor not to diverge. But any policeman in the world could help you out. <laughs> I left the little Frenchman and went back to my hotel. 
where a cable was waiting from Gilbert at the Paris office. It told me that René Francois had booked passage on Air France and was due to arrive late in the afternoon. I left, climbed into the rented car, and drove to the Shelton Arms on East 108th Street, where a sleepy night clerk gave me Gaston Chambray's room number and accepted a $10 bribe not to inform Chambray that I was on my way up. Who is it? A cable for you, Mr. Chambray. Oh. It's from René Francois. How do you know that? I peeked. You are not a messenger boy. Sure I am. I've got a message from René Francois. Well, give it to me. He says to give me the painting. Oh, oh. Uh-uh. I'm coming in. You have no right to come in. You got something to hide? Get out of here before I call the police. Oh, no. I'll just stick around. But if you want to call the police, why don't you go right ahead? Maybe you'd like to tell them where you were earlier this morning. I was right here in my room. I have been in my room since early last night. You didn't take a short trip over to Jersey? I certainly did not. You arrived from Paris yesterday, huh? Yes, but what has... Oh, police. You are a policeman. I'm surprised you didn't decide that when I pushed my way in here. I have done nothing. But you know a René Francois. Yes, but I know nothing about a painting. Now, look, I know all about of you. Of course, but you can't prove anything. You want me to tear this apartment to pieces, or do you want to hand over the Marchaux? I told you I have no painting. I just said Marchaux. That could be something you shampoo your hair with. You mentioned the painting, then Marchaux. Any fool would know they are one and the same... As for your tearing my apartment to pieces, as you so crudely put it, I think you would be making a serious mistake. Really? You have no warrant. Well, now you're making a serious mistake. Uh, really? I don't need one. You're still going under the assumption that I'm a policeman. You you are not? No, not a bit. Uh. All right, get up. Now, where's the painting? Who sent you? I sent myself. Now, where's the painting? Okay. No, no. Wait a minute. It's it's under the pillows on the couch. Uh Uh-huh. Why did you steal it? Maybe you didn't understand me. No. All right. I was hired. Sure you were. René Francois? Yes. Okay. Now, as long as you're so suspicious about policemen... Put on your clothes. I'll take you downtown, introduce you to a few of the gentlemen in blue. Gaston Chambray gave a complete confession to the police. He'd been hired by the Paris art dealer, René Francois, to steal the painting, had been discovered by Alan Saxton, and in order to make his escape, was forced to clout the old boy on the skull with his flashlight. René Francois was met at the plane, and when confronted with the evidence, readily confessed. He explained that when the Marchaux was proclaimed a possible forgery, he realized that if it really was, his business would be ruined, and he would have to return the 200000 to Saxton. He checked with the sources that had originally sold him the painting and discovered that there was a strong possibility that the painting was a fake. He offered Chambray $10,000 to do the job. He'd arrive in the States after the robbery, offer his condolences, meet Chambray at a predetermined spot, and take the painting. Well, Saxton took it in stride. And after Francois gave him back the money, he even laughed about it. <laughs> you really did a fine job, Dollar. I'd like to make it worth your while. Well, it'll just cost you the $85 I paid out in bribes. <laughs> the rest goes on the expense account. Johnny. Oh, you look pretty bad. <laughs> Terrible hangover. Daddy, don't be mean. You're responsible for this. You got my 200,000 bucks for me. It was that Francois. He was behind the whole thing. Some guy named Daddy. Jim. Well, don't you want to hear about it? Johnny, will you take care of me? I need somebody to take care of me. Oh, dear love, I'd love to. Really? But I've got to get back to Hartford. I can be packed in an hour. Oh, there you go with that eye rolling again. I'm not rolling them. They're rolling themselves. I have absolutely no control yeah. whatsoever, Johnny. Dear love. Yes, dear love. Can I go with you? Uh, no. Why not? Well, I'm an insurance man. What's the matter with that? Oh, nothing. Only I know a bad risk when I see one. Johnny, I'm not a bad risk. No. But I am. Ah! <laughs> 
I bet. <laughs> Here, have a cigar. <laughs> Expense account item three, $55.85, hotel bill and car rental. Item four, $19.65, train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $119.93. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps you keep feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum every day. And we know you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Edgar Barrier, Hal March, Virginia Gregg, and Jay Novello. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. WBBM-FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hanley Conrad, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Conrad. You employed? No, no, I'm not. All right. Ever heard of a man named Howard Arnold, big attorney? Represents some of the biggest... Oh, uh... yeah, yeah, that one. I've been reading about him. Attorney for George Castro. That's right. Represents the whole rotten syndicate. Yeah. We insure him for a half million dollars. We wouldn't want anything to happen to him. With that outfit behind him, nothing could. Mm. Castro's got more guns than the Army and Navy. I've known Arnold for a long time. Went to law school with him. Called me up the other night. I met him in New York. He's worried. He didn't say it, but I think he's had that falling out with Castro. He wanted to know if I could give him some protection. Why doesn't he go to the police? That's what I asked him, but he said the police wouldn't lift a finger unless he helped expose Castro. What do you want me to do? See him, find out what's on his mind, and stick with him till he feels safe. Okay. Thanks, Johnny. He lives at 944 Sutton Place. I can leave in an hour. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes the time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, World Insurance, and Indemnity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. 
The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Howard Arnold matter. Expense account item one, $23.55, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. Expense account item two, $1.75, cab fare to the hotel. Where I registered, went up to my room and put in a call to the illustrious barrister, Mr. Howard Arnold. Hello? Is Mr. Arnold home? No, he isn't. Who's calling? Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Arnold's not home. May I take a message? Just tell him I'm staying at the Ellsworth Hotel. Maybe I can reach him at his office. No, he's not there. I've been trying to reach him all morning. But I'll certainly tell him you called. Thank you. I unpacked my clothes, had some lunch, and waited around the hotel for the rest of the afternoon. I called Arnold's office twice, but his secretary said she hadn't seen Arnold for several days. Presumed he was out of town on business. I went down to the bar, had something cool, and returned to my room. Around 7 o'clock, there was a knock at my door. Mr. Dollar? That's right. Howard Arnold. Oh, come in. My wife told me you'd called. Yes, and I checked with your office several times. I haven't been to my office. I haven't been home, even. Sit down. Thanks. You got a light? Thanks. How much do you know about me, Mr. Dollar? Only what I've read in the paper and what Hanley Conrad told me over the phone. Yeah, I went to law school with Hanley. Mm-hmm. That's what he said. You know about George Castro? Just what I've read. He'd like to kill me. Why? Because I know too much and he's afraid I'll tell someone. I thought you were in pretty solid with Castro. Yeah, solid as anyone gets with him. Our relationship's been getting thinner and thinner for the last year. It finally stretched too tight and snapped. I called Hanley right after it happened. I knew Castro's next step would be to try to liquidate me. Well, I'm here to see that he doesn't. Yeah, Hanley mentioned you, said you were capable. But just to be with me in order to keep Castro's boys away isn't very practical. Well, I didn't think so either. If Castro wants you, it'd take a lot more than me to stop it. But if you think so too, I, uh, why does... I really want you to keep something for me. It's better insurance than 20 efficient bodyguards. I'd have given it to Hanley the other night, but I didn't have it then. That's why I asked him for someone like you, someone who's capable of holding on to something as hot as this is. Just what is it? Has enough in this envelope to send Castro and the rest of the outfit away for a hundred years. Couldn't you just leave me a bundle of dynamite? <laughs> as long as I have this evidence and Castro knows that if anything happened to me to get to the police, I'm safe. Castro knows you've got it? He sure does. I told him by phone a half hour ago. And all you want me to do is hang on to it? That's right. For how long? Until I make some arrangements, I'll let you know. Then what do you want me to do with it? You'll give it back to me. Wherever I am, you'll get it to me. Okay. All right, there you are. Now, if you don't mind, I'll use your phone. My wife's probably worried. I looked at the large envelope and thought about George Castro, the big boy of the outfit. One-fourth man, three-fourths rat. If he ever found out where that envelope was, yours truly could stop planning for his old age. I had dinner, sat in the bar listening to a thin blue piano player for about an hour, then went back up to my room, where I'd hidden the envelope in the dresser taped to the bottom of the second drawer. Shut the door. What? The... Shut it. What goes on? I speak to a little boy. I'll get over there and sit down. Okay, okay. Hey, I know you. Good. You're Marty Fleet, one of Castro's happy little trigger men. All right for you. Sit down. Now let's have it. Have what? Don't play games, huh? A little while ago, you had a visitor. I did? Yeah, and he left something with you. Let's have it. Have what? You're going to make me go to all the trouble of tearing this joint apart. Not if it's going to make you grouchy. If I spend a lot of time looking for it, what are you going to be doing? 
Do you want me to help you? Uh, no, I do better by myself. You're going to tell me where it is? If I knew what you were talking about, I'd be... Okay, okay, so I waste my time and tear the joint apart. Shall I uh, turn my back? No, uh, you just take a nap. I finally got my eyes open and found myself alone in the middle of a pile of furniture. The gorilla had departed, and to my amazement, I discovered that he hadn't found the envelope. I called Howard Arnold. Hello? Is Mr. Arnold there? Who's calling? Johnny Dollar. Just a moment. For you, dear, and Mr. Dollar. Hello, Dollar? Well, I think so, but I wouldn't swear to it until I find my head. What's wrong? One of Castro's boys paid me a visit. Did he know I'd been there? Obviously. He wanted the envelope. You didn't give it to him? He was persistent in a physical sort of way, but I still have the ugly little thing. That's bad. You're darn right it is. He'll tell Castro he couldn't find it. If Castro even thinks you've got it. Well, let's relieve his mind. You take it back. Well, certainly it's no good you're keeping it if Castro suspects you still might have it. Look, you meet me. Where? Well, certainly not in my house. Castro's probably having me watched. He won't do anything until he knows he can get his hands on that envelope. Well, any place you say, but if you think you're being watched... I'll be careful to lose anyone who might be following. I know a spot. It's about two miles off the main highway to Connecticut. Well, why all the way out there? Can't we just meet in a gas station or something? No. When you turn over that envelope, I want to be in the safest place possible. But that's a long way. It just doesn't make... Please, Mr. Dollar, this is the way I'd like it. I know what I'm doing. It's deserted, away from everything, and the last place Castro would think of. Okay, if that's the way you want it. I rented a car and drove for a good 40 minutes till I spotted the turnoff. I swung right, hit a stretch of dirt road, drove two miles, and then my light picked up Arnold's car. I pulled up in front of him. You took your time. I've been waiting 20 minutes. I had to come a little farther than you did. I was at the envelope. This place gives me the creeps. Yeah, sure. Here. Both of you hold it right there. What? Oh, no. Don't move a muscle. I'll do something. Who's got muscles? Hello, Fleet. Aren't you a long way from home? How's your head? Fleet, wait a minute. Oh, shut up. Hey, Castro's been worried about that envelope. At all time, huh, Dollar? Cross my heart and hope to... No. No, I take that back. Can't we make a deal? No, not now. Please, Fleet, I... I'll give you 5000 No. Ten. Sorry. Fifteen. You got 15000 No, but he has... Yeah, 15. I'll, I'll make it 15. Can't see it. Then what do you want? Well, first, I want to make Mr. Dollar sorry for lying the way he did. Look. So turn around. Now, wait a minute. I said turn around. Go on. The law knows about your fleet. If they find me dead, it won't... You gonna turn around? Okay. Now what? I said I was gonna make you sorry for lying. <laughs> again, that disgustingly familiar deep black hole. The hole works. I don't know how long I was out this time, but when I slowly pulled myself back, I thought at first that part of the dream had stayed with me. I got to my feet and made my way to the edge of the road. The whole sky seemed to burn with a brilliant yellow light. I looked down in the ravine, and there was Arnold's car, resting on its side where it had rolled, the flames roaring up around it. The charred arm of a man hanging out of the window. Friends, this coming Friday or Saturday evening, you'll probably have a lot of youngsters ringing your doorbell and calling out tricks or treats. Well... Here's a suggestion that'll make a real hit with those youngsters and give you a lot of Halloween fun, too. Make your treat Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Kids love chewing gum, 
And they really appreciate it when you give them sticks or packages of Wrigley's Spearmint. It's a wholesome, healthful treat, too. And it's inexpensive. You can treat a whole army of little goblins and spooks without running up a big cost or going to a lot of trouble. So, when you go to the store, get some packages or a box of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. You'll agree, it's a perfect treat for Halloween. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I made it back to the road and flagged a car that drove me to a phone. I called the police and the fire department. Forty minutes later, the fire department arrived, and the wagon hauled what was left of Arnold down to the morgue. I explained what had happened to a Lieutenant David of homicide, then we drove back to the station where I made a statement. I'm having Castro picked up now. Got a call out on Marty Fleet, too. I still can't figure how Fleet got out on that road, Lieutenant. He followed Arnold. No, he couldn't have. Fleet worked me over and took my room apart. And when I woke up, he was gone. All in all, I was out for about ten minutes. Yeah. Arnold lives a good thirty minutes from my hotel. When I arrived, Arnold said he'd been waiting twenty minutes. Uh Uh-huh. It would be impossible for Fleet to tail Arnold, then. Unless he had wings. Ever think he might have waited around, tailed you? No, he was already there when I arrived. Maybe somebody could have told him. Who? How do I know? Maybe Arnold told his wife, and she said something. She's down in the morgue now, making an identification on the body. Yeah? We've got George Castro downstairs. Hold him. He got Castro downstairs. Yeah, I heard. I want to talk to him. Lieutenant? Yeah. Miss Arnold's outside. She identify him? Yeah. Said the body was Arnold, all right. Pretty hard to tell, but the ring and the watch clinched it. She's feeling pretty bad. I'll bring her in. Yes, sir. Oh, come in, Mrs. Arnold. Yeah, this is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? Hello. Uh, sit down, please. Thank you. Now, uh, I'll try to make this as brief as possible. I'd appreciate it. I understand you identified the body. Yes. It was Howard. You could tell. I'm certain. That was the watch and the ring. They belonged to Howard. Did you know your husband was going to meet Mr. Dollar before he was killed? No. He didn't say where he was going. He'd been acting very strangely for the past few weeks. Did he tell you he'd been to see me earlier today? No. I didn't even know he knew you. Well, do you know why anyone would want to kill him? Lieutenant, you know who my husband was. What he did, the people he represented. See them. (sighs) All right, Mrs. Arnold. I'll have someone take you home. Thank you, but I have my own car. Well, if you don't feel well... Uh... I'm all right. <laughs> nice meeting you, Mr. Dell. Goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah, she's taking it pretty good. Uh-huh. Uh, you wanted to talk to George Castro. Yeah. Yes, Lieutenant? Yeah, send in George Castro. All right. I think we'll be able to hold Mr. Castro for a while this time. One thing really bothers me. What? Why didn't Fleet kill me? Just knock me out. Kill Arnold, run him off a cliff. Something really out of place in this one. Here's Castro, Lieutenant. Well, how are you, Lieutenant? Sit down, Castro. Uh, Are you going to introduce me? If it's important to you, the name is Dollar. Okay. (laughs) Now, what's this all about? Howard Arnold was killed a couple of hours ago. Ah? Uh, you don't say. Shot. Piled in his car and run off a cliff. Caused quite a fire. Oh, such a shame. <laughs> well, don't look at me. It's all right, Castro. We've got strong stomachs. This one of your cops, David? No, but I agree with him. Well, that's too bad, because I don't like him. So, uh, I guess I don't like you either. Well, I'm getting all choked up. That might be arranged, too. Listen, Castro, you keep your mouth shut until I ask you a question. You may throw a lot of weight around this town, but you're on a diet when you're in this office. 
One of your boys killed Arnold. I doubt that. Marty Fleet, and I'll swear to it in court. Fleet, huh? No. Who pushed your fist around, funny man? Fleet, on your orders. I don't even know you. You sent Fleet to find something that Arnold had given to me. Something that could put you away for a hundred years. Really? You want to know something? I don't think Arnold had anything like that. Fleet said you sent him. Ah, that's pretty weak, funny man. Let's see how weak it is when I testify. Look, boys, you're not playing with no punk kid. Now, you look. Your boy Fleet came into my office, drew a gun on me, worked me over because he said you sent him. Howard Arnold told me he was afraid you were going to have him killed. Tonight I met Arnold and Fleet showed up with his gun again. He put me to sleep and when I... Yeah. Yeah, go on. Your what is it? Huh? I just thought of something. Castro, you say you had nothing to do with it. That's what I said. And tell me where I can find Fleet. Oh, don't get me started laughing. I'm too tired. Okay, then hang. This guy's got rid of sense of humor, Lieutenant. You should have him on the force with the rest of your funny cops. I don't think it's so funny, Castro. He's just telling you the truth. I'm going to hold you this time. There's not going to be any writ. Huh? Huh. <laughs> you making any book on that? I'm even giving odds. I got more than one lawyer. Yeah, and both of them have already seen Judge Phillips. You're not going to get a writ from anyone. The pressure's on. Fleet's your boy and everybody knows it. The DA's got an election coming up and the papers have been yelling for your scalp. Oh, stop it. Even if your lawyers show up with a writ, you're not going to be here. I'll move you to every jail in this district and I'll keep moving you. I'm going to nail you to the wall until you're convicted. Ah, go ahead. I had nothing to do with this. Then tell us where we can find Fleet. Yeah, go on, Castro. If you had nothing to do with it, tell us. <sighs> okay. Okay. Maybe you can find him over on 64th Street. The Alton Arms. I'll check it. Can I go now? Not till I check it. While you're doing that, I want to go over and talk to Mrs. Arnold. What do you got? Just a hunch. Yes. Oh. I'd like to talk to you, if I may, Mrs. Arnold. I really don't feel much like discussing anything, Mr. Dollar. This is pretty important. All right. Come in. Sorry I had to disturb you. So am I. But if it's important... Well, you want to get your husband's killer, don't you? Certainly. We can go in here. You know, this happened so suddenly, it's, it's hard to really believe it. Now, Mr. Dollar, how can I help? Well, I'd like to know a few things about your husband. He, uh, he provided for you, didn't he? Yes, but I don't see how that can be of any importance. Well, I just want to know a few things. Your husband made quite a bit of money, didn't he? Yes. You, uh, got along? You were happy? Very. You know... There's something awfully funny about this killing. What do you mean? Do you mind if I smoke? No. Please go right ahead. Oh, thanks. Would you like one? No, thank you. What did you mean? That there's something awfully funny about my husband's death? Well, a man named Fleet is supposed to have done it. Works for George Castro. My husband was always afraid of Castro. This Fleet came to my room at the hotel... Said he was working for Castro. Wanted some evidence your husband gave me in an envelope. Fleet knocked me unconscious and then, for a professional hoodlum, did a remarkably poor job of searching. Why haven't the police picked him up? Well, they're looking for him, but I doubt if they find him. Why not? Why won't they find him? He met your husband and me out in the road. Knocked me unconscious again. Then when I awoke, it looked like he'd killed your husband and shoved the car over the cliff. Oh, please... Can't this wait until tomorrow? I think you can help me. But I don't know what you're getting at. Well, Fleet couldn't have followed me because he was already out there. And he couldn't have followed your husband because there wasn't enough time. Somebody told him where we were going to meet. He had time to get there, but not to follow us. Now, Fleet knew that I knew him, could identify him. Why didn't he kill me? I don't know. And I don't know what you're getting at. Now, if you don't One mind... more question, Mrs. Arnold. Yes. When I called your husband this afternoon, I talked to you, didn't I? Yes. At the station, you said you didn't even know your husband knew me. That's right. 
But when I told you my name over the phone, you knew who I was. I did no such thing. Oh, I'm afraid you did. You said, oh, yes, Mr. Dollar, the first time I called. Well, that's not so unusual. My husband has a great many clients. It was just a matter of diplomacy. Mm Mm-hmm. You know what I think, Mrs. Arnold? I'm really not interested in what you think, Mr. Dollar. I'd like you to leave. I think someone wanted me to identify Fleet as your husband's killer. I don't think Fleet killed your husband. Well, someone certainly did. I think someone else wanted the police to think George Castro was behind it. Might even have hired Fleet, unknown to Castro. Told Fleet to be sure and tell me he was doing the job for Castro. How can I possibly help with all this? Your husband wanted me to hold the evidence until he could make some arrangements. What kind of arrangements? How should I know? He was safe as long as the evidence was safe. Castro wouldn't do anything. Arnold could have put the envelope in a safety deposit vault with instructions to have the police open it in case of his death. Mr. Dollar. Instead, your husband gave me the envelope. Said he'd take it back when he'd made arrangements. Now, how could that help him? I don't know. He couldn't hide, go to another country. He knew you can't run away from a man like Castro. And if he ever had the evidence on him, Castro would kill him in a minute. All right. You've said what you had to say. No, not quite. You know what I think? I think the arrangements had already been made. I think the best way for your husband to escape Castro was to have himself killed. You're insane. If he was dead, you'd have all his money and a half a million more in insurance. Get out of here. But he isn't dead at all, is he? The man in that car was Fleet. Get out. Your husband leaves the country. Everyone thinks he's dead. Castro stops looking for him. And after you collect the money, you meet him. Get out. Get out. Howard. Well, hello, Mr. Arnold. You don't even look singed. And what a lovely gun. I didn't credit you with this much sense, Dollar. Howard, what are we going to do? We're going to do just as we planned, with one slight change. Your car's in front, isn't it, Dollar? Yeah. Get our car, Beth. You're going to follow us. Where? Get the car. Fleet was the body in the burning car? Yes. You hired him to throw the blame on Castro. Of course. You're really a pretty messy guy, Arnold. You won't have to worry about it long. The police know I came here. They're going to wonder who killed me. What's the matter with Castro? Uh Uh-uh. He's sitting in the lieutenant's office right now. (laughs) He has so many efficient assassins. Let's go. Okay. Howard! You just follow us. All right, Dollar. Over to your car. You drive. Howard! What? There's a car coming up the drive. Howard! Look at that nice squad car! (laughs) Dollar, what's going on? Oh, hi, Lieutenant. You've met Mr. Howard Arnold? Holy! He's alive! Yeah, but slightly unconscious. Better get them both in the car. Right. Here's Sergeant. Now, what's going on? I'll tell you all about it as soon as we can sit down in some nice, loud saloon. Okay? Well, uh... It's on the expense account. Okay. We picked up the not-so-honorable Mr. Howard Arnold and took him back to the station, along with his weeping wife. I filled in some of the details on the way, and later, after I changed my shirt, the lieutenant met me in the bar, and I explained the whole thing from start to finish. Between the start and the finish, I ran up expense account items 3 through 25, $27.75, drinks and dinner for two. Expense account item 26, $49.18, car rental and hotel bill. Item 27, $21.43, Train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $123.66. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. 
The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. And we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. And remember, Halloween is coming, so be sure to have plenty of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum on hand for the youngsters who come calling for tricks or treats. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were David Young, Jeanette Nolan, John McIntyre, Hi Averback, Frank Nelson, and Bill Conrad. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. From Hollywood, it's time now for John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. My name's Elgin, Mr. Dollar. Claims Division, Delaware Mutual Life. What can I do for you, Mr. Elgin? Would you be free to work on a case for us? Oh, I might be. What kind of a case is it? It involves a man named Patterson and a claim we paid off to the tune of $40,000. Uh-huh. You see, Patterson died in 1947. All the routine procedures were followed... There was no reason for not honoring the policy at the time. And there's reason now, Mr. Elgin? That's for you to find out, Mr. Dollar. A lifelong friend of the deceased swears he's still alive and kicking. Oh. I'll take the case, Mr. Elgin. John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, Hartford, Connecticut. To Controller's Office, Delaware Mutual Life Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Walter Patterson matter. Expense account item one, $78.14, fare and incidentals between Hartford and Wilmington. I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon, found a room at the Chesapeake Hotel... Stowed my luggage and went directly to your headquarters, Mr. Elgin. Of course, reports like this cross my desk ever so often. If I ran them all down, I'd get nothing else done. And ten times out of ten, the report's wrong. Yes, I know that, but this report bears investigation. I can remember three years after my father's death, I saw a man on a subway train to New York who... Well, he looked exactly as I remembered my dad. I finally walked up and asked him his name. The minute he spoke, I lost the impression altogether. I think a lot of people have had that same kind of experience at one time or another, don't you? Yes, I suppose so. We all have a double somewhere, they say. An old friend saw this man, Patterson? Yes, in Tucson, Arizona. Her name's Virginia Collier. I'd have her here now to talk to you, but unfortunately, she's en route to Europe. Oh, I see. Two weeks ago, Mrs. Collier stopped off in Tucson on her way back from Los Angeles. She claims that she saw Walter Patterson as big as life sitting in a bar at the El Conquistador Hotel. Is that all? No, she managed to talk to him. He told her his name was Euler, William Euler. Mrs. Collier says he pretended not to know her at all. Uh-huh. Now, here's the first point, Dollar. I wired authorities in Tucson to run a check on William Euler. In their conversation, Euler told Mrs. Collier that he'd been born and raised in Tucson. But from all we could gather, he'd never bought property or made a financial negotiation there until June of 1947. Oh, wait. This uh, Mrs. Collier, do you consider her reliable? Well, that's another point. If it had been anybody else, I don't think I'd have bothered to make even a cursory check. But Mrs. Collier practiced law here for a number of years and sat on the circuit bench for two terms. She's most reliable, and she knew Walter Patterson all of his life. Okay. Go on. 
The next thing is that Mrs. Collier distinctly remembered Patterson's limp. He was a pilot in the war. One leg was about half an inch shorter than the other from injuries he received in a crash. Mrs. Collier said this man, Yoler, had an identical limp. Well, with the similarity of features, it would be easy for her to imagine that part, don't you think? Ah, uh, yes, yes, I know what you're driving at, but there are some other things, too. Mrs. Collier asked Yoler if he'd ever gone to Amherst. That's where Patterson went to college. Yoler denied it, said he was a Notre Dame graduate. That didn't check out either. Now, we can assume that William Yoler merely looked a great deal like the late Walter Patterson and told some inaccuracies in the conversation at the bar. Or we can assume that he's really Walter Patterson, covering rather badly in the face of an old acquaintance who recognized him. At any rate, this is Mrs. Collier's entire statement duly notarized. All right. Now, this is a copy of the original policy on Patterson. How long with this company? Since 1936. Started with two $5,000 policies and built up to a master over a period of years. I see. Here. $20,000. Patterson was killed in a plane crash, and we paid double indemnity on the accident clause. Oh. It happened in April of 1947. Patterson took off on a rented plane one day and crashed offshore down the coast. Part of the plane wreckage was recovered, but his body was never found. The appellate court declared him legally dead after the usual three-year waiting period, April 5, 1950. Patterson's lawyer uh, filed claim for the widow April 17th, and we issued a full check April 30th of that year. Investigators' reports? Uh, right in this folder. Now, this is the last picture ever taken of Patterson, and these are his vital statistics. Uh-huh. I didn't know exactly uh, what you'd want to do first, so uh, I thought they might prove helpful. If we had a body to exhume, it could all be handled rather simply. Is Patterson's widow the beneficiary? Yes. Gloria Ann Patterson. Uh, incidentally, uh, she knows nothing about this report yet. Oh? Well, where'd these things come from? Pictures and fingerprints aren't stock material in insurance files. Uh, Mr. Brennan, Patterson's lawyer, gathered them for me. He's been very helpful. Oh. Has Patterson's widow been checked? As far as the money goes, she simply banked it in a savings account. Hasn't been touched at all. Well, on the face of it, that would eliminate the probability of any fraud on her part. Yes, the moment. it would. Well, I want to look this all over. Sure. Uh, you'll keep in touch with me, won't you? You bet. I spent the remainder of my day in and about Wilmington talking to the principals connected with the plane crash death of Walter Patterson. Number one was the radio operator who'd spoken to him last. Number two, a mechanic at the flying field. And number three, Lieutenant James Craigson, Coast Guard, who had conducted the search in the bay. See attached statement. We both agreed that an unreported rescue was possible but highly improbable. And when I left for Tucson that night, I was more or less convinced that all I'd find there would be a lot of desert sunshine. Expense account item two. $202.25, plane fare and incidental expenses from Wilmington to Tucson. I settled for a motel room out by the Veterans Hospital, slept six hours, then looked up Sergeant Tyler at the police station. Yeah, sure, Mr. Tyler. What can I do for you? Well, Mr. Elgin said you sent him a little information on William Yoler. I wonder if you have anything to add to that, Sergeant. No, nothing much. Of course, I don't know what you folks are driving at exactly. I just checked up on him a little bit. Well, he resembles a man who's supposed to be dead. And that's why I'm here. I see. Well, there's nothing much I can add to what I sent Mr. Elgin, Dollar. Yola's never been in any trouble around here. Gets along fine. You were the one who checked out the residency business? Yeah. According to Vitals, Yola wasn't born in this state, and I, like I said, no one knew him around here until five years ago. What does he do? Nothing. Always oh, seems to have plenty of money. Bought a nice little house out in Sierra Vista. Paid $42,000 for it. Is he married? No, lives alone there. Putters around with clay and painting. You know if he flies? I couldn't tell you that. He might. How about his friends? Lots of them, Mr. Dollar. A little town like this, you get to know people fast. Now, really, you folks might be spending a lot of money for nothing. Will Yola don't seem like the kind of fellow who's hiding out from anybody. Yeah, I agree. But I'll have to talk to him anyhow. Yeah. Here's his address. Sure pretty day, isn't it? Mm, sure is. Mm. 
Mr. Yoler? Yo. Who are you? My name's Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh? Well, come on in. Oh, well, thanks. Take a chair. Anywhere. Now, oh, what's what's on your mind? Oh, I'm just making a routine check, Mr. Yoler. I thought perhaps you could help me. No, what about? Well, I'm running down a report in the home office. Now, tell me, do you happen to remember a few days ago when you were out at the El Conquistador Hotel? I'm out there all the time. What about it? I steal something? No, uh, you met a woman named Carlier. Did I? Yes, it was at the bar. You had a drink with her. No. I might have. I still don't understand. Though. Well, I know it seems confusing. Uh, maybe this will help. Take a look at this. Mm-hmm. Well, you'll admit you look a great deal like the man in the picture. Yeah, I suppose I do. I'll be darned, I, I, I do it that. Well, that's why I'm here. You see, the company I represent insured the man in this picture for quite an amount of money. He was lost in a plane crash five years ago. The Mrs. Collier, who saw you here, thought you were him. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not. Oh, I wasn't in the Army. You want to smoke? Oh, thanks. Yeah. She was a lifelong friend of the man, Mr. Yoler. I have her sworn statement about the identity. Well? What years did you go to Notre Dame? I didn't go to Notre Dame. What is this? Well, that's what you told Mrs. Collier. Oh. Oh, now I remember that woman. Well, that was, um... On Sunday, yeah. Well, I, I might have told her anything, Mr. Dollar. You know, she was one of those inquisitive kind. I never could make out what was on her mind. Oh, now I get it. You, uh... She thought that I was this man. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, did you go to college? Yeah, Tulane. I got out in 36. You haven't lived in Arizona all your life. Where else have you lived? Uh... Mr. Dollar, I, I don't want to be unpleasant, but do you have any right to uh, ask me questions like this? Well, no, I don't. But you'll help me a lot if you'll answer them, Mr. Yoler. All right, why not? Well, I've lived in Cincinnati, Buffalo, around the country. I came here a few years ago for my health. I, I got a little asthma that bothers me. Ever been married? Yeah, once, 1944. It didn't last very long. Huh? Anything else you want to know? Well, are you in a hurry? I can come back no, later. No, no, not exactly. I, I've got to go downtown today, that's all. Look, uh, you seem like a nice enough guy, but it makes me uncomfortable answering these questions of yours. Well, and I appreciate the time you've given me already, Mr. Yoler. Please understand, it's just a matter of identity. Well, you know who I am, I just told you. Mm, that's true. Uh, I don't like this business much. Is there any way that we can eliminate it? Uh, I have a birth certificate and some other papers. You can have them. Make photostats if you well, like. Well, that's very kind of you, Mr. Yoler. Well, they're in my safety deposit box down at the bank. I'll get them for you this afternoon. Okay. Uh, my job is to check them. Sure. Sure, it's okay by me. Well, how do you like Tucson? Well, it's a lot different from Connecticut. Yeah, I'll bet. The uh, birth certificate and whatever else you have will help a lot, but I wonder if I could ask another favor. Sure, what is it? The most positive identification would be fingerprints. Oh? Mr. Yoller, I'm not so much interested in who you are, but simply in proving that you're not Walter Patterson. If you volunteered a set of prints, it would save me a great deal of digging around. Could you drop in at the police station? <laughs> Certainly, Mr. Dollar, why not? Well, that'll be fine. That's all right. Nice meeting you. Same here. <laughs> If he was trying to cover something, it certainly wasn't apparent from his conversation or his actions. He was almost too anxious to help me. By five o'clock, I had made reservations to return to Wilmington because the set of fingerprints she attached, which Mr. Yoler made at the Tucson police station later that day, in no way matched the right thumb and index prints recorded in your file for Walter Patterson. In short, the report seemed erroneous. William Yoler might not have been William Yoler, but he certainly was not Walter Patterson. Johnny Dollar. Will Yoler, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the prints. Dollar, I- I've got to talk to you. Something wrong? Plenty. Do you know how to get to the Arizona Inn? Well, I can find it. All right, I'll be there in 20 minutes. In the tone of his voice, I felt compelled to get there in half that time. I sat down at the bar and ordered a drink and waited for him to show up. 
An hour later, I was still waiting. I called his house three times and received no answer. I began to get worried. Finally, I left word with the bartender and took a cab out to his house. I arrived there at 8.35. There were no lights on and apparently no one around. I walked up to the front door and found it partially open. Yola? Yola? Mr. Yola? Operator? Give me the police, please. One moment. Sergeant Tyler speaking. Johnny Dollar, Sergeant. Hi, how's it going? Thought you were leaving. Not for a while, Sergeant. I'm at Will Yoler's house. He's been murdered. We'll return to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Every Saturday on CBS Radio, Theater of Today brings you fresh, gripping drama, well-acted stories of human relations. Sometimes it's comedy, sometimes serious. Always, Theater of Today strikes a chord of response in listeners who readily identify the stories with their own experience, past or present. Remember to hear Theater of Today every Saturday in the daytime on most of these same CBS radio stations. With our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Turned out to be a long night. Sergeant Tyler and several homicide officers arrived at the murder scene within a matter of minutes and got right down to the matter at hand. Yoler had been beaten to death. There were signs of a violent struggle having taken place all over the house, kitchen, bathroom, living room. As far as the police could determine, nothing was missing. The motive, the name of the killer, and any probable suspects were all up in the air. As Sergeant Tyler drove me back to my motel room. The whole thing's a mess, Dollar. You sure he didn't say anything else to you on the phone? Just asked to meet me. I'll admit he sounded frightened and worried about something. I don't get it. Our business was all finished. He wasn't the man I was looking for. You going to be around for a while? Well, if I can help you, I'll stick around, sure. Otherwise, I'll get back to Wilmington as soon as I can. I'd like to have you around for a day or two. You have a particular reason, Sergeant? Yes, I do. What? I want to find me a killer, and I think you can help. Nobody walks into a man's house, fights with him, breaks up furniture and lamps, beats him to death without making a lot of noise about it. Well, the wind was pretty strong. I don't care if a hurricane was blowing people fight like that, there's always noise. Somebody heard something. Somebody saw something. Somebody saw someone. My men will cover every house in Sierra Vista if they have to, to turn up a witness. Bound to be somebody, somewhere. The dogged Sergeant Tyler turned out to be 100% correct. In fact... 300% correct. For by 11 o'clock the following morning, his men had located three different people who had information about the brutal murder of William Mueller. One of them, a Mrs. Lucas, gave us what turned out to be our best lead. I take a walk every evening after dinner. The nicest part of the day. And you were out walking last night, Mrs. Lucas? Yes. I told the officers everything. Would you tell us, please, Mrs. Lucas? I walked past Mr. Yoler's house on my way down the Arroyo. What time was that, Mrs. Lucas? Between 7.30 and 8. And I saw Mr. Yoler standing in front of the house talking to this man. I spoke to him, and he spoke to me. Can you describe the man he was talking to? Yes, I saw him very well. He was a very large man, bigger than Mr. Yoler. And Mr. Yoler always struck me as a big man. Uh, Go on. Well, this man was a good two inches taller he had on a top coat, a tweed one, and he had his hat in his hand. His hair was red. How old would you say? Not over 40. Have you ever seen him before? No. 
I noticed him when I walked by on my way down the arroyo, as I said. And then when I was coming back, I could see through the window, and he was still there. With the lights on in the house? Oh, yes, in the living room. And the porch light was still on, too. Would you know this man if you saw him again, Mrs. Lucas? Well, yes, I would. I'm sure I would. He was so big. Was there a car out in front of Mr. Yola's house? I didn't notice one. That could have been. Was there a bus service that runs oh, up there? Oh, no. Everyone who lives in the Arroyo has to have a car. No buses up there at all. Sergeant Tyler issued an all-points bulletin according to the description given by the witnesses. In the meantime, his men checked the local cab companies and found out that one of the drivers had carried a fare to William Yola's house at 6.30 the previous evening. The cab driver verified Mrs. Lucas's description of the suspect and the important information that he had picked up the suspect at the airport. When that was checked, it was found the man had arrived on a plane from the east at 5.45 in the afternoon. He had used the name Roger Bales. But except for a strong case against him, the whole thing was still very confusing from our point of view. Expense account item three, $6.50. Long-distance telephone charges to your office. Well, I'll be darned. You have to stay there? Well, they've asked me to, Mr. Elgin. Well, as far as the insurance company is concerned, it's really none of our business, is it? That's right, Mr. Elgin. I'm going to... Dollar. Oh, hold on. Yeah? Answer from Washington on your wire. Oh, yeah? Here. Let me see. Mr. Elgin. Yes? It is our business, after all. Huh? The War Department has a better sample of Walter Patterson's prints than you gave me. Please check out. Uh, slow down. I still don't understand. I wired a sample of Yoler's prints to the War Department this morning for a positive identification. They just answered me. Yoler was Walter Patterson. Uh-oh. Where did you get those prints that were in the file you gave me? Uh, Mr. Brennan, Patterson's lawyer, got them for me. From a pilot's license. Uh-huh. I'd better call Mr. Brennan. Oh, don't you dare. Well, what can I do to help you, Dollar? Don't open your mouth. I'll handle it when I get there. <laughs> Expense account item four, $42.85. Expenses while in Tucson. And item five, same as item two, traveling expenses from Tucson to Wilmington. I arrived at 10.15 in the evening, called you, obtained lawyer Brennan's home address, and went directly there. The house was English, conservative, expensive. And the fire in the living room looked cheerful when the door opened. Yes? Good evening. I'd like to see Mr. Brennan, please. It's rather important. Uh, my name is Dollar. Bob's been ill for the last two or three days, Mr. Dollar. He's up in his room reading now. If you're sure it's important, I'll disturb it you. It is, Mrs. Brennan, very important. I'm not Mrs. Brennan. I'm Mrs. Patterson. What? Is there something wrong? Oh, no, no, Mrs. Patterson. Well, come nothing here, Mr. Dollar. If you'll excuse me, please. I'll see if he can see you. I watched Walter Patterson's widow disappear up a column stairway. I hadn't been ready to meet this attractive, well-groomed woman. But after I had met her and seen her for that brief moment, I was partially prepared to meet Robert Brennan, attorney at law. Mr. Dollar, Bob. Oh, hello, Mr. Dollar. You're a late caller. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Bob, I'll run along. It's almost seven. All right, dear. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Mrs. Patterson. Brennan, I just flew in from Tucson, Arizona. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. Well, good night. Uh, Gloria, you'll be interested in what Mr. Dollar has to say. What? I don't understand, Bob. Let's go into the living room. Come on, dear. Are you sure you want Mrs. Patterson here? Yeah, Gloria, I didn't get these bruises falling down a flight of stairs. I got them in a fight. What? I flew to Tucson the day before yesterday to see Walter. Why? Yes, Walter's been alive all this time. Bob. This is only for her benefit, Dollar. I'll tell it just once. When you get me in court, it'll be different. How did it happen, Brennan? Gloria, Walt didn't die in that crash. He was picked up in the bay by a fishing boat on its way to Florida. The first port they came into was Charleston. 
He phoned me long distance from there and told me all about it. This was ten days after we all thought he was dead. Gloria, it was his idea. You've got to believe that. What was his idea? He hated you. You know how often he asked you for a divorce? It was the idea he had when he phoned me from Charleston. He said it was his chance to get away from you. He knew how I always felt about you, and he said I could have you. For a price. You've been supporting him wherever he's been since then? 25000 a year, regular monthly payments. I could afford it. I could afford anything for you, Gloria. Did he tell you he hated me? Did he? He just wanted to be away from you, from everything. The war changed him that way. Uh, about the day before yesterday... A man at the insurance company called up making inquiries. I didn't know if he'd sent an investigator out there or not, but I gave him a lot of information and material that... Well, it should have helped throw you off. It threw me off, all right. Especially the fingerprints. Mr. Dollar can tell you, Gloria, how Walt didn't want to be here with you. Isn't that right, Dollar? Didn't he do everything he could to make you think his name was Yoler? Uh-huh. You see, Gloria? Where is he now? He's dead, Mrs. Patterson. Truly dead now. Oh. That's all I have to say, Dollar. You've... Fought with Walter. You killed him. It was him or me, Gloria. I... He phoned me two days ago and said that the police had been checking on him. I told him what it was all about, not to get scared. But he was scared, and I got a plane the first chance I had. What did you argue about? Apparently, you'd been there that morning. He was going to tell you the truth and claim he had amnesia. He said he had a date to meet you. You didn't answer my question. What do you mean, I didn't answer? I I just told you he was going to blow the whole thing. Oh, Bob. All I wanted out of this was you, Gloria. He didn't want you. I did. Last week, you said you decided to marry me. It took you five years to decide that. And it took him one lousy afternoon to decide he was going to come back to you. that the confusion is set down in this report is worthless as evidence both to the police and your insurance company. The proof that Brennan killed Patterson will be a matter for the courts to decide. The proof that Gloria Ann Patterson is guilty or not guilty of a fraudulent claim is a matter for you to decide. At any rate, she is a widow now. And I personally am convinced that she had no complicity in the matter of claims, murder, or collusion. Expense account item six, same as item one. Expenses from Wilmington to Hartford. Expense account total, $610.13. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. 